run the show, whoa, whoa, enemies, never know, whoa, whoa, got it all locked down, we don't sleep till the morning, whole crowd loud on their feet, and we blowin', uh, 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 blowin', uh, uh, blowin', uh, uh, blowin', uh, uh,
Intel Extreme Masters Katowice is brought to you by Monster Energy, the United States Air Force, and Intel. Hello, StarCraft fans. Welcome to day one of IEM Katowice. It's uh, pretty chilly out here, but inside the competition is about to heat up. So I'm going to go find a seat. I'll see you in there. You are here for a reason. A place where glory, passion, and dedication converge. A single step stands between you and triumph. In moments of hesitation, a misstep can lead to a fall. legendary arena where heroes etch their names in eternity. Before them, a challenge that distinguishes the great from the greatest. There can only be one. We're back, ladies and gentlemen, for the 12th time here in Katowice for StarCraft II. It's 2024, and we've got $500,000 for these nerds to play for as we continue things on the road to the World Cup. But that road is paved with gold as one of these 24 players will become the champion here in Katowice once again and continue the lineage of this prestigious tournament. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Kolaris, joining you here as the host, as always, and to my left-hand side to join me on the desk to get things rolling and good to go. It is is Zombie Grub and Wardy. Thank you for joining me here for a moment. I'm not gonna ask you any questions just yet, but there you are, looking great, looking fine, looking clean as we prepare for this tournament. Not only are they gonna be joining me though, but also a host, a wealth of people are gonna be joining us as well to get all the first casts going and all the voices that are gonna be joining us. We also have good old Pig and Loco in the distance here, who are gonna be bringing you that first game as they are here ready to go. Give me a wave, hi guys. It's, it, <laughs> I didn't know. I didn't expect to do it that way, but that's how we're going to do it for this time round. And we also, of course, have Ben and Rotterdam that are going to be joining us alongside Rachel, who is over on the stage as well. So, guys, first things first, we're back. Katowice, it's time to go again, ZG. Are we going to cry like last year? I don't know about that. And I didn't cry. Thank you very uh, much. Uh, you maybe cried, I, Roddy cried, everyone else cried. I, did, I didn't cry. I'm a manly man. So, but yeah, I think it's going to be very difficult to top that amongst any tournament in any esport. That's the thing. It was yeah. actually one of the most beautiful things in the entire competition that is video games. No, definitely so. Uh, let's take a look back at 2023 Wardy here, as we did, of course, have Oliveira being able to claim, as you say, not only something that is most important in terms of StarCraft II history, but esports history, something that kind of goes under rivaled in terms of an unexpected result, Wardy. Katowice is full of magic. It's going to be hard to again re replicate what we had there, but the, the field of play is excellent. La last year was just unbelievable, right? Legendary run, legendary yeah. storyline. Nobody saw that one coming. And probably never again, you know, very possible <laughs> because StarCraft 2 is that game where the competition is so tough. The players are so good. And at the very, very top, the top four or five players do have a leg up on the other guys. So to make a run through one of those guys is hard. Never mind multiple back to back. I mean, Katowice is always amazing. Everyone always brings their absolute peak gameplay. And that's what makes this event so special because all the players hold it in such great stead. Yeah, people were, were really wearing the hearts on their sleeves when it came to last year's Katowice. Again, for a lot of these players, it is one of the most important fixtures on the calendar when it comes to StarCraft II. Of course, we are on that road to the World Cup, which is becoming extremely important as well. But that doesn't take away from the fact that Katowice is seen as by these players as a nerve-wracking experience, the place that they want to win and claim that trophy. It's incredibly prestigious and, it, you know, it's an amazing experience for every single player so yeah we've uh, heard that lots of customs have been played you know people hiding things on ladder actually discussing how much they want to win either because it is i am katavica or to follow along some of the storylines from the previous year some disappointments from earlier tournaments looking to be rectified in this tournament and that's really exciting and i'm sure we'll get into it more in the groups but i think we actually have a lot to look forward to for even the very first day where we get to see all of these players and all of these groups 
Definitely so. And more to look forward to here as we get ready to head on over to the stage. So without further ado, let's get Katowice 2024 underway. Your IEM Katowice 2023 champion, Olivera, returns to the stage and brings back our incredible trophy. Olivera, how does it feel to be back on this stage? Well, it's a little bit nervous, but it's more exciting for this tournament. A little bit nervous. I would think the other players would be a little bit nervous about facing you. We have some scenes here from last year when you claim that trophy, you claim the championship. What was going through your mind at the time? Well, it's... It's still like a dream, and it's an unbelievable. It's it's a like miracle for me. Yeah. Well, we have seen some incredible StarCraft on this stage. I know this weekend promises to bring us more. But for this audience, maybe some new faces here to watch StarCraft. Anything you want to say to them? Uh, I want to say something for you guys. Like, I remember someone told me like, maybe not today, and maybe tomorrow, and maybe next month, but. One day I will be the champion again, I promise. Woo! Strong words from Oliveira to start us off. Let's get some more strong words from our wonderful desk. Back to you, Kylaris. Thank you, yes. Bold words from our current defending champion here, Oliveira, looking to fight uh, towards another championship. It will be tough here, though, with the player base we actually have for our 24 players competing for the championship this time around. But again, even you know, when it comes to Katowice, there is a little bit of magic there here, Wardy. Every single time we come here, I, I don't think there's been a single time I've been disappointed. That SOS winning that finals really fast wasn't exactly a disappointment, but it was interesting. <laughs> but it was never disappointed. Went down in history. For sure, right? It did. <laughs> there's, there's this aura around Katowice, yeah, you know, yeah. and, and ZG touched on it a little bit just before, but it really is apparent if you've just been online in StarCraft, you have a bunch of these guys on your friends list, they're all in customs, they're yes, all yes. online, like, and it's been constant, you know, it's noticeably different from a couple months ago. They are raring to go, they're going to bring their best games, and that always translates. It's actually really amazing how you can see, like, for the biggest events, everybody steps up because everyone's practiced the most. It's going to be amazing. Yeah, absolutely. Especially since we're seeing the landscape change completely when it comes to StarCraft 2. It's not only the fact that the players are trying to up their game time and time again, it's the fact that we now have Vitality, Cloud9, yeah. Na'Vi, RA, all of these teams, ZG, coming in because they're wanting to compete for the very top prizes in the in the scene. It's a wonderful injection, you know, of just like passion and life energy because, of course, all these teams are also, you know, using social media to actually talk about things. And I know that that has been, you know, honestly kind of missing a little bit in StarCraft, which is, you know, bring in the other people from those teams, from the other games that are on those teams. And they're like, oh, I love this team. That guy's on this team. Yeah. I'm yeah. going to go cheer for that guy. I know a ton of people did that for Gumio as he was one of the first big pickups for this team. Yes. And I think that was a great first addition because he is such an interesting player. We do talk about him a whole lot. So to have it happen for the last like six months has been amazing. Yeah, it's been a whirlwind. I mean, let's make no bones about it. These teams want points at the Esports World Cup, but it is fantastic to see it kind of proliferating, moving here through StarCraft 2. Let's talk about the format here for Katowice though as well, as we have ourselves group stages, which moves into that playoff bracket down the line. And as you can see here, those group stages is going to be distributed across the next couple of days, and then we move into those playoffs. Now, what is most important, I feel, aside from obviously becoming the champion here, Wardy, those quarterfinals, they're very important too. Each and every quarterfinal is like a final in itself, because this year, it's the road to the Esports World Cup. That is the World Championship. That is where everyone is going to play for the biggest prize pool in StarCraft II history. Yes. And everyone wants to qualify, and it's not going to be easy to get there, no. right? There's very <laughs> limited spots, and everyone's very good. So yeah, each of those quarterfinals is going to be a play-in to that Esports World Cup. 
going to be amazing. And the prize pool doesn't disappoint here either at Katowice. $500,000, 150K for first place. I talked to Reyna. If he wins, it's a Porsche 911 for him. I'm okay with that. <laughs> Big fan of that. He's been in this hyperbolic time chamber working on out for all of this uh, when it comes to that kind of Archon mode that he's been playing. But overall, a great prize pool here, ZG, for all of these players to fight for. Yeah, and I believe they do get the additional money as well for winning in groups too. Right, correct. Right? So that's actually, it, they, they add so much layers to the competition because at no point in any of the last few years or any kind of pizza, as far as I know, but certainly the ones that I've been to, has it a point where it's like, oh, this poor guy, like he's going to give his best, you know? But <laughs> yeah, no, like yeah. you absolutely do give your best, especially when some of the groups like last year ended up having like four people, two, three or whatever that was, right? Yes. So it, it just encourages more competition and obviously getting to that grand prize is the goal, but it's incredibly difficult when you got these players listed here. And here are the groups as they do. So obviously seeded by the way EPT points or rankings actually worked out as a whole. We'll gloss over group A for the moment because that's what we're going to be starting off with. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, but group B, let's start off with that here awardee. Clam Cure, Oliveira, the defending champion, Bunny, Shin, of course, Ragnarok, and Stats making a return here to the true international stage. That makes me kind of hype, although maybe he's not in the same shape he once was. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's hard to be as excited for Stats as when it was back in the day, but you're still excited that he's here, right? Because he had to get here. That wasn't easy. He did it off a, a lot of uh, PvP. Not many Protoss in this group, so <laughs> might be a little bit of a tough one for him, but I mean, it's just a tough group all around. Yeah. You're talking about Clem, who is hot off the heels of that uh, the Dreamhack Atlanta big win, deal. right? That was a massive win. But then he's got probably the worst group he could have drawn. TVT, a matchup he's improved in massively, but it's still volatile. And it's still, I look at this list of players on the Terran side, I'm like, I think any of those guys can knock Clem down a little bit. And if Clem starts to get in a rough position, then I can see him stumbling against Shin, for example. So, yeah, it's going to be a, uh, a good time. All right, well, I'm getting word that the players are already anyway. But oh. like, so that we're kind of blasting oh. through this here. Uh, so I did want to talk about C&D, but we'll get a chance later on in the day to talk about that. Here is Group A. Apparently, we're whisking past that here as well. <laughs> but it's a great group to start things off here, ZG. Obviously, some big heavy hitters. You've got the likes of, now that I mentioned it before, Cloud9 and Na'Vi and yep. all these organizations now in here as well. So it's an exciting group to start things you off too. You have one of the newest teams being introduced and literally one of the oldest teams in StarCraft oh, with Hero Marine, with, uh, with Mal. So that's pretty cool. And obviously some of the other uh, injections that have happened in the previous years just because people love StarCraft, like Shopify Rebellion um, and Basilisk. So it just it is yep. a wonderful group of players for wonderful teams. But then it is a really fun start because we have a lot of, I think, the non-Korean hopefuls, the fan favorites going into this group. Yes, yes. And a lot of the really fun players as well. And we have the Polish hope and we are in Poland and Spirit always does well in Poland so I'll be looking forward to that especially yeah definitely so I, I would love to see Spirit do well because there's also been a little bit of magic for him in Katowice yep. when it comes to even the open play-ins that he's played in sometimes as well as some of the groups that actually does go down let's take a look at the schedule here for today as well because we have a lot of games <laughs> for you to be able to witness here just on this stream alone, never mind the fact that we have a B and a C stream as well on the way. So we're starting things off with Spirit vs. Scarlet. We'll get to talk about that in a moment here. But as you can see, everything is very sorted out. Reina versus Maru later on, Wardy. <laughs> yeah, okay, I'm up for that. I'm up for that. That's definitely quite the highlight of day number one, right? <laughs> but of course, it's that Group D. Every single match yes. in that Group D is so good. And you know Reyna, he's feeling it, man. He definitely comes into this. He knows he's doing well. He won game is eight last year, right? He knows that he wants to do very well here. And I think he's very confident talking to him and everything. It's going to be really fun to see that later. All right, here's our first match then. It's Scarlet versus Spirit here. Shopify Rebellion versus Na'Vi. Of course, Na'Vi made their entrance with Spirit. Spirit's constantly been on the up and up here to mm -hmm. try and kind of subvert the expectations of players around the world. Scarlet's going to come in here as a challenger who is a mastermind when it comes to RTS here, ZG. And she can absolutely pop off. Yes. We actually have two different extremes of the stories, which is that Scarlet can be a very hype player, has been one of the best foreigners on Koreans in the world in the past, and she can have that amazing run. Maybe she gets stopped kind of abruptly, but she can actually show that she is top uh, of the line as far as StarCraft II play. But then we have Spirit, who basically isn't so much spiky as he is just continuing to improve. He takes a step forward every single year and stays at that step. Mm -hmm. So after a couple of years of that, you have him as an especially scary player, and apparently the rankings from the other players also show that, where he's one of the more improved for the player cards we'll be showing later on. Correct, correct. What are your thoughts coming into this one? Really fun first match, really important first match. This is a group where you've got a couple of favorites out in front with Gumiho and Solo, the way they've played. 
And then you've kind of got, I think, all of Spirit here, Marine Scarlet and Trigger being like, they could take down a Gumiho or Sola, but there's very much still going to be a lot of importance amongst those guys, how the results go for making playoffs. So yeah, this is a very important opening match. One of those groups which is absolutely not set out in stone at all. Mm. And I think this one really sets the precedent for the rest of today, then tomorrow. So it's yeah, going to be really big. And very interesting because it's not like a guarantee. You know, I think Spirit has been playing really well, but you know Scott has that ability to pop off, right? To just yeah. show up and be like, oh, she's just going to creep the entire map and Spirit doesn't get to play at all. It's going to be very interesting to see if she can get that kind of control going. Does that sometimes, though, lean into what Spirit wants to do? I mean, as much as Scarlet, yes, would like to creep the entire map and do whatever, Spirit is not adverse to the idea of, I'm going to sit back and just play my game in my own corner of the world and just be okay for a little while. To be fair, he hasn't been so much that guy in the last True. year or so. He's actually really improved as far as not looking shy or scared mm -hmm. and does generally match the flow of the top tier Terrans. Mm -hmm. And I know that people kind of having their idea of the meta of TVZ, but to be honest, there's a couple of more extreme metas that are being pushed this tournament. We'll see, we'll talk uh -huh. about that later. But TVZ also is kind of being pushed as well. When you, the expectations are set to be basically Clem versus Serral, which is insane expectation, but still. You get to talk a lot about like how that multitasking works out for Clem and how other players want to copy that or how the late game isn't literally just turtling with ghosts, which I know is still a complaint, but it honestly has so much action compared to where it was two years ago. So. Yeah. I mean, Spirit might be forced into that position and he might be more comfortable because that had been his thing for so long, the defense of Terran. Yes. But I think actually you would really miss out if that's just what you assumed from him. Sure, sure. I'm sure Scarlet is not going to assume that from him, but uh, you actually got to be very scared of his mid-game. I was going to say, mix him more lethal, right? The potential yes. that there is more versatility to a game compared to a last year awardee from someone like Spirit, who, again, kind of feels like he's been on the cusp of doing something great in Katowice, but not really been able to kind of get over that hump. Yeah, I mean, I remember last year, it was really kind of noteworthy what he said, because he played against Gumiho, that was essentially a play, and he was like, this is the most important match of my life, right? <laughs> yes, he did. And so he's gotten closer, he's gotten closer, and this year he really has stepped up again. He got a great group this time around. And yeah, I think he has been able to mix up his playstyle a bit more. He's delved deeper into things he was less comfortable with doing. He's been much more comfortable being like, right, I can attack, I can kill you, instead of just falling back to his safety net, which was that big macro play. So in that regard, we might see the best spirit we've ever seen at Katowice. And considering he usually hits upwards here, that's very exciting as well. Do you expect, Wardy, any particular playstyle coming out from Scarlet, be it aggressive or be it just kind of like, I'm going to force the game into a longer state? I think she might play a few like roaches into like, Kind of like get safe early because I always feel like Scarlet CVT struggles the most in the first five or six minutes. Uh -huh. yeah. She's died so much to like just a few Hellions getting in or just things along those lines. If she gets to mid game, she's terrifying. So I think if she can prioritize getting there, that would be amazing for her. That'd be very nice, very nice. All right, well, it is time to get our first match underway as we head on over to the stage. Let's have a little chat with Rachel to see how everything's going over there. We're in the auditorium this time around, so it's kind of like we're back home for what Starcraft is here in Katowice as a whole. Rachel, how are you doing over on the stage? I'm good. I'm glad I have all of you who are so well versed in I am Katowice Starcraft. It's not, I've not been here since 2015, so if you could catch me up on what I might be missing. Well, I, actually, it's it's Fat Thursday today here in Poland, so you've got to eat as many donuts as possible. It's a legal requirement, so get on with that. I've been doing that every day since I got here, so no problem, Jason. <laughs> <laughs> Have a good time. <laughs> well, let's get things started here on the stage. They've been hyping up this first match. It's going to be a great one. We have from Shopify Rebellion, Scarlet versus from Navi, Spirit. Let's take a closer look at these two players. to start off the tournament with a big Terran versus a guy in pig. Joining me is Loco. How are you doing, mate? mate? I am so excited for this match. It's going to be our first best of three series of IEM Katowice 2024. 
And what a match to start this off with, right? I mean, we were talking about it a little bit. In our minds, this could be a series that is anywhere between 15 to about two hours long. <laughs> yeah, it could be quick with either of these, bringing out timing attacks, catching the other one off guard. But uh, Scarlet has been known for being unafraid of the late game, covering the map in creep, as they were mentioning there. You know, she might just get control. But on the other side, Spirit, we know he's happy to turtle up as well. So mm -hmm. there is that chance where this ends in a uh, static late game where you've got wall offs of planetaries and Nidus Worms trying to break the front line. You've got 26 Broodlords trying to one-shot Thors, all of the madness. But uh, it's, it's an interesting moment to kind of gauge where this group is at. Absolutely. Game number one is already being set up here. The players are in their seats, so we will be jumping into our first tournament match here in just a moment. I think Wardy brings up a very good point just now on the analyst desk. I think Scarlet needs to play a very clean early game. If you make a few slip-ups here and there, you lose a couple drones, Spirit is just gonna gobble up that entire map, right? That's what we've seen Terran players do over the last half year or so. They're very good at taking control of the matchup. And even though it might not be game over right at the very start, you just lose so much momentum. I do wonder exactly what sort of openings we're looking at out of Spirit. Terran is often the one that sets the pace in the early game outside of some very dangerous options that Zerg can make. Is it going to be Hellions diving in? Are we looking at very safe Hellion Banshee? Or are we rushing straight up to the Marine tank stage of the game? Lots of options are open and Spirit will very much usually be in the I pick my build. And how does Scarlet as the Zerg player adapt around that? Where can she block his, his harassment? Where does she expand? How does she build her economy? And is she going to be very Ling Bane focused or Roach focused? A very big question mark. Absolutely. Spirit historically, a big fan of playing those long macro games. Over the last year or so, ever since really the previous IEM cut of it, so where he had a fantastic performance overall, he has been playing a bit more aggressively, right? Like he's been ending games a bit earlier overall, rather than yep. just making a new command center whenever he's got the opportunity. Sometimes you actually go in for the kill. A classic three base eight racks. It's a strategy we've seen many times at Katowice over the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. Very likely that will be coming out. And it's going to be an interesting start. We're going to be going on to Alcyon for map one. A big Terran versus a Zerg match to start us off. Any nerves that are going to be out there, they're going to be coming out big time in the first match of the entire tournament. In the bottom left side of the map, we're representing Shopify, Shopify Rebellion, hailing from Canada. It is Scarlet. And her opponent, representing Poland as well as Navi. In the opposite corner of the map, it's Spirit. You're absolutely right, though. This is the first match you're playing, and immediately you have to go onto the stage, right? Which is one of those moments where, yeah, sure, you may be performing really well online when you're playing from the comfort of your own home, but playing at a, well, a stage when you can see an audience and a different setup and everything else, it certainly is something a bit different. Now, is this going to be a comment center first right here for Spirit? Yes, it is. So he is not afraid. Nice economic way to start things off for the Terran. Alcyon's a map which is, uh, we've seen our fair share of late game on this map. I do think the Watchtower is a big advantage to Terran in the mid game though. Mm -hmm. You've got an incredibly choked up area around that. Very hard for the close range Zerg units to actually get on top of them. And the amount of map control you get from controlling that area, if Zerg wants to go around, they have to go all the way around either behind the minerals or up the far left side of the map. And it's very difficult, especially if these rocks are still up, for the Zerg to avoid the frontal Terran push. Absolutely. Spirit, though, not afraid of an early game push right here from Scarlet. Scarlet opening up with a hatchery first as well, which is, of course, something we expect from Zerg players. But every once in a while, they will throw a curveball where the command center on the low ground, well, it would put you in a world of trouble. Scarlet is not going to see the scouting SCV, but she will get a glimpse of it in just a moment. And that's really just to confirm that that command center on the low ground was not a mistake. Around the time of Atlanta at the end of last year, Scarlet was having a lot of fun with Mass Hydralisk against Terran. She was uh, like really Mass Hydralisk. We're talking, let's skip melee upgrades and get range instead and get 30 Hydras with the Ling Bane and uh, get a silly economy up. We'll see if she can find the room to do that. I, I always look at that style and on paper say, this can't be serious. This can't be the best way to play a tournament. And she'll beat top players with it. And I'll go, that's crazy. But she's, she's just got such a, an explosive macro ability if she gets a good start. And that's yep. why I feel like Spirit has that kind of onus on his shoulders before the game even starts. If I can't let her get going, you know, let's not give her the map. 
yeah, I've done a greedy opening. That's cool. Now let's get on top of her. As, as soon as I got, you know, Hellions on the map, Liberators going around. Once you've got the Marines out, you have to be in her face or she will run away with the macro. Couple of Zerklings sneaking around the left side of the map. That Reaper looking around. So luckily for Spirit, he did not actually send that unit across the map. One of the links right now, <laughs> barely poking out of the shadows there. But ultimately, the Reaper Ooh. is at home. Fresh Kill, mules. Uh, Fresh mules. A mule would be massive. The mules, when they just land, are very, very valuable pickoffs. Two, two SCVs is really good. All right, ultimately the Reaper is going to be able to get rid of all of these units, but a bit of lost mining time, and obviously four Zerklings is 100 minerals, two SCVs is also 100 minerals, so I don't think Scarlet is going to be upset about this early game at all. Yeah, I mean, I reckon at least one mule trip each got wasted there with the, yes. the micro. Each one of those is 25 minerals as well, so straight up value is great. Starport, of course, coming down along with that third command center for Spirit as the Queens start to spread creep. And with the, the Ling speed, but also we've got a worker mining gas. We've got a few more Lings coming out. This is looking like Scarlet wants to play her favorite style. Just Ling Bane, ever since 2013, she's been one of the best players in the world at the forefront of playing a kind of solid Ling Bane macro opening. So this is what she loves to do. Over the last couple of months, we've seen quite a few of the top level Zergs, like for example, Serral and Raynor and Dark. They've been focusing a lot on Roach openers rather than straight Ling Bane. Usually they will still transition towards Ling Bane a little bit later on into the game. So Scarlet apparently not really making that side trip to Roaches. She just wants to go straight into those Zerklings and Banelings here, but a nice little bit of harassment here to get things started for Spirit. Roaches hit an expiry date. Ling Bane doesn't. Ling Bane is pretty much always good. Great focus fire for Spirit, I like that. Catches a few Zerglings that she had stacked up. It is an exceptionally safe Hellion Banshee yep. with a, a greedy third command center off of a command center first. So, I mean, we were asking, how is Spirit gonna play this series? Uh, safe, solid, standard seems to be the answer. He feels like he can take Scarlet in just a, a straight on macro battle. Scarlet not getting any vision right there of the main base can be a little bit annoying. She will see the timing of the Banshee in just a moment. So that at the very least is gonna give her confirmation that there's very likely a third command center as well. It's gonna indeed be Stimpak on the back of this. Well, now the third CC is already flying on down to the low ground. And this really is a big Terran economy right from the start. Lair coming up as well for Scarlet. We are expecting a Bingling Nest here right about right now. It's important not to forget about that. Got to make Baneling speed the moment that layer finishes normally. And uh, no second gas yet. I mean, we got to focus on the fact that she knows he's being greedy. She is going for a very quick fourth on location. So she is clearly trying to kind of match his economy. And <laughs> she's going straight either Hydras or Infestors, mate. The fact that yeah. she doesn't have a Baneling as she's doing it. it could just, just be for an Obser or sorry, an Overseer here. But... I'm hoping for Infestors. It, ha it has to be Infestors or Hydras. And we're going to see the moment that layer finishes what structure she goes for. This is special tactics. Oh. Double upgrades coming up right now. There's the Hydra then. It's Mass Hydra, man. I can't believe it. I figured, you know, it's been a few months. Maybe the Terrans have figured this out, but she didn't have great success in that tournament. She didn't have a big target on her back. Not that many Terran players watched those games. Mm -hmm. And now she's coming out with it and saying, you know what? I've got three bases full of workers. I'm already droning my fourth before the six minute mark. Let's just go straight to Hydralisks. And Hydras take away Terran's momentum. Normally Terran can pick away with their superior range. Hydras have the same range as Marauders. They have more range than Marines. There is not a lot you could do here if she's got Hydras on the field at the seven minute mark. And she's going into the main base right now. Spirit already pre-cloaked them, so no vision here for Scarlet until right now. A couple drones indeed will end up falling. Nice bit of harassment, but you're absolutely right. Figuring out that it's Hydras here is actually very critical. Now, does this Siege Tank play here from Spirit? So at the very least, he got that one right, but... Yeah, the Hydra is an interesting unit, right? It's one of those units that usually is a supportive unit. It's one of the Queens is a bit in, in a bit of trouble. One Queen does get sniped. Scarlet, not too happy with that, but it's, of course, not a uh, killer blow or anything like that. Hydrogen has not been scouted. The Hydras have not revealed themselves to our knowledge. There is a bunker coming up on the third base. Uh, Siege Tank's very good versus Hydras, as you pointed out. You know, they're, they're, they've got the long range. Hydras, uh, otherwise they can set up a concave. And Hydras, because they don't have the movement of like Stim Marines and Marauders, you can have massive overwhelming numbers, yeah. but Hydras can't really break a position. Because if the Terran keeps pulling back and kind of stutter stepping and they have siege tanks, watching Hydras push through a choke point is one of the most excruciatingly painful thing for a Zerg player to watch. It is like terrible. They're good at defending when they've got the concave and they are terrible at attacking through choke points. 
There is an infestation pit on the back of this too right now for Scarlet. So she may be thinking about going into Lurkers and Hive Tech here momentarily. At this point, Spirit does not know what he's playing against. So he is going to go for what is considered to be his standard move out. Combat Shield, Stim Pack, 1-1 upgrades. All of it is, well, finishing up at this point. Is Spirit prepared to play against Mass Hydra? Because Scarlet has been producing a lot of them for quite a while already. Yeah, she is way up on workers. 85 workers right now against 70. She's got a good unit count. 1-1 one, one is going <laughs> to finish right now, and immediately Spirit pulls back and goes, whoa, I do not want to fight on creep. No, fighting on creep here would be an absolute disaster. Now, pushing it to siege tanks, likewise, also not a great idea. Now, of course, the surprise has been spoiled. We did see two infestors, by the way, on the production tab. Keep in mind that these days they will have enough energy for a fungal growth. So right when they pop out, that is something very handy here for Scarlet. But how much longevity is there into yeah, in a unit composition like this? It's kind of odd because obviously if the Marines run forward in the blob, she lands the big fungal. It's massive. She can take him down. But if he's very careful and methodical and maxes out with a good tank count, it is tough for her to find a good fight. Fifth base gets killed in the south, or the sixth base, I should say. Fifth one up here on the rich gas base is deflecting the double drop. Scarlet's able to control her side, but she's going to have to get rid of this. She's going for it. Big fungal landing on the Marine Hellbat. This is not the entire Terran army, though. Drop inside of the main base of the Zerg player as well. Scarlet is going to have to run on over and defend against that. That is about 16 Marines here going to town. At the very least, they'll see the timing of that hive. She Short crushed the army on the well, front, though. Yeah, she, she went yeah. for the counter attack. She was chasing the drop back. She now turns it into a run by, but there is so many units at home. And I'd definitely love to see Scarlet bring that army back to her side of the map. Her creep in the north is ridiculous, by the way. Yep. In the midst of all this happening, remember we said you can't let... Oh! oh, that's a major error right there from Spirit. Oh my lord, great catch. Uh, good, good positioning by Scarlet to catch that. We were saying you can't let uh, Scarlet just get away with the macro, but you know, he, he embraced this macro game. Spirit's going up to five command centers. He's going for two, two. He's massing units, but he just lost a lot of his army momentum. And if Scarlet can use this to just keep re-spreading that creep, getting back out there, and she's already trying to go backwards to Banelings now, sideways, I should say, with mm. the Baneling Nest and the Hive on the way. I actually feel like a Lurker transition from here has potential if you go Lurkers plus Vipers for the tanks, yeah. but it's kind of awkward because if you can't kind of trade, it's not as mobile, whereas Banelings have supreme mobility. So Banelings are the best for breaking planetaries, busting through and just overwhelming a Terran player. Scarlet actually on the offensive here. You pointed out earlier already that pushing it to siege tanks is incredibly difficult. Scarlet, of course, very dangerous with the fungal growth in particular. Oh. Is she actually going to push in here? There's she, not that many tanks. She got me supply advantage right now for Scarlet. She's got the fungals waiting. One of those in the south would be nice. It does land. She's trading right now. There's only like two tanks firing. Actually, one of them only just sieged up. Good time to pull back for Scarlet. If she committed a bit more, that would have turned into an absolute bloodbath. I wouldn't say it was a great trade for her, but it definitely wasn't too bad. And if she can keep him off a fifth base, she has a massive income right now. 2-2 two, two is finishing up right after the fight. So that set of upgrades just finished. Adrenal Glance, Ultralisk Cavern, and Vipers coming up together with 17 drones. So Scarlet more than happy to play the macro game here. Now, one thing that we see go wrong for StarCraft players in general is second guessing themselves, right? When you start thinking a lot whilst you're playing the game, usually that's where things go south. And this is not a unit composition that Spirit can have a ton of practice against, right? So there's a very good chance that Spirit right now is playing this a little bit more cautiously than he ideally should be, because when's the last time you've really played against Mass Hydra? Yeah, I, I would say caution's probably better against yeah. this than being over eager, but you're absolutely right that it puts you in a weird state where you're like, exactly where do I push? When do I push? Oh, here we go. She can't push through there, no, though. The, no, tanks, no, no the way. tanks are in range. She's got to get out of there. Oh, well, they deal a lot of damage, though. Ultimately, oh, she does live. Yeah, she's trying to bait out a few of those Marines through that choke point now. Drops, though, in the meantime. I'm the top left as well as the bottom right. She's really refined this style from the last time I saw her play this. Last time a big problem was she kept going up to like 60 Hydras. This time she's stopping at about 25, max 30, because they get stuck behind each other the more you build. They don't really add anything to a battle. And she's gone into the Infestors, the Vipers, the Ling Bane. She's got Melee, Carapace, not to mention Kindness, Blading coming in. All these upgrades are fantastic and the spores spread around doing pretty well. Yeah, the drops are annoying, but they're not getting massive damage. And look at that, even abducting Medivacs. I think she's really keeping him contained in his side of the map. The problem is, at the end of the day, her style is hard countered by two things, ghosts and tanks. And that is exactly what he's building. Yep. If he gets enough tank ghost, I don't know if she can maybe attack the natural where he's out of position. That's her best bet because she can't fight him front on. 
Nice abductions over here, getting a few free units, although the Terran units are going to try and chase this. I really love the combination of Zerg casters here. That being said, though, Spirit is building Ghosts at the perfect moment. Ultralisks are just hitting the battlefield right now in big numbers, and you really do need either Liberators or Ghosts, or preferably both. Either way, Spirit is going to have an answer against those Ultras, because if you would be stuck on just Marine Tank at this point in the game, I think Scarlet could just A-move. She still has an Overlord in his back door as well. So a Nidus Worm up there would be a fantastic option for opening a new front. If she can attack his natural from the left, then attack down here in the bottom right at the gold base, do some more abducts, and then pop a Nidus in the back. Some, you know, during all of that, I'd love to see. I really feel like that's where some power lies for Scarlet. She's forgotten about these Hydras. They are just kind of chasing on their own. Uh -huh. Hydras here also blocking the pathing right here for those Ultralisks. There are quite oh. a units set up though. Snipes going down. Fungals attempted from the low ground, but good positioning here by Spirit. Yeah, she's only really engaging buildings right now. She's in big trouble. Scarlet needs to get out of here. She needs to get out of here fast. It's a bit of an overcommitment. She is catching a few Medivacs and Marines, but she's mostly killed depots and turrets with this push. It opens up a bit of the wall off for an, a follow-up attack. But right there, not necessarily the most amazing oh, trading. That being said, a creep she, spread though, your first second pick. Like it's insane. She's so good. like 75% of the map. Every time he kills one, her queens are back there. Like she's just so quick on that, isn't she? Um, oh, I, I feel like though, she can't let him go too long. This gold base has to be the last expansion that he gets for free. And if she can keep trading, her bank's so much bigger. She's got to keep him small. She cannot let him get too big here greater spire on the back of this too now spirit is going into his late game army as we do have once again another engagement big fungal growth this time around no ultra to really follow this up we do see that finish off at least on the siege tank couple of the medevacs in trouble but for spirit he's trying to hold on right he's going into ghost liberator already though scarlet is preparing here a whole load of corruptors is she going to instantly turn them into brute lords or is she yeah. going to save them for a bit no, she's going to go straight for it. This is 100%. She she knows she's still got momentum, but not for much longer. She feels she's got to keep doing something. Oh, she's going for a big Ultra Link Bane trade. The Bane Link's trying to get towards those ghosts on the right side. Snipes are landing. The Ultras are getting popped. That is a brilliant hold from Spirit. Uh, he was dead even on her 10k resources lost for each side before. But he is defending calm and with poise. You can see there is very interesting way he uses his keyboard and mouse Spirit. But he's gone from equal resources. Yeah to a, a 5,000 resource advantage. That's massive. Don't get me wrong, she's got more bank, but that's because Spirit's putting his money into Mass Command Center. He's going to get the Iron Bank, you know, eight plus orbital command centers for unlimited mules. He's got so much infrastructure. The longer this goes, the better it is for Spirit. Absolutely. Spirit is going to be aiming to try and essentially half mine the map, right? If he can mine his side of the map entirely, that's amazing. That's exactly why he's also trying to get rid of this base, because that will be one of the bases that, well, we consider to be the Terrans. So getting that one sniped nice and early before Scarlet can really mine it is very nice. That being said, 10 Brute Lords are just about to show up. This harassment, though, is brilliantly done by Spirit. This is as soon problem. as you go into Brute Lords, your army's so immobile. Yeah, this is a huge problem. Losing a hatchery on her gold, losing his purple gas and her purple gas base. Three bases in a matter of a minute. This brute lord attack needs to do big damage. The infestors, one of the infestors goes down. Those infestors are the only thing that are going to defend these brute lords from the ghost snipes. Already one brute lord falls to the snipes. Luckily for her, there's not a lot of ghost energy, but a second brute lord goes down. Oh. Bungle whiffs. It lands on a medevac, and that is it. Her brute lords are just not supported enough. It's hard for her to push in. He's even liberator harassing spirit, staying calm and focused under pressure. I am very impressed by Spirit in this game. There have been about a dozen moments where things could have gone horribly wrong. I can imagine that all of these tech transitions from Scarlet is not something that Spirit has practiced against a ton, but he's still handling this incredibly well. Now the Brute Lord surprise, of course, has been spoiled. And well, we have Thors coming up. We've got Vikings coming up. We already have Ghosts, of course, on the battlefield. They're gonna get their personal cloaking upgrade done. We have the Advanced Ballistics upgrade too. That's the Liberator ranged. Everything's looking really nice right here for Spirit, but it's not over yet. First person view for spirit right now that's why you are seeing those low graphics this is his exact monitor uh, view on his screen right now you can see landing a base on the right he's trying to fend off those brood lords and push back this creep which of course gives scarlet a lovely launch pad for her to poke and prod at his bases he's bringing more units up from his natural scanning to see what's going on we're back to the overall view now and oh he snipes another brood lord brilliant play I think Spirit is playing around those fungals really well though he's been yep. zoning against those those infestors lovely now there is a nice counter attack here. For oh, 
Ooh. going up to the high ground. Big fungal growth, but no follow up on the ghost. Two broodlords just got sniped. She's down to four. Her broodlord count has lost its count. She does kill a third command center, which is fantastic. But he's got the bottom right, and there's a planetary up there, I believe. And not to mention the top left. So yeah, he's dropping mass mules. Not even a planetary yet. A few zergs could deny that. She's pushing into the natural. Her Ling's yeah. breaching the wall. This could be a good moment for Scarlet. He's spread very thin right now. But a lot of bio ghosts coming north. If she can land the fungals on it, jump on top with Banelings, she'll be able to clear it. But he's bringing the tanks. He's only got two tanks. Actually, Lingbane Hydra can do this right now. She needs more of a Lingbane Hydra army. Oh. There we go. One fungal here to end it all, but not quite getting it. It's very difficult for Spirit to defend if the Zerk is already on that high ground, right? You preferably yeah. shut it down before Zerk ever gets there in the first place. Oh, those bees doing big damage. Parasitic Bomb damaging all the Vikings and slaying one of them. <laughs> 15 more Hydras in production yeah. for Scarlet. She is obsessed, I'm telling you. She loves this unit. They are very generically well-rounded, the Hydra. So mm. they are always nice to have as a supporting unit. They can shoot up, they can shoot down, they can shoot all around. Uh, speaking of all around, well, those SCVs are going to get boom boomed and Spirit's work account is dangerously low. Absolutely. That does also at the same time mean that his army supply count is massive. He's rebuilding a few of those SCVs here, but I'm wondering what this army of Spirit is capable oh. of doing right now. Big fungal, though. That's going to keep those brute lords alive for at least a little while longer. Even just the, the, the five brute lords, it doesn't seem like a lot, but it's annoying. Oh, yeah. he's got ghosts on him. Shuts it. down those siege tanks so nicely here, right? So more infestors coming up. Scarlet actually manages to hold on here. And still, now she does have that base all the way in the top left hand corner of the map that we consider to be the Terrans. Oh, nice. Fungal catches a few ghosts. The Banelings have to be wary of the tank fire and she disengages just right. I'd like to see big Ling run buys for Scarlet. Yep. That's what she's lacking right now. His natural is wide open. He's so focused on trying to secure this bottom right base. And she's correct to think, hey, if I deny that base, I, I can probably win this game because she's got the top left mining. She's got the purple gas base. She's on top of his production with just a small Ling run buy. She can ambush him on the way back. Oh no, nice. he's got off guard here entirely. Couple of the siege tanks do go down for free. Banelings connect wow. with the leftover SCVs. Uh, he's actually been rebuilding quite a few of them here, but one That's of the massive. thinking about doing some caustic spraying here too, but you're absolutely right. This section of the map is wide open, and now the golden base is going to end up going down wow. as well. And when it, rain, it, when it rains, it pours here. Spirit is just in all sorts of trouble. He destroyed her first couple of big attacks to break yep. him. I thought Spirit was like way more confident in this game, but Scarlet now is using her positioning so well. She moves in, clears a few big units, says, okay, I can't take this fight, let's get out of here. But if he chases her, she will fungle him and ruin his day. The bottom right side base is very vulnerable once again. The unit's lost time, you can see, is back to dead even, which is a massive accomplishment for a Zerg in this matchup. Normally at a 25 to 50% deficit would be standard. Yeah, income advantage here going heavily in favor of the Zerk over the last 10 minutes or so. This this area of the map has not been well protected for a long while. Ever since that sensor tower first fell, it's been a bit of a disaster in this section of the map. And every time Scarlet goes to the bottom right, she follows it up with a push right over here in the natural expansion. Fungals still threatening from the back. Some good snipes going down overall. But is there enough Terran army left over? Pretty MPs on those infestors. Only one fungal lands and not on that many units. But Scarlet has the numbers and she will not be perturbed. A few good EMPs are not going to stop her committing when she knows she's got the numbers advantage. The wow. Hydra's clean house. A few ghosts trying to hold on, but she's still got enough Hydra's. Nope, she doesn't. Those ones go down. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot more coming, though, Pig. You're definitely not wrong. 31 of them on the production tab. We have plus two air weapons also researching for the Zerg, but I don't think she's going to need it. At this point, Spirit is flat broke. He's Got a bit of income, but that's about it. GG is cold, and it's indeed Scarlet who obtains the victory here in the first game of the tournament. You know what? There's been a bit of discussion, right, in the Zerg community. Do you go Ling Bane? Do you go Roach Ravager? Should you maybe just go straight Hydra Pig? Just skip, man. Queens defend everything anyway, right? I've, I've seen the, uh, the, the Protoss on the Terran forums. You know, they've said, Queens just stop anything I do. Scarlet read that. I, I have heard she goes on the Battle.net forums to get her strategy. <laughs> That's like, where everybody goes. What are Gold League Terran players complaining about today? And she uh, she writes that down and she perfects it. I, I think this is a great way to counter a guy like Spirit, though. He plays a very yeah. European style, macro-centric, wants to get to the mid and late game. And I think she's saying, look, if you're going to just kind of play passive with a three command center build, I don't need to invest in a Banely Nest or anything like that. Let's just rush upwards. And you could see he, he, his... Not able to pick at her with the multi-prong, 
he had to like dive into yes. mineral lines and it's like often they are dying before they get out like there's no way to really micro in and out with bio mine like you'll see clem do against ling bane with like bio uh, marine widow mine no, you're absolutely right. I think one thing Scarlet did really well there is push on the right side of the map and then follow it up with an attack towards the Terran's natural, right? Because yeah. initially Spirit did a fantastic job holding on, but then at some point, I guess the sensor tower disappeared, a few siege tanks ended up falling, and he just lost control of that part of the map. And ultimately, that made the game pretty much impossible for him to play, because the first 20 minutes or so of that game, I don't really know exactly how long that game took. I think in my mind it was like 25 minutes, but anyways, the first 80% or so of the game looked really good there for the Terran player, and then suddenly Zerg started getting damage done. Yeah. And ultimately, when she grabbed control of the end game, I mean, she just never let go. Hats off to her Broodlord usage. Yeah. She was doing a lot of drops in her mineral lines, she was losing bases, but she was cleaning them up. And she kind that of went really scary though. Oh yeah, losing three actually. Those are a few times where she lost multiple mining bases within the space of a few seconds. But I think the the maneuverability is better for the broodlord, right? They do less damage. The broodlings don't attack as fast. They don't move as fast. Uh, the broodlords themselves move faster though, and she did move them around a lot. It was like poke at the gold base, pull back, move up north, move back south. And so she that combined with her creep spread, I think there was a, a position where with all the information we had. There's not that complicated for Spirit to look at that game and figure out what he can do to win. Mm -hmm. But when you've got creep covering 90% of the map, knocking on your doorstep, you only have a limited number of scans. You can't see exactly where she's set up, you know? It only takes a few small openings in those defenses and she starts to run away with it. I think we're going to see a very different game too. I would not be surprised at all. That match is going to be taking place on the map Solaris. And spotting right here in the bottom left hand corner, representing the Shopify Rebellion, it's Scarlet. And in the top right, representing Na'Vi, it is Spirit. Some really strong starts in that game for Spirit. Yeah. He just so needed to clean things up a little bit more as it uh, progressed. And that's always hard to do because you think, oh, you got ghosts. But if you haven't had them for that long, it's not like they have unlimited energy just yet. And You need to control yeah. the map, right? Like if you are playing catch up, to the Zerg's attacks, then suddenly the game becomes very difficult. What we see very frequently from a lot of the top tier Terrans is that every single angle that you try to fight from just seems impossible as the Zerg, as we once again, by the way, have him going for a command center first. Apparently not too concerned about early game pressure, but it's interesting to me that, um, yeah, Spirit, he just lost grip of the map. Like he was doing a good job defending one area, but then the natural was just wide open. So I think in his mind, he probably needed to make a few small adjustments and then he would have been fine. Yeah, it's often just replacing a tank hero there makes yeah. a big difference. Sensor and tower would have been massive in that area. Yeah, she got one earlier down with the Hydras and I don't think he got a chance to rebuild it. So great activity level from Scarlet. She, she took one or two bad fights towards his natural, but it did break up a lot of the infrastructure and allowed her to start taking advantage. And it, it turns out that just when he went to that bottom right side of the map, he stretched himself a little too thin. Rather than going for the bottom right expansion, perhaps he should have yeah. just gone for the one next to the natural, kept his army a little bit more in the center of the map. You're absolutely right, yeah. Uh, who knows, maybe... It's a should, tough yeah. map. It's, it's awkward because if you don't have the watchtower we talked about, she had it. You know, she's just got more vision. She's got creep everywhere. If he's got the watchtower off her, he has a much easier time defending. Absolutely. Well, either way, game number two. Bit of a different map overall. Do you think Scarlet is going to make any significant adjustments here? Do you think she's looking at this and she's like, oh, I'm going to play Mass Hydra once again? The Ultras was a waste of money. Just go straight the to Ultras, Broodlords. Yeah, the Do Ultras the exact same money. strategy, but just go Broods. <laughs> like, Ultras is a good choice if it's a more activity yeah. late in game where Spirit's like attacking her and you're back it's, and forth. It's one of those units yeah. where like, if Terran does not have a late game counter to the Ultras yet, you just straight up win, right? They're, they're so good, yeah. Yeah, they're so good against an unprepared Terran, but... Marines, low marauder counts only a few siege tanks only one or two liberators hey ultras are, are absolutely amazing but it, ultras hydras infestors great for ambushing a terran on the map not as good for breaking an entrenched position absolutely well only time will tell here so far not really any adjustments here for either player scarlet keeping with one of the drones in gas spirit i'm expecting a third command center nice and early once again not really scouting all too much here with that reaper there we go third cc goes down we'll probably see some hellions lately it's become more popular for terrans to do this opener with for example a liberator rather than a benchy every time the main downside of that particular build is that you leave yourself very vulnerable to roach bushes 
That's not something that we really all too frequently see from Scarlet, but it's certainly something that's possible, right? Especially when you're 1-0 ahead in a series. Great micro there for Spirit. Doesn't even pull the mule that time and does deflect the four Zerglings for no losses. Third command center on the high ground. Uh, I do I like what you said about the Liberator as well. It's a bit more of a fluid harassment unit. Most importantly, it's a much cheaper investment. 125 gas as opposed to two Banshees and Cloak, which uh, adds up. That's 300 plus gas. So definitely a lot more time on the starport as well. Whereas otherwise, if you build a Liberator, the starport can start building reactors for barracks. Uh, but this is, of course, the safety play for Spirit. Exact same opening as last game so far. Yep, for both players. The only difference, I guess, so far is that the Zerklings didn't get nearly as much done. It's the little things that do add up over the course of a game like StarCraft 2, though. So, yeah, if uh, Spirit can just cross his T's, dot his I's, and play ever so slightly cleaner, I think in his mind, that is all it really would take to win a series. It really speaks to the mindset of both players, uh, as you hinted at there, where they both think, oh, I can just do the same thing again. I don't need to pull out my special tactics. You come no. to a tournament like this, you've got five other matches in this group stage, you know, six people in a group. Five matches is a lot. You don't want to use up all your best builds straight away. You don't want to use your sneaky builds on the player who you think you can play completely standard against and, and, and beat them. So definitely they're saying, oh, you know what? I'm better than you in the macro game. I can play straight up and standard. Whereas if you see uh, either of these players play someone maybe they're a big underdog against, you will see much more tricky all-ins and timings coming out of them. One thing I would like to see Spirit focus on a little bit more is contain that creep. So obviously with this opener from Terran, you just simply don't have a lot of units, right? And fighting the Queens is very tough. But these Hellions sitting all the way back here means that, the, yeah, sure, you're not going to take damage from Zerklings, but it also means that the Zerk gets to spread that creep for essentially free. And already Scarlet is starting to control the bottom left-hand corner of Solaris. And if you give her a couple more minutes, she's going to cross the halfway point easy. It's exponential as well. Yes. As you get further, you, you kind of... Oh, one lane is in the top. Now it's two lanes. Now it's three lanes in the top. Good luck clearing that. You know, you're not going to have a Raven. How many scans do you have? It's going to be really tough. And the Hellions are finally moving out onto the map. 1-1 one, one range is on the way again for Scarlet. I expect the... Those upgrades are a bit faster than last time, but the Hydrogen is a little delayed. That yeah. layer did just finish. Yeah, interesting that the timing on the Evos here is slightly different. It is Missile once, uh, once more, though, and at this point, it's only the Queens that benefit from it. So we are fully expecting, there we go, that it is indeed going to be a Hydralis then. Nice bit of harassment here by Spirit, trying to keep this controlled. But yeah, killing drones at this point is, of course, nice, but this is not going to be game-ending amounts of damage. Well, seven workers is really good, though. It is really good. I mean, it's, it's just his worker count impresses me so much. It's just past six minutes. He's got three bases saturated. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Spirit's economy is ridiculous. Uh, he's got a lot of workers building structures right now, and yet he's still got such, you know, such a good worker count. Scarlet wants to be up 15 or 20 workers here. She doesn't want to be sitting on the same worker count, so she's going to have to get a move on with saturating that fourth base of her own. Absolutely. Fifth hatchery coming up already as well. Last game, we saw Spirit do a timing attack as soon as those... Well, three upgrades on the right side of the production tab all finished up right around the same time. That was a relatively small group of Marines and Siege Tanks. I'm expecting that army to once more move across the map, because it's one of those one of those pushes that keeps the Zerg player honest. Otherwise, Zerg would just go to triple digits drones right away if they yeah. can get away with it. But it wasn't really all too successful, right? And you got to be so careful, because yes, Spirit sieged up his tanks in time in game number one of this series, but that was on a razor's edge. If you lose that group of units, you just get overwhelmed by the Hydra Flood. Yeah, Spirit's playing so defensively. Finally, now he is going to move out. Two tanks, Marines, Madavax, 1-1, one, one, Combat Shields, and Stim. The all entire right finished. side of the screen, man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Everything's finishing. That's that's the beauty of a good Terran build. If you guys really want to play Terran, enjoy lining things up. If you get satisfaction out of that, Terran's the race for you. <laughs> Absolutely. But look at that creep spread once again, though. So Scarlet can fight it. What seems to be miles away from her actual mining bases, right? Like he, he's teaching up. He's like attacking right outside of his third. <laughs> yeah, exactly. His, his attack starts at his own base. It's like, <laughs> well, okay. I don't know if that's really an attack. That's just a forward defense. All right. Now this is a bit of a scary push. There's a lot of hellbats in the mix too, but obviously Hydras are not bad against that. Queens in the front as well to, well, transfuse a little oh. bit. Big circling run by in the natural expansion in the meantime. That's oh. really going to slow down everything. Well, I love being at Katowice. So the production's on point. Our observers over there already catching a run by 
She doesn't care about losing that base. That's that's a fifth base. She's still got four fully saturated. And it's more about getting set up for the next fight that she's got to be a bit worried about. She's almost supply blocked right now. She had a great ling run by killed a lot of Marines, gets an SCV or two here as well. But the attack is marching forward. Spirit though, his army here hasn't reinforced for a while. If she can flank this, she could take it out. But she's all in one side. Moving down a ramp is not a great idea. Love this little Hellbat push as well. Well, she is going to commit to it, especially into the green zone. That's very dangerous. That's a speed up zone right there. Fortos Terran Marines. Siege tanks having a grand old time shelling away at all of these Zerg units. And that little Hellbat squad really distracted her. Luckily, that queen has lured them away. That queen has lured those Hellbats away from killing an entire mineral line. But Scarlet here, yeah, she, she needs to like surround this army or something, but she doesn't seem to quite have the numbers. Spirit has committed very hard of five barracks marine tank production, and the Hydra is unable to get a good angle. Oh. Such a bad angle for the Hydra and no detection. The Banshee's putting down crazy damage from the skies. Scarlet, Scarlet's Hydra dip build looked great in game one, but in game two, He's prepared for it. He knows it's coming. Yeah. And despite doing a very greedy build of his own, once he got that five barracks in the factory up, he just did not stop building army. Yeah, playing the map really nicely as well, right? Aiming for that exact angle. Sure, she could give up that base in the center of the map, but I wonder if maybe setting up a big surround there and trying to slow down the Terran as much as possible would have been the better choice. That Zorkling run by earlier was nicely done by Scarlet, but losing two benches, or sorry, two bases worth is of course certainly not worth it. I think she wanted to buy time until 2-2 is finished up, and that is, well, done at this point. So if there ever was an opportunity to fight, it is indeed right now. Terran just about to finish up 2-2 of their own, though. I do like the upgrade advantage for the couple seconds it lasted, but those tank volleys are brilliant. The Marines and Medivacs doing fantastic damage. And you can't be down in supply this badly down in workers. There is a very nice advantage for Spirit. And of course, Scarlet seconds away from tapping out. She realizes she just doesn't have the material to cover both sides of the map at once. He gets the hatchery and runs away before she can do anything. <laughs> and that's the downside of Hydras, right? I mean, Hydras have many downsides, but this is one <laughs> of them. We don't usually see the mast as just a singular unit. It can work out quite nicely for you, but you have to be on point. And yeah, as soon as the floodgates open, Spirit has been all over it. Now, we do have a few infestors joining the Hydras and the Zerklings, and it does look like there's just nothing to back up anymore. Hello, Spirit. Are we just going to give a couple units away? Yeah, that was. A, it was obviously focused on the south, where she threw away a bunch of Hydra Ling chasing into him. But because he was so focused on taking the good fight on the south, he took a bad fight on the top left. Gives her a little bit of hope in this matchup, but... Mm. I say a little bit of hope, yeah. I'm not exaggerating. It is a very small amount of hope. The only thing not going here for Spirit at the moment are the 3-3 upgrades, right? Like that would really seal the deal. Other than that, oh, well, there we go. <laughs> He's been ahead in every department now for a little while. Obviously now finishing the 3-3 would be amazing because at that point you can just go in for what I would consider to be the killing move. Yeah. Spirit may just sit back here for a bit longer, right? And if Scarlet is given enough time, look at her. She's already back up to 81 drones here. She's going to try and crawl back up. But there's so much money here that the Zerg needs to spend in the tech in order to fight a fully upgraded Terran army. So Bailing Nest coming up, Hive coming up. We're going Burrow? I guess we're going to try and get lucky. Well, Burrow Infestors is the best comeback play you've got. Mm. However, I don't think she has the money for Baneling tech. I think she needs to just build more Hydras and... Uh, well, I mean, it's tough, really, because yeah. Hydra, Hydra Ling, even with good fungals, is not the greatest army, but it's it's all she can really afford right now. And it's really, in this scenario, you're way behind. Put all your eggs in one basket. Look for one big fungal ambush, and then try to get a late-game army out behind that. But unfortunately, losing an Infestor there. She catches a few Marines in the north. Spirit is taking his foot off the, the, the pedal a little bit. Like, yep. He's maxed out. He could probably go kill her right here, and he's going to start to. In the south side, his army's moving forward. There we go. Not going into the plus three infantry armor. If we have to be very critical, I guess that's one thing that's not going perfectly well right here for Spirit, but everything else has been fantastic. I mean, we have queens again, or sorry, we have ghosts against this particular Zerg army. In the previous game at this phase in the match, we would have ultras already on the battlefield, right? I mean, yeah, I think they've remaxed by this point in the, the previous game. Obviously the economy a little bit slower for Scarlet after taking that all, all that early damage. She got a full medevac in the north of the map. Mm -hmm. And I think wisely giving up control of this base. Takes off a, a Marauder or two. Double drop into the main. Spirit here realizes he's got money to spare. He's got the numbers. Time to put on the aggression a little bit harder and really force Scarlet to defend. 
Yeah, Hydras are not bad though in these scenarios. Fungal, fungal on these would actually be kind of nice. That's another 10 or so supply, maybe 20 or so supply even going down here in total. I mean, not that long ago, we saw like a 60 supply advantage for the Terran. At the very least, the supply count has evened up. Historically, Spirit was known for having the best uh, defensive macro and the best harassment in the game, or, or some of. Uh, his ability to finish the game with a timing attack a few years ago, we were talking about this, maybe two or three years ago at Katowice, was where he fell short. Uh, I don't think he has that as that much of a problem, though, anymore. Uh, even though he's not finishing her off, it doesn't matter, because look at his production tab, because he's still adding everything else and setting up for the late game very well. Whereas it used to be he'd fail to finish his opponent off, but he'd also throw his army away in the position. He doesn't make those mistakes anymore. He's getting ahead in every regard. How many Vipers do we have? I think we have at least one, right? There's like seven Siege Tanks. <laughs> and Siege Tanks even, yeah. I mean, one Fungal and, and one in Blinding Cloud is not going to cover that. Oh, losing... Oh, no, that's really bad. Okay, oh. yeah, there goes the Snipe. That's the only Viper that our Zork player had. And well, Scarlet is going to commit. She's going to make one final move here. Nice fungal. It's just not enough stuff. Look at the siege tanks. No, he just, it, it's, it's what, what does a Terran say in this scenario, Loco? GG. Oh, wait, uh, no, the Zerg says GG. Thank, <laughs> thank you very much. Ah, there you go. <laughs> uh, I'll stop. Get um, him off the stream. Uh, you got to start off uh, Katowice uh. in special fashion, but that was good. We, we saw Scarlet open up with a bit of a mean build in game one. She pulled it out, the Mass Hydra. He shows, no, 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 I can punish that. You can't pull this one out. There's a reason nobody else does this build. Yeah, I, I think it, so she gave up on that middle base, right, on the fifth. That's the critical moment, right? She decided to give up on that particular phase in the match, and ultimately that made this push right here on the high ground a lot more doable. Yeah, I think, I think if the Terran opens Widow Mines, it's not a bad style at all. But oh, I think no. if they open Siege Tanks and they kind of know and expect it, 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 they set up for that big, big push and they just don't let you get a position. That's what's important. If they stumble into creep and you kind of get on top of them with the Hydras from two sides, you can crush it. And we yeah. saw that in game one. But in game two, he was so well prepared for it. I don't, I don't think the style is a complete meme, right? You, you can bring it out, but it has to have a bit of surprise. They can't be expecting you to do exactly that build order or they can take advantage of its weaknesses. And I think that's what Spirit showed there. Yeah, Spirit showcasing some excellent gameplay, though. Not really making any critical errors in this game whatsoever. Essentially playing mostly the same game, right? Essentially yeah. playing the exact same match that he did in game number one, but just a little bit better, just a little tighter around the edges, and then ultimately he just had a much better fight. So, Scarlet, what exactly do we do at this point? Do we play Ling Bane? Do we do a Roach push? Do mass we... Zergling, Mass Zergling, no splash damage, Mass Zergling. That's what I'm cheering <laughs> for, mate. I, I, I like that she's playing a bit creatively. Yeah. Um, we've seen the Hydras from her before. She might try it again with like a few small adjustments. Um, we might see her play more of a classic Ling Bane. It's, it's, I think that's what we'd probably expect, right? Is classic Ling Bane. But Maybe a Roach all in would be cool, but I guess we've seen Benchies twice in a row. He did just sit at home with the Hellions into the Banshees. Yes. So you could... Very passive. Super passive. You could actually do it, if you think about this. You hide it and you wait for the Banshees to hit your side of the map. It's like a very late Ravagerling all-in where you're hiding in like his fourth base. And that's when you just flood in when you see the Banshees on your side of the map and you just kind of bust in and destroy. Yeah. I think that's... that's if he plays the exact same way, that would almost be a completely free win. But of course, that's us working with perfect information. Who knows what they're going to do? The players have gone for a quick bathroom break, so we are going to be back in just a minute. Hey, hello. Stats, Kim Deo. Hello, Team Liquid Associate Top Top Gamer, Chua Kim Do. Ready? おおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおお
<웃음> 저도 대업이 형이야. <웃음> 어. 아 사실 제 입장에서는 상대할 만한 선수가 없죠. 예, 다들 엄청 잘하고 레더에서 게임 해, 해봤을 때 진짜 많이 지고 왔거든요. 그래서 예, 진짜 좀 지더라도 좀 최선을 다해서 제 플레이하고 지는 게제 목표예요. 저도 저희 조가 쉬운 선수가 진짜 한 명도 없는 것 같아가지고 아유 너무 어렵다. 아, 터질 아. 못하겠다 근데. 형왜 이렇게 잘해요? 아니야 근데 어. 뭐야, 뭐, 뭐야. <웃음> 아니, 나 뭔지 아니, 모르겠어. 아니, 뭐, 하나도 이렇게. 아니, 내가. 했네? 뭔가 똑같은 그림 찾으려고 하는데, 저거 찾게. 아, 잘, 네. 잘, 잘, 게임을. 어, <웃음> 게임을 <웃음> 되게 힘들어. 아, 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 게임을 얻는다고? 아, 오케이, 오케이, 오케이. 받을 준비하고 있어. <웃음> <웃음> Ah, always nice to hear of stats and, of course, of Cure as well. I think one thing we figured out over the years is that pro gamers have a very specialized knowledge. <laughs> I think we saw from the Jenga games in Atlanta that they're, yeah. they're not, their skill set is not wide in, in its uh, variance. I think it was Serral who was like first piece knocking the thing over. I was like, oh my! <laughs> well, thought... to be fair, there were like 20 pieces to that puzzle. Oh. <laughs> Well, here we go. We're gonna load up into the final game of our first best of three series of the tournament. The score has been evened up in game number two by Mr. Spirit. But here we go, game three, our final match here in this best of three. We find ourselves on the map side Delta, and in the bottom right hand corner, it's Scarlet. And in the top left, the king of Polish, a macro representing Navi, it is Spirit. Very start of the tournament. Early in the day, we've already got people starting to spill on in there. Mm -hmm. Lots of people very excited. Uh, saw, you know, people posting threads about getting down here. People being upset about uh, strikes and things and getting delayed to get down to the event and missing the first few matches. But looks like everyone's starting to arrive and having a, a good time uh, over here in Poland as we go into Site Delta. And we're going to see Command Center first again. Yeah. Does he play the exact same build three I games in a so. row? Yeah, I think so. And I, I think this is something that Spirit generally likes to do. He just has a build order that he feels really confident about. And he's been practicing it over and over and over again. And sure, there may be a couple of vulnerabilities, right? But what are the odds of a Zerg player opening pool first? It just doesn't happen that often in the current meta. Now, maybe a year or so ago, right? We cycle through this sort of thing. A year or so ago, yeah. we used to see it quite a bit more frequently, but lately, Zerks have been all about hatchery, into gas, into pool, the build order that we've seen for... Well, well, and it, it kind of needs to be a very early pool to punish a command center first, because exactly. it finishes so fast, you need to do like a 12 pool, like a 16 pool... A 12 actually... pool against a Reaper opener? <laughs> yeah, well, that's it. You gotta do like one base Ling, Ling, ba Ling Bane, or one base yeah. Ling Rav like Roach Ravager, or something like that. Those builds do counter this. Like, Spirit does almost certainly die, I would say, to a one base Ravager. However, you can build Cyclones really early now, so I'm actually not so sure. They're not as good as the old Cyclone. Well, the thing is, he doesn't scout at all. Like, he yeah. has no idea about what's happening, because that Reaper is going to sit at home, too. So, yeah. one base Ravager could, I guess, work out, but it'd be so risky. Absolutely. So, so risky. Now, Scarlet, I remember she was experimenting with this style leading into Atlanta. I remember when they were, um, yeah, the Mass Hydra. And it was this map, I, I think I remember her playing Beyond over and over, just doing Mass Hydra. And it kept working, so it gave her faith in it. <laughs> I, I wonder, I mean, Beyond's one of the best TVZ players out there. Yeah. I, uh, Beyond's TVZ is also very different from Spirits, right? He just will attack more. into the Hydras. Yeah, exactly. He will. <laughs> he will probably boost it to the main base at least yeah. five times in a match, so yeah. I mean, if you know they're going to play tanks, yeah. is there an argument for just going Mutalisks here and just playing Mutaling Bane? I guess it's a possibility. That's also a unit composition we just haven't seen much as of late. I wonder if it would be possible to, rather than transition yeah. into Infestors, is transition into Lurkers? Because that would be yeah. really strong against these timing pushes. Lurkers are so good at defending pushes, right? And you could yeah. go like four Vipers or something to start just abducting all of his tanks. But it's so much slower, right? And then you yeah. can't really punish the expansions as easily because... What, what are the maps where Rainer and Serral keep playing muters? It's it's Golden Aura and... Uh, How is it? Well, Radosek gets vetoed, but before that got vetoed, yes. Right. Um, uh, Equilibrium. Equilibrium and Golden Aura are the two maps. But I feel like this map, if you know they're not playing Widow Mines, you could do it here as well. There's like yep. enough enough space. I, and Scarlet really has not been scouting much, right? Like we only yeah. really see scouts coming in as soon as like the Benchies go across the map. Yeah. 
the Banshee Scout by killing drones. That's it. That's late. Now, do uh, we have a Banshee opener here at all? No, no, no. He's going second and third barracks. So that's interesting. So that is very interesting. He's going to be having a lot more Marines out here. Mm -hmm. But I don't really see this leading into like a committed attack. I mean, he's got the third command no. center still on the way. I, I'm curious to see if it's just, no, no, no. When I do attack, I'm just going to have a lot more Marines, but I'm still going to have tanks building behind it. We'll have to kind of observe how it progresses. He could start multi-dropping very early. He's going to have an abundance of Marines. Hmm. An abundance of Marines. That's beautiful. It's <laughs> like the title of Tom's <laughs> biography at some point. Man. Yeah, that's it, man. It's like, you know, you have a good seasonal crop, a lot of Marines <laughs> popping up out of the ground. They fertilize, fertilized well this season, man. There was a lot of rainfall, you know, lots of vitamins in the soil. It's great. There's the double Evos once again here for Scarlet. Very early. This is yeah, a we don't have a lair yet, right? Yeah, we have. This is Link Pain for sure. I mean, it, it could be Roaches, but there's no reason to go upgrades this fast if you're playing no. Roaches. So you got lair first every time. Yeah, I, I like it. Just old school Ling Bane up against Bio. Yeah, uh, this I'd... kind of feels like an old school match, right? Like these yeah. players are so far down the strategic masterminds that at some point you just end up playing good old Ling Bane against Marine again. <laughs> yeah, mass Marine so far as well, yeah. right? Three racks Marine, so it's like, okay, let's do this. She's gonna have a good upgrade lead. His evades are just starting, but he's going to have like a, a nice little aggressive window. I wonder if Scarlet's going to be very backstab focused. I think this Overlord is really helping her out right now because she sees those engineering bays aren't crazy fast. And I have a feeling she's going to try and run into his natural with a bigling Bane bust while he's pressuring her sometime around the eight and a half to nine minute mark. It's one of those things where I can't even explain why I feel this. I just have this like weird inkling that because she's maybe not as confident with straight up Ling Bane as she is with like the Mass Hydra style, she's going to be kind of looking to catch him off guard a little bit more. That would make a lot of sense. I guess we'll see in just a moment if you are indeed correct. Here we go. First meta Vex going across the map. Whatever units we had left over from the early game are going to be joining in as well. Now you brought up the upgrades already. Only just now is one one when 1-1 one, one Rotter starts up right here for the Terran. So this is a little bit of pressure. Zerklings are certainly needed, because otherwise, obviously, the Terran will just overwhelm you. Yeah. But Zerklings are really all you need, right? Queens and Lynx are going to be able to clean this up just, just fine. Well, I was, for a moment, I was like, well, she only has nine Zerklings, but she was building 35, so that's yeah. okay. <laughs> <laughs> you need probably about 40, maybe 50 or so here. So She yeah. should be okay. Getting the base cancel, though, would be massive. There is a little oh. run by yeah, run by goes in the third. Just a few lings. Nicely done. They are derping around a little bit. They finally start attacking the SCVs as the Queens engage. She does get a bit of damage on the Metavax. The Marines and the Hellions back off. And four SCVs, not bad. That was actually very well done by Scarlet. But problem, she didn't respread creep in the middle. Hmm, that is actually a pretty significant oversight. 1-1 one, one is going to finish, though. And this is that attack that you were talking about, right? Or at the very least, one of the many options here that Scarlet could be going for. Yeah, no Bane Speed just yet. So this is more of like a run-by attempt, I think, than anything else. Yeah. I think it's a good timing because he just moved out with his army to rejoin on that south. Hunter's empty. She's getting in there. Very nicely done by Scarlet. She's going to get good damage. Yeah, this is a lot of SCVs going down. In the meantime, though, there's a push on the other side of the map. Spirit has decided to commit to this fight. Oh, oh, oh. They need to siege up quick. Oh, great decisiveness from Spirit. She's actually kind of forced his hand with that counterattack. She's not ready for it oh. at all. He focuses down the Baneling. Scarlet is caught unprepared. She needs to give up ground and give up this base. A disaster for the Canadian Terran. Uh, Canadian Zerg, sorry, as Spirit <laughs> pushes in. This is massive. She engages her. Banes aren't here. Her Lings aren't here. She's going in piecemeal. A few panicky engagements there for Scarlet. She clears one tank, but there's another one behind it. She's going to lose the southern base. Yeah, Spirit is settling for that base at the bottom. He knows that Baneling Speed is going to finish up momentarily, and that's when this defense becomes a lot more manageable for our Zerk player. There's a lot of Banelings finishing up. I would not oh. mind to retreat right now, as we do have Scarlet overwhelming this. She does clean this up in the end, but that was very costly. Then again, though, Spirit lost a lot of workers at home. He did, but look, now he's, he's got a new army here. He's got a big army, she's got a big army, but he's the one setting up and taking the fights. And that is scary, because if he wins another fight here, he can rebuild behind it economically. She is pinned defensively as a Zerg. You need space. 
How far along is that new base that she's making? Ah, it's about halfway done. Counter attack Boy, with everything. Right. You might be right, Loco. It's hard for her to make that call in the heat of the moment, though. Ling's jumping on top. The Bailing's going after the Marines. Good spready for Spirit. Oh, no, not a good spready for Spirit. He takes a massive Bailing connection. That was a great fight for Scarlet. Yeah, the Queen ends up going down here, but he stopped running for just a moment. You got to stay on top of that Marine micro as much as possible. Now the Zerklings are once again going in for the counter attack. Has that bunker been filled up yet? If if it hasn't, nope. Oh. Those SCPs are going to have to run another time. And this, it's taken the wind out of the sails, right? So Spirit is now forced to go all the way back home with his entire army. Scarlet survives, and she didn't even need to give up that base. Dude, that bunker has been a troll in this game. It's like yes. building a police station in a high crime neighborhood and then never actually staffing any offices there. <laughs> it's just been an empty bunker every time a run by gets in. Those SCVs. It's intimidation. Yeah. <laughs> Why is it even here? <laughs> just park a car outside. That's all you need to do. Here comes the bailing run by. Okay, Spirit is paying attention, and he has been on top of the defense every single time, but it's just, yeah, not been as successful on the other side of the map. It looked like it was going to be for just a moment, but suddenly the floodgates have been opened. Scarlet, of course, is going to be happy to overwhelm this if she can, but she really doesn't need to. 83 workers in total, high fires up right now for the Zerg. I mean, this is going incredibly well right now. She's just going to lock down her defense, but instead she's keeping up the offense. That triple drop in her main base could cause problems. She's getting massive damage here. Spirit needs to annihilate her main base. Triple drop, 24 Marines and three medevacs in the main. They have a mission, kill everything. And if they fall short of that, he's like in that. massive trouble. Yeah, sp the spawning pool right there ends up going down. We don't have any defensive banelings at all, and that's going to be the last of the banes as bailing nest number one falls as well. Scarlet will not be able to reproduce the bailing nest until that new spawning pool finishes. So she desperately here starts up an infester. Okay. Oh. That was, I guess, best case scenario for Spirit, right? He really could have not hoped for a lot more than that. The question is, was it enough? He needed more than that, though. That's it. I mean, he, he needed that just annihilate her. And it, look, her, her money's banking. She can't build anything except yeah. sit there for now. Which Hydra then would be nice, pick. It would be great, <laughs> wouldn't it, right now? Anything. An Ultra Cabin, a Hydra Den. Probably not a Roach Warren with these upgrades, but. He's stuck on 44 workers on three base, and it's just been Ling run by after Ling run by into, into Ling Bane attack. She's kept him on the back foot really well, and I think I, I really oh, admire... Oh, oh that's nice. another meta effect going down. It's not a lot of damage from Fungal these days, but still enough to finish off low HP units. So this is going from bad to worse. Spirit going for what I consider to be his final attack. Scarlet is going to meet it off creep. She doesn't even need to be th doing this, but she's very confident. I mean, Ooh. those few Marines right there, though, really holding down that force of units. Yeah, I don't know. That one Marine with a bayonet at the front just stabbing <laughs> the Zerglings and Banelings as they come in. not pass. Hold on. Um, well, ultimately, though, does it really matter? He's, he's got to do a lot of heroic effort. Oh, oh okay. Uh, nice pickup. Scarlet missing the uh, attempt, or not even trying to take the attempt to fungal there. I think she just assumed he would have picked up already and was looking elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Her Ling's coming down south as this well. This is still three-based Terran, though, right? Yeah. Like, this, like... <sighs> Spirit is running out of steam. Like, even though all of these fights over the last couple minutes have been going pretty well, He's, gonna, he's looking for a Gumiho vs. Serral from, uh, from Sweden right. last year, you know. Kill the spawning pool and be in four mineral lines at the same time. The Liberator trying to kind of overload her there. It's all good ideas, but as you've pointed out, you know, even two Liberators... I mean, this oh. is looking a lot better than it was a few minutes ago, though. I think Spirit is just trying to play here. Like, if this was a ladder game, this would probably be one of those games where you already left, right? Because things have been so tough. But you can see that in StarCraft 2, it's not over until a player GG's. When was the last time you played ladder, ladder Loco? Terrans never leave. They always stay in here, micro-ing their last <laughs> You can always fly to Command Center, too. Yeah, this is the most Terran thing I've ever seen. Oh, I've got one Liberator and some Marines and a medevac. I'm going to keep micro-ing and make it really hard to win. Oh, here we go. The Fungals are landing this time around. Burrow is available, too. So that Liberator is not going to be able to shut those units down. And ultimately, no medevacs available. Yeah, they show up a little bit too late. That's two more? No, just one more going down. But GG is cold, and it's Scarlet who wins our first series of the tournament. You can see there was a lot of tension in both players there as a little Rai shake of the head for Scarlet as she finishes that game off. A close series, a fun series, and always awesome to see in 2024 a sort of new meta style kind of showing itself big. Mass Hydralisks versus Terran. That was a lot of fun to watch. Absolutely. Incredibly well played right there by the Canadian Zerg. She's going to go ahead and shake Spirit's hand, too. Of course, is very frustrated here. In all games, there were moments, right, where 
things could have really flipped upside down. Like, this was an incredibly close series. I mean, if this is what the entire tournament is going to be like, we're in for a treat. Very good way to start it off. And we were saying, you know, it could be some long games, could be really quick. Kind of ended up in the middle where, don't get me wrong, the, the players maxed out quickly. But because of that, it was an accelerated, just massive engagements. And it was just big armies crashing into each other. Uh, an awesome way to start the day. And, uh, of course, a very nice start for the Canadian. The creep and... spread here in this game was absurd. Just it feels so game. bad when yeah. it's outside your base, right? When it's like, oh. it's, oh. You insane. try so hard to hold onto your bases, and then you realize the creep is mocking at your third. Now, this game went a whole lot better for Spirit. It was almost a one-to-one -one copy as far as the first eight or so minutes went. But ultimately, Spirit got a much better position. And, well, it became pretty clear that Hydras may not have been the perfect choice right there for Scarlet. Still, she managed to bring it back in game number three. Yeah, just great positioning, I, I feel, for Spirit in this game. He really used all the ledges and choke points just right. The tanks were layered back very nicely. And, uh, of course, he did win that game. But the Ling Bane counterattacks were what it was all about in game three to wrap up the series. It was constantly, even from the first attack, which was like five Zerglings, it forced four SCBs to go down. It forced his whole mineral line to run away. And then the ambushes didn't stop from then on. There was one moment this as well. Gandalf, right over here. Yeah. <laughs> there he is. You shall not pass. <laughs> the, a lot of very small Balrogs ran away in fear there. A fantastic way. Let's go over to the interview on the stage. Thank you so much for calling that match. Now I'm here with the winner of it, Scarlet. An impressive way to start off IAM Katowice 2024. How do you feel kicking ass with a win right to start? Feeling pretty good. I'm already doing better than last year, so that's a nice start. Excellent. Glad to hear it. We saw some... Yes. We saw some interesting strategies for you talking to Roddy in the green room. He says a lot of players will say uh, Hydra's maybe not so great, but you really proved that they are a strong play in game one. Yeah, I've been trying it out recently, making a lot of Hydras. It's better if they open Widow Mines, uh, as you can see from game two, like it can have problems against tank bushes. Well, you had great adaptations for game three. Tell me a little bit about your mentality, uh, joining up in that game, hoping that you do well to start off this tournament better than last year. Do you mean the, the full match or game three? Uh, the Game three. Game three, talking about the game, um, I was thinking if he was going to play CC first again, and like if I saw the SCB coming, I was going to skip my lanes, try and get an advantage in the early game, but he didn't. He played pretty greedy, and I feel like got in a good spot. And I definitely didn't want to play Hydras again because of how the game two went. So I tried to metagame him a bit by going fast to Evo and hoping he didn't do anything too aggressive early, and it worked out. Fantastic. Way to think on your feet. We're looking forward to more games from you as the tournament continues. But for now, we'll throw it back to the studio to take a closer look at those last ones. Thanks, Rachel. Thanks, Scarlett, as well. The fan favorite getting the first win here, although, I mean, against Spirit, our Polish representative, a little rough for the home crowd, but I'm sure Spirit will be able to bounce back here, maybe throughout the rest of the group. Joining me, ZG, as well as Wally, to talk about this one. A bit of a back and forth series to start things off, ZG. That second game, obviously, you get into a position where the tanks get up on you. You kind of have to try and ward it off with the Hydras, but they're not great at doing that, so it's understandable why she kind of loses some ground there. Yeah, I think you, you look at that and you know that they were we're also thinking the same thing you were pretty much but it's already executed yeah, yeah. it's already being done so that's what it is but as far as an opening match that was a really important one for i think the rest of the players looking at scarlet spirit plays a lot of the online cups and hasn't had so many questions as to where his priorities are sure, sure. And so, you know, you kind of knew what to expect from Spirit, but Scarlet really was a question mark, I think, for a lot of us. You know, is she spending a lot of time doing other work? Is she mm -hmm. able to prep a lot for this tournament? Uh, the previous tournaments haven't looked great for her, so is that going to affect her here? So that was actually really important to show a very solid ZVT that did get explosive every now and again. And then also, I guess, that particular style, which... Um, I wonder if, like, even revealing a little bit there, right, for Hero Marine later down the line, because the bomb, the yeah. race for third or second, because I think we believe Soul is going to get first, but like the race for third or second in this group is going to be super tight. So that kind of revealed information is like, I don't know. I feel like it's it's really tight already. Sure. Even thinking about the interviews of this group. Well, especially since, as you say, hard hitting Terrans in this group kind of important to deal with. But we've already had a TVT conclude. And Ward, you were looking at the Hero Marine versus Gumiho match, which uh, I thought Gumiho might have a decent shot in. But where were we at? 
Yeah, it's especially interesting because coming in, Kieran Marine's not being super consistent. He has struggled a bit in TVT. Yeah. And he came in, he 2 0 Gumiho. Mm. Uh, took a lot of harass against a weirder build in game one. Shut it down, got across the map, closed it out. Game two was a lot closer, a lot more back and forth. A distinct lack of Cyclones, actually, so oh, far okay. in the TVT. So, very interesting stuff. Hero Marine does go 2-0, and, oh, and that already shakes up, because I think at the start of the day, I was saying, you know, Solo, Gumiho, for me, are the favorites coming in. Gumiho's been really good lately, but that's a big loss for Gumiho, and now he's got work to catch up on. So, yeah, it's going to be very important seeing how the rest of those games go. And if Scarlet is coming out swinging and taking down Spirit, who we feel like is in shape, yeah. then, yeah, she might be an issue for Gumiho. Uh, and speaking of kind of needing to make a bit of catch-up, feels like Trigger might have to make a bit of catch-up here in this group as well. Yeah, he arguably got the worst first match, though. Again, I think sure. most people looked at this and said, Solar, most likely. We'll see what the forms of their players look like. But that said, like, second and third is going to be uh, a toss-up. And so yeah. Trigger, yeah. I think the most important thing is a test mentality right and that actually is one of the things talked about for trigger coming into this event entirely is that he is the freshest face Agreed. he's yeah. the newest one yeah. here so you know how is he going to tackle that when right off the bat he gets zero two if he says it's solar and that was gonna be tough anyway and he can brush it off i'm sure we can see better results in the future well, it's a tough group for him, and it doesn't really get much easier right after this break, as Trigger is going to be going up against Gumiho on the mainstream. Of course, we have B and C streams covering all of the games as time goes on as well, so make sure to tune into those. For now, though, we'll be back right after this. Intel Extreme Masters Katowice is brought to you by Monster Energy, the United States Air Force, and Intel.
A good start for Group A as we continue things here for Katowice. Scarlett already finds herself with the first win. However, for some players now, you don't want to be going down 0-2 quite this early uh, in this round-robin stage. For both Gumiho and Trigger, that is a potential reality after this game. Joining me, Pig, as well as Loco. The guys that just cast that previous series here for this one. Pig, though, we are getting into it. Gumiho versus Trigger. Quite the, uh, the clash, I think. Because, I mean, I don't think there's a huge amount of expectations around how Trigger's going to be able to fare in this group, but I think a lot of people see Gumiho as one of the favorites who's already won zero down. Yeah, there's a little bit of a question mark around Gumiho going into it because he had such a fantastic year last year. Yeah. You don't, you know, turn around performances from being, oh, I, I win 6% of the time ever versus Maru, and then he beats him at two big land tournaments. <laughs> and you're like, well, that's pretty impressive, you oh, know? Well, yeah. He did the same thing against Solar. He had like an 8% win rate against Solar, beat him multiple times in a row. So yeah. he kind of, I think, turned around his story of always losing to a few nemeses last year. And if he could, you know, ace this group, destroy it, there'd be a lot of excitement. But it's not a good start losing that TVT to Hero Marine. No, definitely not. Bet on himself last year. Uh, I mean, we even saw that, you know, in terms of now joining Cloud9. The second places that uh, you know, Pig is alluding to from last uh, year was very impressive by Gumiho. Um, but I'm sort of expecting him to be the favorite here against Trigger. Yeah, I agree with you. He... We're almost, almost... We're already almost at a moment where he needs to win this series, right? Like, both players, 0-2. Yeah, not really the way you want to start off the tournament. And on top of that, obviously, this is a group where a lot of us look at it and we're like, okay, Solar is going to move on, Gumiho is going to move on, who's going to be third? But losing that first series against Hero Marine already flips this group upside down. So if Trigger ends up winning this particular match, I mean, it's it's going to be really fun. Yeah, Trigger on the other side of this, uh, most recently when they did play against each other, it was 3-1-2 Gumiho. Uh, so Gumiho has, and I mean, he normally takes big Protoss scalps, like Max yeah. Packs and things like that. But recently against Hero, it goes a different way, but Hero's been on fire. So you can't compare that. Well, that's kind of the funny thing, right? Gumiho doesn't let Protoss players play their game. He, he just oh, gets yeah. in there and it's like, oh, like there's a it. proxy here. There's some weird stuff happening. He does his weird like uh, double reactor style where he just has like 50 <laughs> Marines very early stims and destroys his opponents. So I think it's really, can Trigger get some momentum and actually take the the, the momentum away from Gumiho? Uh, the card's are back. Yeah. Uh, what are we looking at for Gumiho? <laughs> I was just looking at the, the strategy number right here. I don't know if we can see it, but apparently the other pro gamers have rated him at a strategy of 93. Wow. I think that's that's about accurate. Like the man has such a a massive range of builds and strategies that he can bring out. And I think overall, this is all very accurate. Yeah, Pig, you're holding the trigger card. What's well, I don't think, you know, it sounds good. Was that 90? 93, yes. 93, okay, so sorry. We actually have something that hard counters that. It's the uh, 69 strategy rating here for trigger. Of so course Pig noticed this. There you go. Right away. Oh, come that on, is... trigger's gonna destroy. He, he's representing <laughs> the great America's region. That's looking nice. fantastic out of Canada, and he is ready to destroy. Trigger is a guy who likes to mass immortals. He's got his own style, his own flavor. He uses Storm in late game, which other Protoss players don't do. He's got all the pieces he needs to take Gumiho down. That's nice. Anyway, well, okay, right, we're going over to the stage. Of not 100%, <laughs> yeah. All right, let's get to our next best of three here on the main stage. Thank you so much. Our next matchup, of course, features Trigger from Basilisk. Let's see if he can stop Gumiho in his tracks, or will it be Gumiho from Cloud9? Maybe he can push the payload all the way home. We will find out very shortly, but first, let's take a closer look at these two players.
It is time to hop into our second best of three of the day. A Protoss versus Terran. Two players that lost their opening match in the group. So Ben, you could say that it's almost, almost very important already for these guys to get a win on the board. I mean, massively so. I mean, Trigger was unfortunate that he had a, a first game going up against Solar that I think is the big favorite in this group. But Gumiho losing out to uh, Hero Marine over there, that was definitely a little bit of a shocker. And he really starts stepping up because this is a group that absolutely should be making it out of, right? Yes, but with Gumio, you also never know. Like, I completely agree with the boys at the desk. He had a great 2023. He made it to the finals over in Yon Chopping. He made it to the finals of GSL Code S. That's insane. But there are also some of these tournaments where he just does not show up. And every now and then, if it goes wrong, it really does feel that the wheels are coming off and nothing goes his way anymore. I think it's a tricky group. And one thing that we didn't mention yet, and I do think it's important to keep in mind, if you're a world-class Terran and you get ready to travel to Poland for this tournament, you look at this group, bunch of Terrans, bunch of Zerg, one Protoss. You think of people that you could potentially run into into the playoffs, they're not probably all that worried about TVP, right? Meanwhile, Trigger had three Terrans to get ready for, so he's been playing PVTs non-stop for over a month. But I can only assume that Gumio has been mostly focusing on TVT and TVZ. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. I just, when I look at both these players, those strategy numbers that they talked about on the desk, I know sometimes they can be a bit of a meme, but I feel that they were actually spot on. Gumiho is the kind of guy that has such an array of strategies. He has a big ass tool belt every time he goes into a match. I mean, it's just like, what is he going to bring? Whereas Trigger, on the other hand, he's a guy that I know from olden days, he loved his Blink Stalkers and it was all about Blink Stalkers. You've told me that he started swishing it up a little bit, which is very, very useful. Because if you go up against a guy like Gumiho that's willing to exploit any of those weaknesses, he will absolutely do that. Yeah, this is one of these buckle up and enjoy the right best of threes because it could be over before it ever even truly begins. Where if Trigger moves out, but Gumio is moving out as well, they meet in the middle, somebody gets a great fight. And a lot of the openings of Gumio, it's not like, oh, he's got to move out, but then there is a next and a next and a next. No, it's often very committed, all of his eggs in one basket, but he's just so damn good. He executes those builds incredibly clean, so he shows up a bit quicker than you expect there in place to quick uh, show up. Your blink is not quite ready yet, or you hit like one or two stalkers short from the magical amount of stalkers where you feel safe about dealing with a Widowmind drop in your main and then Cyclones and Marines in your natural or something along those lines. It's going to be very fun to see what these two will bring to the table. And it's going to be very important to have a clean early game for our Canadian. We watched that first series that Trigger played. It was obviously on the C stream, covered by Harstam and Lambo. Was it a bad series by Trigger? Yes, he lost 0-2 against Solar. First game, a bit shaky, just took too much damage, and he cannot do that here in the second series. So the second game, however, it looked a whole lot better. Absolutely did, and we're going to get right on into it. Spawning over on the top right-hand side as our Red Terran here on Heck 8. It is Cloud9's Gumi Ho. You're going with the Heck 8, Ben? I thought you made fun of me for calling it Hecate. Oh, Hecate, Hecate, you know, I, I get these things wrong all the time, Kev. <laughs> In the bottom left side, we are looking at the main base of our Canadian Protoss player representing Basilisk. This is Trigger. Obviously, very tough start of the group for him. First, you get Solar. Second series, you get Gumio. It's like, who well, made it to the most recent GSL Code S finals again? Oh, yeah, those two guys. So it is a tough start, but Trigger knew. The moment he qualified, as fun fact, by the way, I don't know if you think it's fun, but both of these players qualified through the American Intel Extreme Masters qualifier. Gumio did not make it through the Korean one. And he decided not to play the European one because that latency is just very hard to deal with. So he decided to just get it done in the final opportunity. That was the absolute last chance that anybody had even making it to this tournament. Gumio did make it through the upper bracket though. I believe he beat Chem and then Scarlet. Trigger beat Creator and then lost against Bonnie, but also defeated Chem in a very close series, by the way, 3-2. to two. Now, interesting. And it's good that you point out that both these guys were in the finals of the recent GSL kind of thing, you know? It was, uh, Actually, a very surprise run by Gumiho to do so well. And it was just as he was picked up by Cloud9, it was like the stars aligned. Whenever you play against a guy like Gumiho, and right now Trigger with a very early scout here, nice and early, gets see double gas and a proxy barracks. Gumiho is the kind of guy, I remember when I was learning StarCraft 2, I'd watch Mario and I'm like, I can't do that. But I'd watch Gumiho and be like, you know what? There's one thing that I love that he does. Every unit that he makes, every production facility, he always uses one of those units to deal damage. And he's just so good about being such a thorn in your side. This probe actually is getting a lot of hits off on these SCVs, and we don't expect the probe to kill an SCV, but it is actually messing up the build order now a little bit. Look at that, that supply depot is not done yet. 
Uh, the Whoa. gets it. Trigger gets the kill on the SUV. That may seem minor, but that is such a feel-good moment for pro gamers because you also get the perfect scout. You know about the factory. I think obviously at this point you know about the double gas as well, even if the probe didn't get in that far. But you also force that Reaper to come home, and that means that the Reaper is not in your main base. It's not going to get that first lucky probe kill right before that Stalker comes out. And Trigger actually going Stalker before Adept. I really like it in this scenario just because Stalkers, I think they provide a bit more safety against these Reapers. Uh, I think that's an amazing start for Trigger. It's just one SCV, but that one SCV represents so much value. It's something you don't expect, right? You commit to the scout, you actually get to get out somewhat, but also it's like, hey, might as well get the SCV here, mess some things up. And yeah, already a decent start. Hiding his tech as well. We'll go for the Twilight Council. Now that's something that I did anticipate from Trigger. Mm -hmm. Already something a little bit unusual here with this early Widowmine, but most likely just playing safe here is Gumiho already might be a tiny bit thrown off, but he just wants to keep checking his T's, dotting his eyes, making sure he knows exactly what he's up against. Trigger went for a very early shield battery in the natural, but I really don't hate it. If you get a good scout off, and if you know that you went for the cybernetic score into the Nexus, so you're gonna get a little economic advantage, and your opponent is doing something that's a bit more tech heavy first, and then they expand, you're already ahead. It really does not hurt you that much to drop that safety battery. We now can see that in a perfect world, he didn't really need that battery that early. But I always think of our boy Zest, a man who found a lot of success over here in Poland. If he knew he was ahead, he would play it safe. And he's like, I'm not going to give you a window to turn around that economic advantage that I've created for myself. No, slow and steady. You get a battery. You look at the work accounts right now, Ben. Trigger is still enduring an eight worker lead. That's very good. Of course, Gumio is going to try to do something about it with his double winner mind drop. And, you know, there's a lot of stalkers here on the defense already. And I mean, this is a nice scout by Gumo, and he's even going to get out there a little bit of a pro pull to try and get the last killing blow. Nice scout here for this probe. This probe is going to give Trigger those two second heads up that the medevac is coming. Look at the stalkers getting a lot of shots up on the medevac. Unfortunately, he is not going to get the kill immediately. He does get one widow mine and only loses a single probe. Say that Trigger should be more than happy with this defense. I don't think Gumio can save that widow mine. He is not going to save it. Five worker lead, going up to three bases, very quick blink. This is everything that Trigger practices over and over and over again. He's got to be very happy with where he finds himself five minutes into this game. Yeah, and I mean, it's a three gate from him as well. So he's going to have a lot of stalkers out very quickly. Blink's already done. And I mean, you always have to be a little bit worried about what a Terran can throw at you after the Widow Mine drop. Because I mean, we do see that there is a Liberator out now. It's going to be Tank Marine follow-up as well. The Cyclone will eventually shut down this Adept, but... Ah, I mean, so far, not a bad start for Trigger at all. He dealt with that Widow Mind drop very cleanly. Yep. I think it's an amazing start, even. I think Gumio is not happy, even though he has a 10 work elite. Now, maybe that won't liberate. If it shows up in an unfortunate moment for Trigger, right where Trigger is trying to micro stalkers on the other side of the map, or the gateways are on cooldown, then this liberator has the opportunity to get a bunch of kills. Trigger doesn't need to be too aggressive here. He needs to make sure that he doesn't take damage at home. I don't think he's quite aware of this liberator yet. He is going to see it, and now we wonder where are those stalker warpins? Excellent reaction there, though, by Trigger. Pulled the probes away immediately. Warped in a couple of Stalkers. He's still kiting over here. He's already shaving off units with a three base against two base scenario. I think the young Canadian is playing a fantastic PvP so far. He is playing good and he reacted very nicely. Here though, losing a couple of Stalkers to one juicy tank shot. Got a few bruised and battered earlier on in those skirmishes. But if there's one thing that I would have liked from Trigger, just having a pylon below here at the bottom third base, just to see drops coming on later on. That could have helped a little bit, but he handled it really well. And that's a very fast charge follow up. And that's one thing that you absolutely want to get online against tank push, which is kind of inevitable at this point. Yep, the Stalker is going to see where the Terran army is at. It's a bit unfortunate for Trigger that those Stalkers moved in the wrong way. It started off all very good, but until he lost a couple Stalkers at home, that was a bit scary. Now Gumio is here, and Gumio might try to force the fight right before this battery, but I think Trigger needs to know that as long as he stays near this battery, he's okay. That Liberator has moved forward, though. That's a great play by Gumi. And then you can see right now that Trigger is not totally oh. certain how he wants to deal with this. He's waiting for Zello Charge to come online. And he should be able to wipe in a couple of Zealots, but he's also worried about the Liberator dealing too much damage. I mean, probes are dying here, Kev. Stalkers are dying as well. I think Gumahosh is running away with it. There is a very aggressive warp in there right in the face. Does lose one Stalker on the plow, but I don't think he's going to be able to recover from this, Kev. This tank push just too good, too strong. 
And it's that liberal oh that's been moving. 11, 11 kills! Bouncing between the natural and the main. Gumio with perfect liberator control and trigger. I think losing track of that army in the center of the map really disrupted his flow, disrupted his momentum. Maybe he stuck around on that high ground a bit too long. You mentioned that one tank shot. And after that, you can see, okay, the stock count is not that high anymore. He had to split up his units. He Ooh. lost track of it. And Gumio, a single liberator, is all that Gumio needs to make sure that his push is devastating because he's so annoyed with it. He's forcing Trigger to pay attention to the main, the natural, the main, the natural. And Trigger tried to stay patient and calm, but he just couldn't quite get on top of those tanks or actually warp in enough Zelda to deal with that bio initially. Now maybe he finally has enough units, but look at these tanks, man. There's four tanks, and all four tanks survive. That's gonna be it, Benny. It absolutely is. I mean, that Amorda got one shot off there, right? Like, it popped out the Robo, already went down, lost all its shield, lost its uh, reactive uh, shield there. And here, this, the Zealots are doing a decent job, but ah, it's just too much Gilmeho. Even if, even if he holds on here, look at the worker count behind this cab. It's not meant to be like that. No, it's three bases against two. The Zealots will get on top of the tanks finally, but it's just a day late and a dollar short. Don't know about that Liberator, by the way. Maybe Gumio sent it into early retirement. Ah, oh, it went down. It deserved a better ending than that, because that Liberator was the absolute MVP. If Trigger is not distracted by dealing with that Liberator, what he does is he stands near that battery, he blinks Stalkers back one by one patiently, he Corona Boost charge one time, and that wasn't too many bio units, right? Like, what were we looking at? Nine Marines, two Marauders, it wasn't that much. So five Zealots with charge would have changed everything there. But because of that Liberator, Trigger could just not buy that time for himself, and was forced to take a bad fight or two. And this is such a sad little squad moving out right to try and do a poke. I mean, getting some information, that's good. But Gumaho, he's even getting a turret at the front here. He's like, how can you come back out of this terrible situation? You have to do something crazy, something risky. Oh, poor Ursodon over there getting absolutely butchered. But yeah, I mean, Trigger, it, this is a mountain to climb at this point. He's got one Hail Mary left in him and every choice feels like a bad one. Yeah, no, he knows that he took too much damage. Maybe you just take these final moments to see if you can find your rhythm and your groove, right? I mean, you kite a little bit with the stalkers, you pick up a few marines, maybe you snipe a medevac, and Trigger obviously knows that the writing is on the wall for this one, because this was not a low SCV two base all in. If that was the case, Gumio would have had way more units. It was very close. It looked one-sided. This was one of these moments where if Trigger would have been able to pick up that lip and you warp in five cells oh. with charge, you Chrono Boost charge one time, then he could have smashed that push, and then he would have been in a great spot with three bases against two. Unfortunately, Gumio did not let him get there. Gumio is walking away with it. We're going to micro the Marines and the Marauders. There will be a tiny bit of friendly fire, but that does not matter. Gumio gets his first map win on the board. Rough start, but excellent mid game. Yeah, to say that that probe situation happened early on and the Widow Mind Drop was pretty decently deflected as well. Gumio. From that point on, it was just a bit of a masterclass, wasn't it? Like, the Liberator did everything that it had to and more. Like, ideally with that Liberator, maybe four or five pro kills, you hope for, but to get 11 and all that time board as well. And I mean, this fight, the Zealots weren't online on time, were they, to deal with it? No, like, you see it on the right side. Charge is 10 seconds away from finishing up. But this is also one of these moments where if Gumi was not already distracting Trigger, Trigger could have fired another Chrono Boost on that Twilight Council. And you don't need that many Zealots there, because we were looking at 9 or 10 Marines, it really wasn't that much firepower. Trigger tried to stay patient near the battery, but obviously Gumio eventually realized, like, hey, I see what's happening here. You pretend like you want to fight, you don't really want to fight, so I'm going to bring the fight to you. And he moved pretty far away from the tanks, but it was okay, because the medevacs were there to provide the healing for those bio units, and in the end, Trigger was just a few units short. It's one of these fights where you get your hands on four Zealots, and it's a night and day difference. But that's why Gumio is Gumio. He's not going to give you that time. He's not going to make it easy. Trigger will be kicking himself for that moment with the Stalkers on Gumio's side of the map, where at first he was doing perfectly fine, but then he kind of moved back, and then he moved back in range. And that's where the tank shot happened, and he lost two or three Stalkers. One of them was very low in HP. And then he's like, okay, now I need to play it way more safe. But by doing that, he lost his kiting potential, right? He kind of lost track of the army. Then he split up his units. He thought Gumio came from the bottom right, but Gumio actually came down through the dead center. He saw it with one stalker, but one stalker can't do anything. It cannot slow Gumio down. And all the trigger needed was to slow Gumio down one more time. So he had those extra seconds for Zelda Charge. Yeah, and I know Trigger's your boy, right? Like he's one of your Basilisk lads. This is the kind of play that when I think about Trigger's PVT, it's he's going to be aggressive with Stalkers. He's going to make Stalkers. The way that Gumaho did this build, where it's like, all right, 
the one thing that I don't want you to do is be at your base just waiting there because I'm going to keep on attacking you. And I kind of mentioned this earlier, but this was like the perfect game to really show the essence of Gumiho. Anything that he makes out of any one of his production facilities, it's all about dealing damage and hurting you. And that's exactly what you saw out of that game from him. And that move out with the Stalkers, if he got to know that there's a Liberator, would he be out on the map? Absolutely not. But how can you know? Yeah, well, you could have. I think the initial response against the Lib was quite good. It's just that it still distracted him and it made him mess up a little bit in Gumiho's natural. And this man is a world-class Saren player, so you make a slip off, he's going to punish you for it, picking up his very first map win of today. Cloud9's Gumio. And spawning over in the bottom right of Oceanborn, the Blue Proros Basilisk Trigger. 2023 was such a cool year for Gumi because we knew he was good. He was always up there. You think of Korean Terror players, he may not be the first guy you think of, but you always mention him, a proper legend of the game. He's been around forever. But some of those runs in 2023, Ben, especially the one in Sweden as well. I don't want to say it came out of nowhere, but I don't think many people thought Gumi was going to go all the way to the Grand Finals. And let's not forget, he really put up a proper fight against Saro in those Grand Finals as well. That was far from a landslide victory for Saro. So it was amazing to see Gumi peak in yeah, what feels like the later stages of his career, but that's just because he's been around forever. He has been around forever. I mean, he was one of the guys. In fact, he was the guy that played in the Pro League days. He had the booth fall on top of his head, you know, and credit to him, he, he shook it off, still won his game there, which was awesome. But he's a guy that's been to the army, came back. He was a bit meme right? Just playing mech against absolutely everything. And it was like, ah, Gumiho, you know, yeah, you had your time in the sun, but whatever happened to him? Because all of a sudden he's just like, you know what? I am one of the better Terran players on the planet. You might keep forgetting about me because for some reason, I think he's one of the most underrated Terrans of all time. Mm -hmm. The fact that he's done what he does and it, little flashes of brilliance here and there that he always manages to remind you that he's a guy that's absolutely worth watching. But yeah, consistency, that is something that is pretty hard to keep up for these players. I feel like with Gumio, there's almost no level of consistency because he's either incredibly freaking good where you're like, whoa, he's so much better than I expected, or he underperforms a little bit. We're like, ah, oh, expected a little more of Gumi. It's very hard to figure out what a normal performance for Gumio is, but that makes him a very fun guy to always follow throughout these tournaments. He plays Terran a bit like a Protoss player would, with the fact that he has so many builds available. He's all about like harassing, dealing damage. He, he's good about these timing attacks as well. And he's not scared of late game either. And the fact that he can really come out with a huge, vast uh, varying army composition in any situation as well. It, it's it's tough, man. You already see a very different build coming out of him. Yep. Uh, I, I honestly, if I was Gumio's coach, I would prefer these kinds of builds because I do think that he put himself in a bit of a rough spot in that game one. But obviously that's what a lot of Terrans are okay with because they want to get quick access to that factory, quick access to the starboard. I think this is a slightly superior build. I'm very curious to see what's coming out of the man from Basilisk. Is it going to be four gate blink? Is he going to be aggressive? Or are we looking at a two gate blink stalker opening with a robo and going up to quick three bases? Because those builds, they look similar, right? If you are not watching Starcraft all the time, you're like, ah, oh, he goes for blink stalkers and a robo. He did it in game one. But that doesn't mean it's going to be the same thing. Because if he makes four gateways, he is going to be aggressive, he's going to be in the face of Gumio, and he's basically going to try to end it. Well, last game, he tried to control the game. He tried to slow it down so he can get an economic advantage. I have the feeling this time, Benny, we might see a very aggressive trigger. And there it is, baby, all four. That's good. I mean, like, even though it's Blink Stalkers again, it's a very different tempo of Blink Stalkers. And Gumiho, the way that he's playing this right now, he is getting a tech lap nice and early. It's not going to be the Widowmine drop, is it? I don't believe. No, I don't see any meta back on the map. But yeah, this is this is already a very different game to game one between these two. And I like that Trigger's bringing, bringing a different pace here. Now it's all about Gumio figuring this out. Gumio obviously had the Reaper, but he didn't want to just throw away that Reaper. It does really help a Terran to scout it, but to be fair, if Gumio would scout it right now, he wouldn't do a whole lot different than what he's actually doing, because he's going into tanks incredibly early. There are many other Terran builds out there, like you mentioned, Benny, and you think of Heli and Heli and into whatever, right? Or a bunch of Widow Mines, a triple Mind Drop, double Mind Drop. That's not happening. Gumio is actually going into tanks incredibly quick. This is a nice scout, because it's 428 in the game, and with a lot of Brothers builds, that's 
would have already been there. So now Gumi OC is like, hey, you're not on three bases yet. You're on two bases. That means that I'm probably going to get attacked. The only thing I think uh, Gumio should do, though, is build a bunker or two. Yes, he has very quick tanks. Tanks are awesome. I still think you want to make life easier ah. on yourself and go for a bunker. He only made one tank. That can be risky, man, because Trigger is a guy who will just go for it. And, I mean, that tank is very exposed there. It looks like it's in a decent spot, but if you blink on that high ground, I mean, these war pins right here, has the Liberator even shown itself yet? Because that is something he hasn't oh, shown Lim himself. Oh, chilling on the other side of the map. I mean, if Trigger is going to dive deep into the natural Gumio now obviously knows like oh wait a minute this is not the same thing at all I feel like he should have already known I feel like there should have been a bunker uh, this orbital is going to take a lot of damage Liberator is now going to siege up in the main Trigger is very well aware of that he needs to save his war prism you cannot lose the war prism Trigger that would be a disaster he does not lose it and only loses two probes so far so good Gumio moved his tank to the low ground Ben am I crazy or is that crazy uh, it's a bit crazy, Kev. I mean, he added Marauders to his army comp very early here, so it is quite a stocky little group. But, I mean, this, it's already getting a bit spicy. He's gone with one stalk of, for defense only, which is definitely not too committal by him. That Liberator will still cause trouble. Going up to a third base as well. I like the fact that he's not uber all in with this. Nope, but I also think that Trigger should do more, because you cannot Oi. play 4-gate Blink Stalker as the Liberator is going to, whoa, not win, it's a double KO. Now the Blink in the natural is going to happen. That was the only tank, but good news for Gumio is that Stim is almost online. Combat Shield is already done, Stim is going to finish up in the near future. Trigger needs to still be very careful with that War Prism, and he knows it. I mean, there is a lot of potential in these Blink Stalkers against a Terran play that has zero tanks and no bunkers. Absolutely, and look at that. All these Stalkers do get out scot-free here a few are a little battered and bruised but he's getting charge online third base very close to completing here pro production has definitely slowed down a little bit but it, it had to with how much pressure he put on. nice micro by gumi what i would really love to see here from war is put four uh, stalkers inside of a war prism and also drop a little bit in the back of the main but trigger just wants to take this fight straight up it's going kind of well but obviously there will be some terrible reinforcements i think trigger can split up his army right now the way that hero and max Pax love to do it you put a couple of stalkers in the back of that main four stalkers is the magical amount of stalks to one shot in scv i think that would be the play. and you can still be active with these stalkers in the natural ah uh, these are really good trades man and gumo He's accidentally killed two of his Marines this game just by accidentally attack moving on them, which is definitely messy. And Gumiho, he has no idea what's happening on the other side of the map. He's even got a turret here just to be like, hey, man, I really don't want to lose. Like, I don't know what you're doing here behind this. And starts his third base as well. But right now, Trigger in a phenomenal position. And he's he's taking your... Uh, oh, that Widow Mine. I didn't even see that. But this is still going to get some decent damage done. A bit of lost mining time. It's also a scout, right? Because now the Zealots will see that third command center is on the way. I think we had an observer here earlier, but I believe that observer has been scanned and picked off. Yep, that's well done by Gumio. Because you don't want to give the Protoss too much vision. Don't want to make it too easy for them. Trigger is doing a little bit of everything, and I don't hate it, especially with the way that Gumio is approaching this, where he says, all right, I don't think I can move out. Let's just go up to three bases. Then I think it makes sense that Trigger is also dropping the Drobo Bay, going for the extended thermal lens. You want to be cautious with this kind of stuff, right? One or two Zealots running into Terran Army, not a big deal. If that happens a few too many times, you find yourself in a massive army supply deficit in the near future. And that's where Bio, even if you have a Colossus, can still really pack a punch. Gumi was definitely feeling it micro-wise, even though he did have a couple of errors here and there, doing a lot of pickup micro. And I mean, he's definitely saving more units than maybe he should be, but Trigger getting that 20 supply lead going. He's still got the Warpers on the map, it is battered. But slowing down Gumho any cost here is decent for him. That Colossus tech is online. Thermal Lance halfway done, getting his plus one as well. And he is rocking a superior economy for the time being, but has to be so careful with this. Kudos to Gumio though, for even finding himself in this spot nine minutes into this game, because the man went one tank, no bunker, against four gate Blink Stalker. And I'm pretty certain a lot of professional Terran players will look at that cell and be like, yeah, you're dead. There's nothing you can do. And Gumi was like, well, it might get difficult, but I'm going to hang in there. And he absolutely did. And he's not even in all that bad of a spot. He's down a couple workers. He's going up to three bases. I'd say that Trigger has a small advantage, but I think what the young Canadian really needs to work on here is the map vision. As we're following his first person view here for a little bit, you look at that mini map, Ben, that's a scary mini map to me if I was a Brothers player. You need more vision against world class Terrans like Gumi. Yeah, I mean, he's really hoping that Gumi's just going to stay on the back foot in his base. And I think maybe that will be Gumiho's choice. So I think Trigger fairly spot on about how he's approaching this, taking the fourth base as well. And yeah, Gumiho right back over there. So he made the right 
call. He's very safe. That is such a heavy Marauder army, Kev. Like that, <laughs> they are outnumbering the Marines two to one. Ghost coming online very quickly here for Gumiho, but that army from Trigger packs a massive punch. I would love to see him split off ten Zealots and just run into the natural, or you send that Prism into the main. Right? I don't know if all the Zealots need to be here, but you did mention Gumiho is very heavy on the Marauders, and if there is one thing that Marauders don't really enjoy dealing with, it's an overwhelming amount of Zealots, and we're looking at thirty-one Zealots at sixty-two army supply of pure Zealots. Trigger is just kind of trying to force out the stim after stim. He now sees a big stim has been used, so he's going to run back towards his War Prism, and he's going to try to get as many shots off as possible with the Colossus. The War Prism is taking damage, but that War Prism is not falling. I, I tell you what, Trigger's micro there, he was so hesitant about these Zealots, he really didn't want to run into it, and these supplies are looking closer than ever. This was definitely a little bit blundersome by Trigger, but the nerves are beginning to show maybe a little bit, but he's still got a good position in this game. SV count massively caught up for Gumo. I don't know how Gumi's doing this, honestly. He's playing so nicely. It was beautiful positioning right on the Terran units, and he was also very patient with stimming. He didn't just stim every single time that Proto's army got close. He stimmed one time, and that's when they actually battled. So in the end, the Trigger is going to go back. I do feel like there was some more potential there for Trigger. If we have 31 Zealots, you either indeed fully send it and you swarm that army, or you split off some Zealots and you go for some Zealots in the main, some Zealots into the natural. Like, as you said, he was very patient because he was probably afraid that Zealots would derp and start attacking buildings or that the bio would be in a well-protected choke point. And there was nothing at in that Protoss army that would really rip through Marauders, right? Zealot, over time, yeah, they're great against Marauders. Colossus, they can poke them, but they don't really shred through them. So I understood why Trigger was hesitant, but I think there was more potential there with the army that he had. And I mean, this game, it, Trigger's not in trouble just yet. Wow, but, look at that. <laughs> Sorry, uh, Ben. I mean, that's perfect. Like, at the start of this game, it was like 1k to 2k lost uh, in favor of Trigger, but that just shows how well Gumho was trading with Kind of inferior tech, right? Like the first EMP that you landed as well, he's dancing with the ghost, got a beautiful EMP. And yeah, right now, this game's as close as it's been, honestly. So Trigger is going to go into Triple Robo, and I think we have Boy. the double forts as well as that one low HP prism that absorbed a Widowmine shot earlier is finally going to get picked off. Triple Robo, Double Forge, all of it looks good. And I do think that Trigger is a good late game PvT player, but I also feel like there are different stages of late game. And I like to call it the ultra late game. Some people call it end game, where Terran players have infinite amount of command centers. They are five bases plus. They've got double starport, a fusion core, as you guys can see right now on the production tab, and advanced ballistics liberators with plus two ship weapons. That is the Terran dream, up to the point where the SCV count can get low and they can have 170 armies supply i don't think trigger ever wants to find himself against gumio in that scenario anything up to that point i believe trigger's got a very good shot i think so too and right now his army doesn't really get too much better from this point on i mean gumio soon he's going to overtake him in upgrades getting 2-2 blink dt's getting online like you said he might want to avoid the late late game but DT's getting online, That's that's that spells confidence to me. Yeah, but that's also Ooh. still a way to avoid it, as one of the disruptors got picked oh. off immediately, but two of these Novas absolutely connect with the Terran army there, a couple of goals going down as well. It's not even that bad for Gumi to get rid of a couple of Marines and Marauders, but obviously we don't want to lose Ghost. Ghosts are the key unit together with those Liberators, and we keep an eye on the production tab, we see plus one ship weapons, okay, that's scary. Once plus two comes into play, it gets really scary. No, I mean, you're totally right about Ghost. People often look at them, they're like, oh my god, they're such a good unit, but they are expensive. I mean, each one about the same cost of the tank, but look at this. This is a juicy flying getting online, and oh, disruptor shots. They are landing, Kev. They are huge, but the Colossus also finding themselves under big, brutal fire here, and what the stalk is doing, they're not helping these Colossus at all. Finally getting a blink under them, getting a few shots off, but this is chaos. What's the resources lost tab? Okay, okay, Gumo definitely getting the uh, worst end of the stick there. Those are some sick fights, and I actually thought Gumio was about to get an incredibly sexy engagement where I was like, oh, that's smart. But force fields? 13 minutes into the game, we dropped triple force fields on a ramp, and you know what? It was perfect. We kept those bio units at bay, kept the Colossus alive a whole lot longer, and Trigger even fired a Nova through those force fields where he blew up. This is some really cool stuff. It is so far four base Gumio. That's scary. 
Trigger wants to stay here. This is right where he wants to be. He wants to keep on warping in units. Don't forget about Zealot runbys. DT runbys into the natural, I believe. Whatever is running into the natural has a tiny bit of potential because you don't want to see Gumio get up to five bases. That's just where it becomes terrifying. And I think Trigger is doing everything within his power to prevent that scenario from happening. This is so scrappy, man. Like this army that he has right here, Gumiho's army, it is so flimsy and brittle, right? Like one wrong move, but Trigger, he is fighting without shields the whole time. These ghosts are still landing EMPs and stuff. Now that, that is a run by that you have to respect. Five Liberators are online now, and that number is gonna be a difficult one. You see here, decent preliminary defense here by Gumiho will shut this down, but Ah, it gets to break through the top a little bit here, but now the army of Gumiho looking like it does, is able to take a fight here. Trigger has to be so careful. Yeah, especially with near that planetary, right? You know that he wants to get on top of that planetary, but if he just moves that army a little bit too close to it, and all of a sudden Gumiho shows up, drops a couple of EMPs, Trigger's army can get wiped out, so he does not want to see it there. I wouldn't hate Warprism speed or something. 12 DTs. Yeah, that. And that is expensive, and that could be the killing blow here. And right now, you see Trigger getting some nice little pickoffs here. Stalk is being used to absolute perfection there to take out the libs. Gumio realized that he cannot defend forever. He is going to see that, though, and Trigger has his main army now kind of in between all these bases. Killing the Sensitile would be a big one. That Sensitile is just sitting there. That is an awesome unit to pick off, I think, as a Protoss. Oh. Trigger is now... Oh. Surrounded, but he says, I've got the invisible guy, baby. You're not surrounding me, I'm surrounding you. It's a great blink as he wipes out even more buy units, but he's still not getting that critical economic damage that he's clearly looking for. I mean, the thing is, he's got he's got Gumi on the ropes and he wants to keep him there. He has to be very careful because his army, one wrong move, and I mean, these are going to be nice, juicy detonations. At least one going down to Gumiho. He is feeling the pressure. He's been feeling the pressure nonstop for like the last five minutes from Trigger and Trigger. Yeah, look at look at his bases behind us as well, Kev. What's that? Six, seven Protoss bases? He's macking great. He's playing great. Trigger is really playing a solid game here, and you said he's got him on the ropes, but it's also important to eventually get him out of there because we've seen the Korean Terrans pull out a rope a dope or two but you think you've got him on the ropes for the longest time but they just hang in there and they never give up but Trigger truly is trying to get Gumio out of this game supplies are closed but the momentum the minimap it's all in favor of Trigger this is a big moment he does get the PF that's an awfully close call Trigger getting a tiny bit fortunate there but that's the planetary kill that he was looking for oh but is this army staying here for too long all those valuable disruptors getting cleaned up and I'm looking at this. He's still got a bank very available here. Is he going to go for a little cheeky recall? I mean, it'll be kind of redundant right at this point. But Gumiho now, 30 supply ahead. All those robo units are down. He's very fortunate that he does have three robos to reinforce, but... Yeah. I mean, he has to be so worried about the counter attack that's coming across the map. Yep, we even had the Medivac upgrade, by the way, because I was wondering if the Medivacs were ever going to run out of energy, so that is going to come into play. Like, Trigger can now easily lose a base. The one thing that Trigger should absolutely not do is lose his army in a base, because then you can rinse oh. and repeat that as one Disruptor does get flanked. This is going to be a tiny bit scary. Trigger is still counterattacking. Ah! He's going to find more damage as he's firing some big Novas as well. I think this game still belongs to the man who has just macroed nonstop and has consumed the entire bottom side and right side of Oceanborn. Ah, uh, he's looking real good here, Kev. That counter-attack got more damage done than all the attacks combined, pretty much. 29 SEVs are falling. Gumo is somewhat trying to clean it up. But, I mean, at what cost here, Kev? I mean, he's taken out a base. Maybe a second base is going to be on the way, but the thing is, Trigger's got lots more. Yep. Gumiho absolutely living on a prayer here. Trigger could decide to fight here because he's got the cannons, he's got the battery overcharge, but if you want to fight, he should warp in units on the right side and the main army should come in from the left. Gumio is stimming in very deep. All of the cannons have been taken out. If all of these cannons were going to take out or are going to get taken out and the base would fall, I think that Trigger should have maybe recalled those probes to the bottom left, but he didn't want to do it. He does still have a bit of an army here and every single unit he picks off of Gumio is a unit that Gumi is going to have a hard time replacing. He's down to 31 SCVs. Yeah, it's not a fair fight at this point. Trigger's just got more money. And I mean, oh, look, look. In fact, I'm looking at these arrows. Gumo with more mineral income at this moment in time, which is a bit, bit surprising. Okay, it's not surprising anymore. That's, a, that's an absolute mule camp. But this Terran army still is strong. So many disruptors out there. 
I don't, I'm not actually sure if Trigger has already seen that center base, right? Trigger might just be very tunnel vision. Can we take a look at his vision right now? No, he hasn't seen it. So he's very focused on this. And he's probably thinking, as long as I'm denying the fourth, I am absolutely flying. But there is a more important base right now in the center. Now, the one good thing for, for Trigger is that Kumio has been forced to spend all of his money on battle units over and over and over again. So he actually never got plus two ship weapons. And now there are a couple of zealots on top of the SCVs here in the center base SCV count has dropped to 24 Ben ah uh, he's he's absolutely struggling here absolutely is that's hidden kind of pace uh, did get spotted oh, oh unfortunate Colossus being uh, marched to his death over here army supply neck and neck 102 to 100 here these widow mines getting some juicy hits as well this is getting messy and scrappy I still much prefer trigger's position but Gumiho is making this a battle. Yep, and Gumiho actually has two big armies out on the map right now. Trigger cannot afford to lose these bases too, and he knows that. What just happened in the natural there, by the way, was actually low-key a very big deal, because Trigger warped in three DTs. All of them got the EMP. They died immediately. A Colossus pops. That one dies as well. Like, that's a serious amount of resources down the drain before this crazy base trade is even starting. Only one medevac here. Should be great news for Trigger, because if you can just get on top of that medevac, all of these units, eventually, they will run out of steam, right? Every Every stim hurts so freaking much. Gumio cannot heal up his units anymore. So even though he has taken out a bunch of production facilities and a main base and natural whatever, he just can't heal up his units anymore. No, you can really feel that Gumio is starting to run out of steam <laughs> here. I mean, this is such a wounded army. I mean, what can he do at this point? Trigger, he is the big kid on the playground. He's getting a bit more situated here. His economy is far, far better. 43 probes still alive. And Gumo, yeah, you can see it. A little bit of uh, talking to himself here, and GG Trigger ties it up. And that was an impressive display from the uh, young Canadian over here. Just an awesome PVT, right? I feel like that's everything that we love about Protoss versus Terran, or Terran versus Protoss. I do think that Gumio looked incredibly good in situations where it should have been worse for him. That build order, I feel like he should be in trouble. A single tank, no bunker, against 4 gate Blink Stalker, Ben? Like, yes, Trigger won, but he made life very hard on himself. And in this moment as well, Trigger showed up with a 30 army supply lead. You would think, like, ah, Gumi, you're in trouble, right? There are 31 zealots knocking on the front door of your third base, and he wasn't. Absolutely love those forces, by the way, on the ramp. You don't see that that often anymore, if you ask me, because we kind of all think once ghosts are out, yeah, you can get a sentry for Guardian Shield, that's about it. But force fields can still come into play in these latest stages of PvT as well. They absolutely can. Like, he went full parting over there, still using force fields a good 15 minutes into the game. But, yeah, I'm, I'm super impressed with Gumiho, the fact that he actually turned that into somewhat of a game, you know? And it was a very decent game, because for all intents and purposes, I just saw the bases growing for Trigger. I saw Gumiho just being wounded throughout. Third and final map between these two will be Alcyone. Now, this is where things can get a little bit tricky. If you're a Protoss player going up against the likes of Gumiho, he can do some pretty nifty stuff, nice positions for things going on. And both these players, at this point, remember, they're both 0-2 in the group in their first match, so 1-1. One, one. This really matters so much for both of them. Yep. What was very fun as well is that obviously Gumio got a great surround on that army when Trigger was doing the thing that you're supposed to be doing as a Protoss, where he's like, all right, I'm rich, the Terran is not, now I'm going to get a bit reckless. I've got DTs with Shadow Stride, I'm going to blink on top of a planetary, but Trigger made one kind of like rookie mistake. He didn't just poke with his main army, he took a battle with his main army while doing that with the Zealots and DTs. And I kind of feel textbook Protoss play is like, hey, you show the Terran, this is my main army, here are my disruptors, here are my Colossus. You kind of poke, you fire a Nova from afar, but you keep that main army safe, and that's going to open the door for your Zealous NDTs. You're not supposed to YOLO all the Zealous NDTs in and then also run your main army in the middle of three bases, because that's where it's still got a tiny bit scary, right? Where it's like, okay, you got the base, you got economic damage, but you just lost like 80-something army supply. And of course he was rich. He had all the bases, triple robot, double forge, but that's not a combination of things that's supposed to happen. You make it seem like you want the main fight, and that opens the doors for the Zealots and the DTs. You don't actually take the main fight and then also have all the Zealots and DTs near a planetary. Yeah, if there's one fight that game that I was very worried for Trigger, it's those Zealots that were just kind of dancing there against that big wall of Marauders. I was like, mm -hmm. go, 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 because it felt like uh, just kind of bouncing there was exactly what Gumiho wanted. And he kind of allowed him to get a little bit into the game. But 
I like that Trigger didn't slow things down macro-wise, and he did keep evolving with his army, because, I mean, that many Disruptors and Colossus, it's so hard to engage. And I've, I've got to give him massive credit as well. These Disruptor shots, not often do you see that many massive connections actually do stuff. So, yeah, well played. Well played to Trigger there. Oh, for sure. We had a couple of good ones. I'm sure that's something that Gumio is looking at, and he probably feels like he could do better. But I think Gumio will most likely think, like, okay, this is just not my kind of game, right? Gumio is the in-your-face kind of Terran. Gumi doesn't want to be turtling on three bases, waiting for his third orbital to finally float over. He probably just anticipated a different build from Trigger, probably thought that Trigger would go for the two-gate Blink Stalker, Robo, quick third base, and then all the tables are turned, right? Then it's Trigger defending, and Gumio's out and about on the map. So I don't think that was totally Gumio's comfort zone. He knows it. He's probably going to try to play very different. I do think that if Gumi ever gets a proper four base setup where the early game is a lot more even and Gumio is also out and about on the map. He's dealing some damage. If he gets his hands on plus two Liberators, I don't think any of those Novas will connect because that just really makes a night and day difference. Yeah, he was he was playing from behind for a lot of that game, but uh, I like what he brought anyway. Third game, what kind of opening are you thinking we might get from Gumiho these days? Or is there any sort of opening that you're like kind of worried for Trigger? Mm, I mean, uh, there's a lot of things in TVP. Like Star of 2 is a game of skill. We all know that. It's so incredibly hard. But there are some little moments where you can get a bit fortunate. You decide things in the dark, I decide things in the dark, and it's definitely not as extreme as the Wings of Liberty days where it's like, oh, it's a build order win, but there are some things that just give you a big advantage. Uh, I think that the players, one of them has a minor issue, I don't know who it is, so I think we should maybe just hang on for a split second. I don't know if they can hear us, Ben, but don't want to put any doubt in their minds, right, when it comes down to... That's true, that's true. Uh, but I also, as you said, it's a different map. It is a map. Well, we can say, out of all these maps out there, that is a map where Trigger does like to play some Stargate every now and then. We haven't seen Stargate yet. It's not his bread and butter. There are some Protoss players in the European scene where you just know they always go Stargate. Trigger is not quite one of them. It seems that our technical difficulty is going to last a little bit longer, so we've got a great video for you. And after that, we'll be back with Trigger versus Gumio in Game 3. <laughs> The players are very used to facing off against each other in 1v1 in StarCraft, but let's test their general knowledge against one another. But don't land on the X, because that's minus one point. Do the honors, Nikita. Let's go. Okay. Geography. Okay, okay. okay. It's probably America. No, I, I, I'm just not sure which city it was in for BlizzCon. Yeah, you probably won't tell me. <laughs> I have no idea. It should be. It has to be America. Oh. But I'm not sure where BlizzCon was. Me neither. I mean, I was there a couple of times. Yeah, it's unfair. I wasn't. I wasn't there. <laughs> Katowice. <laughs> okay. All right. Let's see. Twenty eighteen. Ah, I knew that. 17. I knew that. Damn. Okay. Well, at least we're that's tied good, now. That's good. That's good. <laughs> I like. Oh, oh. unlucky, brother. All right. Okay, the pro gamer guy. Wait, the only two non-Korean players to obtain the triple crown. And then the triple crown is to win in Korea, in Europe and in America. Is that it? Do you have any input on this? Absolutely not. Okay, uh, I want to say Probably Neeb and Cyril. Okay. Oh, that's easy. I have no clue. I never played campaign. Like Tassadar. Okay. That was my second guess. Oh, it was a decent one. 
I never played campaign. I have no clue <laughs> what's happening. I'm, I mean, I, I like single players. No. But I think it's yeah. That's hard. That's a terrible way to end. <laughs> that was Kilos with the worst Wheel of Legacy run ever. And Kalazar with a decent run. No, Stay it wasn't decent. <laughs> I love how we battled there for a little while and the final score was zero for Kalazur, minus one for Nikita. <laughs> it's like, did we really play, Ben? Uh, I mean, they tried, right? They tried. I mean, whenever I see these pro gamers doing things like that, I always giggle a little bit. But some of those questions are tricky. When we were talking about, like, where were the most world championships, and even we kind of got it wrong. Well, I thought it was Anaheim, and I still think it's Anaheim, but I guess it depends <laughs> how you phrase world championships. That's true, that's true. All righty. Third and final game between these two underway. A little bit of a break going on, so Gumiho can somewhat reset, and uh, Trigger can cling on to that victory for even longer, with Gumiho writhing in it a little bit. But Alcyone will be the final map deciding it between these two guys. Unfortunately, oh. Yeah, it doesn't want to be listening to us and our high-level strats, you know. I believe there was a minor keyboard issue before, and the keyboard issue has been solved, but now obviously it's very important that the headsets still function properly, because we don't want the pro games to be distracted by either. Some of these passionate nerds that have already shown up Thursday morning, Katowice. I always love about big events like this, man, hearing all the travel stories of the fans, people coming from all over Europe, but not even just Europe. Like you have Americans showing up, they just look forward to Katowice all year long. And it makes me always super happy to see them show up. And it's very early into the weekend, but I know that a lot of nerds are gonna make the journey over. As we have a minor update, some of the other games have also been played. While we were watching Trigger versus Gumio, it seems that Solar has been able to win his second series. So Solar played a ZVZ against Scarlet. Solar now 2-0 in series, 4-1 in maps. So Scarlet did take a map, by the way. And that's quite important as well. I believe Hermine was up against Spirit in his next match. So being, mm -hmm. I think, 1-0 up there, there, that's really cool for him as well. Was it 1-1? I don't know. I know they are playing against each other, but I didn't look at that part. Let's go ahead and focus on our best of three. Second best of three for both of these guys in a very, very important game three on El Sione. Top right side, we are looking at the main base man who made it to multiple finals in the year 2023. This is Cloud9's Yumio. And over in the bottom left, the cheeky little Protoss player from Basilisk, it is Trigger. So we had the Twilight Macro opening coming out of Trigger. We had the four gate Twilight Council with Blink Aggression. I think he could have done a bit more than what he ended up doing, but it's all good because he brought Oceanborn home in the end. Is this going to be the map where he's going to switch things up and go for a Stargate? And you were mentioning, right, like, or you were asking me, like, are there certain things that you hope for that you don't hope for? Like, if Gumio would go for some sort of a double Cyclone opening and Trigger is just chilling at home and he's going Stargate tech, he's going Phoenix, and he's hiding those Phoenixes, like, you could be in so much trouble as a Protoss because Cyclones are just omega good against Phoenix. That doesn't mean that you can't do anything with the Phoenixes, but that has to change the way that you're going to play a little bit. It's going to change your movement. It's going to change your timing of dropping the robo or taking gases. So it really all comes down to who sees what and when do they see it. And it's kind of hard. Like, if you're in Trigger's shoes and you've been playing against Gumiho's opening so far, they haven't really been the same. But they all consist of getting a Cyclone out, having the Reaper on the other side of the map. So far this game, he doesn't know what's behind that. It is a double gas opening, but then taking a few guys off the gas to get a faster CC behind it. It's kind of hard to get any edge against those kind of openings. But if there's one thing that Gumiho has been doing, it's kind of skipping out on the defense, isn't it? He's all about that aggression later on. So, hey, maybe stick with the four gate blink stalker here if you're in uh, trigger shoes. It worked, right? Yep, I don't think that would be a bad choice at all. I also don't think blink stalker would be bad or even just the two gate opening because just because he lost game one, that doesn't mean that the strategy was bad. He lost it on execution. He lost a few too many stalkers in the top side of the map. He lost track of the army. One of the key pivotal moments in PVT if Protoss goes up to three bases before the Terran is that your stalkers are there the shaving of units and their buying time. Trigger kind of failed in that department. He tried, it just didn't go well. It's a dance of execution and Gumio got the better of that dance. Uh, so, so far, both builds technically worked out. He's gonna switch it up, Benny. It is gonna be a target in game three and he's gonna make it hard for Gumio to scout this. So now it all comes down to what will Gumio do with his starport? 
Is uh -huh. he opening up with a medevac? Is he going to go for some sort of a winner mind drop? Or is it going to be something else? Yeah, I mean, that is nice to see him mix it up like <laughs> that. And <laughs> both these players throughout the series maybe attacking their own uh, units and structures a little bit. But uh, I mean, so far, Gumaho has shown that he has gone for double gas. And so far, just going for probes here, not going for the big scout which he gonna will see. see a pylon over here. Doesn't get to see what it is, though, but crazy. seeing a pylon over there, sometimes you do kind of anticipate that it is going to be... Ah, I tell you what, that is a nice start for Trigger and not disclosing what he's actually gone for. That's a big deal here, Kev. Yep, what just died? Okay, take a look at the Adept. Plus. It's one Adept that has died, only one Reaper, so the other Reaper was still alive. It's kind of crazy that Trigger did not lose a single probe there, by the way. It felt two mineral lines were exposed. Oh. This Reaper is going to try again, and it will see the Phoenix. And that was not a hallucinated Phoenix. It didn't move like a hallucinated Phoenix. So now Gumio knows what's up, and that is a big moment. Because if Gumio doesn't know, there's a chance that he loads those Widow Mines into a Medivac, he flies it into the main, and he gets punished for it. Now he knows that it's way smarter to keep these Widow Mines close to the Marines and the Cyclones, and that's going to make it hard for the Phoenix player. I think you need a battery here, and Trigger is going to get a battery. I thought it was a pylon, but that battery is kind of mandatory because this one Cyclone is just hard to get on top of. And I tell you what, as soon as Gumaho got confirmation on what he's up against, he moved out. And I mean, yeah. you do have to be careful with this Terran army, but he's also reactoring out Cyclones here, Kev. That is one thing that you do have to be careful about. And he can delay a third base for quite a bit by just being here and being a real nuisance. The Widow Mines are there. Not, not trying sure. to block the vision with the Medivac a little bit there, I think, is what he was trying to do. Trigger sees them, but he doesn't have an observe, so he can't lift it. And overall, it's hard to lift. And it's nice to sneak shade a couple of adapts to the center of the map and already pick up some of the reinforcements. This is cheeky by Gumiho, isn't it? Like, he's got his whole army here in this main base. And remember, there isn't really a way to deal with these Widow Mines properly. I mean, once they reveal themselves, obviously you take them out, but this is not really what you want. This is not comfortable for Trigger at all. This is not what normally happens in this matchup. No, it's not comfortable, but it's also not the end of the world if he eventually cleans this up, like losing a single gate, maybe even losing the Cyber Core because he's already rebuilding the Cyber Core. This is, it's uncomfortable indeed, and he's going to try to activate one of these Widow Mine shots with a single probe. That's not going to happen. Kind of just wondering, where are the units, right? It feels like we haven't seen a unit in forever. The Adepts are going to go forward. They're going to lead the charge, so the Widow Mines have fired. Nice Micron splitting up one of the Phoenixes there. The other Phoenix is going to take a lot of damage from the Cyclone. It does live. I don't think this was necessarily good enough for Trigger, right? When we talk about a cleanup, we mean everything. Every Marine, the Cyclone, the Medivac, the Widow Mines, and seeing five Marines and a Cyclone survive. Yeah, not what you're looking for as a Protoss, because Gumio slowed him down a lot. And this follow-up, man, we're just cranking out Cyclones two at a time. You mentioned Reactor Cyclone a while ago. Gumio still building Cyclones, and he's even going for Ravens with Interference Matrix. This is the first time that Trigger sees all these Cyclones. Probably did not expect that. Oh. Won't lose anything, but he took crazy damage. Crazy damage. They are very, very injured over there. And this almost, when you look at it, it's almost like a TVT build coming out from Gumiho here, isn't it? So a lot of Cyclones, two Ravens, third Raven on the way as well. And I mean, if you disable those two Immortals on the ground, Kev, what do you do against this? It's very hard, but obviously it is hard to drop an interference matrix on those Robo units against this many Phoenixes. I'm going to give a shout out to Dolan, man. Dolan, our American terror player from the Cranky Ducklings. He did this stuff a couple of times in the ESL America regional, uh, regionals. Different scenarios and often not against Phoenix openings, more against Twilight openings, but yeah, just the idea of spamming interference matrix on the Immortals and then the Cyclones will wipe the floor with everything else. The Phoenixes are not where they are supposed to be, but it is also risky though, right, what Gumio is doing, because it does kind of feel like, okay, this could be super awesome, but what if it doesn't work? This is such an important best of three for Gumi already. And I mean, he's putting this on the line. Absolutely, because you're absolutely right. It's very important. And the fact that he's doing this, he obviously has a lot of faith in it. He's getting up yep. to th three bases now. He's got a higher work account. I mean, we can't forget that that third base was delayed a lot by Trigger. And He's going to have to be so careful. He's doing a decent job of keeping all these Phoenix alive against Cyclones, but mm -hmm. he has no idea what's happening behind this. And I mean, you're against Gumiho. This guy has pulled out Mech before, and Mech would be crazy, but what is the follow-up? He has no idea. Nope, but whatever Trigger is doing, I think, is something he would be doing even if he scouts more, right? Like, he's playing against Marines and Marauders. He's going Colossus. We've got Zealot Charge on the way. There is a very good chance that he's indeed incredibly concerned about Quick Mech. 
And it could still be something a bit different later on because Gumi is now going for a second starboard already. I feel like that's very early, 7 minutes, 48 seconds into the it's game. It's incredibly early. He's also not going for the Ghost Academy this game. Very quick into the Armory. I dare say this game could be looking at a massive SME pool, like a couple of minutes down the line. Something like that, because he's going to want one massive push hitting very, very quickly. Yeah, I don't really understand that from Gumi. I think ghosts are always good here, no matter what Trigger does, with all these phoenixes and the immortals that are already out. I kind of feel that ghosts are always good. Seems that Gumio's game plan is to just crank out four Vikings at a time. That is going to make it incredibly difficult for Trigger to properly defend the Colossus. But what if you kill the Colossus, but then you lose the ground fight because you made all those Cyclones, so you have less bio units and immortals, Archons, Zealots, maybe some Stalkers with Blink down the line. I don't know, I think it's a bit risky by Gumi. I personally think that just going for a Ghost Academy would have been a more solid play, but he is going to absolutely obliterate these Colossus whenever he gets on top of them. Absolutely will. I mean, it's not much AoE damage, is it, at all in Trigger's army? In fact, it's zero. And those Phoenix, they've got a massive job on their shoulders. The Vikings, whereabouts are they? They're not joined with the army yet, so... Oh, those are nice. Those are sick force fields. Decent little pick up here to save the last scrambles of that army, but... I don't think Gumiho can stick around here for much longer. I believe the Phoenix has tried to get lucky in the natural the third of Gumiho, but I think Vikings had something to say about it, and I assume a Phoenix or two has gone down. But yeah, Trigger is probably just going to give up on the Vi Phoenix altogether, and that's completely okay, because he's not going to overpower a Terran with a better economy. I mean, Gumiho is enjoying an eight-worker lead. So yeah, your Phoenixes are not going to win the fight against a couple of the Vikings. But I think his gateway units, the, the Immortals on the ground, the Zealots, the Stalkers, I think they can win the ground fight for now. I'm just scared for him, man. Like, these upgrades from Gumiho getting 2-1 this much faster than the Protoss is a big deal. And we haven't talked really about what these Ravens are truly capable of. Obviously, they're going to shut down all those big Robo units. And without them in the fight, I mean, this army, I love the addition of these High Templars. These are not necessarily to get Storms out. They are to shut down those Ravens. They pack such a punch in this situation. And, oh, guess a few. Did he get the same yeah. one there? Or? No, he got one feedback. He right. only dropped one. One feedback, a very risky Immortal over there getting absolutely shut down, and Gumiho being very careful with how he's approaching this, and this Liberator count, Kev, look at that. Four libs at a time, already four here on the front door, and I tell you what, nice little feedbacks here from those High Templars. He even gets the Archon. This really wasn't all that bad for Trigger because his uh, Robo units actually have survived. Inferior Matrix is going to run out. I'm not sure if stepping in this many circles this early is a good idea. We have a couple of Stalkers on the ground, but there is not enough anti-air to take care of all of these Liberators. The Phoenixes, they got obliterated by the Vikings and the Marines. There was one Archon in the mix, but it could not get close. I don't think the Trigger had to step into those circles. They were not on top of his base yet. They were still pretty far away. And look at this from Gumiho. Range Libs are online now. Look Look how many there are on the field. You've lost all your Phoenix, and I mean, taking those bad boys out now, this is going to be so difficult for Trigger to deal with. He's doing a good job with the shield battery overcharge, just staying in range, not creeping on these circles, even trying to get some disruption going on back at home, but I can't see him managing to break out of this one. Upgrades are such a big deal here, right? Where Zealots, if the Zealots would have plus two attack and plus one armor against Bayou and with only plus one, you'd be like, whoa, just a couple of Zealots can really turn things around. But these Marauders at home, they're going to stand there, they're going to laugh at these Zealots. A triple upgrade advantage. I mean, double on the buy units versus those gave units. That is just a very big deal. I think Trigger is going to have to try to get clever, somehow get behind these lips, but that's not going to be that easy. He's doing whatever he can, but this time the tables have turned right. In game two, Gumio was up with his back up against his rubs. Now it's Trigger, and it kind of feels that Gumi says, nowhere to run, nowhere to hide. You're going to have to take one of these fights, no matter how painful they may be. Trigger thinks that this is the one that's the best one he can take, and he gets two out of those five lips rather quickly, but two out of five is not enough. It's not enough indeed, and third base is lost now for Trigger, and... He's getting pushed against the ropes here, Kev. He's 30 supply behind. Base-wise, Gumiho is still expanding. I mean, the Liberated account has definitely been wounded. All these units as well, there isn't enough medevacs here to really heal them up. And these Ravens, they have to be careful too. One is sniped out immediately, dodging these Liberation Zones. And honestly, Trigger's making the most out of this little avenue here over on the right side. And that's about the best fight you can hope for. Is it enough? These are very wounded Terran units. And Whoa. oh my goodness, all of them just got absolutely splattered into oblivion. And Trigger breaks out. He's wounded, but I didn't expect that. 
What a fight. What a Nova there towards the end as well. Beautiful, this kind of movement on these units where he's like stutter stepping almost a tiny bit. He's like, yeah, I think I found a tiny angle where I can fight. And that was probably kind of a scary moment for Gumi. You probably thought this one is in the back, right? This game is pretty much over. And Trigger says, nope, nothing is ever going to be easy at the Intel Extreme Masters Katowice. Everyone's going to have to work really hard for every victory. And still think Gumio is absolutely cooking because of the great upgrades. He's got plus two ship weapons, but he does need to take care of this army. He cannot let that army get into his own natural, for instance. Yeah, Trigger's not out of trouble just yet. Three, two, about to finish up. And he's only on plus two Protoss units. And I know a lot of Protosses, they're okay with just playing with plus three attack, but this, not from this situation. That Liberator count is huge as well. And plus two on those, they're going to start two shot in these Stalkers. But Trigger, he's making it very uncomfortable for Gumi here. Yep, he's making it it's a very annoying game. And Gumi is wondering, do I have enough to just trap this army and force it to take a fight? It really does not want to take. We cannot ignore the fact that Marauders are about to get plus three on the infantry weapons against Stalkers, Zealots, and Colossus with zero armor upgrades, man. Like, how quickly are these units going to die? But I love the addition of a couple of Archons. It's important to keep in mind that Gumio never got a Ghost oh! Enemy. And that is a painful misclick for a trigger as these Colossus are wandering off by themselves. Two big robot units will fall for absolutely nothing. Oh, and Trigger's going to go here from the back where most of the Liberators are not set up. But, oh, I mean... You don't really need EMP when your opponent has zero armor upgrades. You've got this much firepower in the mix, and all the Vikings now, they can go into Waddle Duck mode over here and really <laughs> fight against Trigger. And look, Trigger, he can't get through this little gap against this army. He's getting absolutely torn apart here by just precision play from Gumi. I think you always need EMP, though. <laughs> I mean, EMP is always damn good, but 3-2 with these kind of upgrades and 2-0, I mean, this army, it's just not a fair fight. No, it's not a fair fight, but the Oracles normally, they can actually hang in there for a little while with their high HP, all, all shields. And if they don't have any goals, they can actually make a bigger impact. But losing those Colossus, and in the end, perhaps just a few upgrades down too many. Trigger is still going to battle, but this time he didn't just lose a lot of his key units. He also lost the base. He loses 19 probes, and that will do it. Cloud 9's Gumio made life a tiny bit harder himself there in game three. But he gets that very important first win in this group. So now he's one and one lost to Hero Marine, beat Trigger. Gumi is still going to feel all right about his chances to advance. And honestly, Trigger, when he went into this group, getting to play against potentially the top, well, it is the top two seeds of the group in your first two matches. Getting a map here, though, that's actually important. We've seen a lot of these groups collide where it's like, hey, this guy will more map extra than that dude, and he's the one that made it through. But his next three matches are so damn important in this group, and it doesn't really get a hell of a lot easier. You've got Scarlet here, you've got Hero Marine and Spirit to take on later. Not going to get any easier, but potentially a little bit easier than Solar <laughs> and Gumio. I think Trigger will be kicking himself a little bit for game one because a lot of things were looking good in game one. He had a sweet setup. And if the kiting would have just gone a tiny bit better through the center of the map, if he would have been able to keep a little more track of that Liberator, I think that was him. Game two was a fun one. Both players having that moment. Gumio looking really good under a lot of pressure and surviving a potential build order disaster without any real issues. Uh, in the end, could not close it out, but he still looked good in that game. I think in game three, that's kind of like a key example of Trigger is clearly a player that is good with almost every strategy, right? But everyone at this level has builds they prefer. And Trigger is more of a Twilight boy than he is a Phoenix boy. But he has practiced a lot of Phoenix leading up to IM Katowice, so that's part of his arsenal. But if you then play against something as bizarre as this, where it's like the two Widowmind Cyclone move out, and you're like, okay, I'll just play it safe, take my time. And then you blink twice and you see eight Cyclones and Ravens, you're like, what the hell? I haven't practiced this because <laughs> whenever I practice, normally I just have to keep three bases alive. I play Phoenix Colossus, I take it from there. So kudos to Gumio for having one of these crazy follow-ups that I think Trigger was not very comfortable with. Let's hear from the man himself as he's on stage with Rachel. Take it away. Thank you so much. Congratulations, Gumiho, on an excellent match. Three very exciting games. I want to focus in on that third game. Bit of a back and forth, an interesting strat to start things off. Walk through that game from your perspective for me. 어 일단 고병주 선수 승리 축하드리고요. 어 일단 3세트 얘기부터 좀 해볼게요. 3세트가 아무래도 되게 어 초반부터 되게 전략적으로도 되게 인상적인 경기였고 되게 좀 치열했던 경기였기 때문에 어 뭔가 좀 고병주 선수 입장에서도 되게 쉽지 않은 경기였던 것 같은데 어떻게 생각하시나요? 어그 3경기가 사실은 제가 
되게 좋게 시작한 것 치고는 저는, 저는 좀 약간 마무리를 잘 못했다고 생각하고 어, 그냥 전체적으로 세 경기 다 그렇게 만족스러운 게임은 아니었던 것 같아요. So even though I uh, started really good, but I didn't really feel that I picked uh, picked off where it started. So like um, all the three games where I felt short on on uh, everything. So um, it wasn't really satisfying overall. Does it feel satisfying to stand up here having won a head to head, knowing every map you win, every game you win moves you forward in this group, and there's so much relying on group standing. 네, 그래도 뭐 이렇게 하나 한매 한매 이렇게 승리하는 해가는 게 그래도 이제 그립 스테이지에서 이제 조, 그 8강 진출 8강 12강 진출하는데 그래도 도움이 되기 때문에 그래도 이런 승리를 하는 것 자체는 그래도 만족스러우실 것 같은데 어좀 어떠신가요? 어 다행이다라는 생각이 좀 많이 들고요. 어 오늘은 이제 제가 해야 되는 매치는 다 끝났지만 좀 연습을 하면서 조금이라도 좀더 컨트롤이 좀안 되는 부분을 좀 만족스럽게 안 되는 부분을 끌어올려야 할것 같아요. So mostly I feel it's uh, relieved uh, rather than satisfied. But um, I'm going to improve what I shorted uh, on the last games. So um, I'm going to come back uh, stronger tomorrow. That's very exciting. I have one more question for you, Gumiho. You are the first StarCraft player to represent Cloud9, a storied esports organization over this last decade. What does it mean to you to wear the C9? Uh, Cloud9 is really... Uh, 명성 있는 팀에 이렇게 또 입단을 해서 이렇게 플레이하게 되셨는데 어 이제 C9 소속으로 이렇게 플레이하게 된그 소감이 좀 어떠신지 궁금합니다. 어 상당히 엄청 어, C9 소속으로 게임 할수 있게 돼서 엄청난 영광이고 사실 좀더 좋은 성적을 낼수 있을 거라고 생각은 하는데 약간 좀 그런 부분에 있어서는 좀 아쉬움이 있는 것 같아요. So definitely is a huge honor to play uh, for C9 and I, can, I think I can go further on uh, in the tournament, but still I need to fix some things uh, I fell short on, especially the basic micro stuff. So um, I can definitely improve and I'll try to show the best of me. Thank you. All right, well, I'll stop wasting your time here on stage, let you get back to the drawing board so you can accomplish that. And I'm going to throw it back to the casters and our analysts to take another look at that matchup. Thank you, yes, of course, here, as Gumiho was able to make it happen. It was back and forth, as Rachel was mentioning here, especially in that game two where I thought Trigger might have completely thrown it away, but it was not to be. He still was able to take that match uh, in earnest. But uh, joining me, Pig, as well as Loco, to talk about this one. Pig, that was quite the battle here between the two. It really does show here in Katowice that it's very important for all of these players, considering the severity of the situation. Yeah, I mean, it was tense. It was back and yeah. forth. And I think Trigger's showing that, despite starting off the day with the two hardest matches in the group, He's got what it takes to go toe-to-toe. -to -toe. Uh, and, you know, uh, hopefully he has the mental fortitude to go, you know what, those are the worst matches for me. It will get <laughs> easier from here. And uh, it was a very close one there. A bizarre strategy from Gumiho, though, especially in that final game. That's what I love about Gumiho. He always makes it fresh. I mean, I was concerned in game two when there was a propensity to be hit by every disruptor shot that existed <laughs> in the game. But it's, you know, it's by the by. Maybe it's early here. But we do have other things to talk about as well, Loco. We had other games that were going on during that. Let's take a look at what you were checking in with. Was this the Zerg versus Zerg, I believe? Yeah, I was having a look at Solar versus Scarlet that was going on at the exact same moment mm. whilst these other games were going on, although it ended quite a while ago. If we can switch on over to the laptop, that would be amazing. I want to show you guys the final minute of the final game. So game number one, and I'll just unpause it here. In game number one, Solar decided to go for a cheeky little roach rush, and that ended up winning him the game. Game number two, Scarlet decided to go as I switch to another observer. There we go. Scarlet decided to go for a, a roach push into a Nidus cheese, which was also really fun. Game number three, Scarlet decides to go for a 12 pool with a bit of a spine crawler cheese. Now, ultimately, she does manage to catch Solar off guard here. Solar has no idea that this is coming until she's already inside of the main base. But look at this defense right here. This is one of those build orders that's incredibly strong, especially against the strat that Solar went for below the professional level. There's a reason why we don't see this strategy very frequently anymore these days, because the top level Zergs, like for example Solar, just have practiced game after game after game against this particular style, and ultimately with a beautiful hold, it is Solar. Yeah, that ends up moving on here into the next series, but well done. Yeah, it's been uh, it's been a close group so far. To be yeah. honest, obviously, I think a lot of people look at Solar as one of the big favorites to be able to advance from it. I do like the little punching gloves of the drones. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> nice. uh, but we also have uh, over on Pig's uh, laptop. What, what's going on over there? 
Yeah, I mean, I just wanted to touch on that solo game really oh. quickly. A few people were saying, because he actually died to that same build, same map spawn. In Atlanta, I want to say, a recent tournament. It happens. People were saying, you know, you got to Evo Chamber block is what the Europeans like to do because that spine crawler position is too good. Yeah, they positioned the spawning pool differently too, right? Yeah. yeah, he didn't bother doing it. Holds it with good micro. So the margin yeah. for error is just so tiny, right? And especially if yeah. you're playing in a big tournament, you make a little slip up, then suddenly the 12th pool is, yeah, gonna destroy yeah. you. But but he's on fire, and you know who else is on fire? Oliveira and Stats. If we go into my laptop, we can take a look here at uh, this game, which was going on. And uh, Oliveira took out game one, looked fantastic. But then we went into game two, and it got very fiery very quickly. We have the four Stalker drop hitting the main at the exact same time as Oliveira is moving out on the map. And this game just gets crazy. But what I'm curious about is, you know, Stats, of course, coming back from being one of the greatest players in the world from the military. And a lot of us over the last year have had our eyes on him mm. and his performance. And the thing that I get excited about his stats was always famous for getting better at land tournaments. You put him in a high pressure environment, True. they would say everyone else minus 500 MMR skill when you go to a land tournament, stats plus 500 MMR. Like you, you would see this guy be in the finals of all the tournaments and people would go, you know, he's like ranked 50 on ladder. Like, like his MMR would be so much lower than the other top yeah, pros yeah. on the ladder, but he brings it. And you can see the multitasking here. He's bouncing his drop around. That SCV kill count just keeps going up while he's kind of kiting back with these stalkers, buying time. And it was really cool to see because I felt watching this, this is such a stressful moment for the Protoss. A lot of players crumble under this pressure. Um, we saw like Hero versus Oliveira last year in the quarterfinals, for instance. A lot of pushes like this, which he couldn't handle. But Stats actually handled this while continually juggling his Stalkers. Hmm. And as this settles down, he kind of barely holds on. He's still got the four Stalkers in the Prism alive on the other side of the map. So just very impressive. And I think invigorating for the Protoss fans out there yeah, as these yeah. guys are right now playing Game number three on either the B or C, C stream. Can't remember which one right now, but uh, definitely want to catch the rest of this series. Yeah, very cognizant of when he had to strike against the tank, sieging up whilst also putting on the harass, right? Like if they, if you allow that siege up and get a, like an extra volley or two off, I suppose, then more stalkers die in that scenario. But yeah. well, that's how that plays out, I suppose. Stats goes on to win the match. Is it, is it in game three now, I believe? Yeah, they're in game three right now yeah. as we speak. As you can see, this is kind of the final hold. Once that yeah, tank's yeah. gone, Oliveira's got no economy behind it. The Prism is still dancing around on the other side of the map. I can actually show you guys that. Check it out. Four Stalkers and a full hit point Prism. 37 kills. 37 kills. And he's, every time a Marine's popped out, he's focus fired it as well. It's, it's fantastic. This is almost like a bit of a skill check too, right? Like a lot of us don't really know exactly how good Stats currently is. We saw him play some fantastic PvP. Yeah, yeah. But this is one of those games where you can really see that he's looking solid here. Like that was yep. solid control. It's very easy to make a mistake, lose the prism, lose three stalkers at home. We see that go wrong. Well, especially in like ladder games below the pro level quite a bit, right? But I, I, I do have a soft spot for seeing stats do well, even though I don't think he's going to, you know, quite make it tunnel deep into <laughs> it. But, you know, yeah, stats, man. You never know. It's, it's great to have him back on the international scene. But anyway, anyway, let's take a look at the group here and so far and see what has gone on from the results as we do have some situations here for Solar, of course, 2 0. Here, Marine 2 0 hmm. as well. Maybe the Katowice and Magic's firing back up because we've seen him go deep in Katowice's pig. Two Zero is a good start so far. Yeah, he's looking fantastic. He was uh, down a map against Spirit. Yeah. But uh, decided to build some Cyclones of his own. He, he made that one look good. Scarlet's doing nicely as well. She's a single map score ahead of Gumiho there, as she took a map even in the series she lost first solar. Spirit and Trigger having the worst end of the start today. But Spirit's series have both been very competitive. So Spirit's kind of the one that's like, ah, oh, just yeah. barely missing what he needs right now. Yeah, I agree. I'm actually very impressed with Trigger here. Like, if you're looking at the results and you haven't actually seen the games, you may think that Trigger just got beaten, right? Like, he went yeah. up against Solar, he went up against Gumiho, he lost against both. But if you're actually looking at the games, he's playing incredibly well. So, yeah, he's got the the most difficult opponents out of the group already done. We'll see how he does for the rest yeah, of the Yeah, maybe the shorter hurdles here for now. But anyway, thank you very much, gentlemen. Time for a short break when we return more from the Intel Extreme Masters Katowice. Intel Extreme Masters Katowice is brought to you by Monster Energy, the United States Air Force, and Intel.
Hello, welcome back to I Am Katowice. We are in day one of our StarCraft II competition and joining me here at the Social Corner, I've got a familiar face for all you StarCraft II fans. Clem, lovely to have you. How are you enjoying Katowice? It's been great so far, yeah, it's been great. Yeah. I haven't seen you since DreamHack Atlanta, where you certainly cleaned up at the ESL Masters SC2 Winter Championship. And uh, that qualified you for quite a lot, but we haven't had a chance to really reflect after that event. How's it been for you? It's, it's, it's been really cool, and uh, obviously I'm still like, super happy about, about Atlanta. Um, and uh, yeah, right after Atlanta, I've got some, I had some uh, like, very good results in the WTL tournament. But then right after that, um, it started, yeah, my form was like going down a little bit, but now I think it's going uh, better again right before Katowice. So yeah, I'm, I'm hoping I can show some really nice games here in Katowice. Well, that's just like a Terran to have perfect timing. Glad to hear you're feeling back just in time for IEM Katowice. We also have a little bit of a ticket to recognize your achievement mm -hmm. at DreamHack Atlanta. You are one of the few players that has already punched your ticket to the Esports World Cup, and I'm going to hand this over to you. And uh, I'm going to let you autograph that one as well, just to make sure, despite having your picture on it, despite having your name on it, we want to make sure no one else tries to claim <laughs> your ticket. There was some debate over where to sign on here. I'm interested to see what he chooses. Fantastic. Hold that up to the camera. Show the people. There is Very Clem's nice. ticket. All right. Any final words, Clem? Well, um, I believe I'm playing next match, so uh, it's going to be a, gonna be a good one. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm hoping I can, I can win there. The next two, in fact. So stick around. We're heading on over to the studio, and we're getting right into those matches. That's right. Thank you very much. Yeah, we should have just got Clem on here, actually, and just he could talk <laughs> about the game that's coming up. That would have been nice. But he has already punched his ticket, of course, to the World Cup over in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, which is also fantastic for him, alongside Cyril, of course, uh, that have been able to claim their spot. Joining me, De Muslim and Rotterdam, to talk about the next match that's coming up. And uh, yeah, Clem looking fiery, maybe for Katowice, Roddy. Yeah, no, he said it as well. He's like, oh, Atlanta was amazing. And then I came home and not everybody watches all the online tournaments. And that's, of course, uh, logical. There's a lot of stars awesome. to cover. The WTL code as playoffs was insane. Clem reached a form that was perhaps even better than what he was showing in Atlanta, mm. but just felt that the kid could not lose. It reached the point where people in Twitch were complaining like, yeah, I'm starting to get a bit tired of Clem winning all the time. I was like, <laughs> oh, come on. This boy's been working all these years so freaking hard to reach his level. Yeah. If he has his three weeks of being invincible, let him have it, let him enjoy it. But it's very obvious that it did not last. He said it as well after that. Yeah, I kind of started losing a few more series, but there was something insane about Clem. And if that Clem from Atlanta and that WTL weekend shows up, everyone is in trouble. The field is yes. in trouble because he looked untouchable in those Yeah, games. I can't be the doubter anymore, Roddy. I can't be the guy. Who, <laughs> can I get it done off flight? Yeah. Kind of can. Let's take a look at Group B. Clem, Cure, Oliveira, Bunny, Shin, uh, Ragnarok basically, and Stats going to be entering the fray here. Some of the matches have already started, of course. We've seen some of the results kind of coming in, filtering in from that. But there's a lot of Terran power here, uh, Ben, to get things rolling. Yeah, and as far as Clem goes, I mean, Kevin nailed it. He's He, he leveled up. I really felt after that match against Serral at Atlanta on Alcyone, he just kind of he broke something, like yeah. a seal, where it was just like, okay, now I'm unleashed. And he went true Tasia in the uh, whole W Team League. But that group isn't easy for him. Like, Cure is actually very, very good at TVT and has been kind of a thorn in Clem's side in that matchup, even before he joined Team Liquid. Bunny and Oliveira, no slouches either. They're both very, very quick. Mm -hmm, and then mm -hmm. Ragnarok's a very solid macro guy as well. I mean, the only guy that truly is an underdog in that group is Stats, but even he's kind of showing that he can tango with some of these lads. I think it was 1-1 one, one, uh, against Stats in the group already. Or rather, 1-1 one, one against Oliveira. My old brain, as I say, I'm like, yeah, Stats is back, yes! But he, it is a tough group. You're absolutely right here. Uh, but let's take a look at this matchup that is going to be coming along mm. here. Clem going up against Cure Rotterdam. I see you holding a card very close to your chest here as we take a look at the two Team Liquid boys. It wouldn't be a tournament without Team Liquid uh, battling each other here to get things rolling. So what are we thinking for this matchup here, Roddy? Well, I'm thinking Clem, just because we saw him be amazing in Atlanta, we saw him still be amazing in the WTL Code S playoffs as well, and even in some of the weekly tournaments yes. afterwards for a beginning. But Cure just has an excellent historic head-to-head -head record with Clem. They played 29 times. Cure won 21 out of 29. That's pretty insane. He also won the last four times they played in a row, as you guys saw in the ticker as well. So there is something that Cure does that Clem really does not <laughs> enjoy. And TVT overall is a little bit weird. I'm sure you guys heard Zombie Grub talk 
talk about Cyclones. Some people love it, some people hate it. I think this TVT meta is a very good one for Clem because it's a less about, oh, TVT is like chess, you know, it's strategic and slow, yeah, yeah. we move tanks. No, it's chaos, it's Cyclones, it's micro, it's in your face. You attack me, I attack you. That's where Clem shines. I think that's where Clem has the upper hand over Cure as well. But I think Cure is going to do whatever the hell he can to slow those games down a tiny bit and make it old school TVT. I, I think you're totally right. And I mean, it's the one matchup where Clem can truly be caged a little bit because speed doesn't matter as much in this matchup. So when he's playing TVZs, when he's playing TVPs, he's absolutely unleashed. You know, he's a wild animal. But in this matchup, Kyo is definitely one of the slower play pace players here, but he's also so good about knowing what to do and how to approach it and how to pick somebody apart. And the fact that he can kind of slow down a game and make it his pace against Clem, that's very important for Kyo. Yeah, I mean, uh, looking at how kind of Kyo plays things out as well, for me, it's been extremely enjoyable to watch him throughout 2023. Of mm -hmm. course, we had Cyborg Kyo for a little while. Uh, and then now we've got him in the situation where it's still very enjoyable. He'll be able to kind of force base trade scenarios, but still, for some reason, be able to crunch all the numbers and win out a lot of those scenarios. Uh, but it does feel, Roddy, that as much as, yes, I, I was a doubter for a little while, Clem definitely has got that monkey off of his back. He looks confident. It looks like he's feeling confident. When you talk to him, he always seems confident. It's kind of this new era of Clem, which is kind of terrifying. Yes, it is. But there's one thing that might be a tiny bit terrifying for Clem. And don't worry, I'm not a doubter. You guys know I'm a Clem believer. But Katowice and Clem, historically, True. not very good. It's been a couple of years, even when Clem had that rise during, like, even before the COVID era. We're like, oh, this Katowice, Clem is going to be good. We had an open bracket back then. He lost. Mm. Last two years, we really thought he was going to peak in the group stage. Like two years ago, Clem was in that crazy group of death with like Rainer and Maru. Those were his first two games yeah. of the tournament. He went 0-4. Nobody really held it that Clem didn't make it out of the group stage. Last year though, that Clem was about as scary as this Clem. It was just a matter of when is he finally going to bring it online. Mm -hmm. And he didn't bring it last year. Lost in the group stage again of Katowice. So there is something about this city that hasn't really worked out yet with Clem, but I, I cannot imagine that we don't get to see that Clem from December or January. Yeah. This should really be a whole nother level. And I think he can get rid of that monkey as well, once and for all. And he can finally embrace Poland the way you embraced Poland many years ago, James. He started building castles over here. Oh, well, I've got to do something, right? I've got <laughs> another one on the go, actually. But anyway, we have always <laughs> we have backstage moments going on throughout the day. We're just getting ready for this match. Uh, so it's always awesome to see how these players interact and are able to get things rolling for Katowice. It is a special place, Ben, of course, as we've had such a lineage here for the uh, heroes to be able to kind of take the championships. Not only that, but every time we have these players playing series here in Katowice, even in our first two series on the main stage, it feels like there's a bit more urgency about it here in Katowice. Yeah, and I mean, we had a beautiful preview, right, with the Masters Coliseum online. Really, it was, That was good. It, yes. it was it was a wonderful, like, it was the best preview possible, and you really got to see some of these players shine. But that is one of the tournaments where Clem didn't do too well. And it was kind of like he talked about it. He's felt a little bit rough, but he's feeling it again. And... Clem is a guy to beat right now. Like lots of the players, when they talk about him, they're like, I don't want to run into Clem. I don't want to run into Clem. And Terran wise, that is the one matchup that really kind of held him back a little bit. But ever since beating Maru at Gamers 8, which was like the guy to beat in TVT, right? He definitely has stepped it up. It's just, it's so hard beating a guy like Cure. And even though Cure does live in the shadow of Clem right now, especially during the WTL, when it comes to this matchup in particular, he's very good against Clem. Roddy, you look like you want to say something. <laughs> no, I was just agreeing, and I was thinking about the, you know Maro being that guy to beat in TVT. I was like, I'm not sure if everybody not agrees. Not tasteless. <laughs> you know, he was, uh, yeah. No, but I mean, like, we obviously don't know either, right? But <laughs> we don't know what happens within Team Liquid. Maybe Clem and Cure actually <laughs> practice a lot of games with each other. We cannot possibly see what happens in in-house practice, and no. maybe Cure in those practice games also gets the best of Clem. So maybe this is just that a terrifying opponent stylistically. There is something that Clem really doesn't enjoy, but. I I think it's going to be a fun series. I think even if it goes wrong for Clem, there is absolutely no reason to panic yet if you're a Clem fanboy. But there is that Olivera guy in this group stage. And Olivera and Katowice is a very happy marriage, as he did the most magical thing ever last year. And Olivera just does good against Clem in TVT. Sure. So in that way, this does become a very important first match for Clem immediately. Because that other guy, yeah, that seems to, get, seems to get the best of him every now and then as well. It does make you wonder as well for someone like Olivera if, like, okay, you know, maybe, you know, some of the tournaments between last Katowice and this one, yeah, okay, man, they might have not gone your way, but it's Katowice again. You got, you got to imagine he's like in the background, trying to practice as much as possible for something like this, because it means probably a lot to him considering last year, Ben. I mean, absolutely. Like, 
I remember Oliveira when he was time, and I was like, this is the best Chinese player that's ever been, and now he's absolutely cemented it. Uh, but yeah, he is the kind of guy that also is a massive grinder when mm -hmm. it really comes down. Sometimes he takes time off, but when he grinds, he grinds. You know, 50 games a day, he was talking about games eight. Something that's actually quite interesting as well, uh, that you mentioned Rotterdam whilst we were not on street, we were just at the hotel chilling, mm -hmm. is that uh, traditionally in StarCraft 2, South Korea is really good at StarCraft 2. However, the last three Katowice's not gone their way. It's been four years since a South Korean has won Katowice. That's kind of crazy to think about. No, it really is. Obviously, we had the online era, the COVID year, but Rainer still won that year. Yes. And that was an amazing tournament. And he went through all the top tier Koreans of their respective races. After that, we had that great Serum versus Rainer final. It's like, okay, that's awesome. Last year, we were like, oh, okay, well, it's probably now going to be Maru, right? Because Maru has finally gone all the way to the grand finals. And then it was only Vera to stop him. So yeah, that definitely is a bit of a storyline. It's weird. I think Koreans can absolutely win this edition of IM Katowice. Oh, yeah. There are multiple that have a very serious claim. But yeah, some of the foreigners are just up there, right? Like winning among the top favorites. And Clem is, without a doubt, one of them. I feel like Clem is a bigger favorite to win the entire event than Cure is. But yeah. Cure might still mm. be the minor favorite in this head to head. It's funny how well Cure has done, though. Like the game is eight, getting to the finals. That was something that I didn't quite expect. Yeah, I knew it was yeah, huge. Sure. But, you know, walking away with, what was it, like 70K for second place? I mean, it was. Not bad. No, not bad at all. And it's just, it's a rough place for Cure to be because he's one of the old school guys where he played for Jhene, he was in the shadow of Marrow, and now he's kind of in the shadow of Clem. But there is one thing that does go against, or go against Clem. It's just the fact that in Europe, he plays all these weeklies and he goes for the NA weeklies as well. Beats really good Protoss players all over the shop, like Hero Max, but maybe not that last couple of weeks. Gets the good Zerg practice as well. But the Terran practice, that's a really tough one to replicate. And Cure, he gets to practice with some of the absolute best. And I know he's like good pals with Marrow and stuff. And you get to keep tricks up your sleeve when you play against teammates, you know, like because you, you can't show them everything that you know. And yeah, I I'm thoroughly looking forward to this one. It does make me think, when is Cure going to get that? Well, I mean, obviously he has had big tournament wins in the past, but in the current form of Cure, when's that going to one come along? I mean, it might not be Katowice because it is so difficult to be able to do it on this stage. We've seen that in the past couple of years here, Roddy, but it's surely due. <laughs> Yes, but you look at the field and we just have a bunch of incredibly Romantic. talented video gamers yeah. and we can make a speech about how Serral should win again, how Rainer should win, how Maru should finally win. Maybe Oliveira can represent Medic, maybe Hero goes all the way. So it's like, yeah, it's Cure awesome, has yeah. the skills, but there are like eight other guys on the level of Cure that all want to win. So it's sad, but that's the brutal thing of esports as well, right? Some players are incredibly good. They deserve to lift trophies at international events, and it just never happens. Like, yep. the stars really need to align. Last year, they aligned for Oliveira. That was absolutely fantastic. And that story is still inspiring a lot of underdogs in this tournament as well, because they'll look at it and be like, that guy lived out my dreams. I know that I'm not the favorite coming into this tournament, but if Oliveira wins it, that means that I too, if everything goes perfectly, have the chance to go all the way. And yeah, Cure is one of the favorites or an outsider, but it's so freaking hard to actually close it out. Like we sometimes take it for granted when we see the same guys win over and over again, but winning these kinds of tournaments it's just ridiculously difficult. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. We see it all the time uh, for Katowice. I mean, what, we've been here now 12 times and every single one of them has pretty much been a banger. So uh, that is how it sits. Thank you very much for your patience here for the moment whilst the players are just getting ready. And thank you to our sponsors, of course, here as we have Intel joining us for the Intel Extreme Masters, as is a surprise. They've been here for a long, long time now and we're ever grateful for them. We have Blizzard as well for making the game and everything possible here for StarCraft II. And we, of course, we also have Monster joining us here because they've now got the sugar-free original monster taste and I'm very happy that it's in the green room. <laughs> I'm gonna turn <laughs> why are you laughing at me? I, I love just, it. I just like you, James. Every time I come to an event with you, you're like, did you try this monster? It's great, man. It's a fantastic. To be fair, the last couple of Katowice is every single time there's a new one and I'm like, yeah. that one's really good. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. That one's really good. <laughs> 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 All right, so, I mean, uh, final thoughts before we actually get into this, Roddy? One final thought I have that's not related to this Cure against Clem matchup, because we already said it, we know where Clem is going to try to shine and where Clem has the advantage, is that Hero Marine in Group A, he's just off to a freaking flying start, man. Yeah. And don't forget that Gabe made it to the semi-finals in Katowice two years ago, made it into the round of 12 last year, where he lost to the eventual champ, Oliveira. If Gabe makes playoffs in Katowice three years in a row, mm -hmm. honestly, that deserves a standing ovation for me, because... Winning is hard, but even making playoffs is incredibly hard. Gabe's off to a great start today. It's weird because 
because for for Gabe, he kind of flies under the radar a little bit because there are so many great Europeans now, right? You've yeah. got the trio. You've got your Cyril, Reyna, uh, and uh, of course Clem here that we've just had on the couches. For, for Gabe, he's always been really good, but it's it's difficult to kind of shine when you're in the shadow of those kinds of guys. So, but yeah, I mean, the fact that he started off with a 2-0 against Gumiho and looked really good whilst doing it, quite aggressive against Gumiho, being able to push him, that was a great start for a hero marine. I'm impressed with Gabe because the last like six yeah. or nine months or so, it's been kind of like a bit rough, you know? Like I see him playing against players that I'm like- Under the weather. Yeah, because Gabe is normally <laughs> Mr. Consistent. Like, yeah, a couple yeah. of years ago, he was the gatekeeper. It's like, who's going to overtake him for fourth place kind of thing. And, you know, Max Bax came along, which was like, hey, here I am, but- Not it's... the big Gabe Weekly anymore. <laughs> no, no, but the fact that he knows where to shine and where, like, he does something right. The fact that he knows when to peak, and that's just a talent to have in itself. Yeah, definitely. Not the Big A Weekly anymore. Sometimes it's the huge Clem Weekly. Sometimes it's the mysterious Max Pax Weekly. Uh, but yeah, for sure that title has been taken away from him, Roddy, as you're very well aware. <laughs> if Gabe's TVT is good enough to hang with Gumio, and Gumio being a strong Korean Terran, obviously, in this tournament, that should give Clem a tiny bit of extra confidence as well. It's like, hey, in Europe, we really did make some strides. Yeah, or yeah. Maybe it's just this specific Cyclone meta that really favors them. I don't think Cure is going to go for all out Cyclone wars against Clem. I think Cure is very smart, and I think he knows where he has the best chances to beat Clem, and that is by not doing the same thing as Clem, right? Mm. Kind of how when Sarah was invincible in ZVZ, the, the way to beat Sarah was not do the exact same build and do it better because that's probably not going to end well. I think Cure will know this, and I think he's probably has a clever way All to right. get quick into Marine Tank, etc. It's going to be a fun series between these two. Well, let's get into it then. TVT, Clem, of course, is maybe the most prolific and strongest Cyclone user in all of TVT. But let's get into this. Let's head over to the stage for our TVT. Right on. Whether you're a fan of Terran, Team Liquid, or four-letter words, this next match promises to bring you some excitement. We've got Cure versus Clem right now. Let's check it out. Ward and I here to bring the TVT action. It's the first one in I am Katowice, but we have been paying close attention to the meta development since Atlanta, where it felt like it came out of nowhere. The Cyclone versus Cyclone, the mass Cyclone versus Cyclone. And one of the guys here was a big fan of the 20, 30, 40 plus Cyclones. That guy was Cure. The other guy, big fan of six to eight Cyclones and Kill before we get any further, and that was Clem. And now we have them battling each other at another fantastic offline tournament. And one where the TVT is going to be looking a bit different. We've seen already today someone trying to go counter Cyclones, maybe not on the stream, but on the B stream. Gummy Ho is opening like masses of Marauders. There's been a lot less Cyclones just with the Marine Tank opening, making a return. It's been a fun matchup again lately. And I feel like Clem really, for me, took a step forward in TVT with the six to eight Cyclones. It felt like it gave him confidence. He got through those early stages well, and he played a good game after. I'm a little worried that it's almost standardizing back away from Cyclones a little bit for him. So we'll see what he brings here. I think I'm especially worried if Clem tries a Cyclone though, and Kyo just says, no, I'm going to sit back super defensive, take an expand early, skip through that phase and hit you hard with my follow-up. That may have been exactly what he was doing the last couple of times they've played, which is very, very recently. It was close, but it was also won by Kier. So that was, I mean, kind of a surprise considering the excitement that was surrounding Clem, as well as his prowess now in TVT. But it does feel like if he cannot win with that early game micro, then it kind of goes back to, well, a standard expectation. And in a standard expectation for TVT, I think we and the desk give it to Cure. Yeah, no, I think uh, Kia still has that kind of, it's just the ability to turn games around as well. You know, and I feel like this exists in the Korean version of TVT a lot where 
they're in difficult spots, but they're still gonna just be like, okay, you know what? Now I'm just gonna run some, you know, run some Marines through the map or something along those lines. Those moves are the ones I definitely feel like Clem still struggles with a little bit. Mm. It doesn't feel like he makes those comebacks happen as often as the Korean Terrans do. So something to watch out for. Even if Clem does get off to a good start, he's got to keep stabilized throughout the rest of the game. Yeah, and that is extremely difficult to do. Both these players actually facing the great TVT -er that is Maru in the most recent tournament uh, that was online. Very big tournament, Masters Coliseum. And both of them had some difficulty, but it was Kira that had more difficulty. If Clem could have tried to prepare for this exactly, and with a lot of Terrans in his group, you gotta be expecting TBT practice, and there was something to learn there, but he couldn't show it just a few days ago in an online tournament. Will offline be different? They're getting into the first game on Solaris. In the top right for Team Liquid, he is Clem. In the bottom left, the newest addition to Team Liquid, of course, he is Cure. You think they did a little rock, paper, scissors to choose the Team Liquid color? I don't think the admins would let that happen. The admins are very <laughs> defined on who is what color, Jess. That is actually a very good point. <laughs> um, but yeah, we we can't really go over too much more than the desk did, but if you missed it, basically you have a potential clash of styles, you have a potential moving forward from the Cyclone meta, and you have a potential countering. This is freaking me out, actually. <laughs> Okay, anyway, a potential counter of the Cyclones uh, that we know that Clem really, really loves. The thing is, is that we're really emphatic that Clem loves the Cyclones because it just seems to fit him so much. But while Cure might not be a guy who seems to fit that hyperactive, action-packed micro drop everywhere, he actually is the one that really was pushing the Cyclones. He's the one that kind of forced Maru to be like, oh, that's what we're doing? And then Maru tried doing it back to him. And then that was what they did in their best of five as well, Cure versus Maru. Tomorrow. most recently it was a lot of cyclones so it is kind of funny because we don't know what the most recent online tournaments again like literally a couple of days ago had in store for the games but i'd be really shocked if it was cure still going with cyclones and winning i think if it is cyclones i absolutely give it to clem but i might just be wrong yeah clem's cyclone play has been absolutely you know through the roof amazing like he did things with these new cyclones that i was like no surely you can't do that with a <laughs> new cyclone right but he's been so good with them it will be very interesting to see if you can make those work out from in the series we already see a bit of a greedy opening from cure just gonna go straight into that reactor would put him in a little bit of danger if there was a proxy or so initially but that has not happened at all so cure is going to get get away with that earlier reactor now he's going to be able to be up a reaper very soon and that's going to give him a big little advantage early game and it's just going to make it a little bit tougher for clem as cure will have a few more units to kick off with in the first few fights yeah so the reaper hellion battle used to be obviously big explosive very entertaining and the micro can still absolutely be there but when you do set the expectation of cyclone um you know this is almost like something we pass by at this point uh, clem started to really show his prowess in tvt online by actually just killing people with this reaper hellion opener and then you know good old patch gave him another early game unit to do the same thing so he was like oh thank you very much but we haven't really seen it do devastating damage and one of those reasons could be is that Cyclone comes out so much faster. It's so much cheaper, it doesn't need a tech lab anymore. So getting that snowball doesn't happen to the same degree. Clem is the first one to go for a Cyclone, but here is still building Reapers and Hellions. There is a point where there's enough Reapers to out damage a Cyclone. Yeah. It seems kind of crazy, but the Cyclone can die. And that is a factor to see the factory to the reactor now here from Cure, so likely to follow up this up with Cyclones of his own. Clem getting that medevac though will help a little bit micro-wise. We'll see how well Clem defends this first onslaught, which is coming across the map from Cure right now. He's up a Hellion, he's up two Reapers. It's that Cyclone that really has to play a big role here for Clem defensively. Yeah, and he knows that as well, so he's going to be paying attention to the forward line in case an attack like this has happened. There you go. Pretty much the immediate retreat is really the important thing here. High ground for the Cyclone too, but it is not a lot of supporting units. And it is a full wall either, but Kier is not going to go for the chase. Going to find what he can get here, which is actually only one SCV thanks to the medevac popping at a very opportune time. 
pretty pretty good from Clem all said and done, right? Because the Cyclone was kept very safe throughout. There was never a chance to get on top of the Cyclone. First he kept it on top of the ramp, then he pulled it past the depot, raised that depot. Secure probably felt as though this was a good start, but he really ended up just losing a lot more units. And like you say, he only got one SCV. So Clem is gonna get away with that slight advantage into Cyclones of his own now. Yeah. He already had a Medivac, so he's a little bit faster to the Raven as well. And that Medivac is gonna start to harass one Cyclone versus the two Cyclones that will go across the map from Cuba. Yeah, exactly. In an ideal scenario, you know, nothing really happens in the early game. You both mirror each other, whatever it is. And the extra units that Clem had do go in this medevac, and it creates a little bit more of a SCV killing force. But at the end of the day, both players are going into reactor cyclones. So it's about finding the one angle and the one second of time in which the cyclones are not properly positioned and getting lock-ons. And that's why this becomes such a big micro battle, one that Cure is totally eager to fight against Clem with. Yeah, he did a great job with that. That one Reaper left over from before, so important because it drew the Cyclones away for a couple extra moments, meant he got a couple extra SCVs on the natural, and that's been the difference so far. And Skiro does retake a worker lead in this game after Clem was a little faster to expand. And there's the Interference Matrix upgrade coming up here, and uh, Clem, you know, I was going to say he didn't get it yet, despite starting with Raven sooner. Of course, a lot of it nowadays is you want to kind of drop all the turrets down. Yes. As Clem is hunting this medevac, he knows roughly where it is, but Kira is playing some fun games to dive on out of there. So the other TVTs that have been happening in other streams have gone more of a classic way. Maybe some Cyclones at the beginning, but they've actually, a lot of them ended up into Marine Tank. But I can tell you, I haven't watched many games like this. Basically, what's going to happen is that one person's going to push, try and get better auto turrets to lock on, you know, fake outs as well as actually do the damage. And then only if that doesn't straight up in the game, because it absolutely can, will the interference matrix be used later down the line. It is going to be Clem looking for that moment. Auto turrets do get thrown down first for him, and less so for Kira, as one of his raids got bopped immediately, but you can see the defense is good enough. Clem recognizing it as well, is trying to evacuate, but chased down by a very eager Cure, who's also microing to his heart's content here, and is actually doing a wonderful job. I mean, fantastic stuff, right? Micro on the Cyclones as well. We do lose the Medivac now. Uh -oh. Some more of his Cyclones too. He loses a bunch of units and Cure is still pushing. So that means that Clem is really not going to have a lot here. Down 10 army supply. He's building more Cyclones. But boy, Cure just keeping so many of his alive. He might have been losing his Ravens, but he did so good elsewhere. There's one order to come down to help Clem out. But he's in some trouble. Cure is on his front doorstep and he has got the numbers to push on in. It's, uh, I mean, kind of like some of the other mirror matchups that we have, Muta versus Muta, Phoenix versus Phoenix. You, you basically don't really recover from this devastating of a loss. If it was one or two Cyclones countering, the game would have gone on. But you can see that Kira does receive that GG from Clem and wins the Cyclone battle. That uh, might just be how their recent matches have gone, which is that Clem doesn't actually get to be the only hyperactive one on the field. He does have to deal with the other person's micro and then might not be the best when it actually comes to those direct engagements. But to really say that, we have to take such a long, close look at that one, like half a second moment with the auto turret cyclone yeah. battle, which I imagine we'll see in a second here. Yeah, this, this start really did feel like it was going to do so much for Cure, but Clem again was great defensively with his Cyclone. He got an edge off of this. This was the important fight. And oh, okay, okay. The concave uh, was better for Cure, right? Yeah, he just so, got more Cyclones fighting straight away despite the yeah, order attack. Yeah, exactly. There was like literally half of Clem's Cyclones were caught behind his own Cyclone. So the auto turrets did take the lock on, and they did buy some time as well as do a you know, minor amount of... Um, damage because the output's very strong but then they'll live very long um, but that that's that's the calculations that you do and then the game ends and this is what we have been seeing from particularly these two Terrans. The other Terrans in I Am Katavita might be just very strongly against this, and so they don't really eagerly play to this point. But between these two, that's 100% expected. I just thought it would go the other way. Yeah, I, I would agree. Clem's usually so good at picking those fights and just think it's one of those cases where I don't even necessarily think you misjudge this. Just in that moment, you think, right, I've got this, but the pre-setup concave, yeah. and that just makes the difference, enough of a difference. And even then, maybe if Clem had just straight up ran home, he yeah. might not have lost as many Cyclones. You get home, you get a couple of repairs, and maybe you defend. He tried to do a little bit extra, right? He tried to micro back against the micro of Cure, and then he ended up losing a couple extra Cyclones. That's what really gave Cure the ability just to keep on going from that yep. point on and just never stop. And that's how Cure picks up a pretty fast game number one in this opening best of three for these guys today. Obviously, yeah. some of the matches in this group already began, but this one was uh, held off, waiting for the rest of the games in Group A to finish up for today. So this Group B action could begin.
It's a very explosive way of playing. I mean, there's definitely something to the strategy there. And certainly one of the things that uh, Clem could have been thinking, oh, I've caught him off guard. Because literally yeah. the auto turrets have to come down so quick that if you are later to them, they either don't come down because the physical space you're going to put them in is now taken over by your own cyclone or their own cyclones. It's a very short cast range spell. Or the raven dies because <laughs> it is slightly forward and gets locked on first and then it gets bopped immediately. So the, there's a lot of reasons as to why Clem would do what he did, but Cure basically negated that as much as possible by having the preset concave that really did help him out. And then he also was able to kind of give as well as take as far as the, the micro, right? Like it wasn't just watching Clem yeah. bop someone in the online cup as he can do. It was watching him go up against someone who's very equally capable of doing that. If you put them in a literally like arcade map that is literally that micro, Clem might win like an average point, you know, superior in the micro. Okay, sure. But when it comes to big moments, big tournaments, Cure is just as capable. Yeah, absolutely. Cure is uh, very, very capable. Again, I think that uh, chance to kind of play a game is A as well, right? All the way through to that finals really showcasing yeah. that he's got it. Like he's done it all in Korea before, but to do it in, you know, big international event on the very biggest of stages, he really was, it was really cool and cool to see him do that. And so, Again, just give you confidence in the rest of these events. Similar for Clem, he got it done in Atlanta. Let's see if you can use some of that confidence in this next game. Game two coming up here as Clem takes on Cure in this best of three to open Group B. In the top right, the Red Terran from France. This, trying to make a comeback, is Clem. In the bottom left as the blue Terran, we do have Team Liquid's Cure. Oh, it's funny as, uh, oh, Kier sends out an SCV. But I'm um, you know, looking at the two maps, and they're both maps without a natural ramp, which can be a more natural deterrent to some of these Cyclone shenanigans. But both players are probably pretty confident in doing the Cyclone shenanigans. Yeah. They're like, no, I'll beat the guy. No, I'll beat the guy. No, I'll beat the guy. <laughs> yeah, no need to kind of pick one of those uh, rampy maps. As you will see, as you mentioned, one SCV out on the maps. The second barracks of Cure is going to be proxied. This is a you know, a cool build, right, where it's like you can put on a bit of extra pressure, but you're not super committed to the Reapers. Just a bit of a different way to open your upper game, keeps you in a good spot. Clem actually likes doing this a lot as well. When yeah. he gets into, like, a, a game lead, he's like, you know what, I'm going to set this up, then you can't proxy Rex me and succeed straight off the bat as well. So just gives you a good way to apply pressure early, and we'll see if Clem can deal with that in these next few moments. Yeah, and he should be able to. There's really a very low chance of this ending the game or really even doing, I, th I think, significant enough damage to you know, call it there as well. But it can. I mean, sometimes the, the shock and all factor, you know, like first game is, even though it's kind of more common now, it's still oddly short for a TBT. It just yes. happens. It's just done. It can and, happen with Cyclones, right? Just yeah. And then you follow up, wall up with an immediate aggression. Like, that is a good momentum game plan right there. I know Clem has certainly improved his like mental aspect and it doesn't usually get tripped up like this. I mean, it could have happened. Or alternatively, Clem could have actually tried to one rex expand and been a little more vulnerable, but that's a little less likely. He doesn't do it too often. That's going to be a uh, factory obviously on the way up from Clem, and that's obviously good news. Second gas factory all before expanding gives you the best possible chance of dealing with any sort of early reaper pressure. So that gives him the right direction to deal with this. A factory done soon. Problem is for Clem, he sent his Reaper across the map, so it's not going to be here defensively to help out. Now the two Reapers show up here from Cure, and Clem's going to be like, okay, well, that's not great for me, because again, his first Reaper's so out of position. He starts up a Cyclone immediately, but it's going to take a little while to get here. And this is Clem going to start taking some damage. New Reaper pops out, but he's already two SCPs down. Command Center being delayed, and he's got work to do to work his way through this one. He's going to try and micro the other side as well. Does capture one of the Reapers with his SCVs. Now, this is a lot of lost mining time, but if Clem can do both sides of the multitasking, he might be able to get revenge. And so far, so good as far as the literal SCV kills, as far as the denied mining, it still favors Cure a little bit more. But Clem's right back in here with another Reaper. Going to find another SCV. Certainly a four. I mean, he could definitely target fire a fourth. Actually, kind of missed target fires there a couple of times. So I was wrong about that, but... It could have been four, I swear. 
Uh, not bad though, right? I mean, three SCVs, you got more workers than he uh, lost. Yeah, yeah. So he comes out a couple workers ahead. And don't forget that Q obviously is a little bit of a step behind on tech. He's got a yep. barracks out in the middle of the map still. He put a lot of gas into those Reapers. So mm -hmm. Clem does very well here. He defends aptly. And now he's going to have a couple Cyclones out as that Starport kicks in. The Medivac comes online. And we start to get back to where we were at in that previous game. Where that Medivac harass can begin. We'll see what Clem can do from there. And of course, he's got that command center, which is already halfway done on the natural. Cure has no expansion in sight. Yeah, he actually didn't bother expanding um, to do a full on 1 1 1. Uh, like any matchup amongst the professionals, not, not really popular anymore. So we're, are we going to really do a one base? Send it, yeah. Stop on the reactor and we just build some. Like a control. classic tank Viking push that you get bopped by ladder on and you say, that's a stupid build, I hate it. Yeah, <laughs> and then you bring it out here. <laughs> you know, if I expected anyone to do this, oh, okay. I would have said like maybe Oliveira or someone, because he yeah. does this a lot in like TVP, for example. Right. You know, maybe you extract out a TVT, but man, now you expand and you're just an expansion behind for, for what gain? Like, I feel like Q didn't even really know what he was trying to get done here. Yeah, no, he literally had the starport on the reactor. Uh -huh. I mean, that's that's kind of hard to misclick. I mean, it's not impossible to get your brain <laughs> Go in the wrong direction. Right but click. <laughs> yeah, um, that, that's that's very interesting. And you're right. There's the thing is, is that really an advantage of getting that much faster of a starport for either side, honestly? Just because the cyclone is so powerful. That was pre and post patch, really. Like obviously the starport gives you some more options, but uh, I'm just saying as far as timing goes, it, it, you know, this isn't benefiting cure, as you said. Clem's medevac is literally already here. So. Yeah, I think he was. <laughs> I think he was quite lucky actually that Clem was being extremely cautious because he left Cyclones yeah. at home, yeah. specifically worried for I think something coming. Now he's going to bring them across. As this medevac tries to leave, it is going to get out unseen, so that's an opportunity for Cure down the line. But he does still have to deal with these Cyclones at the front right now. Four Cyclones and two Reapers to help lead the charge in. So a couple, a couple of initial hits maybe. And there's only two Cyclones here for a couple moments. There's the two extra. And that comes down to Micro. Clem still has that medevac to Micro with. Remember. Uh so that will help him, but generally Cure is going to be able to push this back. And now we look to Cure's offense for the next moment or two. Yeah, well, Cyclones are on the way for Clem. They're about to pop out, but how many SCVs can be killed before that happens? And does the Medivac escape, which is obviously the really big thing here. If the lock-ons of Clem go on the Medivac, both lock-ons, that is, it's, it's usually dead instantly. Back on the aggression for Clem, I think he did realize that he had a moment there, right? Because he locked onto a Cyclone. Where Kira locked onto a Reaper is yeah. why I kind of got the benefit right there. Not quite strong enough that he felt comfortable really pushing it, but he has taken leads. He's taken the lead in the SCVs and the economy in general, but now he's also very much in control. This is exactly where I think he was going to shine when it comes to Cyclone Wars. Yep, in control. He's got a Viking coming to shoot down the medevac of his opponent. He finds a cancel on the oh. CC. It was just now placed. And even just picking away in the corner, right? It works out over time. There's the boost away, and that is going to be those medevac cyclone combos getting out from Cure. Clem backs away with his own, but has definitely established a lead. Six workers up right now, up in army supply. Love where he's at in general, as these ravens are going to add in some auditors to help push this back. And now that medevac really will just have to boost away. That's it for really the aggression from Cure. Um... Which, which means that he's basically just going to be sucked behind. <laughs> he doesn't have a third CC. He's not moving on as far as the technology goes. If he cannot win with this upcoming Cyclone push of his, then, well, he's not going to win at all. This does help. Now we also have something from the back here. Clem does find a Raven. So that's decent because if he can escape anyway, he's going to lose another Cyclone, though. Yeah. And two, actually. Turned around. Yeah. Okay. This is now looking a little bit better for Cure. His attack now has a lot of potential. Uh, Clem still has a little bit of the defender's advantage. Another Raven actually popped out. SCV pool would be very helpful if it was done immediately. Yeah, yeah, yeah I think he's going to be all right. I was going to say the Raven NG is one big thing for Clem, too. Those old servers do make a big difference. Got to use it a little bit here, and now he's on the chase. This time, he's actually pushing Cure back. May not get to push him back as far, but a good first step as that Orbital Command comes down to the low ground. That will be Clem mining from his third base much sooner here with a worker lead still intact. And Kira's still trying to come in, still believing a little bit. Auditor goes down from Clem, finally comes down from Kira a few moments later. Clem is born to lose a Raven. Numbers are very similar, and I think Clem does still have just the better position to be able to turn this around. Even the Medivac falls. Oh, we're going to keep on hoping we do find one more Cyclone. I love that they're both still building Cyclones. Yeah, well, very it's much. an active game, right? I mean, oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. But it's, it's very much, you know, they, they do want to move on. But you can't move on because it's so quick, it's so fast, like literally in the fights, but also the production. You don't want to fall behind in the Cyclone War. And uh, that is actually going to be it, yeah. yeah. Thing is that Kira would not be able to defend his third. No. So there, there's really no hope in trying to make a comeback happen. So Clem, based off the Cyclone opener and the way the Micro went down, 
gets revenge. It's funny how similar it is, because even at the end, it's like the reason Hero really has to leave the game is because Calamicus keeps catching a couple extra Cyclones yeah. on the retreat. And if Kyo could just get everything home, probably fine to go on from behind Shure, but is able to kind of stay in it. But in this case, no, he just loses too much and the third's in trouble. Clem's already got Stim on the way to combat shield. Q is trailing, so yeah, that's going to be that. And Clem ties it up one to one. So we are tied in this series and we are ready to see who can take this down. Big opening match. These two both know there's a lot on the line. And of course, we've not really talked about it a lot yet, but the idea of getting first in one of these groups is so important because you get yeah. to skip that round of 12. And with the group D in play, that's so tough. There's going to be some yeah. very difficult round of 12 opponents. Yeah, that's that's definitely looking forward. But uh, trying to think about their road to victory, obviously every player wants to be like, well, I want to defeat everyone and get 10-0, you know? <laughs> but only one player could probably do that. Um, but, uh, you know, realistically, I, I put, I think, Kyrus first because I'm such a big believer in his TDT and his solidness. And I, I'm also yeah. definitely on the hype train of, like, he deserves international win after all this time. But uh, it does start, I think, more so for Clem here, right? If Kier loses his first best of three, ah, oh, it's a bummer. Maybe he doesn't get first, but I'm very confident he gets top three. Yeah. For Clem, I really do think that even though he's improved his mentality, he has the proof that he can go to the international tournaments and win, it would still be momentum-based. So especially when the rest of your matchups are still mostly TVT, to get kind of bopped, like if this game went Kier's way, I think it would set him up very poorly. No, I'm absolutely with you, right? If you can just kind of get that man. And it felt like that was a little bit of what happened to Clem last year in Kata yeah, Vitsa, right? Because yeah. he, he did lose out to Ragnarok. He lost out to Oliver in those groups. And it just felt like it was just a little bit tough for him to get back on track after those series. And yeah, he is such a momentum-based player. Like you said, I think much improved in that regard. But it's so easy. It's one of those things that's so fragile to kind of fall back into your old, old ways when it's like one of the bigger events of the year. Yeah. And all the pressure is back on you. Game number three, setting up right here between these two Team Liquid players. We are going to be starting off in the bottom right-hand corner with the Red Terran. Bringing it back to a game three, it is Clem. In the top left, also for Team Liquid, he is the Blue Terran, Cure. Well, Golden Aura, you mentioned the lack of a ramp on a natural. This is going to be the same case once again. Bit of a, I mean, if we get there, very defendable map on three, four bases. But, uh, well, we really not really been able to even think about a third base too much, <laughs> right, so far in this series. So let's not get ahead of ourselves. Yeah, no, don't, don't do that yet. This is really the group of Discovery. Again, Group A with Spirit and Hear Marine, they're able to display some more classic TVT. Which is great, and it, you know, it was really fun. But this was the group that I looked at, and I was like, I know Cure likes the Cyclone stuff, even the like egregious Cyclone stuff, you know. He also had that one build that he seemed attached to in Atlanta, but kind of stopped doing it, like the Hellion Banshee one. And then Clem loves Cyclones as well, as far as the micro of the early game. And then as Oliveira goes, he also is a very action-packed, fast player. So he's, is he favoring Cyclones? And the question marks are just everywhere because if they had both come in here, or all four Terrans to come in here and they didn't have any Cyclones, I'd be like, oh, okay, so someone figured out. Yeah. Someone figured out the Cyclones don't work. But there's clearly something there, and uh, certainly one of the differences in the groups amongst the players is just, you know, how good they are with the early game Cyclones. That can be different across all the Terrans we have. So here's a here's a question to add another question mark. Is there any potential map like Golden Aura? We maybe see some mech, like maybe some Hellion, uh, some some Banshees and those Hyperfly Rotors. Is that something you've seen Cure kind of cranking out here and there? He never got a chance to <laughs> in, in the best of five with Mara at the very least. I don't know, again, the most recent TDTs in the last week, but um, he did, like, obviously in Atlanta, it went that direction a couple of times, but then it also definitely felt like both, like every, at least the Korean players are very much experimenting with this thing that was like post medevac cyclone, where the Europeans were like, oh, okay, you know, two medevac or two cyclones medevac, maybe up to six or eight, oh, okay, okay. but. Uh, yeah, it's something that is another question mark. If we could get there, oh. it also means we could actually get like an actual macro game. But this is an extremely greedy build for this game, this series being so based on early aggression. 
Yeah, this is almost like believing Clem's just not going to do what he's done in the previous games, right? Like, I genuinely believe he's going to mix it up as, ooh, we jump up, that's going to be a donated Reaper. Ooh. The second Reaper actually stays close for a little bit, and Belly gets away for the moment, needs to not turn a corner right now until it regens a little bit, still being hunted. The other Reaper splits off to try and go elsewhere, it's not going to work. Well, not okay. too bad to just lose one Reaper. Maybe a little bit of cannon fodder later on, but uh, I mean, nice for Cure, who obviously is going very greedily here. Yeah, no, exactly. I think that's the biggest thing, right? We're not, I'm, I'm not trying to overhype or single Reaper dying, but I am going to kind of hype up the fact that he gets away with this for just that much longer. It's still a secret. Clem does not know what his opponent is doing, uh, particularly that supremely fast third CC. Now, Clem is going for the medivac as expected, so he has a you know second form of scouting that will eventually find out. But this basically can like set up his expectation from being a little harassment, the same thing that he's gonna do to me. Instead of thinking that, he could have been like, oh, this guy's totally vulnerable, let me really push this issue. And now he's only going to find out, have to readjust, have to redigest the type of game that he's playing, and then, a, you know, according to Kira's plan, Clem's got to play from behind because Kira will have an approximate, like, similar number of Cyclones and Ravens and fans advantage, and Clem will just not have a third CC. It's going to be very interesting because if Clem, yeah, doesn't get anything done, then that is most likely going to become a problem. Yeah. Obviously, right now, just Cyclones, the Ravens, he, he needs to kind of make something of a move. Kira's going to come in to scout and see what's up himself. He's been blind up until now, apart from killing off a Reba, so I'd say get some very standard info and yeah, it's just going to be the speed of that third CC, already a 4 SCV lead, and Clem is just so passive with the medevac, not taking it across the map. He's missing out on pretty much every opportunity he might have had to really get anything done very soon here. These numbers are just not going to favor Clem in any way. Yeah, this, this is becoming a bigger ban issue. Now, there's still the one action-packed Cyclone Raven v. Cyclone Raven moment. Oh, I actually love this supply depot from Kira. Kira's so cool. But there is that still that moment where it could go really poorly for Kira, and then he loses all of his advantage because he has to tap out of the game. Mm -hmm. That is still possible, but if that doesn't happen, if anything is less than that, then Clem is going to be playing a more natural TVT as they both move into Marine Tank from behind, which I really think Kira wouldn't let go. So that's kind of what we're waiting for, is the actual move out. And so far, Clem, you know, just going for a little harassment, still building up the Cyclone count is also probably wondering if he's about to experience the same thing from his opponent, because he still doesn't know about that third CC. Yeah, everything he's seen is just being like, oh yeah, you're doing the same as me. But he's not had any of the information. It's like, oh, you were a Cyclone down earlier. Like, he missed those opportunities because he lost the Reaper so early. So that's kind of where Clem sits, as the Cyclones in the Medivac are now beginning to get ready to make a move. A Reaper comes in here from Kira, is going to find at least one worker. And that's uh, always nice. Going to bring a Cyclone back here as well for a moment. Now this Reaper does go down, but yeah, Clem, he needs to make something happen. He's down 12 workers at the moment. This is becoming a very serious issue. So drop into this main base. We'll start to get some SCVs. Let's see how much we can get done. Not too much because the Cyclones are quick to respond. I mean, it's a good step in the right direction, but it's it's not all the way yet. No, oh, and that wasn't really something that told him he's super far behind. Yeah. Right? Like, that's, a, that's not a strong enough scout timing. So he doesn't know that he's actually nine workers behind right now. He's also going to be behind on the upgrades and then... Um, not, like, basically nothing's really going Clem's way. Does he even have, like, faster stim or faster barracks? It's it's all cure all the way. Now, I don't want to say that Clem can't bring back a good old-fashioned TVT. Anything can happen, I think, when Terrans get that third CC saturated. But, um, again, I think it's just where cure is, is old-school strong. So, here we go. Cyclone's finally moving out. I think this is the strongest chance for Clem to actually get the appropriate amount of damage to even up this game. Yeah, no, I, I think this is a real opportunity here. Kira did finish Stim, so he has quite a few Stimable Marines. They might just help even just buffer a few shots. There's four Ravens. Wow. So Clem has a lot of energy available. He sends three yeah. of those into the main base. He is going to lose his medevac. He's going to try and take a fight. He'll knock down one Cyclone, make it two. So he has some opportunity, but of course, the Cyclone is at least here stranded. He just wants to try and get some SCVs before he gets cleaned up. Stim is revealed. And these Ravens ah, really ah, need to make a getaway. Ah, He's busy on the other side. He's going to lose all of the Ravens, oh. Clem. Well, he did get Matrixes over here, so he'll break through the Siege tanks initially. This is an opportunity. He's going to start getting a lot of SCVCG, and this is what we've been looking for. Yeah. If he just hadn't lost all of his Ravens in the pro, oh, 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 oh. third as well. It's on fire, but not fun fire enough. Oh, that would have been... Oh, that would have been so cyclone. <laughs> it had gone yeah. down. It will not cure recognizing the danger, get the SCVs on it. 
Obviously, the rest of his army was coming forward. Clearly, that was a really good adaptation from Clem, but the fact that he lost all the Ravens in the main really ruined what could have been a real comeback moment. He is ahead by 10 workers, but he's still behind in many other regards, and now losing a lot of what still makes up his army as he tries to trickle in more reinforcements, gets his tank actually in position, which it will be, but now there's interference magics to worry about. He might be able to save it, but now it's big trouble with the anti-armor missile. SEVs are pulled, which means that Clem goes back down to the worker count. And it actually looks like even with the SEDs being pulled, he is nowhere close to having the army. Yeah, GG's Cure gets it done as Clem. He made one big move to try and get back into it. But even still losing the Ravens, he just lost a little bit too much. And Cure just had enough established, enough of a lead on the build order. And even at the very end, Clem's probably looking at this like, man, why did it go so far? A lot wrong. You jump in that replay, you see how fast the third is, and you're like, man, I did nothing. Like my first yeah. medevac should have been across the map trying to get something done. And it just wasn't there at all. So Clem loses out. Kyo takes full advantage, and he is going to win out this series and gets off to the fiery start here in Group B. Really nice display of build orders here, actually, from here. I mean, yeah, it's a little, it's a little tricky. You know, there definitely could have been things that gone wrong. But after two games that already promoted the idea that he was willing to do pretty much the same thing, you really can't yeah. blame Clem for thinking, all right, I'll play it safe while micering only a few units on the opposite side of the map. Um, and that is where it kind of went wrong for him because he had gone from the get-go, first two Cyclones, first Medivac, then Rally Cyclones across. That might have been an issue for it here, but he is uh, he's playing his mastery in the matchup, really only second tomorrow, and even then, it's like if only one thing went differently in so many best ofs, he would have been first. Um, and uh, yeah, Clem hopefully won't be taking this too poorly because again, he has so many TVTs to play in this group. Yeah, we didn't even really get to see Clem's real TVT in a way, right? Like, we saw yeah. a lot of Cyclones. But anyways, let's hear from our winner of this series, Cure. Thank you so much down here on the stage with Cure. After that very, very fast TVT matchup there, still going all the distance, all three matches. But I want to know how you're feeling after that. 어, 일단 김도욱 선수 승리 축하드리고요. 어, 오늘 클렘 선수 또팀 동료와 이렇게 첫 어, 경기를 치르게 됐는데 어, 이렇게 2대1 승부로 또 이렇게 이기게 되셨어요. 소감이 좀 궁금합니다. 어 일단 클램 선수가 워낙 중후반 운영을 잘해서 좀 제가 클램 선수 스타일도 알고 해가, 해가지고 초중반에 좀 먹고 들어가면서 중반 이전에 끝내려고 했는데 그게 잘 먹힌 것 같아서 이길 수 있었던 것 같아요. So I know he's very solid on the late game. So uh, if I shake him on the early game and the mid game, then I have a shot of winning this. And I think uh, it pretty much worked. I'd say so as well. Now you guys are teammates on Team Liquid. How much do you actually get to practice together? How well do you know him outside of matches just like this? 어 아무래도 클램 선수가 팀 동료다 보니까 서로 이제 연습 매치도 자주 할 거고 좀 여러 가지로 이제 서로 주고 받는 게 많을 텐데 어, 어느 정도 이렇게 교류를 좀 많이 하셨는지 궁금합니다. 어 일단 팀이 아니더라도 원래 제가 제일 잘하는 테란 선수라고 생각을 해서 항상 지켜봤어 가지고 그 전부터 제가 옛날부터 잘 알고 있었기 때문에 그래서 이번에 좀더 맞춤식으로 준비하기 쉬웠던 것 같아요. Uh, even before we were on the same team, I'm, I knew Clem was a very talented player. So uh, I always kept an eye on him and I always researched his play. So um, that's why I uh, had a very good knowledge on Clem. In regards to researching play for this matchup, I, I just want to know your feelings on Cyclones personally. Like, how did you enjoy playing them in the matchup? How did you enjoy playing against them? 아무래도 이제 태태전에 또 사이클론이 좀 많이 기용되고 있는데 이런 태태전 사이클론 메타에 대해서 좀 어떻게 생각하시는지 그게 좀 궁금합니다. 어 사이클론 맞춤식으로 이번에 테란 선수들이 많이 준비해 왔더라고요. 그래서 앞으로 태태전이 계속 진행될 텐데 좀 빌드들이 어떤 빌드들이 나올지 지금 기대하고 있습니다. So I see uh, many p players are trying to counter the Cyclone meta. So uh, I'm really looking forward to what uh, they're going to prepare and what they're going to show. Uh, last question for you. I know you studied a lot in this matchup against Clem, but he is only one of the many scary names here in Group B. So how are you feeling as you size up the rest of your group? 어 이제 클램 선수를 승리 어, 상대로 승리하시긴 했지만 그래도 아직 다른 쟁쟁한 선수들이 많이 남아 있잖아요. 그래서 이제 나머지 경기들에 임하는 각오를 좀 말씀해 주시면 좋겠습니다. 
어, 일단 그래도 클램 선수가 제일 힘들 거라고 예상했었는데 그래도 첫 단추 잘 끼워가지고 다행인 것 같고 그, 어, 그동안 준비했던 거좀 편하게 하려고 해보겠습니다. Um, well, even if all the players are good, but I thought all, I always thought that Clem was the best player in the group. So um, I think I got a, a really good start. So uh, I'm going to finish it on uh, top of the group. Wow, I love that answer. And I hope that confidence carries you through Group B. Excellent performance from Cure. Let's send it back to the desk now and see what they think of that matchup. Thank you, Rachel. Yes, a confident Cure is able to tackle Clem here as it seems like the matchup kind of rests on a knife's edge when it comes to some of these Cyclone versus Cyclone scenarios. Joining me, the Muslim as well as Rotterdam, to talk about this one. Roddy, those first two games were interesting, and then uh, the second game, just a little bit back and forth. Yeah, I mean, they're often over before they ever truly begin because yeah. some of these fights are so chaotic, and it's not just about the Cyclones, what they lock on, what they target, but it's a lot about the Ravens and where can they drop the other turrets, and then you try to find a spot for the other third, the other guy builds, and it's like, no, I want to drop it there. But then every second that goes by, you lose everything. The other guy's already doing an insane amount of damage. Games are over so quickly, but obviously a really painful moment there in game three for Clem. Those Ravens in the main, like up to that point, the game maybe wasn't looking all that hot yet, but there was some potential there. Double Cyclone drop in the main, triple Raven. If he spams all those auditors there in the main base, Either the Cyclones dive into the middle line, they kill all the SCVs, or the SCVs escape yeah. straight through the meat grinder. And it also just takes a little bit longer for Cure to clean it up. If it takes him longer to clean it up, Clem can deal more damage with the Cyclones at the third. And obviously the counterattack, the inevitable counterattack that will come, shows up a bit later. So then maybe Clem has another tank and then two interference matrix is not going to be enough. So losing those Ravens on this level, you get punished for it immediately. And Cure just does it again, man. He has such a good head-to-head -head record against Clem. Won the last four in a row, and he says, that was not a coincidence, boys. We're going to do it again. Yeah, he looks good against Clem. It's so undoubtable when you look at those pre previous results that we've seen from him. And Ben, I mean, Clem, uh, Cure also saying he saw Clem as the strongest player in this group. So now he thinks he's going to get number one in the group, all things considered. Is, is that a surprise here for you? Uh, no. I mean, like, I, I spoke with Clem a little bit before the match, and he was yeah. like, yeah, Cure's the hardest person for me in the group, like, yeah. by far. And he, he knows that he does pretty damn well against him historically. The thing is, I was I was mainly surprised by the fact that Cure was saying that he's scared of his late game as opposed to yeah, the early the way around. Yes. Yeah, because yeah. I, I was thinking like, Clem's the guy that micro is like a, a beast, right? But in these situations, it didn't look like Cure was outgunned at all. And in fact, you saw like in game one, I think, where he had that concave ready, and it was just like, yeah. Clem, don't go, don't oh, go, well. and he just goes in, and then it all went uh, tits up from there on. But like, um, yeah, just uh, good, good understanding from Cure, and the fact that he did go toe to toe with him early on. That was just really nice seeing, not what I expected. I don't think Clem expected that either. No, no. You're so British, Ben. Thank you. So... <laughs> but who would have thought in 2024, TVT is the th quickest match on the schedule? I, I, You know, I didn't really foresee it coming here, Roddy, but that's how this has gone, this one. <laughs> ZVZ might still have something to say yeah, about yeah. it. We did see a 12 pool with some drone pools, right? I mean, we may see a few more very short ones, but you're not wrong, because these Cyclone battles, they snowball like mode tomorrow. Let's talk a little bit backstage as well with Loco. It's funny, because sometimes you have six Cyclones against six Cyclones, and then one guy doesn't win the fight, but he wins with like five Cyclones. Cyclones remaining, and you're like, yeah. I thought we had kind of the same units, but it's just these fights snowball like no tomorrow. The lock-ons, and obviously because the unit moves so quick and is able to lock on over and over again, there's so much micro potential. And if you're in the start of a losing fight, running away from them, it's like, what are you going to run away from? They lock on and they mm -hmm. chase you down. So it is, uh, it is often over very quickly, but great start for Cure. And sure, Cure is maybe the scariest opponent when it comes to the head-to-head, -head, but can we like not make the same mistake as last year and sleep on the Chinese Terran? He's <laughs> kind of good, yeah. had an all right run, last year I believe let's not pretend that he's going to be a pushover because historically his TVT has always been very good especially mm. against foreign Terrans but quite often even against the Korean Terrans as well and he started off all right Oliveira currently he was 2-1 against stats in his first series for this group so let's see how that goes here for the story of group B we're going to go to a short break when we return more from Katowice see you soon Intel Extreme Masters Katowice is brought to you by Monster Energy the United States Air Force, and Intel.
All right, welcome back for Katowice. We are well in the thick of it now here with our matches, and we have got well more rolling on here. But first things first, of course, a huge thank you to some of our other sponsors that are joining us along for this, as we have USR Force. Thank you to them for joining. We have ESL Shop as well, and we have the good old city of Katowice, because seemingly we're going to be here forever, apparently, which is excellent, because it's always lovely to be here in Katowice. For now, though, let's talk to Wardy and Pig about our next match is coming up here we have got Clem again who is now one uh, zero one down even in the group I should say but now he's gonna be going up against stats and Clem in this matchup is fire I don't know why I described it like that I'm not a, like a zoomer but he's really good in the matchup Wardy he, he is really good in the matchup you know there's been no doubts about Clem's TVZ and TVP and there was a point where Clem's TVZ actually dropped off a little bit and we we're like hang on is his TVP his best matchup then his TVZ popped off mm. again but TLDR, if it's not TVT, Tim Clem is looking great. Yep. And he's going to be a massive favorite going into this one. Absolutely. I mean, if you asked me about this fixture, I guess, four or five years ago or something like that, Pig, it's hands down, everybody's looking towards stats as like going to be absolutely dominant in this. But it's completely the opposite way around, right? I mean, when you look at Clem's history in this matchup, especially recently, he loses to two people. One's Max Pax, because Max Pax. And then the other one is actually, a weirdly, Estrella sometimes over in the ESL America's Cups whenever he plays that. But aside from that, he doesn't lose this matchup at the moment. Not really, man. I mean, stats used to be tote slit, but he went to the military and it feels like some of that fire faded away a little bit. I so, hate this. Uh, <laughs> you, know, wait, wait, you, just, you brought this on yourself, mate. I did, um, I did. I'm sorry. What can I say? But, you know, has he has he got back on, on that track? Uh, we'll find out a little bit, of course. I think stats look promising against Oliveira, but Oliveira is a very decisive, hard-hitting and pushing player in PVT, and he was able to roll over him in game three. So I think for stats, the question is what... Clem, is he facing? Figuring that out early is always the biggest part of his element. And that means scouting and getting a read on what Clem's up to. And that's easier said than done. Yeah, true, true. Let's take a look at the verses here and how these guys are going to go head to head with one another here. Clem sitting at what is effectively a 94 on his card. Unfortunately, didn't quite able to transcend above Cure in his previous series. Stats, on the other hand, in terms of his card, where did that disappear to? What's he at? Is he at 70 something? 75. 75. I've actually got it over here. So attack uh, being kind of his lower end of the stats as well as strategy. I think basically that tells you pro gamers don't rate solid, unstoppable, unbreakable defensive macro play. Because what are you talking about? That's not low strategy. He's just he's just awesome. But yeah, obviously defense comes in as his highest stat at 78. It makes perfect sense. Yeah. Uh, he was always the defensive king of just surviving. Very much the opposite of our most recent top Protoss player in Korea, Hero, who's just never played like stats his entire life. Yeah, he's the kind of guy as well as time goes on for stats, he's gonna he's gonna develop. And it was, should usually be quite quick in, in terms of like what stats is capable of. We've seen him in literal BlizzCon finals, for Christ's sake, right? Like he is excellent when it comes to offline, but maybe this might be a little bit of a step too high. <laughs> I mean, you, the problem is, right, you're coming into the biggest stage against one of the hottest players right now. Yeah. It's going to be difficult, you know? And we knew that for stats coming in, right? He's definitely not reached the peak of what he was before. He's shown glimmers of hope of it again, right? Like, mm -hmm. it's there. You can see the play that he once was, but he just needs some more time to get back to fully where he is, especially in a meta, which is so much more difficult, especially that kind of style. It's just difficult to be that defensive macro strategist, right? Yeah. When, yep. when that's just so hard to do, especially when the game just keeps on speeding up year after year. Yeah, the fact that the matchup is now deep and actually some people would argue like it's one of their favorite matchups to watch across the board here, Pink, yeah. means that when you're going up against someone like Clem who has this wealth of experience against the very top Protoss, again, you having to go up against someone like Max Pax, which does take your scalp quite a few times online, but you know, you're getting that practice constantly as Clem. That has got to count for something. 
It definitely does. I mean, you also look back at the history, and they played a lot in 2020 when Clem was kind of coming into his own, yeah. and stats uh, often lost to him. You know, there's three to ones, three to twos. Uh, the famous performance was the Warty TV 25,000 YouTube subs tournament, where uh, Clem actually beat him three to two. <laughs> what? <laughs> Classic. Oh, that one! Oh, sorry, I don't remember that one, James. I completely you've, forgot. You've been gone from the scene for so long. I know, I'm never time. here. <laughs> just bringing up only the relevant games today to make sure the audience is primed, you know, that's very relevant for what's going to happen in this following series. I was going to say, could you tell me about the opening of game two? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you, any other thoughts? Did you memorably remember your own game? I mean, you, you know, I'm quite memorable now that you mention it. Real, uh, that was a real banger of a series. It was 45 minutes only for best of five five games. Oh wow! They were aggressive. You're, you're, yeah. you're I actually do remember it. No. Yeah. Amazing. Okay. Yeah. Great. <laughs> right, we've got Rotterdam here. This is brilliant. Yeah, what can I say? It was very much so not what you expect, right? You expect Stats uh, to go uh, for this big macro game, and he was like a bit cheesy actually. Though. Ah, okay, yeah. okay. So it's memorable. Variety. It's different. <laughs> yeah, from five years ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. Maybe, maybe not as relevant now in uh, today's era as a whole here. But it does kind of put these two in a bit of a weird spot for the group, of course. Obviously, we came into our second series of the day in Group A with both of our players being 0 1. Now, Clem is 0 1 and Stats is 0 1. Going down 0 2 in this group is absolutely not where you want to be, especially when it's two big heavy hitters that you've probably already played. Yeah, it's it's interesting. How do you respond to this high pressure moment? Clem is known for being a little bit more defensive, especially recently. Yeah. And stats, of course, uh, his specialty is defense as well. So, you know, does Clem just bring out some fire, say, no, let's just hold his feet to the fire and, and kind of try to basically overwhelm him mechanically and with the multi-prong? Or do we see Clem play stats at his own game? Because Clem has looked so confident in late game TVP lately. I think he's... For him, it's it's the world is his oyster. All right, well, thank you very much, guys. Time to go over to the stage now here at Intel Extreme Masters Karavica and see if it's a repeat of whatever tournament Pig mentioned. <laughs> Group B has just begun, and both of these players are down by one, looking to pick up a match to keep themselves alive here in Group B. We have, returning to the stage, Clem from Team Liquid, going up against Stats. guy that everyone is talking about coming into this edition of the Intel Extreme Masters Katowice has started off his group run 0 and 1 after losing a TVT against Cure. No reason to panic just yet, but it's safe to say, Ben, that this is now a must-win series. It absolutely is. I mean, Stats is the guy that comes into the group as the massive underdog, which is kind of weird to say when it's a guy like Stats, but no longer is it 2018 where he's making those finals. Went to military, came back, and... You know, I'm, I'm just excited to see what he can do so far. The fact that he took a map off Oliveira and I was watching some of the games, he wasn't looking too shabby, but Clem, he's such a beast at this matchup, Kev. He's talked about it very openly, that he practices against like Max Bax and Hero very, very frequently. Should be fairly decent for him, shouldn't it? Yeah, and of course, this was a group that was relatively easy to prepare for for stats. Not easy when it comes to the level of opponents, but you look at the group and it's like, he's got four Terrans in his group. And then he's got a single Zerg, so a little bit of PvC. But other than that, the man basically could have played for 45 days non-stop PvT. Because it's been a while, stats actually qualified for this edition of the Intel Extreme Masters through the Korean qualifier. And that was just a weird one. We had the Chinese players popping up, like Cyan and Firefly. And the stats kind of just found him himself suddenly in a match where he's like, wait, if I beat SOS, I'm in. It's like stats against SOS for a slot at the Intel Extreme Masters Katowice 2024. What year is it? Yeah, like it's... a truly one of those moments. Mm -hmm. uh, so he had plenty of time. The groups have been released for a little while. I think the players knew a little bit before the audience knew. So he knew that he had to play a lot of PvT. And I'm sure that he has, has, has done that. He has done plenty of games. And then eventually you'll find a few things that you're fond of. Now he can't be the old school stats. Because it's funny, when I just saw him kind of come back again and 
and he played in the WTL Code S for his team, the Africa Freaks, that he's no longer with, but he was back then. In the very beginning, I saw Stats, who had a good start in the early game in the PVZ, and he just sat there on three bases, and I'm like, that's not what we do anymore, mate. Like, you can do this, but it needs to be on four bases. But he went overly defensive on three bases. I was like, you're just going to get overran, my friend. And that's exactly what happened. But then when I fast forward a two months into the future, he did make those adjustments. And he was not just sitting there on three bases. He went up to four bases quickly. And he clearly had adjusted already to the current meta that we are playing. I mean, stats, like, for all intents and purposes, to me, is one of the greatest processes of all time. And I know you like, we can say that, you know, pretty pretty willingly and just throw it out there but there was a time where he was the protoss that everybody looked at as like i love his play he's defensive he's cool he's sharp he's got beautiful micro going up against this man though this is one of the best tvps on the planet off to a bit of a shaky start here and against a veteran like stats but i feel like clem saying welcome back to the big boys over here because yeah it's not going to be easy it is not going to be easy, but I'm sure that those demons are starting to make a little bit of a sound. Those Katowice demons that have been haunting this man over the last few years. Let's see if he can silence them once and for all. In the top right side of Hecate, we are looking at the main base of Team Liquid's Clamp. And spawning over in the bottom left here, as our Blue Protoss wants a finalist here. Finalist in many, many championships. It is none other than Stats. Second PVT that we get to see over here on the mainstream. Earlier today we saw Trigger, who came in with a, I would say, variety of build orders. Even if game one and game two looked similar, they were not similar at all. The two gate blink into a third base is a night and day different build than the four gate blink stock. I mean, you stay on two bases for a whole lot longer. Then, of course, in game three, we saw a Stargate. I have the feeling that Stats is probably going to be a Stargate boy today. Now, I only saw a little bit of that Oliveira series as we were obviously casting and watching other games as well. And I did see him play Blink on Oceanborn, the game that he won. But Clem is incredibly good against 4-gate Blink Stalker. He has played against it time and time and time again. And he has made some very fine adjustments over time where it's like, all right, he used to do a triple mind drop. He's like, no, I can't really do that. Then it's the double mind drop. But then sometimes he was a bit too in the dark. And eventually he kind of settled for one Hellion into a single mine and a single mind drop it may seem underwhelming because what are you going to do with a single mind drop but if the protoss is just out and about on the map in your face with all the units if you show up with that single mine at one meta vac you unload it you burrow on burrow you retarget and i truly believe that clem is the very best in the business when it comes to getting value out of widow mine drops a single mine can truly pick you apart we actually have a bit of a spicy start here man as the ebay block is going to be the opening here for clem Gonna force stats. Stats did not want to pull probes. Chronobus out of settled. Stats will just say, like, I'm just gonna take the third. <laughs> Recently, I played a lot of game myself where this happened, and I took the third. I got obliterated by something. I don't remember the details. Someone in chat said, I feel like I never see a Protoss win if they're forced to take the third as the natural. And I thought about it. I was like, well, that's obviously not true, right? Because sometimes you win. But it does seem that this pretty much always goes terribly wrong for the Protoss. Whether they lose probes in the main or whether they lose probes in the third. And because Stats built that second pylon in his natural, the third pylon is going to be late. You need a shield battery here ASAP. If he does not have a battery by the time those Cyclones are here, this game could be over at minute four and a half. Yeah, I mean, the way that this started, you're totally right. It was kind of interesting. I mean, this Adept could be a little bit annoying, could potentially slow down that CC a little bit, and I think it will do just that. I like the shade away by him already to get on out of there. Oh, in fact, he's going to stick around, maybe. But then you lose it to the Cyclones. Though. Exactly, exactly. I don't think that's really what you want to be doing. We'll get the SAV, so at least he got something out of it. But, ah, you need every unit you can get out of this. And I love how Clem did his SCV scout initially, by the way. He didn't send it down the normal path. He sent it out a little bit earlier to circumvent a probe scout. So then he immediately got the engineering bay but block up without it being spotted. This spells disaster for Stats. Well, Stats knows it, so he goes double battery. I do like that. He goes Oracle, by the way. That's pretty wild because Oracles are not very good in the straight up fight. It may actually be a play for Clem to send these Cyclones into the natural because there's only a single pylon there and there is no shield battery. But yeah, getting these pylons near this bunker, at the Adepts are not that good against Cyclones. Adepts are terrible against the Bunker. What is that Oracle going to do? Are you just going to send it to the other side of the map and hope you can kill a bunch of SCVs? But if Clem just keeps
keeps on building Cyclones, which oh. is what he's currently doing. Stats is in all sorts of trouble, and this is honestly, to me, starting to look like potential game-ending damage over. I, I think it is, Kev. He's not, and I mean, number three and four are going to turn up very soon, and here they are. I think this is going to be one of the fastest games that we've had so far in the main stage, and it is not going to get better before it gets worse, and GG, wowie wow. Four minutes and eight seconds is all it takes for Clem to pick up game number one. A couple of mistakes there by Stats, obviously. You lose the Adept, you say it. As a Protoss, you don't have a lot of units in the early game. A lot of your units have way more HP than the units of Zerg or Terran, but you don't have many units. So if you lose one of them, you already lose like 33% of your army. By the time those first two Cyclones show up, the bunker made it extra annoying. I don't know if an Oracle is the right choice there, and if it is the right choice, then that Oracle needs to fly to the other side of the map, and it needs to just gun down as many SCVs as possible, because an Oracle cannot battle Cyclones. Cyclones are just incredibly good against flying units in low numbers. Yeah, and I mean, like just, just to mention how this game started off, just these small things that Clem did this game, he waited until that probe showed up on the other side of the map, went with the engineering bay block when there wasn't a probe there. And then stats, he goes down, he's like, yeah, I'm gonna take a Nexus now, right? And it's like, no, you absolutely can't. And then he has to build a pile on there, goes over to the third, and then Clem being a little sneaky snake, went and put that bunker at the back there, just cementing his position. Even keeping the SV alive over there too, could repair those cyclones for days as well. Just nice play out of Clem. Yep, and if you guys wonder what should stats have done different, even if you go Stargate, it can be annoying, but Stalkers are just far superior units in these scenarios than Adepts. Stalkers have more range, Stalkers have more damage output, and Stalkers have more HP. So a Stalker can actually just stand there near a battery and fire a shot at a Cyclone, disengage, can fire shots at bunkers and disengage. Like with three Stalkers and let's say a Phoenix, you're totally fine there. Like you can absolutely, your economy is a bit uh, disrupt and it's not going to flow as well as you would like to, but you will definitely not die. Stalkers do not die there. And I know he had one and that one did die, but that's also because you don't have any other stalkers there. The adepts, they didn't do anything, and that was, of course, a micro error on the side of stats. You're not supposed to lose your only stalker there. Even if you have batteries nearby, you still need to be on top of the fact that your batteries have energy. You might have to overcharge it if you're afraid that the damage of the cyclones is too high and you can't make any mistakes against this kit in this matchup. No, and I mean, I didn't even see an overcharge use there either. No, he but didn't. The thing is, even if you do overcharge, the Cyclones just pull back to where that bunker was and you're still in worlds of trouble and getting out the right units. He just wasn't able to at all. I, I didn't even check the Nexus Energy, whether he was lacking it for the uh, overcharge, but we're going to start loading up the second game now, which will be on Oceanborn. And after that kind of opening, well, in Stats' mind, it's like, well, that was about the worst thing that could happen. And hopefully, getting back into it, he's going to feel at least letting the nerves settle a little bit, right? This guy in Twitch chat was right, man. Nobody ever wins if you take your third. He was right the whole time. <laughs> in the bottom right side of Oceanborn, we are looking at the main base of the Frenchman, the guy that everyone is talking about, taking the one lead. Team Liquid's Clem. And spawning over in top left, the blue Protoss, it is stats. Might look at that game and be like, yeah, you know what, maybe Stargate is not the play against Clem, I'm just gonna go Twilight. I don't think he really lost that because he went Stargate, he lost because of the way that we moved our adapts, the way we lost our Stalker, and then maybe that Oracle uh, choice was questionable, and then on top of that, what we did with the Oracle. So I wouldn't hate it if he's really confident with Stargate that he wants to do that again. But I kind of think like he had some success with the Twilight Council on this map against Oliveira. And if you can have success against Oliveira, you should be able to have some success with it against Clem as well. I mean, getting a success against Clem, he's had so much practice against these very aggressive Protosses, right? Like he talked about it in a recent interview. He goes up against Hero very frequently, goes up against Max Max very frequently too. And they are some of the absolute, in fact, both of them are pretty much the best Blink Stalkers, right? So stats, if you, if you know that, and he's obviously done a little bit of homework with this group being four Terrans, you have to kind of take a page out of their book and see what they're doing, but most of the time, Clem is just looking so damn strong in this matchup. Yep. A little while ago, he looked invincible, and it was just trio, trio, trio. Lately, he's actually been dropping more series against some of those pros players, and he's been winning. So he's been far from untouchable, but those are, of course, minor online tournaments, and I know Clem. And some people think that oh, they don't take it that serious. That's not the case. Clem is not going to sign up for a tournament, play for four hours, and then not do his best in the finals. Like Anybody who believes that, in my eyes, is crazy, but it is still a different ballgame. On land, I'll see more pressure. Nerves will come into play, and if you do have one or two things that you truly believe in these are the moments that you bust it out 
But those losses, they still mean something. It, it shows that it is possible because Clem is not going to play for four and a half hours to then not want to win the grand finals. That does not exist. No, absolutely not. I mean, Clem has absolutely kind of grabbed the weeklies as his own kind of thing these days. And having the kind of guys that he has to tango with in them is really cool. Already a very different opener. It'll be a Hellion opener. drop here. You think it will be a Hellion drop? I mean, yeah. that is a prime location for a Starport if I've ever seen one. Does have the reactor already online. Starport coming off over here. And so far, Clem, he's just saying, I'm going to... I'm gonna immediately throw everything that I have at you and just throw you off guard. And so far, a very different build at stats as well. And this is actually very sad for stats because last game he went for those adapts, right? And that was not really the moment to build adapts. This game, he's like, yeah, you know what? I don't believe in adapts. I'm just gonna go for stalkers. But this actually is a moment where you really want an adapt. Imagine if there is one adapt here that's shading into the main base of Clem. All right, Depot gets raised. But what you will see is a factory with a very quick reactor connected to it. And then you can still keep that adapt around long enough to figure out, hey, is it Cyclones or is it Hellions? Now Stats does not know. And if you really don't know that you're playing against a Hellion drop, this could just be terrible, incredibly quick. I'm actually kind of concerned here for uh, Stats because he doesn't know that a four Hellion drop is coming. And I've seen Clem do this build quite a few times. The shield battery is not even going to save you. We do have one battery on the production tab. I'd love to see where that one is being built. It is in the natural, but obviously... Oh, oh okay, he does know that. That's interesting. Can we take a look at Stats' point of view real quick? What did he see? I am surprised that... All right. Barely anything. Like, this is a... Insane soul read. A, a giga forehead read, yeah. yeah. Like, this is absolutely <laughs> insane. And he's here to greet it, but that does not mean the damage will not be done. And he's kind of prioritizing the medevac, which I actually like I out of him. It, yeah. yeah, and get, he's probably still going to lose a good 11 or so probes here. But i got to say, that is a pretty big deal. This could have been a lot worse for him. Yeah, it's still kind of bad, though. If we go for the full wall off and we are about as ready as we could have been ready and we lose eight probes, you're right, it could have been worse. We could have lost 14, sometimes 16, and then it's absolutely game over. This is not something that I think Stats is very happy with. On the other hand, he has some potential right now. He doesn't have to worry about any follow-up aggression. You can ignore those two Hellions, by the way. They're chilling right now on the top side of the map. And there have been a couple of Protoss players that then they warp in Stalkers on the other side of the map. Those two low HP Hellions show up. If they drive into the main, they can still kill additional workers. So that is something to keep in mind. But yeah, with those four Hellions, maybe the tank production is a tiny bit later and maybe Stats can find some success. And let's be honest, he needs success because at the moment it's two base against two base. 40 workers against 41. Not where you want to be as a Protoss. That's an incredibly no. quick Templar archives, by the way. It's incredibly quick, actually. It's almost like shifting oh, no. a gear out of it. And those two Hellions you talked about, first shot's pretty juicy. Second shot, just a couple more probes going down three. I mean, that's value for Clem, because that's what you hope to get out of those last two. But Clem, he was so damn ready for an attack coming his way. I think he started, yeah, salvaging the bunkers, realizing, all right, all right, you're kind of macroing out of this. and. Let's see what you can do with that. And Clem, they're both making a lot of good reads out of one another. Yep, that tank is in a good spot. Four Stark is still going to go for it, though. Four Stark is the magical number. Oh, no, that's a double lock, and this War Prism is in trouble, and oh, I think no. the Prism will go down. Oh. It is a nightmare best of three for Stats so far. Game one was over before it began, and here in game two, he takes a lot of damage after a magical soul read where he had temporary full wall off. But he still lost eight probes. You're like, okay, that's rough. You lose three more. It becomes very rough. It's like, now it's my time, right, to deal damage. And Clem says, nope, there is no such thing as your time. This entire best of three is my time. And well, now we can talk about potential great storms landing, Ben. <laughs> I mean, this is just a series of unfortunate events, quite literally. And, you know, he's boosting that storm out, getting the charge online. Third base later than a Terrans as well. I mean, this is it's just disastrous. I, I, I like the fact that he's going for something a bit crazy, because again, if you're put in that position where it's like, you know, everything's gone terrible, you have to do something a little bit wild to get yourself back in it. Yeah, but Clem is also thinking about that, and that's why he's building a missile turret right now in the natural. He's like, well, what can I still lose to if I'm this far behind? Most of the time, the answer is DTs, so why not make your life a bit easier against DTs? That is not going to be the play. Off stats, there is that Templar archives with Storm. Storm is ready, but even if the storms are massive, like you're going to soften up Marauders, but you don't really kill them. You need something else that's strong that can kind of stand your ground and fight, like an Immortal or two or a Colossus. 
and we don't really have that. The only thing that you can hope for right now is I guess that a couple of storms obliterate every single Marine, and then you have some sick Zealot engagement, but StarCraft 2 is a numbers game quite often, and the numbers are just so far in favor of stats, uh, well, of Clamp, that I'm not even sure if the best possible storms can save stats over here. And the cool thing as well is that Clem is not even moving out with everything. So now stats is gonna still be forced to drop a couple storms and then Clem can just pick up, leave, keep his units safe and enjoying a, and he's enjoying a far superior economy. And that was a really big scan for Clem as well. He got to see that the third base is indeed later than his. He got to see the warp prism there, which, you know, you don't know what's necessarily in it, but you got to see the high Templar sitting at the third base as well. And when you see no Robotech really online in that army, you have to know exactly what's up, don't you? And I think Clem's just doing everything right. Ghost Sky had with me coming online as well. I'm gonna get a storm drop in the natural. That's kind of cool. You don't see storm drops ultra often. He unloads them very early. The storm drops are pretty big. I mean, that's 12 SCVs. And now Clem is probably thinking like, huh, okay, I'm gonna have to step it up a little bit. Let's see if Clem can find some success with his double Widow Mind drop and a crazy amount of defensive mind. So he's not gonna get a move by Zealots. But it is important now for Clem, obviously, that he does do something with that massive advantage that he created for himself. As a Widowmine is going to burrow on the high ground, but there aren't too many probes to kill there. The one in the main has way more potential. It certainly does, and I think retargeting went on six probes going down. So for every little bit of damage that Stats did with those storms, well, Clem got it right back done. And remember, he's wounded from earlier as well. And now, I like the fact that he's sprinkled in these Vikings as well, by the way, because that really hinders this Warp Prism's ability to be there. It might seem silly to go Disruptors here because you already have, like, High Templars with Storm and you don't need double splash damage. But I kind of think that I would like a Disruptor more than I like a Colossus because you mentioned those Vikings that Clem is already building. These Colossus are not going to have any armor upgrades for a long time. The tank count is still there. In a weird way, I think I would have preferred a Disruptor because we need a Hail Mary play. And that Storm Drop in the natural was cool, but it's just that Clem dealt a lot of economic damage early. So if you kill 10 probes over 30 probe economy, that's a monstrous amount. Killing 12 SCVs over Terran on 60 SCVs, yeah, that's kind of annoying for Clem, but he's building three SCVs at a time. He's going to recover from that in no time. And I don't know if Colossus is the ultimate comeback unit. I'll tell you what, though, from how bad this game did look, like the, the 8 and 11 probes going down earlier on into losing your War Prism without doing much at yeah. all, now I look at this, and this could this could be one of those games where it's like, oh, it looks fairly normal-ish. Like, obviously, the Terran's ahead, but all things said and done, Stats is still somewhat alive. I'm just so scared for his army comp. He's morphing in, like, Archons over here, and there's already a good, like, six ghosts on the field. Like, this army plus one weapons on air coming online already. Yeah, this is building a target. and maybe he just wants to sit back forever and make a quick transition into carriers. But I mean, if you're, what would you like to see out of Stats then, Ben? Like out of that Stargate, you mean? Or out of everything. What, uh, what is the army comp that you think he should be heading towards? Honestly, it's going to be really tricky. Like with Clem's army comp that he has here, this is just good against everything that you can make as a Protoss player. This right now, I think spread high Templars, going full old school mm -hmm. Hasselhoff style, with them scattering across the map. Maybe even, maybe even just trying to get some army on the map as well, just to slow down Clem, because he needs time, right? Like. Clem is maxed out right now. The time is not on your side unless you delay, delay, delay. I kind of feel like Tempest could also be a little bit of a play just to keep him away from you and really use the storms and AOE that you have to just keep him at bay. All right, we are going to drop one storm from the high ground and a forward blink is going to soften up some of these Viking stats. Triple Stargate Fleet Beacon, that is a this monster is investment. What I'm incredibly concerned for for stats is that the army may look big, but we're about to look at 2-2 Terran against the Protoss with plus one attack, no armor upgrades. So you have EMPs, Vikings and 2-2 two, two Bio. Uh, as Stats does find a tank there, as Clem left the tank behind, a couple of Zealots distracting him. I mean, all things considered, it's impressive that Stats is making a game out of this, but this is one of these in games and one of these moments where I can hear the voice of Todd in the back of my mind. Look at these supply, you look at it, you're like, the supply doesn't lie. It's like, I think it kind of lies right now, because Clem has a way more powerful army. I tell you what though, everything that you just asked me, like what sh should Clats be doing or let Stats be doing, like what would I be scared of? It's kind of this, like just sprinkling out high Templars, really slowing down the game a bit and just getting stuff done. And the fact is, he's now equal on supply. He's actually got up to this carrier tank now, like three carriers, that is nothing to scoff at. You're absolutely right, because the upgrades are not looking good, but with the amount of splash that he has, all it does <laughs> take is one bad fight to go on. 
as Clemson late game god though in uh, TVP. I mean, his micro is insane when it comes to these fights. It really is. And almost every Protoss will feel that playing as Clem is a nightmare, but you can get the job done. But you get the job done early. When he's on three bases, maybe while he's trying to go up to four bases, a lot of these top tier Protoss players, and Max Beck said it as well, is like, you don't want to play Clem if he gets a five base setup, because at that point, the very best don't know what to do. I mean, Stats believes in the carriers here, and he does have very quick air upgrades, so that's pretty awesome. But Clem is not even really slacking in that department. And yeah, could Clem have closed this out earlier? Absolutely. Could he have gone pedal to the metal and just rally everything to the other side of the map, either storm or two to the face and close out the game? Most likely. But this is not a bad place for Clem to be in at all. If you would ask him before the game started, hey, 30 minutes in, do you want to be maxed out, be ahead in upgrades, and head into Mass Viking, liberated with good arrow upgrades? Clem will take that any day of the week against every single Protoss on the planet, because no one plays out these scenarios better than he does. No, certainly not. That is still a scary Protoss army. There's a lot of Vikings. EMPs are good. The time warp is pretty decent as well. We'll be able to pick off quite a few of these Vikings before they get too much done against the carriers. Storm's decent as well here, Kev. This isn't looking so bad for stats, honestly. That is quite a defense by uh, by the Korean here. That was with battery overcharge and that mothership tanking a lot of shots from those Vikings. That was pretty decent. I don't know if it was a victory because he did lose some expensive units as well. And he's now just trying to build carriers. And carriers can be awesome if you're mining more than the Terran. As we have a triple observer over there in a row. In the bottom left side, stats should probably spread those bad boys out a little bit. Carriers are sick if the Terran is kind of broke. But Clem is not broke at all, and Clem is soon going to produce six Vikings at a time, eight Vikings at a time, and then it becomes so hard to get good fights with your carriers. I'm just a little bit of a believer here, Kev. Like, I looked at this game six minutes in, I'm like, okay, Sass is kind of dead, right? And then nine minutes in, okay, Clem's definitely far ahead. Now I look at it, I'm like, I absolutely see a world where he is more than back in this. Four upgrades mm -hmm. on the go at a time. So he's going to start catching back up on upgrades. The carry count's getting really scary. He's going to have 2-1 on them as well. I mean, it looks good for Stats, all things considered how it started. But I still think that as long as Stats is not on top of the production of Clem, to think that Clem is in trouble would always be a mistake because he's incredibly good with Ghost, Bio, 3-3, Viking, Liberator. Really, no one does it better than Clem. And I think Clem also got rid of some of the Marauders because he was very heavy on the Marauders. But if Stats is just sitting there with carriers, like this may actually be one of the better opportunities that Stats has, right? Where Clem is still working on his Viking count, working on his Liberator count, but he's not quite there yet. The longer it goes, I actually think the better it gets for Clem again because he's so incredibly good in these late-game scenarios. Yeah, it's going to be a lot of kiting with these Vikings against this kind of army, right? Like, those Vikings, they don't want to let all those interceptors out. He doesn't want to take a direct engagement where he can't run away. And right now, Clem, going to go for a little bit of a drop in the north here, going to start denying bases, but Stats is on five bases now. He's gearing up for a sixth as well, which will most likely be halted by Clem, but... Clem's resources are continuously kept low. He's also on two armories himself. He's getting a lot of CCs, getting more nukes online. This is turning into hyper late game here. Yeah, it's actually very cool, right? I didn't think that we were going to get here. We know obviously Stats' his reputation. We spoke about it. One of the best defensive Protoss players of all time. As Clem has unloaded a lot of bio units in the top right, but the entire army of Stats is here. And this is not a fight that I think Clem really wants to take. Sick EMPs though on the Archons. Observer dies. Two out of three Archons fall. All three Archons in the end do manage to go down. Stats may kill this base and he will clean up this army, but it was obviously just a small part of Clem's army. Oh, the Storms though will keep those Vikings at bay and one Storm dealing that much damage. It may not yeah, look like a hell of a lot, but it's something. And the fact that he goes for this kind of recall here keeps that base alive in the north, getting a base. I'm loving how Stats is playing. He's actually playing a really solid PvT. It's kind of like prime Stats, right? If yeah. you just ignore the early game, we're like, oh yeah, this is how Stats likes to play. Obviously, Clem is still kind of getting into the spot that he wants to be. There are 28 Vikings out on the map right now. You mentioned that storm earlier. That was a big deal because you see all these Vikings, they're bruised up a little bit. The key to victory for Stats is indeed spacing out those High Templars. And whenever Clem tries to clump up those Vikings to get a full volley off on the mothership or on the carriers, that's where he wants to land a storm. And even if that storm only connects with the Vikings for like half a second, that'd be massive for Stats. You do that two, three times, and there is no way that Clem wins the fight anymore because these units do not regenerate. He needs to repair them, and you can't really repair them. I think Stats split off the mothership, by the way, and it will be interesting to keep a little eye on that mothership because he could go for a good old 
Rico into the bottom side of the map. Oh. That could be very annoying for Clem. I love what Stats is doing, though. These sprinkling high Templars everywhere, but the carrier's down in the south now, and that base that was very freely mining no longer. Nice little nuke here. Does get quite a few cannons and a high Templar for its troubles. Liberators are online now as well with range, but that is quite the Terran flock over there. Ghosts on the ground as well. They will make short work of these carriers if given the chance. Yep, crazy amounts of Vikings, but Stats is just looking right now not for one fight to stand there. Stats is looking for a little bit of guiding. One storm when you disengage, one storm when you disengage. The biggest thing is obviously the Ghosts and the Liberators. They have one job here, and that is to protect all these Vikings. As long as the Ghosts and the Lips can keep the Vikings safe, Clem is going to be fine. If the Vikings get a bit over eager, they get ahead of themselves, and Stats can clip that army with a storm and do that two times in a row, then maybe Stats can just grab everything and they move. These upgrades are huge, by the way. Plus three on the carriers. I mean, all of them are starting to gear up to three, three upgrades on everything. I mean, it's actually crazy. Clem did a really good job of, like, jump-starting himself on the upgrades as well against this. And look at that. Beautiful EMPs do land on a good chunk of this army. I don't know where the High Templars are. I don't see any purple bars in the mix. Maybe one, one is left over there. Does get back to safety here behind the cannons. And a shield battery overcharge as well. I don't hate it just to regenerate the shields after the EMP. Even if you're not battling, it is worth to start your fight with full shields again. Now, of course, there are plenty of goals, and Clem is probably going to try to put more EMPs. And not a tactical recall. This one used from the Nexus to the top right side. It's kind of cool what Stats is doing, where he says, like, I am not going to run into your Liberators, but Clem is very quick to react to it. Knows exactly where his army is at. And I don't know if this is a fight that Stats really wants to take. And the Liberators are here already. He's going to blink a couple of Stalkers forward. He gets a single lip, and that is about it. I mean, I love the tactical play, right? Just meandering, moving, using the mothership aggressively as well. But this, this is not what you want to look at if you're a Pearls player. And yeah, Kevin, I saw you hide your head away from that because that was going to be juicy for Clem. But Stats does get away to safety again. Really nice use out of all these cannons as well because they're not yeah. easy to engage because Clem is so focused on the anti-air that dealing with the ground here it has to use nukes to do it. Yep, ghosts don't really like to stand there, get in range and tank cannon shots. The Liberators obviously do nothing against cannons. The Vikings are just looking to fight carriers and they will one shot a carrier. Storm does land. I mean, that's minus three carriers incredibly quick. And Clem still has 33 Vikings. That's more than enough to get in range one more time and pick up carriers oh. one by one. And this is kind of what I was expecting. It took a little while to see peak late game TVP out of Clem here. But you look at the army movement here and you're wondering what on earth is Stats supposed to do against it? Stats had a lot of great moves. He had a bad early game. He made Clem work for it. It's almost feels that Clem kind of enjoyed it in the end. He's like, oh, I don't get to play these TVPs very often anymore. They always try to kill me before I get here. And honestly, Clem looks borderline untouchable in these games. Yeah, I mean, he made that look easy, and it's not easy at all. He has to be so careful about all the storms that can potentially land on this army. But he was duking and jiving, even the position as well. These Vikings on that ledge kind of area, so you can't really chase him with ground, even if you wanted to. But stats, all things said and done, he's the one with a bank still. He's still in this, even though the army's ridiculously scary. Mm -hmm. If he does switch to pure ground, those Vikings, they don't want to be fighting against that. Can we take a look at how many gateway stats is currently working with? Because if we want... 13, 13. Is 13 and double robo is definitely not bad. So yeah, there is some potential for it. This is that the Liberators are still very gnarly. The Ghosts are still there as well. And Vikings can, of course, land. Let's not pretend that they will never be useful, right? Like, oh, stats go to Stalker Zealot now. Well, 33 Vikings on the ground, Ben. Also pretty damn good. As stats has run out of detection, all the observers just keep on getting sniped over here. One more Ops flies in range. And Clem is just throwing down scan after scan. All these Vikings have nothing else to shoot at. So these ghosts are just permanently cloaked. And this is honestly very cool what Clem is doing over here. Yeah, and the Vikings, they do eventually land and they do a lot of bonus damage to armor. But more Stalkers coming in the fray here. Clem, he's too much of supply still, but his resource bank is completely gone. And that isn't because he's not macroing or not rich, just because he's producing so many high value units here. And Stas is putting up a damn decent fight. I, what is the resource lost up so neck and neck between them? That's great. Yeah, but Clem has mined so much more, and that makes it less great for Stats, right? If Stats was the one who mined a little bit more than Clem throughout the game, we'd be like, oh, okay. Over the last five to ten minutes, seems that there were some moments where Stats was doing good, because obviously he did have that tactical recall to the bottom, but now Clem is firing on all cylinders again. He is going to be able to spam mules for days. Stats is on top of one of these bases immediately. He absolutely got to give it to our 
I mean, Korean Protoss here. Some would even call oh. him the Protoss Goat as he's in the top right with Stalkers. He's in the bottom side of the Stalkers. And he's really taking advantage of the fact that he's got the slightly more mobile army. The only problem is this army will not disappear, right? So Clem might be out of position once or twice, but it is not going to go anywhere. By the way, I love what Stats is doing here. You see how he's slowly working on these Vikings, hoping that the, gr the anti ground switch is coming online, which it absolutely is for Clem. But he's switching back into carriers now, mm -hmm. which that if you do take out enough of these Vikings and soften them all up, hey, I mean, Clem could actually be in trouble at a switch like that. But I mean, they're both playing phenomenal. Clem has 151 army supply. So even if he has a few too many Vikings or a few too few Vikings, he should always be able to make up for it. Stats has done a good job spreading out these observers and these cannons are still making his life a little bit easier, making it more difficult for a couple of liberators or ghosts to really get on top of a Nexus. And yeah, that's a serious amount of carriers. We're all of a sudden back to seven carriers, I believe. Two more on the way. Might be okay for Clem to repair some of these Vikings, right? Because these Vikings have been battling for a while. You look at the HP on a lot of these guys. Yeah, I think a little repair won't hurt there. Stalkers are not that cheap, by the way. Zealot run by is something you can do forever. Stalker drive-bys yeah, adds up real quick. It certainly does. Like, he's been reliant on the fact that it's been just an air army for a long time, and he's been able to do that, whereas Clem, now he's got a lot of bio on the field as well, but three more carriers coming online. With all that bio, by the way, he can actually start punching through these uh, cannon locations here, which maybe he's thinking of doing pretty soon, but for all intents and purposes, oh. it's a fairly patient game. Oh, 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 is he going to get it? Clip. Bam, saved. <laughs> I saw a disaster scenario there, four observers and a disruptor dying with all these cannons. That did not happen. Uh, kudos to Stat, you can really see that this man absolutely still has it, if he can just find himself in playable spots. And I almost feel that a tiny bit robbed, even though this game is fantastic and it's still going, and there is absolutely a shot that Stats makes something out of it. If he's capable of this with a bad start in a game, imagine what Stats is capable of in this matchup if you give him a good start. Yeah, this is already a way better showing than what I thought you'd have. Like. First game, disaster, second game, started off like a disaster again. I thought it was going to be one of the shortest series we had, but here we are, 24 minutes in. Both players super close to max out or indeed maxed out. How many carriers are on the field now? I mean, the number Nine. 13, 22 Vikings. Remember, they're pretty better than bruised as well. <laughs> Double storm, even though the ghosts already died, but it's all good. Yes, those Vikings are still a little bit low in HP and EMP lands, but the storm does still go off, softening up the ghosts a little. Clem is starting to, I think, realize, like, hey, wait a minute, this is actually getting kind of scary. You, oh, you have money for that? And Stats is like, hell yeah, I've got money for that. So we're going to use the battery overcharge then. Not totally certain what the point is of that one, because there is no army to heal up. Oh, one carrier is all by itself. That's not what you want to do, but the carrier gets saved by the battery there. So it flies back to the cannons as well. And it seems like we're just going to run most of our carriers and our Templars to the bottom side of the map. And then don't forget that Sets can always recall home with that Nexus, because recall is available again. Yeah, I mean, as the map starts getting bigger and bigger, you've got Mothership online along with the Nexus with the recalls and stuff. You can really start bouncing from one side to the other much faster than Terran can in this kind of situation. And right now, Clem still has a good bank to work with. Now he knows exactly what army comp he's up against as well. But Stats isn't giving him too much time to breathe, but that's a lot of medevacs and a lot of bio over here. Like, he won't be able to stick around here for too long, I don't think. Yep, this is also where it gets very scary because Terran doesn't need that many SCVs anymore. They've got all of their production facilities. They've got all of their main bases, all of their upgrades. I have no idea how the Disruptor is sneaking through the cracks. It will eventually get tagged by one of these Marauders and gets picked off. But you're not looking at a clam anymore that's working with 120 or 115 army supply. This is one. 162 army supply of Vikings, Liberators, Ghosts, Marauders, and plenty of Medivacs. This is incredibly hard to battle. It almost feels that standing there and fighting is pointless. Stats needs one of these running fights, right? Or a chaos, a little fight here, a little fight there, with plenty of storms connecting. Clem obviously is just looking for that one big all-out engagement where he can land those EMPs and the Liberators can do their thing. And I mean, these snipes are real damn value here. He even morphed in a lot of Archons here, just to try and deal that AOE damage, but against this many ghosts. How many how many orbitals are on the map as well for a Clem? We have 10. So he's got perma vision all the time on everything. I just see non-stop scans going off and stats right now. He's really mining out what he has. He's so desperate for another base. And Clem, he feels, he feels that Stats is wounded here and hurt. He's gonna start closing in on here. 
Clem definitely does need to respect all these carriers, right? Because he's pretty heavy on the Marauders there. Ghosts can be good from time to time, but are not always going to be that unit that will stay alive forever. If all these carriers are able to deploy their interceptors, and with this Viking count being lower than it previously was, and a lot of these Vikings still being somewhat hurt and bruised from previous fights, instead, Clem looks amazing here, but he needs to still respect the potential of two storms connecting and all the interceptors doing their thing. Absolutely. I'm so sad for stats right now that there's no high templar in sight like but 104 interceptors they can definitely make short work of this army if they're all deployed and a disruptor from north here will get a little bit of a hit here 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 a ghost die but these vikings here comes the dance and they have to avoid these archons avoid the interceptors as much as possible both of them absolutely destroying one another the intercepts they're all deployed though here kev it takes out a lot of the vikings a lot of the liberators as well but clem how many Vikings can he get back online? I think the answer is going to be a lot, eight at a time. Yep, I mean, that was actually a very good fight for Stats. I'm just afraid that he's been losing economically for a little while right now. But he did about as good there as he ever could, even without Storms clipping those Vikings. What he did have for Stalkers pushing those Vikings away. I think one Archon got a shot off, and obviously Vikings like to clump up. Archons deal splash damage. That was a really good fight. It's just not quite enough to keep on pushing. And if he cannot keep on pushing, the next time he's not going to run into 20 Vikings. He's going to run into even more Vikings, and all of them are going to be full on HP. Absolutely. I mean, four Vikings at a time right now. Clem also feeling the heat a little bit here. It's down to 26 SCVs, but as we talked about, it was 10 orbitals online. Sats finally gets another game or another base up and running here, but. He's running dry here, Kev. How long can he withstand the storm that is Clem over here? He's got such a high-tech army just meandering about the map. And it's going to be so difficult for Stats to prevent these Vikings from doing their thing, where they kind of get in range, they fire one full volley of all their missiles, and then they disengage. Stats right now would love another fight where, hey, all my interceptors are deployed, and it's even better when the interceptors are just battling the Vikings, and we don't have to worry about 20 Marines standing underneath, or Liberators aim moving. It's just that Clem does not want to see one of these fights. Clem knows that as long as he's right on the edge, and he can fire some volleys, and he can disengage, that he is going to be absolutely cooking against the Stats, and it's just running low on High Templars, so Stats cannot really rely on the random storm and oh. running away. It kind of feels that Stats is a sitting duck over here. Yeah, the writing's on the wall, as you would say. These Vikings, look, they smell blood in the water over here, and he's picking him apart. Granted, Stats is doing everything he can here. Battery Overcharge will help quite a lot with keeping these Stalkers alive, and he's still trying to get run by damage on the other side of the map, but right now, Clem is just the bigger kid on the playground. Sick game by Stats. His first oh. series did not work out, but he did take a map in of Oliveira. I'm not sure if it's going to happen over here against Clem, as we are still battling, and Interceptors are kind of out. There are 34 Vikings, though. That is an insane amount of Vikings. You can see the High Templars coming in from the left. They are looking for one more storm, and Clem is not going to let that storm connect. The Stalkers blink forward. There are some Marines and Marauders still left on the ground, and Clem is actually forced to run all the way back. The last two High Templars were leading the charge. All the Marauders have died, but the Vikings are going to chase the carriers down one more time. Stats has a little bit of money. I wonder what he's going to do with it. Every stalker counts here. It's just going to be so incredibly hard to ever battle near a planetary. Stats does not have the army to fight planetaries. He does not have the economy to fight planetaries. He certainly doesn't. Nine stalkers here. That's like one of his final warpings here because the gas count for both of them is ridiculously low. We're almost getting to a point here where neither one of them can really get higher than 150 supply with how low the economy is, but well, I mean, what a game out of both these bad boys. Yep, Stalkers are pretty good in some of these scenarios and Stats still splitting up units in the top right side. Like, there definitely is a tiny, tiny chance, but Stats needs to properly babysit every single unit now as EMPs are going to cover the majority of this Protoss army again. There will always be another overcharge. There's also one last disrupt that is going to fire Nova forward. It does not connect with anything. Let's pick up a Liberator. I want to see that fight in the top right side quickly as we split off the carriers. That's a great play because all the Vikings are here in the bottom side of the map. And Clem actually really needs that base. I love this carrier split off by stats. It's super cool. And remember, he can recall out of there. He's seen a group of the Vikings go over there to deal with. But Kevin, this is a full energy nexus over here. Say if he brings those back when the Vikings are halfway. I mean, if he does it right now and it's back over there, perfect player to stats. He's played a great game, mate. Uh, that is actually amazing what stats is doing. 40 probes now against only 15 SCVs. But obviously, there will still be mules for days. And I mentioned the problem of the planetary fortress. That base at the bottom side is a planetary fortress. Stalkers and Zealots don't want to fight near a PF. 
But Clem definitely needs to be cautious. All the Vikings have returned on, and he, I guess he feels that he doesn't have to be all that cautious anymore. 28 Vikings against four carriers. Oy. Even if a storm connects, it should be fine. As that Nova does connect with a couple of the Marauders. And at this point, I do feel that Clem is like, hey, when is this going to end? Do you ever run out of Brodo's units? And I feel like we are close to reaching the tipping point, but Sets is going to activate one more battery overcharge. All the Vikings have landed done. Vikings on the ground do great damage against Zealot and Stalkers, and that will do it. Clem wins after a 33-minute game where he had a very good start. And this really should give people some hope for Stats, because if Stats can do this after a bad start, I said it before, Ben, but imagine if he has an okay start. But what if he has a great start? Because that was some really good late game Protoss play by Stats. That was not easy. And I mean, Clem, the caliber of Protoss players that he dukes out with these days, and then to have Stats bring a totally different style, especially after the bad start that he talked about, went in with the Storm Drops, he bought himself time, scattered the High Templars, got the carriers out, did the switches as well. I mean, after this first little showing here, I, you know, I was all out of hope for Stats in this series, but... I'm very impressed with him, man. Like, a lot of that was really cool. The mothership usage as well. Ah, just very, very cool series. Game 1 was a disaster, and in Game 2 we started off with the semi-soul read, but even then he lost some probes, and he lost the war prison with four stalkers, and we thought, like, all right, he's just gonna get a move. This was obviously a reasonable fight, because he had a battery overcharge, dropped the time warp as well, and especially the way that he rotated his army around the map, and like, from minute 15 to minute 30, with some great tactical recalls, splitting up some zealots and stalkers, like, stats really played a solid game, and he made Clem work for it as hard as any other Protoss player has made Clem work, because normally Clem on five bases, yeah, that's it, that's curtains, it's the game over. Uh, this one, I don't think Clem was in danger of losing it, but I do think that even he was surprised at time to time where, is this getting scary, right? Like, am I a storm away from being in trouble? Am I losing one more base away from being in trouble? Uh, stats displayed some great tricks, and he's absolutely showing us that he's got a chance in this group. He's gonna have to step it up against Bunny, against uh, Cure, of course, as well. It's gonna be awesome. Let's hear from Clem, though, as he's on stage with Rachel. Thank you so much. I am here with Clem, and that first match, so fast, your second match, you started out so strong. Tell me a little bit about what you were thinking as that match dragged on and on, and the supply went back and forth, and did at any point it feel like it might slip away from you? Yeah, I always felt like I was um, ahead all game long, but at some points towards the end, I was like, oh, am I uh, like one or two storms away from being in, in, in big trouble? And uh, it happened really well, um, recalling like left and right, and it was really hard for me to split my army correctly. Um, and in any way, it was a, a pretty close one. I think I probably could have uh, done a bit more early in the game uh, with the lead I, ha I had, but I didn't really realize um, how far ahead I was, I think. So I probably could play a little bit too, too defensive, but um, yeah, that was, that was a close one, and he played really well. And when you think about a game like that, you sit here as the winner. There were a couple of things you say you can work on looking back, but do you ever feel any regret for anything you've done in that match? Um, against stats? Um, I don't really have uh, well, any regrets except maybe playing a bit too defensive the, the last game, but I think the build orders I picked were, were pretty good. So um, uh, in that way, yeah, I, I think I, I played that okay. Well, you've shown us two incredible back-to-back -back series on this stage. I want to know a little bit about how you rallied after your match against Cure. Did that affect you at all? Did you have to restore your uh, your energy? Um, a little bit. Um, I, I was just I was just trying to um, think of like the next match and not really uh, the loss against Cure. But um, yeah, that that third game against Cure was. Um, like one big mistake, losing my, my Ravens, and uh, maybe if that didn't happen, I, I could have held at home, and then I, I probably would have um, been in a, in a slight lead, but um, yeah, TVT can go really fast, and um, one or two mistakes, and yeah, the, the game is pretty over, so um, yeah, I, I was just trying to focus on, on TVP mostly uh, after, that, after that match, and not really think of uh, um, the TVT. Well, you're sitting a strong position here in Group B. You still have Oliveira, Shin, and Bunny to go up against. How are you feeling about how you might come out in this group? Um, I'm going to have to play really well tomorrow. Um, now the next opponents uh, are they are very tough, but um, I'm probably a slight favorite against all of them, I'd say. So um, if I can play good enough, then I have a very good chance. I know there's a lot of Clem fans here in the crowd, so let's share your energy for Clem one more time after that incredible victory. And let's send it back to the studio to take a closer look at his matches.
Yeah, thank you, Rachel. Right, a bit of a Bobby Dazzler in game two here. Stats putting up a bit of a fight, being able to hold out. But you know what? I mean, this series started like that series all the way back where it was that Wardy TV 2.5 million subscriber for YouTube event where Clem won that first game as well. So, you know, it was almost a foregone conclusion here. Wardy Pig. It really was almost a foregone conclusion. That fast first game really bringing back the memories. But then game two... Clem was like, you know what, Stats, we didn't spend enough time with each other back in that 2020 series. Apparently. <laughs> so they went back and forth a little bit, and actually it was a pretty cool game, right? It started off pretty rough for Stats. You know, Clem got into a good position, but really does show you kind of why you can be hopeful about Stats. He's great defensively. He can hold on. He can play into the later game. If he can just get off to a better start, and I think that might be his big struggle in the yeah. next couple of matches as well. I mean, especially in game two, once it did get to that point where it felt yeah. like Stats had a bit of a leg up there, Pig. It doesn't surprise me too much that right now in today's times, he doesn't know exactly how or when to finish it against someone like Clem, who is going to sit back and be able to kind of weather the storm for a little bit there. Yeah, it's difficult when you've got a man that EMPs everything you have the moment it gets anywhere near yeah. him. Um, you've got those ghosts sneaking in, dropping nukes, cloaking and sniping your High Templar. And really it was, you know, one good storm uh, on the army or the carriers launching the interceptors and maybe he could have dragged it back. But it goes to show that Clem's confident at every stage of the game. He wasn't like, oh, I've got to finish this with my advantage. And at the end of the day, he's just scary in that matchup. Yeah, definitely. So for Clem, this is important. Obviously now 1-1 in the group here. Uh, his aspirations, Wardy, looking for uh, well, at least top three, never mind anything beyond that. So still a challenge for him to be able to get that top two, etc. It really comes down to those TVTs, I think, right? I think he is going to feel pretty good against Shin if he doesn't get shaken early. Yeah, yeah. And then obviously Oliveira Bunny, dangerous players, but I think he's good enough to at least win one of those two. If he performs against the Zerg, it's very possible he throws from here on out, but I think really the odds are stacked towards Clem still making it through. Yeah, definitely. All right. Well, thank you very much, gentlemen. It's time for a break here. After that break, we are going to have Kyo versus Shin, which actually, <laughs> coincidentally, is a rematch of Wadi TV Super Championships 2019 South <laughs> Korean Qualifiers number one round of four. Oh. Oh, we'll see you right after this. <laughs> Intel Extreme Masters Katowice is brought to you by Monster Energy, the United States Air Force, and Intel.
We now get to greet to the stage the man that was able to finish the true fourth when it came to Katowice 2023. He, it was difficult for him in that round, of course, as he had to go up against Mero and looked a little lost. But now going up against Cure, let's see how he's going to fare here in 2024. Joining me, ZG, as well as Pig, to talk about this one. Cure's all right so far. Good start for him here in this group. Pig uh, going up against Shin, a.k.a. previously Ragnarok. How do you think he's faring? I think he's got a big favorite, you know, behind him. Obviously, Cure here. But it's kind of cool looking at the history between these two. They first recorded match was actually back in the end of 2015 when uh, Ragnarok back then, now Shin, blocked him from getting into GSL. Hmm. And that was, you know, the early years. Remember when Cure was known as a good online player, a good B-teamer for a while there? But more recently, Cure is just an absolute monster. And he comes in here as a massive favorite. He has won 10 out of the last 11 matches yeah. he played. No, absolutely. It's, uh, it's going to be difficult maybe for Shin, considering Cure looks fantastic against him in previous kind of results as a whole here. Uh, but ZG, when you think about how this is all going to play out, I do think that for Cure right now, what's very important to determine here, or not really so, is that he thinks that Clem was the most difficult matchup in this group. And since he's been able to kind of get over that hurdle so quickly in this group, surely Kyo's coming in with quite a bit of confidence. I think that he should. Uh, I mean, he's got the history. He's got the expectation that he set for himself, apparently. And then also he's got some really standout TVZs to look back on and be like, oh, right, he can be that good. Yes, yes. I mean, he did get second place at Gamers 8, facing, I think, just one of the best Zergs like ever when yeah. Rainer's at that form. Right. But if it wasn't for Rainer being at that form, obviously he would have won. But even beyond that, I think he would have been the talk of the town because he was playing spectacular StarCraft and not just the kind of like, oh, like humdrum, he pushed and kind of did the thing. <laughs> like he was actually like looking as fast as Clem in some of those games. Yeah. And it was only because Rainer was so freaking on point that it defeated him. So when you look at Shin up against Cure, you're once again being like, well, Shin can be an aggressive guy. And so maybe like a couple of cheeky all-ins or like your low drone counts can really catch the guy off. But overall, this is just one hell of a tight matchup for Shin. Kyo should be locked in. Yeah, here. It, it does make you wonder how much for Shin is kind of almost that mental game again, right? If you think about the match that I referenced with him against Maru, of course, like that kind of result between those two pig was very heavily one-sided to Maru. Even in practice games, it was always going Maru's way. But yeah. It being so lopsided for Cure here as well, can Shin get over a mental game like that is difficult. It's always weird because I feel like every single Korean Terran especially plays very different against Shin. Yeah. Because they know he's capable of just going for the throat. He's got very powerful time attacks, very powerful all-ins. Sometimes there is a meta that develops where you end up seeing the player, in this case Cure, playing very defensively, super safe, and really just trying to turtle it to late game. And if that's the case, Shin needs to take advantage. He basically needs to run away with the economy himself, push his greed, hit something like a very sharp Broodlord timing to try and take advantage of that. So mm. there's going to be a lot about reading. Is Cure playing stock standard Terran versus Zerg? Are we going to see Marines and tanks pushing in? If so, it's going to be a more standard game. But I would actually tend towards thinking it's going to be a turtle play from Cure. Don't give any chances. Get to late game, and you're going to feel more confident there. I was I was kind of thought about uh, Cure as the guy that likes to go for the double prong drops and trying to go yeah. for that. But I mean, you can at least still put a turtle behind that, right? And kind of make that happen. I mean, Shin comes off the back of losing, unfortunately, to Bunny uh, with that in a 2-1 series where Bunny was able to be victorious. So for Shin, it's very important a series here to not go 0-2 down in this group, which has got some heavy hitters in it. But again, going up against Cure, oof, that's tough. Yeah, I mean, this is unfortunate for Shin to be in a group where he has four Terrans, because initially you look at it and you're like, well, he has a matchup to practice, doesn't he? But then he starts losing against them. And they're really good. Terrans. Yeah, and it's it's not really <laughs> like it gets any easier. Arguably, yeah. the easiest is Oliveira, but even then, not really. So, like, I mean, Shin really has to be trying to come up with all different types of strategies. So maybe trying to, you know, go for like a late game timing is absolutely the case. Mm -hmm. We've been seeing more like 60 ish, like, like Ling Bailing all ins, basically, 60 ish yeah. drones, that is. And so maybe that could work, but I do expect Cure to play stock standard. And then I actually am thinking that he's going to win with a mid game push. They didn't necessarily expect to win. Mm. But I mean, I, I'm kind of coming in here as the one who's never really been a big believer in Shin, even last Katowice, basically I was like, okay, 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 I'm proven wrong, I'm proven wrong. And then he did have that semifinals, which wasn't great. But um, he's once again coming in as the guy that needs to prove himself.
himself compared to everyone else who has all of these other tournaments throughout the year. Yeah. That's really yeah. highlighting their skill. Well, I, to me, he surpassed expectations last year. So let's see if he can do that again here. Uh, thank you very much to the desk. It's time to head on over to the stage. Thank you so much. Both of these players have come so close to victory recently, they could taste it. Cure finishing third, fourth at DreamHack Atlanta, ESL SC2 Masters Winter. And of course, Shin coming in third, fourth at IEM Katowice last year. Both with so much to fight for here. Cure coming in hot off a win over Clem. And Shin coming in with something to prove after 1-2 against Bunny. Please welcome to the stage from Team Liquid, Cure. And from Mystery Gaming, Shin. It is time for our next best of three series here in game number, or sorry, day number one of I am Kodo Pizza. My name is Loco. I'm joined here by Demu. Demu, how are you doing? I mean, I'm doing great. Honestly, like casting that last series between Stats and Clem, I really thought Stats was getting bonked, but holy yep. crap, he just played an absolute phenomenal game too. Really impressive to see. Cure is looking pretty feisty. He says he's already got his hardest opponent out of the way, mm -hmm. and he's a master of TVZ. He really is. He's one of those guys that when you watch him play, it's not necessarily the speed that really blows you away. It's just all the positioning and stuff. Like, he was one of the first guys that was really utilizing that Marine spread, having a tank in a little nook, and then having it surrounded by Hellbats. He's so good about that kind of play that makes it so difficult for Zerg players. And he's never just doing one thing at a time. You can guarantee that there's a drop going on elsewhere. He makes it very difficult for even the best of Zerg players out there. Yeah, absolutely. He's capable of a wide variety of play styles too, right? I remember about a month or two ago, he was playing a lot of very passive games to the point where I'm like, Come on, Kier. Maybe make a bit of a move, uh, move out every once in a while, but he's been mixing it up once again as of late, just experimenting with that more passive style that we saw, for example, Maru and also Clem play quite a bit. So I'm excited to see what he brings right here against Shin. I mean, Shin, of course, yeah, not necessarily the biggest fan of playing the late game, but we saw him do that earlier against Bunny, and he looked very strong there. But there's always a moment for Shin where you're like, okay, don't attack that, don't attack that, yeah. don't do it, and then... He does it every time. Like, you know that it's going to happen. And Pig talked about it. He's an explosive player. He likes to be in the face, likes to be dealing damage. Sometimes has, like, those lower drone count games. So, to some degree, plays a little bit like Dark sometimes because he also likes those kind of chaotic games. Yep. But you know with Dark, there's always a follow-up of what can come after. With Shin, it's a lot about weathering the storm that he brings to you right there and then. Absolutely. So, players are getting ready in the lobby right now. We are already... Uh... Yeah, prepared to go here ourselves. So as soon as the players give the go ahead, we will be loading into game number one. This is an important match though, especially for Shin. I mean, Cure so far looking solid in this group. This is a group where Clem is also present and I think everybody is assuming that he is gonna be making it out as well. So yeah, it's important right here for Shin that he gets a couple wins. I mean, it's, it's day one, right? Like the tournament's just begun for these players, but the amount of prep that they've been doing for this tournament, it's been going on for weeks and weeks, if not longer for some. Uh, but anyway, getting on into it straight away. Cure on the left. Shin on the right and spawning over here on Solaris to get things going. It is Team Liquid's Cure. And his opponent all the way in the upper right hand corner, it's Shin. For a while, I felt that Cure kind of suffered from that idea that he was a bit predictable at times, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, I, I really felt that he was very good at the meticulous, very, very standard Terran plays. Like, I would watch some of the greats, like the Marus in the world, the Beyonds, but it's like, I can't really replicate this. But with Cure, I was like, oh, I love this, uh, what, what he does, you know? He's just very smart about how he approaches the game. But recently, 
in quite a lot of his matchups, he's been really spicing things up. So uh, we even got to see that against uh, Clem a little bit. He was risky with a reactor build early on. Then he was like, okay, I've got a barracks on the map. I've seen far more two racks out of him recently in TVTs as well. And here to start things off against Shin, we've got a two racks on the low ground going for that Reaper build. Yeah, absolutely. This is a build that Bjorn popularized some time ago. These days we see anywhere between two to five Reapers or so. Generally speaking, it's three, but it depends on what the Terran players are feeling like and how much damage they actually get done. We'll have to see if, for example, Shin decides to go for a quick third hatchery here, at which point you may just be able to get away with only two of them. But this is a, an opener that can usually keep you safe while also getting a, a solid economy on the back of it. Yeah, and it's one of those where you really get to dictate the pace of the game right from the get-go as well. Like, you get to delay the third a little bit, force out a few extra lings than the Zerg probably wants to make, and every Zerg on the planet at a high level is practiced against this sort of thing. Having a little uh, a little self-neck massage going on <laughs> over there uh, as he's tapping that keyboard. But I like this for an opening in general. It just allows you to play the game that you've practiced and not so much your opponent. Yeah, absolutely. You get some nice follow-up scouts as well. So if Shin decides to get aggressive with, say, Roaches a little bit later on into the game, Kira will usually have at least one Reaper remaining to get some follow-up scouts in. And until Link Speed is done, you can put in quite a bit of work. And obviously at this point, well, Zerk Link Speed hasn't even started yet. First Reaper going straight towards the natural expansion. At this point, Shin is making six Zerklings in total, but soon, right now, yeah, he'll figure out exactly what he's playing against. Absolutely. He did get to spot th with the Overlord as well, directly across the map. Very safe for the time being as well. Second gas going up at home, quite early for Cure, so not like a gigafast 3cc uh, to get things going. But yeah, I'm already going to be interested. Oh, one drone! Ah, that's not what you want. A lot of Zerg oh. players these days, they're very quick with the Spore Crawler making, but Shin there suffering a well, first blood of the match. Yeah, sometimes you run out of minerals for just a moment, but Shin had about 150 there, so I guess he was just a little bit slow on the keyboard, and that's not a great sign. If anything, it's a mental hit. Now the Queen is also taking a lot of damage. Shin is getting a lot of gas behind this, by the way. Yeah. Like, very often you take guys off gas, so a Baneling Nest is his answer to this. That, to me, spells that Shin does not like to be put in the corner. And he wants to go, go, go with something maybe a little bit crazy. And if you do play against Shin, you have to know that this is a possibility, that he, he doesn't want to be kept at bay. So Zerklings are misplaced? waiting on the high ground. Yeah, it's misplaced. So he actually counseled a queen to be able to go for this third base. This third, though, is really just here for larva production. He's going to go for a bailing bust right here in game number one of this series. Not a strategy we see very often in 2024. At this point, Link Speed is done. So what does Terran do? He brings most of the Reapers back home. Does he have any clue about what's happening? I don't think he does at all. And all those add-ons are exposed on the outside as well. So even if you don't break through the depot and kill your opponent oh. right there and then, and Cyclone's first unit of choice as well. I mean, yeah. obviously they can move and shoot, which is great, but Shin just checking things out. But so far, this is a billion percent unscouted. Three CC on the way for Cure as well. And the first two Cyclones... Oh, no, no, no! He lifts up, he knows what he's against. Nice grenades over there. <laughs> well, they like cross that little wall off. I mean, that Stimpak upgrade is never going to finish. The question is, how much damage is Shin going to be able to do? And I think at this point, he's in so much trouble. Cure, that is. Uh, both of the Cyclones end up getting surrounded, and I think that's pretty much it. That is pretty much it. And Cure's little face over there in the camera. Saw him biting his lip, but he looks so calm right there while he's absolutely getting murdered in game. Right now, trying to keep all his SCVs alive. There is one Bailey left in the mix, and that guy has a mission, and boom, he did just that. Takes out a lot of SCVs, and GG, GG wow. Last two stage matches with a very, very explosive game one. I like how we're discussing mid-game timing attacks, late game, and all the other strategies that we've been seeing a lot as of late, but this is a build order straight from 2010, right? Nothing all too spicy, nothing all too crazy. This is essentially the first Zerk all-in we ever saw. Yeah, I remember Demaga doing it to me, yeah. like the first time <laughs> it was ever done kind of thing, long, long, long time ago. But yeah, this was this was just brutal. Cure had no idea. Obviously. I like how that bailing turned around to still go into the depot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he was like, hey, I've, I've got a mission. And then that's blowing this bad boy up. But yeah, very, very cool, sharp opening by Shin. And you know, it's not super often done. Like very often the Zerg kind of, you know, recedes and it's like, all right, I'm going to be a punching bag for a little bit. I'm going to get my third up a little bit later than I'd like. But Shin was just, he was not about that life. And that that misplaced third that you were absolutely right. It's never, ever going to be used. And look at Shin, that little cheeky chappy. Yeah, <laughs> not as well. He's happy with himself. 
Yeah, that is not a, a build order you're going to be able to bring out twice in a series, I don't think. But at the very least, that's a quick 1-0 lead right here in this best of three. Yeah, Kieran, not all too happy with that, right? It's one of those things where you could have scouted it, but you have to sacrifice your Reapers for it, which makes the follow-up harassment from Terran so much weaker. But he didn't even really see the third. He never saw the main base. I guess he just got a bit too greedy. It's one of those things that's kind of tricky. Like, with those three Reapers early on, you can bounce into the main at some point and just be like, hey, you're still mining gas? Because if you're mining a lot of gas, you get to click on the extractor, see what's actually going down. You could be like, all right, there's quite a few things I have to worry about here. But there was none of that. And then the fact that this map, there's speed zones in the middle, there's not that many ledges to jump up in the middle. He was like, okay, I'm going to be safe with my Reapers because... I'm not going to lose to anything, right? And then it was like, <laughs> hold on a minute. <laughs> um, but I, I guess, like, if I'm being very critical of him, having at least one Reaper out and about just to spot things, because from that point on, it's not as if you really need to keep them alive. He just sent them completely back home. So definitely uh, dropped the ball a little bit there. And yeah, he, he absolutely got bit in the butt. Yeah, making assumptions about what the Zerg normally do in that situation. And Ultimately, that's gonna give Shin a nice little advantage. Well, game number two, we find ourselves on the map Alcyone. Bottom left hand corner, it's Kjart. <laughs> and spawning over in the top right, representing Mystery Gaming, it is Shin. Bringing quite a bit of heat in game one here. And Cure looks like he's opting for something so far fairly similar. Yeah. It has to be said that on this map in particular, there's definitely a few spots where you can hunt overlords as they cross across the map fairly often with a forward barracks like this. But all things said and done, I think it's most likely he's going to go for that Reaper opening again. Yeah, we have that little overlord meta in the game too, right? Where Zerg players purposely start scouting in different ways just to try and dodge any of those marine snipes. Nah, it's going to be a double barrack start here once again. So Kiara apparently, well, we'll have to see what he decides to switch up because I can imagine that Chin right now, when he sees what he's going up against, he may just he may just go for it again. I mean, he, first this time, but. He's, he's the kind of guy that absolutely would. I wouldn't put it past him at all. Yeah. Like, Shin is one of those players, I remember back in the day when Cabal used to make those first-person view videos, like with the keyboards and stuff, Yeah. Uh, back when he was called Ragnarok. Shin is incredibly fast, like really fast. So. You know, you can't let him just run away with the game or anything, but when it comes to both these players heading into the mid and late game, like, Cure is the guy that I favor. So him going for a risky build like he did in game one, definitely interesting by him. <laughs> Here's some of that APM you were talking about. First person view of what this uh, Shin's personal view right here. So that's him making Zerklings and drones for the most part. Re-rallying a bunch of times just to get the, the hands nice and warm. These links are going to be able to go across the map, though, in a path that the Reapers will not scout. So the Reapers, they are going to be running across the map momentarily. There we go. That's the first one. And Ragnarok now knows what he's playing against, sir. Shit now knows what he's playing against. This is one thing that Terrans, when they do open two racks Reaper, don't mind going up against. It's like, you get that CC up, you've got a wall going down over there. Worst case scenario, you bring one of your Reapers home kind of thing. The thing is, this build from Zerg also allows a lot of aggressive possibilities afterwards. You can get like a early Roach Warrens and things like that, and it can be a, a real bundle. But this game, Cure heads immediately into this main base, and he's like, Oh, okay, okay. So what's going on here? You've already got a queen out way earlier than you should. And now he's going to keep these Reapers back at home, most likely realizing that something's up. I think he's going to be able to kill the Overlord as well. He's going for a Marine right now. Yeah, you can lift off one of those barracks, although the Zerklings are waiting. This is Shin trying to get lucky. It's not going to happen, and that's going to cost him quite a bit. A lot of those Zerklings will end up going down. Command Center, of course, on the back of this. Shin trying to catch up in that worker count. But this is a little bit of that early game rock, paper, scissors, right? You have to make a choice as to what sort of strategy you want to play. If this would have been a Command Center first, for example, which is a build we see all the time, especially in tournament play, Cure would have been in a world of trouble. Absolutely. Like, it's it's the same opening from Cure, but he's dealt with everything differently. Like, going to that main base, he got to know that it was a pool first, late gas and all that, got to see the queen out was early. So there's a lot of information that he just picked up from 
dealing with it differently and what he did with his Reapers initially. And here, we'll get confirmation of what's actually going on in this oh, game. Oh, no. He's all the Reapers <laughs> alive as well. Nice play. I actually thought that accidentally with that first grenade, he put the queen in such a position that she was going to be able to get the final hit in. But luckily for him, there was another grenade putting her back up in the air. That, that would have been brutal. And right now, obviously, a far better opening for Cure, right? Like, he's, he's not taking damage from that pool first. Shin, you kind of wound yourself a little bit to get stuff done. And we've got to also point out Alcyone was Cure's map pick here in this best of three. So he's obviously a guy that likes to play on this map. Zergs, they have to play on this map in this kind of map pool against Terrans, but mm -hmm. yeah, just a cool start so far. So going into Reacted Hellions afterwards, that will permanently grant him quite a bit of map control. It's hard to deal with three Reapers and Hellions, and then a Liberator as well. I like everything that he's showing. Yeah, I think the Liberator makes a lot of sense here. Sometimes the Banshee can be a little bit risky, right? Because, I mean, it, it can be a little bit expensive, I suppose. If you skip it, uh, the Banshee, that is, against a normal Zerg opener, you can be against, for example, a bunch of Roaches, you can be in quite a, quite a bit of trouble. But in this particular instance, with this opener here from Shin, the odds of him going Roaches are pretty much zero as far as like a timing attack goes. So going just straight up into the Liberator makes a lot of sense. Shin, uh, yeah, he's going to have to play very defensively here while Terran is just simply building up their eco. I like this, by the way, from Cure. Like, I'm the kind of guy that I'd have sent my Liberator over there just to get the Overlord kill for sure. But he's like, you know what? Let's keep that private for now. I've had Vision on the middle tower for a long time. I do have a little squad in the north to clear up creep or cause some uh, comeuppance. But Shin, with decent scouting, decent placed Overlords, does get to spot that. And Cure, as a result, will change the path as well of that Liberator. Right now, Cure is going to be testing Shin at every possibility here, just trying to deal a little bit of damage. And I mean, this isn't a one-two punch from him. Like he's got Stim done, double medevacs as well online. It's just a very clean macro build. Yeah, we're gonna go double evolution chamber here together with a Baneling Nest before the lair. So yeah, exactly. We do start up the lair here eventually. The thing is, of course, that Baneling Speed is now going to be relatively late, all things considered. Oh. And the upgrades are also not all too early. Now, this is a nice snipe, though. Getting that? Okay, he's not going to be able to get the kill, it seems, but just weakening it here is going to make it much harder for Cure to get anything done. That's, that's a big deal, actually, like getting that amount of damage done on it. I mean, those might be his Creep Spread Queens, so it might slow down that, but now you can just kind of leave two Queens in your main, and that's exactly what he does. He's like, hey, you're not getting out of here, mate. And uh, I like so far how Shin's been handling a lot of this because it wasn't the oh. easiest opening to get out of. Okay. He could have probably sniped his base right away, but it's just barely outside of the vision range of those Hellions and those Reapers. Yeah, he just <laughs> barely doesn't see it. There's, in the meantime, yeah, push over here on the right side of the map too. So he knew that there was going to be a fourth base. It was either going to be at three o'clock or over, well, where it's at right now. He could have probably canceled both. Luckily, Shin here, he managed to get away with it. So far, Cure's doing a decent job though. Five drones, getting out with those medevacs as well. And he's got that Liberator in the back of the base, just acting kind of like an Oracle here, where it's like, you have to respect it. So far, these Hellions and Reapers, they've been very non-committal, right? Like they've just been on the map, dealing with a few crews now, which is nice. Three bases up and running for both of them. Drone count not too scary yet though from Shin, but he is trying to oh, he gets make something happen. Oh, he gets a surround yeah, on all of those units. Medevec goes down too. That's super painful though for the Terran because you're really playing that tempo game here. Now, of course, Terrans will be more than happy to play that long drawn out macro match if they really need to, but usually that's like a second choice, right? You only really go into that if you absolutely need to. In this case, yeah, I think Cure doesn't really have much of a choice. No, he really doesn't. like. Getting that shut down, that is your middle map control. Like, he, I think he's still just got a Reaper situated on that tower, so he can see if something does move out. But for the foreseeable future, this is just going to be about Shin trying to get that creep going and trying to reduce the amount of damage that he can take. And he's been very good about his upgrades here, Loka. I saw as soon as that plus one finished, it was like, oh. boom, plus two attack. So these pushes over here from the Terran, though, are not really allowed to do this much damage. Getting a queen already, creep threat's still not really going in that direction of the map yet either. It is, by the way, going to be Hydraling Bane right here for Shin. So nothing all too fancy. None of that mass Hydra style that we saw from Scarlet earlier today as well. She basically ended up just playing mass Hydra on this map. Uh, yeah, I, that was... <laughs> I was talking to the Seltzer in the uh, green room. I was like, yeah, this is pretty weird. Like, this is very weird. But the fact <laughs> that she got allowed to get away with that. Yeah. Okay, okay. So this is three extra barracks. So going up to eight barracks here is Cure. This could be some very old school-esque style where you're just going pure bio tank and just kind of marching across the map. Nice little snipes here for his trouble. And he will start trying to deny this creep because it's getting very, 
very far across the map here. Absolutely. Still one Medivac here on the right side of the map. That one's been hanging out for a little, a little while. I think the Liberator, by the way, must have gone down eventually. Oh, no, it's still alive. Oh, it's still there. Still Can't even see it on the minimap, man. <laughs> I'm, I'm actually thinking that Cure's getting to a point where he's like, you know what? Maybe minute 15 is when I'm eventually going to use that. Because you know, forgot about it by then, right? And I mean, honestly, that kind of thing, if you sync it up with attacks that are happening, because yeah. I see a big blob of red in the middle, on the bottom right, in the top left, very, very far away. Like, Cure's setting himself up for a lot of potential to deal damage here, and maybe that's going to be his time strike with the Liber Liberator as well. Drilling Claws coming up right now as well for the Terran player. That's going to give him some nice speed improvements for his Widow Mines. There's the Infestation Pit as well. So do you think we're going to see Lurker play here from Shin? Or? I mean, a, a lot of Zergs, they can go into Lurker, but they're more often just going for the Hydroling Bane comp and then surviving and maybe killing the opponent. I know that Shin isn't a guy that chooses to go into the late game. Getting those Hive upgrades is a really big deal, but... Now, Shin is feeling comfortable oh. to get on the map. Won't get that kill. There are fights happening here, there, and everywhere now. Yeah, a couple of the Banelings there did connect with some of that bio army, but luckily Oi. picked up on it. Loses one of the Medivacs over here in the meantime. Planetary Fortress, I think this is the first time that the fourth base gets spotted. Fifth Command Center over here too. This could actually be a very juicy target for Shin. He's gonna commit to it. This is expensive for the Zerg, but if he can get both bases, Oi. it'll be massive. That's a massive kill. No cancel either on that CC. And Shin, he's running away with this game, man. Like these tanks, there's one situation on that high ground over wow. there, but Cure is getting absolutely torn a new one over here. I mean, this is so much Zerg absolutely everywhere, and he should have been fully aware of how Shin plays the game. He is not being allowed to breathe, and I feel he's got him massively on the ropes. That is so many Banelings just marching up this ramp right now. Now, by the way, the Hive starts up in the middle of this engagement, so Shin is happy to continue playing. I guess this was mostly just him testing the waters, and he found a very vulnerable base. More than 50 SCVs go down in just a matter of seconds. And I think if Shin just sends all of his reinforcements over here, he may just be able to obtain the victory right here and right now. What just happened? Like, Kyo was not ready for this at all. And he saw that army moving out to the south side of the map, going to his fourth base. Like, this is not the cure that we usually see in this matchup. And Shin, he's just looked better. Yeah. He was struggling against Bunny on this exact same map not that long ago. And in my mind, Cure is a, a little bit stronger in this matchup than Bunny overall. Okay, now that would mind did end up killing about as much Terran as it killed Zerg. Uh, at this point, Cure essentially has to win the game with this army, right? But how in the world are you going to fight Baneling's own creep? It's going to be very difficult. I mean, this just shows how much Shin committed to that attack. The fact that he's not, like, remaxing <laughs> very quickly. The Liberator, by the way, went down. Finally, finally went down. But Shin, he's fairly well off after this. 83 drones is a pretty damn solid number. Getting the plus three carapace as well. By the time that comes online and adrenal glands and stuff, Cure, he's not going to be a hang on. This is a nice little body block with those Marauders stopping the bleed to some degree, but... It's 29 uh, SCVs, man. What are yeah. you going to do with 29 SCVs? We only have three command centers here as well in total. He's got those eight racks still, so I guess he can try and go for an all-in. Generally, I don't like the timing of this Lurker then very much, but I think in this game it's very clever. As long as Shin just holds whatever attack is coming next, he's going to be uh, in a game-winning position, right? So I, I don't see how... Cure is ever going to be able. To... Oh, uh, <laughs> I don't see how Cure is ever going to be able to get a counter against Lurkers out. I'm looking at supplies now. Like Cure is catching up somewhat, which yeah. is his army's big. It's really weird to say. Like that just shows how much Shin committed to those attacks. Like that was a lot of banelings that he really wanted the game over right there and then. But now he's got to work to kill him a little bit, but. I feel he's got the tools to do so because he smells blood in the water here, Loco. And I mean, Cure, he does not want to be sat defending against this. This is a fairly small ragtag army over here. And Shin, look, he's got even <laughs> more on the defense and 13 yeah. lurkers. 13 lurkers. He's just slowly getting all the upgrades, using those Zerklings to buy himself a bit of time. As long as Terran doesn't get a fourth base up and running and Cure is not even remotely close to that, I, I don't see how he's going to be able to contest Shin in the late game. So I, I think Cure has to commit. Now, obviously, he doesn't know that Lurkers are just about to come out because he's been dropping mules. But I think that, that window may have just passed, right? Like, how in the world is he going to fight this? 
I mean, those are GG lurkers, you know, like as soon as they come on the screen and they burrow in his face, I even getting a Nidus oh. here. This is this is Shin hitting his comfort zone, you know, like this is an army that requires a lot of precision, the correct units to deal with. And look at that, <laughs> that that you don't deal with with just pure bio unless you make a grave, grave error. But he's getting ready for a pretty damn sick concave over here. And that is one thing that can maybe bind him. But remember, he doesn't have orbitals for days. And there's even oh. units coming in from the south here. But oh. <laughs> I mean, that is a sick concave by Cure, but it's just not enough. There's too much damage. and. My goodness, Shin, they with a surprise upset over here, taking out Cure, and that is the most meager fist bump of all time, but that keeps Shin's chances alive in this group. Very surprisingly so. Absolutely, yeah. Catching his opponent off guard with a big attack down south, killing two bases there, and that ultimately sealed the deal. Cure was just completely out of position. Those are mistakes that can accidentally happen, right? But there really shouldn't be at this level of StarCraft 2. Well, you can see what happens as a follow-up. Shin immediately, immediately grabs the lead. And he certainly does. And I mean, uh, this this was rough. This was really a rough start. I mean, even going for the Cyclones first as well, not Hellions. I mean, you saw how easily these Lings dealt with them, dealt with everything, actually. Like, game one, absolute disaster for Cure. Nice play out of Shin. And Cure with just too little scouting information. He had no idea what was happening. Absolutely. Just a classic bailing bust right here against the Triple Reaper opener. Something that is relatively easy to hold when you know it's coming, but if you have no clue, well, that becomes a bit more difficult. Bix around here. These units that you just saw going down right there that got surrounded by the Lynx, usually those would have been parked either over at the third or the fourth base. So maybe they were the defensive squad that Cure was missing. I mean, everything we were just looking at there was Cure getting bopped, you know? Like, his army wasn't picking up, it wasn't moving. You see top-level Terrans, like, Bailings don't connect with Bio on the map in here. Not cancelling that base, not being there with anything to greet that army either when you knew it was coming. This just... This was Cure looking less than his usual self, which is kind of surprising given that he just beat Clem. But luckily, luckily, he's 1-1 one, one in the group for him, and he will have games later on as well. But we're going to get to hear an interview from the winner over on the stage. Thank you so much, Shin. An impressive victory. 2-0 against Cure. After Cure's victory over Clem, Cure looked like potentially the strongest player in the group. But you made short work of him. So tell me, what kind of preparation went into this matchup to allow you to do what you did? 어 일단 신이머 선수 승리 축하드리고요. 어 일단은 클램 선수까지 꺾으면서 되게 기세가 올랐던 이제 김. 아, 예, 김도욱 선수였는데, 예, 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 예. 아, 예. 갑자기 놀랬어요. 예, 그 그래서 이제 그런 조일이가 거의 좀 유력하다고 좀 평가받을 정도로 되게 김도욱 선수의 기세가 좋았는데, 어, 김도욱 선수를 또 쉽게 2대 0으로 꺾으셨습니다. 어떻게 준비를 하셨나요? 어, 일단 투병 형 사신 플레이에 대해서 도욱 형이 할 거라고 생각을 했고요. 그 다음에 그거를 이제 어떻게 카운터 칠지 고민을 했는데 그걸 원래 재선이 형한테 하려고 했는데 재선이 형이 안 하는 바람에 도욱이 형한테 쓰게 됐어요. 근데 그게 되게 좋았던 것 같아요. So uh, I once prepared for build against Bunny, but actually Bunny didn't fall for my plan. So uh, actually uh, instead I intended to use it on Cure, but actually it worked really well on Cure. So I think that's got a lead on him. After coming so close to the championship last year at IAM Katowice, are you hungrier than you think any other player at this tournament might be for this victory? 아무래도 작년에 또 이제 4강까지 가셨기 때문에 또 올해는 더 좋은 성적을 내고 싶으실 텐데 어 어디까지 더 가고 싶으신가요? 더 욕심이 있으신가요? 일단 제가 작년에 IAM 카토비체 이후에 너무 못해 가지고 사실 오프라인 경기를 많이 못 했는데 어 방금 하니까 그냥 너무 좋았어요. 뭔가 집중도 너무 잘 되고 좀 많이 그리웠던 것 같아요. 이런 무대가 그래가지고 최대한 오래 하고 싶어요. After the Katowice last year, I've been um, not playing well. I've been uh, struggling. So uh, this is a rare opportunity I get. So uh, I want to stay as long as possible in this championship. Well, Shin, we're wishing you luck, especially after showing us excellent games like that. My last question for you, you're representing a new team here on stage. Tell us a little bit about Mystery Gaming. Uh, 이제 또 새로운 팀, 이제 미스터리 게이밍 입당하셨기 때문에 어, 새로운 팀에 대해서도 한번 좀 말씀을 좀 해주시죠. 
어, 일단 제가 못할 때도 굉장히 이제 지원을 많이 해줘가지고 덕분에 게이머 생활을 좀더 어, 잘할 수 있었던 것 같고요. 꼭 카토비치에서 성적 많이 거둬서 보답하고 싶어요. So even when uh, even when I was down a little bit, uh, Mr. Gaming actually supported me a lot to um, play a lot and to support uh, their support actually made me uh, continue as a player. So I really appreciate them and I, I really want to repay them with a really good result. You sound like an excellent player to have on the team. We know you're an excellent player to have here on the stage and we look forward to more from you. But for now, let's take a look back at those matches. That's indeed Mystery Gaming. Do -do 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 -do. We've got Shin surpassing expectations. We asked the question just before, and damn right he did. He uh, defeating Cure 2 0 with the help of some supply depots not being raised. We've got ourselves ZG as well as Pig to talk about some of this. ZG, this is honestly, it's not the result I expected at all. No, no one expected it. And, you know, we, we heard that, you know, apparently Cure isn't as great in ZVT in the green room, thanks to Rainer kind of passing by. Mm. But it still doesn't necessarily explain having a complete reversal from the last two times they played in the last month. So I can believe that, like, his TVZ has gotten worse or maybe less confident, or people have figured it out or something like that, sure. But seriously, Cure had just 2-0, 2-0. Yeah. And then before that did lose, but then before that it was a huge string of wins. And they're relatively recent. It's not like it's a 10 out of the last 11 series went Cure's way. Like, yeah, I'm totally it's not a you. different map yes. or patch. So, <laughs> yeah, it's weird. There were slip-ups here though, right? From there was slip-ups. There's also dangerous strategic decisions. Uh, remember I was saying before, you probably want to turtle up against him. Bian, who's normally really aggressive, just like turtles when he plays against mm -hmm. Shin like crazy. He plays opposite of his normal style. I expected similar from Cure, but Two racks low ground, on, you know, on the low ground, that's always dangerous. Yeah, yeah. It's your entire production exposed in range of either Banelings, Stim's exposed, Ravager pushes can take them down. And we saw Stim get blown up, gets blown up again, Depots were lowered. Ragnarok Shin, he's always ready to take advantage if you give him an opening. So I think we just saw what happens. If he gets an inch, he'll take a mile. Absolutely, and more power to him, right? This is a game of opportunistic plays and kind of being able to find those moments when you can. So good stuff here by Shin to keep himself decently alive in this group. And speaking of the group, let's take a look at what has happened here so far throughout it as we've got ourselves good old Olivera at number one. Two zero at the moment, ZG. Is it happening? I, I mean, I love that it's happening, just to be clear, <laughs> but I wanted to check who he defeated, right? That's a, that's a good question. That's a good question. <laughs> oh, he defeated Stats 2-1, and we did see Stats have a fairly powerful mid to late game against Clem, so that's still pretty cool. But then, you know, is that is, is that good, good enough, I suppose? Stats coming in as the underdog, you know, he even said that in the little uh, media that we did. And then he defeated Bunny, and Bunny is so hit and miss that I don't know what to take from that, especially because I didn't actually watch <laughs> the games. I don't... Sure. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> so but what we're hearing is you're hating on the reigning world champion. Absolutely. Nothing he's achieved right now means anything. Yeah, okay. exactly. He's got to face oh, Clem, and then uh, he's going to have to face uh, Cure, actually. <laughs> what he's also said in the back room is he's won as many series as he did in the group stages last year when he was the champion. That's right. That's true, yeah. I think he started off poorly and got better last year. Is that what happened? To get him barely into that Maybe. Top? I, well, I can't I think. I'm really excited, actually, for when he plays uh, Clem, which I think will be tomorrow, mm -hmm. because they, last year, Clem was destroying him, yep. made an epic comeback, and it was that single map score that kind of yeah. you know, meant he went through instead of Clem. Right, right. Um, and oh, that was a big story. So. It might come down to those two at some point again this year. It's going to be really interesting. Uh, being up 2-0, it's a great start for him, but uh, definitely Clem, you know, Cure. So, there's very hard well, matches remaining for Oliveira. Yeah, there is, but I'm actually looking at this and like the kind of um, not dependable performances from Clem and Cure. And if Oliveira is the dependable one, unless it change overnight. There you go. Actually, Oliveira could like do some weird thing and get top two or even top <laughs> one, man. Like, Maybe. and that'd be pretty sick. But Pig, what you're telling me is this is like a potential Katowice rematch, not a Wardy TV rematch. That's wow. Real. That's yeah. Not real. Well, sometimes it's not always about how important the tournament is. Sometimes it's just, you know, it just happens to be a similar situation. So yeah, yeah. normally I do place Wardy's tournaments a little bit higher because of obviously of the prestige. But uh, small little tournaments like Katowice, sometimes we've got to you know, <laughs> hark back to them. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much, guys. It is time to go to a break here at Katowice. When we return, we have more fixtures on the way. I believe it's Bjorn versus Australia coming up next on the schedule. So stay tuned for that. We'll see you soon.
Intel Extreme Masters Katowice is brought to you by Monster Energy, the United States Air Force, and Intel. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Katowice. We have got more games on the way, more StarCraft. It, <laughs> ow. It's time here as we get ready for Bjorn versus Australia. But before that, of course, I say, no, not before that. You know what? We've got Wardy and Loco here feeling good, feeling fresh. Wardy, it's been cool so far, right? Yeah, it's, it has been cool. I'm scared something's about to come up because you said before yeah. that, but then we're not. So I'm just. You're hitting the desk already as yeah, well. I don't know, man. The desk. Uh, like, I don't know. I'm <laughs> erratic stupid. right now, James. Yeah, yeah, I'm always erratic and maybe unpredictable. Unpredictable. There's nothing going to happen, I promise. Nothing's going to happen. Okay. Oh, I'm doing good then. Yeah. Good, good, good. <laughs> We've got Brion versus Australia coming up. But before that, of course, we have to say a big thank you to you know who? Monster Energy here, because they're here for the Intel Extreme Masters Katowice. And you know what? They've even got that sugar free 
original taste, which I'm always very excited about too. So I have very one. Much it was really nice joining us. Did you have one? Yeah, it was nice. Lovely, lovely. I liked it. Very excited about that. All right, well, let's start talking about the matchup then here as we have Bjorn versus Australia going to be coming up between these two. You've got a card ready. It's I do. It's going to be a good old time here. Bjorn at an 87 versus an Australia 81. So talk yeah. to me here, Loco, about the matchup. They always do Bjorn a little dirty with the defense score, right? So this is the other <laughs> pro gamers rating each other. So they gave Bjorn an 80 for defense, and he's got very high ratings for everything else. Like Micro and Attack are at 93. I mean, that's not all too surprising. But do you think 80? is fair? No. I think these guys have forgotten about all the times they've played against Bjorn and he's just turtled up. And yeah, been... he's been doing that so much lately. Yeah, I, I don't know. Players, they don't know anything about StarCraft. <laughs> <laughs> what do the pro gamers know about StarCraft anyways? That's a great question. That's and the thing is as well, like when he does have to defend, like sometimes he like defends out of nowhere because his micro can be so good. Yeah. So actually like, they don't get me wrong, he's not like maybe the most defensive player of all time, but like I think an 80 on Bjorn is actually a little bit dirty. I agree. What about Estrella? What does he have for defense? 83. Cannot agree with that if Bjorn's an 80. No. Estrella actually has an attack of 77, but I thought Estrella was quite, quite so aggressive. So I, I think what happens is the pro gamers putting ratings, right? And they're like, okay, 93 for attack. And they're like, okay, his defense is not quite as good as his offense. So I guess I'll give him a slightly lower rating and they end up with an 80, but yeah. Well, if I can't recall correctly, I think Australia was one of the uh, improved uh, when it came to the ratings overall, right? That's from true. the pro gamers from year to Apparently. year. So actually, let's take a look at Group C and how everything kind of shapes up in this group as a whole, because some would give it f uh, different names here in Group C, uh, but some may call it Cyril and Friends uh, here to see who's actually going to be able to advance on throughout all of this. So uh, they are two great combatants for Group C. However, good old, uh, you know, Cyril up there. He's going to be quite the uh, difficult opponent for a lot of these people. So is it a foregone conclusion here, Wardy, that you think uh, good old Cyril's going to be able to do it, do it well, get number one? Cyril? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was just like, you said his name out loud, James. Like, I didn't realize the question had to go with it, but he's looked really good lately. I mean, yeah. the only th the only thing is, like, he has stumbled in the bigger events, right? He stumbled a bit last year in Katowice in the groups, still did well, but didn't get all the way. It was the same story in Gamers 8. Yeah. So the two biggest events in the last year, he has stumbled a bit, but, like, there's he's no lost way. like two series now. Yeah, I know. <laughs> like those are like the only two times yeah. he's lost a match in the like last year as well. So it's very difficult to go against Sarah. I think he's going to smash this group. Yeah, quite terrifying. Quite terrifying. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, beyond all of that, we can start properly talking about this matchup, I guess, then here, as we do have. Group C coming up as Cyril is here alongside Bjorn Estrella, Kelizo, Skillis, and Firefly, who some might say top four for Firefly. Uh, but it might be difficult uh, to be able to attain that spot when you're in a group like this here, Loco. Yeah, absolutely. No, I think this is going to be a difficult group. In my mind, this is one of those groups where it's all about the third place. And I don't mean to yeah, show any disrespect to any of these players, but I think a lot of people which, well, I think Wardy would agree at the very least that Cyril goes out in first place yeah. and that Bjorn will very likely move on as well. The question is, who's going to be in third, right? And <clears throat> if you can take a series like this, right? If you're Australia and you manage to take down Super Bjorn, important. that would be amazing for him. Yeah, absolutely. Here are the two combatants being going head to head between them. And interestingly, as much as, well, if you talk about Bjorn, yes, of course, sometimes he has some issues that he has to kind of work through, etc., and things like that. Australia on the opposite side, we spoke to him. He feels confident about coming into this, but he did also say to me, Wardy, sometimes I come into tournaments and I'm not feeling too confident, so I thought I'd just try the opposite thing, of coming in and feeling confident, <laughs> and then maybe that'll work out. That so was quite a go. discussion, wasn't it? It's like, what a great idea. It like, was interesting. Doesn't go he well told himself he was positive this time. Yeah, you know, he just said, you know, I thought I'd try being confident for once. So <laughs> a whole new Australia. Woo. Australia's super dangerous, I think, is what it comes down to. Yeah. He's clearly capable of taking down someone like Bjorn. I would favor Bjorn on any given, mm -hmm. any given day. Yeah. But Australia's good enough to cause the upset. Um, so definitely feel as though... I actually feel like if this game doesn't end fast with Bjorn being quite aggressive, this yes. could be really wonky because Bjorn likes to attack. Australia likes to be aggressive. They go back and forth. There's some very interesting, long, drawn-out games that can happen where they're both kind of stuck mid-game for a very long time as well. All right, well, let's get to it then as we kick off Group C as we head over to the stage. Seltz is ready to go for this matchup. Thank you so much, Kyle Harris. As you guys already said, Group C full of scary names, just like every other group here at IEM Katowice. But we're kicking it off with two of the biggest. Astrea, representing Team Maturino, won both the Summer and Winter America's Regional Qualifiers to get to this event. And of course, Beyond finished in the top 3-4 slot for last year's GSL Code S. 
Both of them storied players, both of them looking to pick up a W here on the stage. So please help welcome Bjorn and Australia. Beyond versus Estrella here for Terran versus Protoss, where really you can actually say they have some similar styles for being completely different races. And of course, Beyond in the fashion he's been presenting for the last few tournaments, making the handshake a little more fun. I am here with Pig to cast this, and I think it's going to be fun. That is the word that I think has to be used when you watch Estrella versus Protoss, and then Beyond's games in general. There's a lot of wacky things that can happen, and they can force a lot of errors on each other and it'll be up to who actually keeps their game tight to actually win the series it's always awesome to see these two clash you never know when beyond's gonna load up a drop fly right past the opponent's army and try to get inside their main base and of course Estrella just plays weird he brings the clown college the north american circus to the big stage and he happily does you know he, he basically a lot of players out there try to play a bit more meta a bit more standard and Estrella is always at the cutting edge of creativity we've seen him here in katowice in years past knock out favorites of the tournament with proxy nexus in their main base we've seen him bring out the bizarre three nexus with no tech uh we see him in this matchup often go for a lot of just, uh, you know, very much skipping on things like Twilight Council or Stargate. There's just a lot of weird options up his sleeves. Australia is definitely known for the weirder builds, but Beyond can be maybe, a, sometimes maybe an odd build, I suppose, but really, yeah, more so on the odd decision when someone else would have played defensive or safe or just kind of more consistent. He'll suddenly go, you know what? That is an awesome idea. Boost four medivacs over 12 stalkers, and sometimes it works, actually. <laughs> you know, it shouldn't, but sometimes it does. So that's what can create really crazy games. Obviously, they both have a lot of with each other actually even joking about playing random in the chat right now oh, that nice. is something that Australia has been uh, doing actually off raising Terran in some of the open cups and um, not been going super well <laughs> by the way just in case anyone was curious but if he does play Protoss then he actually has had a better versus Terran recently according to the stats he's beaten Bjorn twice recently and then he also was one of the few people who could defeat uh, Clem in the open cups that wasn't named Max Pack so I want to say that he's improved in general, but I did use the like phrase specifically stats, because when you do watch Estrella, there are definitely things that can be abused. He does have faults mm -hmm. that a lot of Terrans will say that they'll know how to abuse, but then he does, you know, sometimes just throw in a weird something or another and like, okay, well, that's not what I was trying to abuse, and I guess I'm wrong here, and so, yeah, of course, he can win, but... Uh, I don't know, there's a lot of uncertainty, I guess, for both players when I come into this, and I agree with the desk too. I think it is coming down to third place, but I actually would say that Bjorn is um, not as secure in the in the top two as I uh, heard from Loco there. Yeah, I, obviously on paper, looking at it before the tournament, you're like, oh, he should be a shoe in overall with how he performs, but we've seen that Katowice groups and expectations don't always uh, kind of come head to head, so. It's going to be interesting to see if he can pull that together. I am very curious if Estrella can, of course, weather the storm of aggression because Beyond plays this matchup on the edge of going all out at any moment. And it's very hard to read. It's not like it's, oh, he's sitting at home or he's coming to attack me. No, he's always on the map. Yeah. It's just, is he going to commit into your base or not? And for Beyond, it's an instinctive thing based on if he sees an opening, he will go for it. And as Estrella, a player who likes to push his greed, push his advantages, uh, he's going to have to just be comfortable in that no man's land of, I'm not sure I have enough to survive, but I'm going to confidently just follow through anyway. <laughs> Because the moment you kind of seize up and play afraid of Beyond, I mean, you've already lost. Yeah, I think there are some people who can fall victim to that, but uh, Australia usually not. In fact, sometimes Australia actually, you'll think going into a series, well, that guy's aggressive, that guy's going to try and punish you, and Australia will do the opposite of what you expect, which is try and compensate for that, and just be maybe as, as aggressive himself. So particularly to give an example, you think, okay, he's going to do like a tank push. So Australia needs to take this seriously, maybe get like three gateways, get ready for it, and instead yeah. he'll actually try and kind of skip a lot and get to like a mass 
uh, gateway army, but it sometimes is 30 seconds too late. And sometimes it's right on time. And when it's right on time, he bops the push. He immediately counterattacks. It's excellent looking for him. But again, that's only sometimes. So it just, <laughs> it's just, it, it, I'm not really like super confident going into it. Uh, for Estrella, I know we talk about that, but also for Bion, who sometimes does get a little overeager and perhaps does choose the. Uh, a little too dangerous thing. We were getting some technical things fixed up, guys, but we are finally ready to go. I absolutely echo your thoughts, Zombie Grub. It's an exciting matchup, but of course, the Terran player does come in as the favorite. Whilst the scores go back and forth, this man, more often than not, does come out on top. He's representing Shopify Rebellion in Korea. Down here in the bottom right side of the map, it's Beyond. And on the top left of site Delta, we do have Matarino Esports Australia. Pause. Pause Australia. No! <laughs> do we clap? Do we, do we yeah. wait? Do we play the music? Please <laughs> clap. That's it. No. Uh, it, obviously. Oh, the repeat rate did not transfer. Okay. So he felt his, uh, his keyboard was just a little bit off there. Had to fix the repeat rate for the keyboard. That's it, the rate at which you hold down the button and it queues up uh, basically, you know, button sequences and commands used for, most importantly with Protoss, warping in units. Something that you have to uh, fix up there. So happy to have that fixed now. We'll be hopping back into game in a moment as the uh, wall of chat fades off the screen. Australia getting himself focused, getting in the zone here at the start of Sight Delta. Yes, indeed. Going for a forward gateway, actually. Well, we have Bion. You don't really call this a forward barracks. You do call this a proxy, but it's, you know, it's like halfway, I guess. Uh, there's a probe out for the scouts. The expectation is that the Protoss will scout that a proxy racks is happening, but then the hope is that they don't find the proxy racks, and they also have a little bit more ambiguity as to the follow-up. So... So a, a confuser racks, uh, yeah. <laughs> it's not going to get to your base that fast, but you're also not going to find it. It does really give up a lot of reactor build timing, though. So the, the you know Marines coming out, the reactors very much delayed, and it does mean you are often going to be going for uh, you know potentially say two Reapers into a heli and something like that is quite common. If you do stop to build a reactor on the factory, it's a big delay on the production. Now Cybercore first for Australia. He's got that low ground wall off. Looks like he was thinking about, of course, chrono boosting an early adept across or something like that to deny the command center. But seeing that it's not a fast expand build, Australia will adjust and adapt his plan. Yeah. I'm going to sell it to help out as he starts to harass the SCV, of course, trying to be as obnoxious as possible. So that they're going to see a factory expand after this. There's always that slight chance, I suppose, someone does kind of, you know, all in a 1 1 1, but not too often. And as you said, it's more of a confused Rex than trying to actually find any advantage from being a couple of seconds early, so much so that he just brings the Reaper back home. Yeah. Reaper's going to deny that scouting. Barracks floating back towards the main. And there is a shield battery going down for Estrella. Stalkers immediately coming out of the map. Now, Stalkers are very important for dealing with Cyclones. Part of the reason you want to go Stalkers early is you don't know if there's weird Cyclone aggression. They're also good versus Hellions. The Stalker is just a more well-rounded unit than the Adept. Uh, of course, you can't shade with it, so you can't scout as easily. Right. Doesn't have that bonus to light as well. So this puts Australia in a much more static setup where he's really just kind of sitting there at home, locking himself down, and he's relying on the early sentry, I guess, for that hallucination scout. Yeah, that's definitely one thing that Australia is known for more than basically any other Protoss, although we do see some experimentation from Skillis as well, for instance. And it is an opener anyone could do, of course. But Australia seems particularly fond of it, either the sentry first or the sec century second. It's going to give you the hallucination to determine exactly what the kind of like the first legit attack is, I suppose, is the ideal situation, but it's not actually a great attacking unit. So say that you hallucinate scout, you see a Hellene drop. Does that necessarily help you? Well, knowing is half the battle, I suppose, but then a sentry tickle beam isn't really helpful for the other half. And it is going to be coming in eventually to see this setup from Dion, which is a factory expand, but a conservative one, high grounds, right? So he's really not looking to try and gain any advantage on the economics. And he did already force Australia to react at least a little bit with that barracks opener and the shield battery. There you go, actually. Very well-timed scout. Won't know it's in the medevac necessarily, but knows it's on the way. Indeed. Could be a, a two-mind drop. Could be, uh, that's really two mine drop or uh, Cyclone. Or Cyclone is the only real option. Yeah. There's not much else it could be with uh, what else he knows. And 
plenty of units ready to defend this. Uh, I'm actually kind of worried. Uh, like, Australia does seem a little vulnerable to the early tank pushes, something that... Uh, Actually, you know what? I won't. I won't spoil. I talked to someone in the group, and they have some opinions. So I'll just leave it at that. But it does seem kind of consistent. In GSL, though, he was also sick. He seemed very vulnerable to tank pushes. And then Atlanta, he also was vulnerable, which is why I brought that specific scenario up, in which he can be a little too greedy sometimes, and not necessarily on an early tank push, but uh, even just tanks with the first bio push as well. Just mentioning it because we're also on a map that kind of has a complicated natural as far as that ramp goes when all your buildings are on the front. Can actually be kind of scary, but doesn't seem to be the setup for Beyond. He's getting a Liberator, he's getting the Barracks, and he actually hasn't found any room with the Medivac thus far. Australia, I believe, is going to be going for Storm Drop this game, so I would yeah. look for Templar Archives the moment that, yeah, he's going charge. So we should see a Templar Archives in the near future. And uh, using, of course, the Robo for a few observers and then a warp prism. Now, this does delay the third base and Beyond's aware of it. It's five minutes, 10, there's no third. Beyond should know to be exceptionally careful in this yes. scenario. There is no reason to push into a two base Protoss player. <laughs> yeah, which is, I oh, saw him move back a little bit there. Uh, that's not usually a good idea. No matter what's coming up behind it, um, in this case, there are a decent amount of units even created from the get-go, and if they are actually outside of their own choke, then they can tackle this. And the Observer's been tracking as well. I think Bian might actually be onto it, but we are going to get to, I was going to say, eventually a Templar Archives, and there it finally goes down. Okay, the Cyclone of Medivac actually just got taken. All right. The bird is going to go in the main while he's distracted. The Medivac, I like that he leaves one Stalker to chase it. Yes. He may get that last hit on that Medivac. Kill it. Ugh, he gets it. <laughs> it just, you know, the Stalkers deserve it. I'm not, I'm not cheering for anyone. Um, but so, <laughs> um, That was actually a really nice find, right? Because I think Bion was really assuming that he was going to be able to have that vision on the that side of the map as well. It's just like a little bit of annoying to kill like a probe sent out to the third base. And that's up to the Reaper, which actually does get a probe. There you go. Not too bad. Size Storm's just begun. It's actually more important to get your High Templar warped in than your Size Storm started, as uh, gathering energy is very important in the long run. But he should have one Storm available. Bion going for a third command center in the main base into the fourth and fifth barracks a little bit after that. And only building a single siege tank and a Liberator. Bion didn't commit too hard to kind of the tech units like the Raven would be rather useless against this style. Uh, outside of Hail Mary Interference Matrix is locking the High Templar in the Prism or something like that, which is, of course, a long shot. But he's still just waiting with the Liberator. He's going to poke forward through the middle. And Beyond's not actually wanting to force a fight. He just wants to distract Astraea, yeah. get him off balance, stop him from probing up that third, and maybe get the Liberator in for big damage there. He really should be picking up on what Astraea is doing. And he, I think he's maybe like second guessing occasionally, but then he scans, then he scouts, and then he actually knows exactly what's going down. And when you see that setup, trying to just do the normal pushes that you would against something like a Colossus opener or a two gate third Nexus, like it just doesn't really it, right? So a little poke forward, as you said, and then he pulls right back. It's not gonna feel really safe until you do get to the ghost, but affording ghosts on two bases is actually a real conundrum. So getting a couple of Vikings here to ward away the war prism as far as the uh, High Templar ferrying can be really obnoxious for the Protoss. But then if that's only what you're thinking of, then yeah, maybe you're actually vulnerable to storm drops. Four tech labs and only one reactor, which is heavy Marauder production. Good for tanking the storm, but not a lot of anti-zealot firepower. Marines are much better at killing those zealots. That's something that you need to keep in mind. Storm Drop looking to come in. Now, he often likes to go for that third mineral line because it's kind of the most accessible to get in there without getting spotted. Strayer moving through the middle of the map. He's got quite a few storms banked up. Blink and plus one attack on the way for him. He's only barely ahead in workers, so he'd like to do damage. The longer this goes on this position, the better it is for Bion. And oh, Bion's Vikings, they're so close. Oh, they will actually find the War Prism. Yeah, it never went in. Uh, possibly trying to plan an attack on the kind of like the side or behind the army as Astraea's army hits the front. Could have been cool, but it did not end up working out. Without the War Prism, it is extremely dangerous to go in there. I mean, you just can't get the High Temple in proper position. A lot of them had to get recalled as well. He does still have some in his army. Bion should definitely not be looking to chase after this, but defensively, he'll probably be okay. He's got those Marauders you were just talking about, a decent number of Medivacs, and one really helpful tank in a very good position to ward away this army. Liberator also did find five probes finally, so that's a nice chunk. And we do have Astraea 
I think now trying to make that transition, you can't depend on High Templars forever. And now the tricky part for Bjorn is determining exactly when it is okay to push into this transition. Can he not get hit by storms on the way? If you've got oh. ghosts, then hopefully that is the case. A couple of storms do go down. It's a lot of injured bio, and there's another pretty good one on the injured bio. But is it going to be enough? Very weak and Terran army right here. Widowmine's only just now burrowing, but the charge lot numbers just simply are not high. And I don't think we're going to get those crucial final shots on a lot of these red marauders. New warp prism has arrived. Double Colossus production starts up behind it as well. But Estrella is only on 65 work, as he does not have a second forge upgrading or anything like that. So it's kind of like, okay, it's good to scare the Terran back, but it is time to transition. Straya's second forge now starts up, his plus two attack on the way. Second engineering bay and armory only now starting for Bion. So there is room to force this to late game, and it really does seem like Estrella is going to be able to get to the late game without being at a huge deficit, a situation which normally against Beyond, making it to late game is, is a trial in yeah. of itself. I mean, with the style of play that Estrella has chosen here, and he can do so many different types, but this one, it really did force Beyond to reconsider what his tempo plan was. When does he move out with a certain number of units to offset a more typical Protoss opener? When does he actually get his push going and then go into like a double drop and a, and a multi-prong push, right? Okay, I'm not the one who can do that. I have to stay at home. So yeah, there's an opportunity in like really nicely played game like perfectly played, right? Really high expectation where the Terran player can perfectly navigate that kind of post High Templar, or, you know, the ghosts are out, kind of getting that, and then pre Colossus. But it is extremely difficult to do. And Estrella kind of taking that fight with all those storms, weakening up Beyond's army, taking out the Medivacs and the Medivac Juice, really once again forced Beyond to play a more defensive style. So Estrella has done a great job kind of controlling the pace of this game, where Beyond now is the one having to play a, yeah, a bit of. Eh, Turtle maybe is a strong word, but certainly defensive game. I think Turtle's fair, Zombie Grub. I think this is something we've seen Clem also get forced into a similar stance against Australia recently, where I've gone from watching Clem non-stop attacking, beyond non-stop attacking in these weekly cups against all the other Protoss players, and they play Australia, and he's so weird and hard for them to figure out what he's doing, they end up locked in these later games. The question is, has Australia actually got an advantage in it? And I would say no. It seems like a very even game when you look across all the stats. 2-2 two, two is well on the way right now for Beyond. Uh, equal upgrades, plus two done for Protoss, one, one done for Terran. That command center would be a lovely snipe if he can finish it off, but he needs to focus fire that with the Stalkers. Yeah, he's currently not doing so. Perhaps actually moving all of them forward would have done the trick. As it is, seems like it is going to survive. Ten SEDs go down. That is that on the left side was looking for exactly that storm. The follow-up one grabbing a few extra as well, and even more workers are going to go down as Estrella realizes he's got a real chance there, and now the Stalkers are focus firing the Command Center, it goes crashing to the ground. Beyond looking for revenge on it, is trying to take the fight, but is this really the right fight to take? It's so close, but the Medivacs are all getting blasted down, as are the Vikings. Both sides taking heavy losses in that engagement. Australia will pull back to lick his wounds, but he took out 18 SCVs. He took out a lot of the powerful air units. Unfortunately for him, he lost all of his High Templar and Robo units. He needs to warp in more High Templar, which he has not done. He's gone straight for the Robo units. He's got four Robos. They're all wow. chrono boosting, but he doesn't actually have enough money to build on all of them. Upgrades are nice. I like that he's going plus three, plus two, but he's got to be wary of the fact that Bion is now at 93 army supply to 60. Yeah, yeah, I don't know if he's actually feeling very uh, not confident there on the camera, but assuming that Bion doesn't immediately go for the attack, and even then it might already be too late, I actually think Estrella is going to have time to recover. He's not rich, he didn't have a huge bank, so yeah, producing off of four Robo and the upgrades and the Dark Shrine upgrade, that's a little much, but now we do have Disruptors on the field. Bion is finally moving in, but a nice Zealot run by, catching the now Orbital trying to go to a fourth base, and Disruptors are going to be excellent at buying time in that choke. The Zealots down there are buying time. They should get out of there, though. You don't want to just throw these Zealots away. Their job is, of course, to keep the unoccupied, and that's what Estrella does. Now, Bion's floated his main out to the fourth. We don't see a sign of another command center. Bion has 2-2. Two, two. Bion needs to get out on the map and control things. If he can sneak a double drop to the north, something to put Estrella on the defensive and be striking him in the back line. He needs Estrella reacting to him. Bion looks next level when he's the one who's forcing the fights where he wants them to be. But because he lost all his medevacs in the previous engagement, you can see he's kind of blobbed together right now. He is remaxed, as is Estrella. 
But more Zealots coming in on the south. This game's getting a little bit messy. Yes, it is. Zealots are going to continue to hammer Beyond's bases, especially without a planetary on that fourth. And then the Disruptors back at home, and now currently the count of eight are going to hopefully hold almost all of the positions we see here. And certainly, if Astraea can stay one step ahead of the army movement, he'll always be able to utilize his own defensive chokes. Maybe it doesn't win him the fight, but it keeps his bases alive. And actually, he's even looking for the fight. Let's be very careful. The Zealot control, but so far, so good. And speaking of Zealots, these are still doing damage. SCVs have gone down. Reinforcements have gone down. A successful distraction, perhaps, as well. Beyond does manage to mostly escape from the disruptor shots, but has been pushed back onto his side of the map. And a total of 26, actually more now, as a DT enters into that orbital, have gone down for Beyond. Wow, this is the problem with getting stuck on the defense. When the Protoss is in your face, picking where and when the fights happen, it's suddenly so powerful for them. And look, isolating a small army in the north, still hunting that down. He cannot let the Disruptors land. Beyond has to run whenever there's Disruptor shots in the air. And he is doing just that. Good pullbacks, but the DT is going ham. They're still there, assaulting the rally point. 32 workers go down. My only criticism of Australia is that he's forgotten about the Storm Tech. I think it's not a core part of your army, but you should still have a few High Templars scattered around the storms in the previous big battle mm. was such a game changer and look obviously Australia is winning economically but he is not winning the army fight right now and this is what happens in these late game pvts we go yeah. oh he's killing the workers he's killing a base yeah go protoss and you go look at the army supply of beyond <laughs> nah, this game is not over by any means Australia still needs to find a way to deal with that 140 army supply of terran units exactly that's why beyond's managed to stay calm throughout this entire time he knows that there's still the one punch army but the dt blink comes in the widow Mine pop off however and the DTs are gone in the blink of an eye the zealots soon to follow as well beyond is finally going to find some damage finding the additional three robos as well severely cuts into Astraea's production capabilities and we do have ourselves a little bit of a worker trade that's a lot of very injured medivacs a couple of feedbacks one storm could have been huge it's going to come down to the stalkers though when they do grab two Oh, this is where imagine a single storm somewhere in there would have been game changing. And that's something where the disruptors are now on the right. He did keep his robos alive. That's the most important thing for Australia because that is the center of his defensive production. I love that there's a random disruptor in a prism on the south side of the map. And oh, we get so many medivacs. That's huge. Uh, actually, I wonder how many that is then. Is three literally the only... Oh no, he still has eight. Oh my god, that was I thought that was the entire drop. He must have been actually continuing to build a solid number of medivacs, which is really great news, of course, meaning that he still has the mobility and he still has some energy. Even though there's been tons of stims and tons of damage and tons of battles, he still has some healing here. War Prism is going to be found out, not going to be any more helpful, but Beyond needs to pay attention and he will able to save himself from a big disruptor shot. And then actually saving the army might be a different question. It's only a small portion of it. The rest of it now coming in, perhaps on the left side. Estrella does seem wary of this, not gonna let himself get surrounded, but now taking the fight with the stalkers in the front, the disruptors not shooting, and now it is Beyond actually, who's got the surround, and it's gonna be too effective. And oh, the Zealots come in as well. He kills all the disruptors, but the Zealots come in, and Beyond supply is taking. That was a scary moment. You know, Estrella, just when the engagement started, he got distracted because his robo units, his disruptors were rallying through the widow mines at his third. He looked back oh. and he looked back at the front, which is why his disruptors were late, but he had the numbers. He had enough. He did throw out the disruptor shots quickly enough and Australia managed to win that fight still, but that's still a big army. You've got to be careful with oh, the Wow. Shots. Yeah, the stalker blinking for this one of mine could get a really huge shot and it does despite Australia's attempt to split. One other thing that was affecting that battle, by the way, is that once again, Beyond has done the Beyond thing. He doesn't have plus three attack, but Estrella is also making huge mistakes by not clearing up these wood of mines. They have taken out so many of his reinforcements. He just lost the Observer. He's having to rebuild it again. These Widow Mines are keeping Beyond in this game. Beyond has now lifted another command center to the front base. He's desperately trying to rebuild orbitals. DT's trickling in is massive because Beyond does not have many scans. He needs to drop mules right now, but if he does that, he will not be able to deal with it. it looks like two Widow Mines still there on the right. At least they're not in the direct rally path. <laughs> Zealots are going to find out, though. Uh, a couple going down, many injured. Beyond still with a solid army supply, although his overall is not looking so hot. Once again, dependent on this army to do the entire work of the game, which is not going to work out. Disruptor shot on top, Medivac's out of juice. No spellcasters, really, just the one little ghost there. The Wood of Mines do clear out a lot of the Zealots, but Beyond doesn't actually have that much staying power. Astraea is still banking, still with tons of bases, can reinforce over and over and over again as he continues to grow an upgrade lead.
This is fantastic play by Australia. And you can see Bjorn kind of shaking his head multiple times there in the camera at the bottom of your screen. Very well played by Australia. And I think it's such an exceptionally safe opening that he does here. But you can tell he's saying, look, if I can just get to that it's kind of late mid game, early late game stage, I will take control with the heavy disruptor army. I will just take the map and, uh, and play very nicely with a mixture of Zealot and Dark Templar backstabs and disruptors on the front line. Now a transition into Mass Immortal from Estrella as a huge Zealot run by runs into the south. It's going to be really hard to just stay alive against the growing army that Estrella is bringing to the front lines. The disruptors, you can always think of the miracle splits and surround and eat. Well, even then, actually, the disruptor counts look pretty good. Uh, but you actually try and do the same thing against a heavily upgraded Immortal and like a charge lot numbers too. And it actually goes the opposite way. You think Bio is going to win late game? Not necessarily, especially Whoa. when it is missing plus three attack. The Disruptors even really need to come in here, but it does. And Estrella will take game number one. Really nice build order choice, I think. That actually probably changed a little bit of Beyond's expectations, although he does do this build. It's not the first time. But then they actually have to have Beyond be the one that goes, oh, wait, I can't. Oh, wait, I can't. Oh, wait, I got to think about this. That really led to Estrella controlling the game. Beyond unable to utilize his greatest strength, dancing on the edge of the Protoss territory. At any moment, the Protoss not knowing if he's going to pick up and go in your main, attack the south, attack the north. He never got to do that because he was worried about the storm. That storm drop charge lot style is dynamic, it's powerful. And when he did finally push out, there was a few fights that looked very promising, but there was always a backup High Templar that saved his day. And over here, just before this fight we're seeing now, there was that storm that came in from the south. Yeah. That did a massive amount of damage. And obviously, like, there's a point where you do lose a lot of expensive Protoss units. The supply doesn't look great. But you got to realize Terran doesn't have a flexible economy. You kill a command center and 20 workers, they can't just make that back like you can with chrono boosted probes or lava injects. They are suddenly forced to counterattack. And if you can defend that, you're going to be in a good spot which he absolutely was able to. Again, those disruptors came out really well-timed, and then they were able to use the defensive chokes on site Delta. And there's still many opportunities where I believe that Beyond in a different game, slightly different game, gets those concaves, gets those surrounds, gets the timing attacks, as in he hits before the disruptors are out or while the Colossus number is still only at one or something. But he never really got the opportunity. And I didn't think he was really playing shy. I think it was appropriate for what he was up against, but you could still tell that that wasn't the best beyond we could see. Put it out of his element. And something in these big tournaments, $500,000 prize pool, you've been at the Intel Extreme Masters Katowice before, and it always brings out the nerves and the best players. You have to find a way to get in your element, a position where you can leverage your skill. Sometimes that means you have to give up some advantage at some other point in the game, or you need to take a risk. But I definitely think, uh, you know, map control and the war for that is so vital. We've seen Estrella and the other Protoss players, when their observers get caught constantly by scans or ravens, they can't see where the drops are and they look panicked. They look afraid. They're always caught out of position. That yeah. bio stims in. They're, they're chasing into Widow Mines for the whole game and their bases are getting sniped. The Terran's getting out of dodge. We didn't get to see any of that in game one. Beyond is going to have to find a way in game two to get it back into his roadmap, his plan for winning a TVP. See if he can do it. We are going into Oceanborn for the second game here. In the top left for Shopify Rebellion, he is Bjorn. And his opponent hailing from San Diego, the American Hope, a very creative Protoss player representing Maturino. It is Estrella. Champion of the now America's region. The inclusion of Lat M did not disturb his chain of victories, never quite being able to prove it in these international tournaments, and then seemingly having the, the worst luck as far as like sickness timing when he does participate in Korea, or kind of getting an unlucky group for him. But now in Katowice, really showing off against Bjorn, who is once again going to go for this kind of confusion rack. It's not necessarily proxied, which it can go literally up to the ledge of Australia if it really wanted to, but rather in the middle of the map. And it seems like he was totally fine with that opener. And I, I mean, it's certainly not what I would think I would blame the game on, but not going to change that. Perhaps we'll change the follow-up. Yeah, it's not optimal on paper in terms of raw income growth, but it does just force the Protoss to adapt and react a little. Estrella, of course, was very calm to wall off with the second gate, getting scouting with the hallucination, and it was it was so smooth, his opening, for sure. But uh, looking at the numbers in the mid-game, it didn't look like he was ahead after that. 
I did want to bring up last year's Katowice, actually, because if you think about it, uh, Australia had an amazing 2022. And leading into the start of 2023, he was, there was so much hope. Everyone was like, yeah. oh my gosh, Australia is the guy. And he kind of burnt out right before Katowice. He just grinded for like yeah. nine months with no breaks. Didn't map it out as well as he should have. He was, you know, kind of admitted that, said, ah, you know, it's, it's a bummer, but I just, uh, I just felt like I was a bit unconfident in my play. Mm. I think I practiced too hard for too long without taking any breaks. And I just, I felt a little bit hopeless playing at Katowice. And it was, you know, it was unfortunate for him and his fans. This year, I think he's in much better form. Yeah. Uh, so I'm kind of smiling because, you know, this is something that Neve used to do. The, the mm. top Protosses of the NA region, both uh, sharing that difficulty, which is that, they, you know, when they're really into it, they're really into it. They play a crazy number of games. But then, yeah, there's always that chance to get burnt out. And sometimes that, quote unquote, like lack of caring. Of course, they care, but there's there's definitely a different feeling. Sometimes it's beneficial. There's less pressure. And sometimes, obviously not. And they struggle against the uh, consistent players. But I do want to mention, as we are on Oceanborn, although we're getting the second soccer, not a century this time, this is the map where Australia does do his very fast third nexus apparently not going to do it this time around i mean certainly there are a lot of odds to watch of Australia defeating well beyond himself <laughs> so beyond google back and watch that but then also defeating clem again at top tier Terran. so definitely wanting to change things up and not do a particularly greedy build against someone who absolutely could throw a tank push but it's not going to be that again here it's not going to be the cyclone either though it is those widow mines and that means that he will finally get something into Australia's mineral line because even if there's something to protect it they, you still want to go basically assuming that they can kind of bypass it when that cyclone last game it actually did nothing and then it died yeah. got caught four widow mines is a it's a proper skill check you always have enough to drop two or three in the mineral line and drop them on the retreating probes or in the other base. It, it basically says, hey, you need to do a lot of things very quickly to defend this without taking big damage. But Australia, he does have a few units out. He's got two gates up and he will have an observer soon. If he can see the medevac coming, that's massive. But unfortunately, that stalker's misplaced. It's behind the grass. Even if it was in front of the grass, I don't think he'd see this medevac. Mm, yeah, no, 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 he would not. He would not, which is also good for Bion, obviously. He might have chosen that direction specifically. This would have mind drop, I've been saying it. It's going to activate. Whether it gets big damage is the question. But it's also going to get scouting, which will go into in one second. One would have mind into the natural. The rest into the main. Oh. Two stalkers already really digging into the medevac health, however. Yeah, this is great. And respecting it as well. Good on Burrow Micro, not letting these Widow Mines fire. Oh, he barely gets it before that one can shoot. Uh, there's only one Widow Mine left here in the main. It gets, oh, it does stay uh. clumped and seven probes go down. Now, it could be worse. I think four Widow Mines is, is a big commitment, but the medevac getting out of there, you get mining time. And you see exactly what Australia is going for as well. It's a good start for Beyond. Yeah, exactly. Yes. And it's really quite unfortunate that Menevac got away for Australia, as I believe his soccer wasn't the natural. It just wasn't where it is we saw right there. It was uh, still in the mineral line. But regardless, the scout also came through, right? So that's a really nice thing about the follow-up Menevac drop, whichever you started off with. But the Menevac drop does get into the main base and the natural sees that it was actually a robo first but then the twilight council also came down and we do have the temple archive so i know he's got the robo i gotta figure he's got the twilight council the medevac went everywhere and it's not scouting the temple archives it probably doesn't need to as again that third nexus is also screaming a lot of warning signs right now australia not playing the super creative unpredictable styles that we've seen from him in the past he's playing Essentially, two slight variations of the same opening in a row. Mm. Does knock that Reaper off the side of the metal. Oh. Launched by Stratosphere. Goodbye. <laughs> that was like 250%, you know, damage in Super Smash Bros. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, third Nexus will, of course, go down eventually. But this is, again, like there's a... There, not every Protoss opener is going to be this, right? And so while it can be safe and it can really unsettle the Terran, there are definitely going to be weaknesses to it. And primarily, again, making sure that you use your army correctly, not getting overzealous when the storms suddenly run out and you're like, oh God, what do I actually have? Unupgraded Zealots. Not actually getting caught on storm forever when the Terran player is starting to aggress and get ghosts out in the field. So that's what we're gonna be paying attention to. But beyond, 
does have to consider how that last game went and whether or not he wants to get into a similar position or push some different angle a little bit more. And he kind of already is. This drop coming into the main base, not promising, you know, didn't look like it was going to do a whole lot. But even then, activated a shield body overcharge, which is actually just nice of Australia to have in the main base, not necessarily a guarantee. Well done by Beyond to get all the units out as well. No overcommitting for either side just yet. Zealot does come in, finds the SCV on the third base. That's an annoyance for Beyond. Putting the third on the location saves you a lot of lifting time, moving that thing around, a lot of fiddling with the command center. But uh, it also does mean it's very exposed to that harassment. Estrella has got another shield battery up now, I believe on the third base. His blink has started. Feels like his economy is still pretty small. I thought with the opening being a bit more awkward, Estrella might try to force a two base all in to work, but Beyond is so active on the map. That's easier yeah. said than done. It does seem like one thing that's consistent for Estrella here, which might turn into a weakness as we watch the series go, is that he's very determined not to die to the earlier attacks. But as far as being in the best position for the mid game, like the drops, for instance, that can be missing as Blink is not done, but the Warp Prism and the Storms finally try and come through to help out. They don't get the kills, but they do dissuade that drop. It's gonna stay in the corner once again. Nine probes going down. Estrella almost still even with the workers of his Terran opponent while we're about to have three mules dropping. This is the best sign for Protoss. I feel like Estrella sometimes he does look a little bit scared, but then he gets behind and you see Estrella's full strength come out, you know? Yeah. We used to always say, oh, he takes a punch to the face better than anyone else. It's because he's good at making comebacks. Nice little storm drop gets seven SCVs. He's probing super hard after taking that last damage as well. He's up to 60 workers now, taking the six gases, and he's going to go for the Tempest turn transition. This is such a, a weird build, but he's been doing this first, oh, Clem. Yeah. He beat Clem with this the other week. He, he won one game against him. He lost a, a follow-up game with the same strategy. It's very hard to get there, but Tempest plus Storm is an amazing composition. Oh, that's a pretty good storm as well. The Zealots will have to evacuate as the Wood of Mines are buried, and they do want to use the shield battery as much as possible. We got the drop coming back into the natural as well, and Australia is still kind of... I mean, not exactly low on like the overall unit count, but getting him in the right position at every single time is obviously a struggle of the Protoss race. So he is getting caught a little off there, but now a shield battery is also at the natural. Better to actually just let that be an easy defense and hopefully focus entirely on the front lines, which is High Templars are not here. Oh, there they are. And the pickup's going to happen, trying to avoid the High Templars. Ditto as the High Templars try to avoid the Widow Mines. Nice War Prison Micro, but it, Micro, but Australia just doesn't have the numbers. He's on the back foot so badly right now, and the more of these small skirmishes there are, guess what? You, you've just used your entire bank of energy. You have no more Storm left as Estrella. You don't really have time to warp in High Templar and wait for it. So what do you do? Well, Beyond says this is where you die. I'm going to push in. I'm going to take you out. Battery Overcharge does go down there. The Prism takes a massive hit, but barely keeping those units <laughs> alive. Great holds for Estrella. As we say that, though, that drop sneaking into the main. He's watching for it, but is he quick enough to be on top? <laughs> that medevac is so annoying. Well, now he also 100% just doesn't have that many units. That is now absolutely a problem as his army supply has dipped down drastically, especially with the addition of the technology transfer. You know, he's got stuff invested into an air upgrade and a single air unit that's not that's not helping yet. The Void Array will eventually pop and eventually burn down medevac drops, but the main issue is still that army on the front lines. Feedback coming down. Only one or two medevacs with a decent amount of energy, but I think it's going to be enough for Bion to actually stay here and kind of continue poking and prodding as long as this charge lot army, which is hardly even here, doesn't get a surround. He's kind of the one free to do this. High Templar, one of them does lose its energy, which means there's only one storm available inside the prism. Bion still has that red hit point drop in the north of the map. His own fourth command center, Armory and Second Engineering Bay have all gone up behind it. So Bion is getting established in the macro game. He says, I'm going to take a fourth, go double upgrades and do all that cool stuff. But also, you're pinned on three base and you are completely stuck. Good luck getting out of this corner. You can build static there all you want. You're not taking a fourth base, Mr. Protoss. No, apparently not. Beyond with a 50 supply lead, 40 of it in army, also continuing to upgrade his pure ground units, where Shrey is actually not a 1-1, guys. He's on one armor and one air. War Prism gets taken out. Very few storms available. A weird EMP, but that's already still got plenty of ghosts extra. And now he's looking to actually take this game. Shield Body Overcharge once again activated, but will it be enough? A very good concave as well for the Terran. That's going to mitigate that single storm that came out. And there you have it. The GG is Bion ties up the series. A good mix up from the Korean Terran, the Fort Widowmine drop. 
finds value as Australia fails to make the final split, loses an additional six probes, and that does cost you in the opening game. From there, it was relentless. It was, I am not going to sit back and let yeah. you do it. <laughs> Thank you very much, guys. Uh, really appreciate the love out there. But what a fantastic uh, series we've seen so far. Australia had his way with Bjorn in game one, and Bjorn said not a chance in game two. It's really interesting to me what Australia brings out in the third game. I think he has to mix it up now. He can't keep yeah. doing the same build. Yeah, 100%. You know, like, because you said you were kind of surprised he didn't just go for more of a two-base committal, shall we say, to try and kind of turn the tides and the momentum. And then... Uh, I was pointing out that this just feels like something that, yeah, can take advantage in the proper scenario, but it obviously does dedicate the two base. It delays the economy. And then if you don't get attacked or you get attacked in a very uh, specific manner, I suppose, where Beyond keeps his army alive, which is what happened, and it can be difficult to actually use that style. So we had Bjorn compensate. He adapted. He now shows the weakness of that style. And Estrella has to say, okay, well, maybe I don't do that. Maybe I do go two gate third nexus. And then what if Bjorn actually that time does something aggressive early on? I was expecting a little more of them doing a lot of poking and prodding and then determining mm. what was going on. And that's what can create really like the chaotic games they've had in the past. But this actually is, I think, more of like a cognitive thing, right? They're both clearly thinking a lot before actually doing the action and trying to counter each other's expectations, perhaps. So it's, it's not necessarily as scrappy as I thought, but it is entertaining. Often the adjustments at the highest level of StarCraft are small, minute tactical adjustments in the midst of the game, and a lot of the rest of it is between the games. It's, ah, you're playing like this, okay. And then I scout, I see you playing the same style again, bam, a decision is made. And Beyond made that decision very quickly upon scouting what he was up against, which was, I will get in your face, I'll be very aggressive and give you very little room to breathe. The big weakness of Storm has always been drops. Anytime yeah. you can kind of get in the back and split up the Protoss' attention into two or three places, suddenly Storm's not as effective. It's You can't find a big Storm in the middle of an army because we are split into three different places. We're going to finish off this series in just a minute. Don't go anywhere, everybody. We'll be right back. <laughs> Uh, That was quite an amusing video. Um, yeah, that's not exactly what a banshee looks like, but... <laughs> Because <laughs> I'm pretty sure it only has two circles, by the way. Yeah, it's got <laughs> two big rotor engines on the side. I was like, wow, there's like six? Like, <laughs> <this is> Apparently. <laughs> uh, it's always great. You know, you can, you can play the game all the time. I almost feel like someone who's just playing for the first times, and they've just kind of played with a Banshee for the first few times, they've looked at it, they're going to have a better idea maybe of the image on a conscious level than a pro gamer who's played oh, yeah. tens of thousands of games and it's just like a pattern recognition silhouette for them. They yeah. don't really see the unit anymore, you know? I think it's 100% true, although a silhouette would only be two, but, you know, 
instead of four. But that, that's still, I get your point, though. <laughs> <laughs> but you're right. I think it's 100%. Like, we don't even think after a certain point of trying to get good at StarCraft. We don't think of the unit and its yep. visuals and its its cool factor like we did when we were 12. And, you know, we named them all names and stuff. So, yeah, I'm not, I'm not too surprised. But then I think what we've determined through all of these media days is that none of our pros are very good artists. This is the great thing about all sorts of sports, Zombie Grub. It's you give people the ability to get good at one thing. <laughs> very, very good at one thing. And they don't need to get good at other things, okay? <laughs> okay. Well, we finally are in game three, guys. In the bottom left, we do have Shopify Rebellions Beyond. And in the top right side of the map, the Protoss Powerhouse representing Maturino, Australia. <laughs> hey, it's good to see as day one goes on already a bit more hype in that crowd out there. People are excited to be back here in Katowice once again. That's, uh, that's pretty awesome. Love the signs, guys. We got a proxy Rax that is the least proxy proxy ever. This is, um, this actually would be the correct proxy if it was the other side of the map. We'd definitely call it a proxy at this point. Yes, that would be the, the most <laughs> obvious spot they always <laughs> check for and it always gets found if you try to build it there. Now, just misses that. Oh, is he gonna, yeah, he just misses it, but I'm looking at the gases and seeing, uh, oh, okay, no, he is too, actually. I was wondering about the gold base on this map, and I was thinking, you know, for Estrella, he's not quite hero. Like, you know, hero, you put him on a, a map with a gold base, and it's yeah. just like, he's like a, a, a mosquito going towards a bright light at night. Like, it just, he can't not. With Estrella, it's like 50-50, so I was like, maybe he'll take advantage of it. This looks a lot more standard. Yeah, yeah, no, I remember hero, uh, the last map pool, he would always go for the gold on one of those maps. The point that I was pretty sure was obvious, and then we'd continue to watch pros be like, I'm not going to scout that. <laughs> <laughs> no, no thank you, sir. Yeah, we're going to lose to double gold base. You know? <laughs> yeah, that was like a that's right, thing. a double gold base. That's right, yes. So sick. That was sick. Um, but no, absolutely, like, definitely less common on Alcyone, um, which, we, you know, we've had a little bit of the improvements, I suppose, as the players taking this map and how they actually take the expansions. Initially, no one was mining out the minerals to so the right, for instance, for Bjorn, but now that's more common. But uh, it's going to be that, once again, not really proxy racks, an even faster addition of the reactor or tech lab, what I'm going to use the barracks for. And the Reaper, again, will go into the main base for that very well-timed scout, too. Not that it gave him the full information last game, but then I think it gave him, like, no information on the first game. So getting set up very much so as Estrella also adds in I mean, kind of, I want to call this one of the more typical openers, but obviously Stalker first compared to Adept first. Like, literally the most typical one is Adept and maybe, maybe in a Stalker, but... It's, it's really a, you can't scout me. I'm not going to let you scout me. Uh, the Stalker is so much better at just shutting the Reaper down, but it also means he's playing a little bit more blind. Without the yeah. early Sentry, it, it is scary if the Terran's a bit unpredictable, but he might be feeling like, hey, this is Beyond. Beyond normally has a pretty narrow toolbox compared to some other Terran players. Yeah, I think you're going to expect some type of maybe early game Reaper shenanigans, like maybe a true proxy. Okay, sure. But as far as the, I don't know, surprising like Cyclones, uh, second factory build, I suppose that we've seen a couple of Terrans use cheesy wise. Not so much. The Reaper will get into the main base and scout that is a Twilight Council opener. And that is going to be going into Blink, although give it a couple seconds to make sure. Yeah, it definitely is going to go into Blink. And the Adept did not realize that one of mines were burrowing. It's still got a scout, I guess, but... Probably don't want to die like that. Yeah, if it was at least on attack move, would have damaged one of those Widow Mines, which potentially slows down the drop because they have to repair it. But at least he's aware of what's happening. And I feel like that is very important because Hellions, it's all about, I need to stop these Hellions getting in my mineral line. Cyclones, it's, I need to just not die. Yeah. And Widow Mines, of course, is its own thing where it's like, okay, I just need to be watching when they come in. If I can focus the medevac down, take away the maneuverability, that's great. But most importantly, I just need to run probes away and leave single probes to tank those first shots. Estrella is sending out scouters for this exact scenario. And actually, I, I thought he was going probe and then pylon on the right, but he's actually doing three pylons all at once, which uh, is a little surprising. Turn the minerals all slapped down at once. The clickety clack there. I hope you're enjoying your ASMR today, everybody. This is 2024 StarCraft now with lovely uh, ear noises as well. And honestly, I do actually love the clickety-clack. It's something that's oh, yeah. kind of relaxing, brings me back to watching streams in 2012 
when Absolutely. everyone had their microphone right next to their keyboard and it was just like clack, 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 clack. You know, you could just, <laughs> it was relaxing. That was my favorite era though. It was K-pop <laughs> on and my favorite StarCraft pro gamer who didn't speak a lick of English, just had the audio from the keyboard. It was perfect. Yours was very different. You know, I was, I was listening <laughs> to Idra Rage while uh, playing this. Oh, dubstep. Terrible dubstep song Lights. on repeat. You know? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely did that as well. <laughs> but uh, the Raven is also going to be dissuaded as a straight. I, he's entirely on this opener, right? And there's, there's basically always a moment where the Wood of My Drop gets in, the Raven sneaks behind or wherever it goes. But so far, so good. And Estrella has gone for a Warp Prism. How many gateways? I didn't think this was a four gate. So did he go for, okay, three gateways, which is kind of transferable. You can use it to defend, which is going to be very nice as Bion is going for a bit of a Marine tank push. And actually it's pretty perfect as long as he also defends the Wood of Mines well and uh, not blinking his stalker so far as he's focused elsewhere. But the important thing is the probe so far have survived. Oh, those Widow Mines getting burrowed in there. Another <laughs> Stalker going down. A lot of Stalkers are dying to these Widow Mines. Oh, oh another one. Another three probes going down rough. Those four Widow Mine drops are always so good for just overloading the Protoss's attention. And, yeah. And that was really big value. Yeah, that's actually quite unfortunate, honestly, because it felt like Estrella had a pretty ideal setup. He had seen the attack. He was going to casually track it. You don't necessarily have to micro against it as it wasn't really committed either. And that maybe is a little bit of the trick that Bion also pulled, is that maybe only the Marines and then one tank. It could have been a second tank. It could have been a Liberator. It could have been an actual push, but... It really wasn't, and so the distractions of plenty came down. Estrella definitely made some mistakes, and is once again going to be going into two base storm and charge here. Something that Bion is going to increasingly pick up on with that later third base, as well as a little bit of the scouting from the Raven. Here comes. Is that a zealot drop down the bottom? I believe it is. I assume so. I wonder if there's a. I don't think there'd be a high templar in it this early. Another auto turret harass comes in and gets three probes. Ah, oh, stalkers. Really well done. Stalker drop coming in. Four Stalkers is the magic number to one-shot SCVs, but they're very valuable units, so losing a Four Stalker drop at this stage is actually a disaster. Yeah. Estrella is down in supply massively, and that looks worse than it is because he is going Storm, and there's... Whoa! Oh, the oh. crazy Beyond drops we were talking about at the start of the series. Oh, I guess he assumed that that was all the Stalkers, like at home defending this drop, as well as in the War Prism, but that was not absolutely the case. And this drop will unload despite having no medevac energy. It is a threat to the probe. Storm is already done, so that's not the biggest depowering in the world. But once again, it's a distraction. Estrella's pulling his army back home. He hasn't recalled his War Prism, and Beyond does have a little move out. I mean, it doesn't look too big as this drop finally is cleaned up. But if that was the third, it might have actually been able to bop it. The third actually taken to the left means that Beyond doesn't get close to it. Prism's gone because the two Vikings are here. He just needs to recall real quick. Oh. Does he have it? Oh, he does. Lincoln to recall, very smooth. He'll only lose one of the Stalkers. Gets the Prism down as well, though. So, of course, Beyond's very happy. And Estrella's supply blocked on 78. Thankfully, his third Nexus does unsupply block him. But on 45 probes this deep, oh. it does not feel good. The Raven has been an absolute menace, zombie grub. <laughs> I think with that soccer moving out, it's rather disappointing. Estrella really needs more wins. It was very nice of Beyond to give him that medevac. Excellent, but that still actually isn't enough to make up for everything that's happened in this game. Estrella never really getting a chance to jab or punch at his opponent. And this hardly counts, because without Storms, this is a very you know weak army, frankly. The Beyond armies will take it on, no problem, especially as it has that upgraded advantage. I don't believe Australia even has a forge. That's not going to change anytime soon. You know, Rotterdam was, was touching on a really important point in this matchup earlier when he was talking about that trigger match where he was saying, you need to just be good at four gate blink, two gate blink expand, and you need to be good at Phoenix Colossus. You have those three builds, you're a top tier PVT player. Australia has not played Phoenix much in a while, and I think yeah. Beyond knew this. He has abused the dead space so well with the Raven and the Widow Mine drop. He's done such a good job of getting himself ahead with that two-pronged harassment while defending the counter harassment. And now Beyond finds himself with a massive army supply advantage, and he's just gonna hit many places at once saying you can't defend everywhere. Which is very true, although Australia does manage to ward that drop away. It also kind of felt like Beyond's hesitation added to that. But it will live, it will clear up the spotters, and Estrella will be even more in the dark. He's trying to get some type of counter-aggression on the way, but how much is it really going to be able to do? 
The mineral is mined out, so we'll see in the future. But Bion is adding on further upgrades. Gonna have 1-1 one, one before Astray even has an upgrade really going. He's gonna have Ghosts. He's gonna have a very good army supply lead as this drop even loses one or two Stalkers. Okay, good save in the last one. And we even have now Bion going for another very aggressive maneuver. This time, not flying over Stalkers for Medivax. Potentially headed to that main base of Astraea. Bion is famous for saying, look, I got rid of your Observer or I killed one unit. I'm going to pick my whole army up and just dive. And he, he likes to do it right past where you have vision. So you, you don't expect it. The Zealot doesn't see it. There's nothing on that path. This is a doom drop. This is a massive amount of army looking for massive amounts of damage. And there is not a lot to respond. Is there energy in the main for recall? I don't think there is. Oh, okay. No, there is plenty of energy. If he quickly snap recalls, he might be okay. That's the question. That's pretty fast. And the bio get a call up on that uh, spotter pylon. Now goes after a depowering pylon. That's three gateways out of the equation. Oh, Bion's is taking Straya. widow mine hit. Oh, oh mine gosh. Hit. Massive damage to his mind. He has to leave oh. a lot of units behind. And and right there, Astraea says, thank you, widow mine. Yeah, yeah. See, widow mines are great. I also hurt Terran, it's fine. But seriously, that was that was very much necessary because there is no multi-pronged attack either. There is no opportunity for Bion to even capitalize on the fact that Estrella literally recalled everything, right? So Estrella yeah. finally getting some uh, repeat uh, successes, but now that Zella run by a complete failure. And Estrella is still overall down in supply. Upgrades are gonna be a big problem. Colossus are going to add another dynamic to the upcoming fights. Just a question of will they be in the proper position as Astray, I believe, has had himself blinded once again. Oh, the Observer's still chilling. That's a pretty good Observer because it was just out of Bion's scan range, like twice. Bion's sitting at home and he is letting Astray get through this dangerous period. I think he could be more active on the map. I, I, I like that he's macroing to a fourth and double upgrades, but right now Astray is so fragile. He's got a handful of units here. He has two hemp High Templar with a lot of energy, two more elsewhere on the map defending his bases. It's not that many. A few good EMPs ruins his day. He's mm. just got his first Colossi out now. I'd love to see Bion get out there and just make him a little bit more paranoid, maybe deny this fifth base on the right side. It's actually a little surprising, uh, but Bion has chosen this way of playing here, and it, it might be that he moves out when he's maxed out, and he's still going to have a supply lead, and it's still going to be very promising, but yeah, not necessarily hitting Astraea where it hurts with this very fragile army that really is, is also getting increasingly one-dimensional as the EMPs threaten all of the charge lots and the High Templars and the Archons. But not to be so, so Astraea gets to add that little complexity. Colossus first, perhaps some disruptors after another layer that's going to bother Bion and a layer that doesn't need upgrades either, so that's always nice. I really have to applaud Astray, I suppose, for being this confident. You know, seeing him out on the map with this army in this position is actually really a great sign as far as his attitude. Obviously, it could be a mistake, but right now, it's really spot on. Be nice to maybe open those minerals up a bit more. Right now, that choke point can ruin your ability to rotate and defend the fourth. First person view of Astraea, strap yourselves in, ladies and gentlemen. He does use the D.Va voice pack, so we may oh. hear some very uh, cringe, as the kids call it, voice lines. Personally, my favorite. Mm, no. <laughs> oh, come on, it's the best thing that ever happened to actually, Starcraft was the D.Va voice pack zombie growth. The Korean D.Va is actually very good, but uh, anyway, we're moving on. We're not going to bring up any of the past transgressions. We're gonna, yeah, <laughs> transgressions. Anyway, the moving of the Colossus again, like it can backfire. If he manages to just barely avoid that one spot on the map with a scouter and then a doom drop comes in, it could be devastating. Or a pop-up attack on top of his gold, that could be an easy cancel. But so far, he's got enough of the map vision with that observer still on that third base, Azella to the left, Azella to the right. He's actually even taking the map himself. Obviously, the uh, it can slow down for the Terran as far as the okay, goodbye tank. As far as the expansion process goes, but we're really getting into a super big late game as Beyond is adding on four command centers, multiple starports. Now that's really where I thought this game was going to go after Stray dipped down so hard in supply. That's so many that's shieldless charge lots, but that's also just so many charge lots. <laughs> Yeah, no feedbacks. Uh, oh, sorry, great feedbacks, I should say, coming in on the ghosts, and not a, not a terrible trade for Australia. Getting rid of some of those valuable uh, ghost energy as well as pushing them back army on the front as well. No disruptors is what's so surprising, I would say, this yeah. game. It's yeah. Immortal Storm Colossus, a bigger mortal count. Trigger is an expert in this style. I haven't seen Australia play it this late in the game before. 
Yeah, we, we did see Hero having a couple of surprising games, because again, kind of our expectation for this matchup is without the big Colossus, the big Robo units, basically. As uh, we have a battle, so hold that thought. Vikings are getting a lot of shots off on the Colossus, but the Colossus are powering through, actually getting the shots off. Rest of the Protoss army also coming through is going to force Beyond to evacuate. The Vikings will not quite get the last Colossus. Still not quite, <laughs> not quite. But at least they gave their lives in kind of a worthwhile trade. Three Colossus for every many Vikings that was. Bit of a wash, both players able to max out again. And it is going to be Estrella still emphasizing the Colossus. Because there's also that time in, in this matchup where a lot of the time, it will be, okay, my Colossus are gone, whatever, man. I'm on oh, to Disruptors. AMP is taking oh. the Blue Blur Energy, a massive ambush. Estrella's army gets broadsided in the worst possible way. Oh, wow. Talents fighting a planetary in the south. Estrella stumbling into Beyond's army and getting not just the worst side of that engage, but pretty much the worst side of any engagement in every single version of this universe. That was fantastic for Beyond. That was so bad for Estrella, man. Down to the, the planetary, taking a bunch of the zealots out of it, the wooden mines popping off. Everything went well for Beyond right there. Estrella actually on phase still thinks he can recover, and with all the economy that he's been able to build up and still actually has running, it seems to be the case. He's actually right about this. Is he going to go up to four Colossus? or five it is gonna be five that's a lot of firepower that might make the the Vikings like more and more effective without a number of stalkers to protect the Colossus but if the Colossus are actually firing away then it might be worth it but right now for Estrella he just does not have the supply yeah unfortunately being this outnumbered the Colossus are gonna rally into the Vikings and get taken down it was a very close series but at the end of the day beyond there confidence some say recklessness i say confidence i say killer instinct the way he just shoved through that entrance of his gold base flanked astraea's army and no hesitation emp the high templar the biggest threat and pounced that was killer instinct right there yeah yeah i mean astraea definitely had an idea if i wanted to play that game and never really got to it Again, those Colossus, if they're able to utilize their range, if they're able to get all the shots, like five Colossus is what it was getting to. And that's a lot of DPS, especially when combined with a handful of Immortals that you don't necessarily expect, and the Storms that did get EMP'd. But Beyond's aggressive uh, tactics, his ability to be on the map, even when he was also setting up for a late game potential, really shown right there. And again, both players trying to adapt to the best of their ability mid-series as they had also played so many times before this. Beyond finally ending his losing streak versus Estrella as well, and in the biggest tournament of the years thus far. Yeah, very important moment there for Beyond. And obviously game one was awesome for Estrella. This was really cool. I like the stylish finish as well with the disruptor shots where uh, Beyond almost dodged it, but he was just too outnumbered. Game two though, really showed Beyond's ability to get back in control. And he said, okay, I'm gonna lean on you much heavier with the four Widow Mine drop which of course ended up getting great value in game two and game three. And from there, it was just attacking multiple areas over and over again. I'm not gonna let you simplify this to just one direct engagement where your storms will find value. And then the third game was also very well controlled from Bjorn. It actually looked like he might have just been able to push in and win, but it did kind of go into a later stage. If Australia had not been totally blindsided by this army, we could have seen something a lot more back and forth. But this was just far too decisive. And even though Australia's supply started to creep back up, it just all wasn't there. It wasn't necessarily the best supplies. The upgrades also impacted these battles. And of course, he was rallying in very inappropriately. Let's go ahead and talk to Bjorn on the stage. Thank you so much. An exciting round of matches. Standing here with the winner, Bjorn. Hard fought every single one of those. Which of those three was the most stressful game for you to play? 어 일단 변현 선수 승리 축하드리고요. 어 일단 세 경기 모두 되게 힘든 경기였는데 어 변현 선수에게 어이세 경기 중에서 가장 좀 힘든 경기가 뭐였나요? 어 아무래도 가장 힘든 경기라고 생각하면 아무래도 진경진 일 경기가 아닐까 생각해요. 그 아스트리아 선수가 세 경기 모두 다 비슷한 플레이를 했는데 일 경기 때 그래도 이렇게 한번 느껴본 것이 이 경기 때 제가 이길 수 있는 주요 요인이었던 것 같아요. Well, uh, I think all the games were hectic, but still, I think the one that lost the first game and actually the one the hardest, I uh, mean, he, his play was very good. So I think um, uh, being battered by uh, him in the first game, I think uh, helped me a lot uh, getting through the second and third game.
Well, tell me a little bit, Bjorn, about Estrella as an opponent for you. You pushed through a losing streak against him. You finally beat him here. And it seems like you know him very well as an opponent, had a great way of exploiting his weaknesses with those Widow Mines. But tell me, what does it mean to win against him? 어 일단은 그 아스트라 선수의 최근 전적이 아무래도 좀 연패를 기록하고 있었다 보니까 이번에 이제 아스트라 선수를 상대로 이제 연패를 끊어내시게 됐는데 아무래도 이제 계속 이제 맞붙으시다 보니까 아스트라 선수의 이제 스타일도 좀 파악을 하셨을 거고 그래서 이제 뭐냐 지뢰를 중심으로 이렇게 좀 파일을 하셨던 것 같은데 어좀 어떻게 좀 경기를 좀 보시나요? 오 제가 아스트리아 선수한테 약하다고 생각은 전혀 한 번도 한 적이 없거든요. 그래서 저는 오늘 경기 전까지 내가 무조건 이겨야 되는 상대니까 과감히 하자 했는데 아스트리아 선수가 제, 저를 그러니까 제가 좀 까다로워하는 플레이를 제대로 맞춰왔더라고요. 평소랑 좀 다르게 플레이한 것 같아서 준비는 잘해온 것 같은데 근데 저는 제가 아스트리아 선수한테 연패를 하고 있다고 생각해본 적은 없어요. So I mean, um, obviously uh, Australia has a good run. Uh, but still, I never thought of uh, him better than me, honestly. But I, I, I didn't even realize that uh, I was uh, on the losing streak against him. But um, still, he, he managed to do a lot of great plays against him, uh, which I was very um, hard to fought, you know, fight against. But still, um, I still managed to do, uh, I still managed to overcome, and I really f feel good. Well, it is always glad to see you feeling good. We love to see your smile on stage. We love the excitement that you bring. And we're going to get to see a lot more of you as you head deeper into Group C. Anyone else you're particularly worried about in this group? 네, 앞으로 또 이제 시조 경기 계속 하시게 될 텐데 아, 그래도 쟁장한 선수도 아직까지 많이 남아 있잖아요. 어떻게 어, 시조에서 가장 좀 견제되는 선수가 좀 있으신가요? 어, 뭐 견제되는 선수는 뭐 다들 견제되는 선수들이고 다들 그러니까 다른 사람들이 뭐 가장 우리 조가 쉽다고 하는데 전혀 그렇게 생각하지 않고 다들 어려운 선수들이고 뭐 세랄만 있는 게 아니라 앞으로 남은 스킬러스나 뭐 켈라졸 뭐 등등 아니 잘 생각이 안 나는데 <웃음> 그런 선수들도 굉장히 잘하는 선수기 때문에 뭐 저는 이렇게 앞에 있는 경기만 우선 잘하면은 좋은 결과가 나오지 않을까 생각해요. Well, I mean, every other guy says uh, I'm in the easiest, uh, easiest group, but still, I mean, uh, there's Sarah, of course, and uh, still other guys are also very great. Skillless, Kelzer, Firefly, yeah, all the other guys are very great. So um, I still have to uh, watch. I still have to like practice through, and I still have to prepare a lot. So, yeah, we'll see. Well, that respect for your opponents, I hope it serves you well. Good luck, Beyond, as you continue in the tournament. Let's send it back to the desk for a closer look at that best of three. There it is. I never thought of my, him as better than me. I love the confidence coming out from Beyond here in the answer. And you know what? It will serve him well to be able to get through this series, but it was quite close. Australia did definitely put up a good fight here. Wadi, as well as Loco, joining me to talk about this one. Wadi, that was, I, I didn't, know how this was really going to play out here, but Australia did put up a good fight against him. Yeah, I think it was a lot of what I expected, I suppose, in a way of just, you know, if you get to that mid game, it is going to go back and forth a bit. It is going to be some crazy surrounds, yeah. some zealot warp ins to save the day and all of that kind of fun. And when it comes down to those kind of games, I really do feel like Australia hits his stride and is able to really make the most of those situations. So I think he really showed that, especially in that game number one, he got to be aggressive. He got to stay on the map beyond just a little bit too good through games two and three, but a great showing from Australia. Very hopeful to see how he does in the rest of these matches now. Yeah, definitely. I mean, after game one, we even saw it in the crowd there. Australia, Protoss, Hope, question mark. Well, not unfor unfortunately, not for this series here, yeah. Loco, as Bjorn was able to fight back quite fiercely. No, that was a really good series. I mean, a lot of back and forth action. I guess one theme is that Australia wasn't really opening up with Phoenixes all too much, right? So that's something that Bjorn obviously will be happy to abuse because he loves flying around with Metavex. He loves boosting into the main base. And well, that's something that backfired a couple times as well, where suddenly those Widow Mines they didn't quite connect on the Protoss units that he was anticipating, but mm. overall, really fun series. Yeah, he's actually, uh, Bjorn is staying on the main stage, and I think he's going to be going up against Skillus next up uh, there. But speaking of Skillus, actually, he did play out his first series already throughout the day here, Wadi, and uh, how did that go? Yeah, I've been watching a little bit of uh, Firefly especially, a couple of Firefly series, and the first one was against Skillus, and Firefly was able to take that one two to one, which has me really excited for Firefly, because I felt like coming into this, Firefly's biggest kind of fear might be just kind of being on a stage like this one yeah, and like yeah. being at a big event. So to get that first one under his belt, 
really awesome. Obviously, not great for skills because it makes this tough uh, group so much tougher for him. His match against Bjorn is now very important. Um, since then, Firefly also lost to Serral. Um, no surprises there. Sarah looked good. Fire... <laughs> hey, actually, game two, I feel like Firefly had a couple of good moments. Just needs to sharpen up. He's Obviously happy he to play the macro game. Like, that's what yeah. actually kind of impresses me, because most people try their very best to just end the game against Serral. Yeah, yeah. Because going up against him in the late game seems like a disaster, but we glanced over, like, eight minutes in. They're actually making fleet beacons, and they're actually going into a late game scenario. Fun match. Definitely potential hopes, then, for yeah. Firefly, who I think does come in for a lot of... Uh, StarCraft fans, is, I mean, I know he's not completely, p people aren't completely oblivious to who he is, but he's definitely the one that kind of stands out as like, people don't have as much of a read, as much intel on this guy who has been able to rise up a little bit more recently compared to the rest of the field. Definitely a little bit of a dark horse, you know, sure. he's been really good in China for a while. Yep. Definitely feel like he peaked, kind of disappeared, came back and he's doing really well again. We just never got to see him on an international stage. So the fact that he's kind of here now, yes. it's really exciting. And again, if he can show his true potential, I think that could be really cool. Like he has a chance to get out of the group. It's sort of why I was hoping that he would get to Atlanta. Obviously we know the debacle that actually occurred there, but that would have been a great little stepping stone for him to have that LAN experience under his belt to then come to Katowice. But anyway, that's by the by, I'm kind of musing in different directions here. Thank you very much, gentlemen. It's time to go to a short break. When we return, we will keep Bjorn on at the stage. He's going to go up against Skillis here. Current Currently 0-1 down, really needs to fight on back. Intel Extreme Masters Katowice is brought to you by Monster Energy, the United States Air Force, and Intel.
A different match, a different opportunity here for Skillis now as we move into our second round of matches for Group C. Joining me, we have ZG as well as Ben to talk about everything that's going to be going down here. How are you doing, Ben, so far? You're looking good. You're looking fine. We've got lots of good Terran wins on the board so far today. Yeah, good Terran wins and some surprises. I mean, Shin beating out Cure there was not what I expected. Right. But with uh, Skillis going up against Beyond, like, uh, it's, it's quite an exciting match, actually. I mean, like, Skillis, he has has to start winning here because losing oh, yeah. against Firefly, that's not the favorite in this group whatsoever. But it's not going to be easy going up against Beyond, who just, you know, kind of slapped uh, Shreya aside a little bit. A kind of rough one is PvP, I suppose, for someone like Skillis going up against Firefly. And then there is still a Shreya kind of in the wings waiting for that Protoss versus Protoss matchup coming along. Yes, but let's talk talking about this. It is Beyond versus Skillis. Beyond obviously just comes off the back of winning a TVP. I don't know how much Skillis has been able to, you know, sit there and actually watch how much was going down in that match as a whole here. Right. Uh, but Beyond had some vulnerabilities here and there. Well, yeah, I think he, like we said in the cast, it was kind of one of those things where you could tell that they had both played each other a lot yeah. and there was a lot of uh, preconceptions as to what they were going to do as a player, but also as the meta and the race of, of TVP. And I think it's going to be just completely different here. Even if Skillis was able to watch and take notes and even have time to practice, which is absolutely not the case, sure. to actually replicate whatever Estrella was planning and then their history together, it just wouldn't be the same, right? And I don't think Skillis would be replicating that. Skillis actually came into this tournament extremely extremely confident and extremely happy with his presence. But he does kind of look like still that guy who can take a harsh loss and then let it affect him. So I kind of come into this best of three hoping that Skillis can do very well. But he did just take a harsh loss that was probably very helpful to be a win. Mm -hmm. So that might be affecting his mentality. And then Bjorn, I think, typically is better than him in this matchup. The history does state so. And when Bjorn also gets to play a more comfortable yeah. TVP, which Skillis might actually be giving him, we'll see, uh, then yeah, that's also going to make it very difficult for Skillis. Your thoughts coming in, Ben? I mean, historically, it's 13-3 in favor of Bion, which is, you know, it's kind of expected with how good Bion is in general. But between the last five series, which is pretty weird to say, it's actually like 3-2 in favor of Bion. But the one time that Skillis won, he won 3-0, kind of slam dunking him out. I, I don't think it's going to be a walk in the park for Bion, but if he plays as good as he did against Estrella, which was pretty solid overall, I, it's going to be tough. It, it's going to be tough for Skillis because he plays a completely different brand of PVT against, well, against Terran in general. Mm -hmm. He's the guy that's very much like in your face more with Blink Stalkers, whereas Astray is far more about like sitting back, taking some of the punches, playing the more late game, whereas Skillis loves his aggression quite a lot more. What are you spying on, ZG? You know what that 3-0 was, dude? Demo? Yeah. You want to say it? <laughs> yeah, balance test tournament. But still, but still, but still. <laughs> <laughs> Balance test tournament. <laughs> all right, well. Hey, it's, it's a big deal, all right? Cyclones are better then, eh? It was the Wardy TV. Yeah. Whoa, wait, was it the Wardy TV? A very tournament? prestigious tournament, I'll have you know. <laughs> a rematch of the... It, it proliferates everywhere. It's like... <laughs> After Pig brought it up earlier, I was like, yeah, we've got to talk about it again, but I didn't want to mention it, Zombie Group. <laughs> We're going to talk. It's going to happen every day. <laughs> Maybe not on the last day. It's a bit more important. But anyway, yeah. So, all right. <laughs> I don't even know what to ask anymore. What do I well, ask? Skillers did win against him, like, oh, actually still The last time they played, it was 2-1. Yeah, but it was also four months ago. Like, I actually was kind of surprised. Cool. Oh, actually, uh, yeah, that's also quite a long time ago, I guess, and the meta continued to develop. But, sure. you know, that was still a time in which we had kind of figured out that Cyclones added a new early aggressive option and Protoss were, I, I feel like their frustrations with the matchup are about the same as in they're still frustrated and they still admit that it's a hard matchup. Yeah. But, you know, it has been four months and Skillis says he's improved, but Bion's now warmed up. Skillis might have the loss that's really, the, you know, tagging him and, and making him feel bad. I don't know. But I, I do want to believe in Skillis. Mm -hmm. And uh, this could be an amazing match if he were to win to really boost that confidence going into tomorrow. And I, I know like people like to talk about Max Packs, but Max Packs over the last couple of weeks alone has just been showcasing like phenomenal PVT, going up against Clem, beating him out like 3-1 in Europe and then 3-0 in NA. And I mean, yeah. Skillis is the kind of guy that 
really like reveres Max Pax. So if he can take anything from his play and just be like, hey, I can actually squeak that in a little bit, because yeah. Max Pax was very open about he's going for more tech units let, or more gas kind of thing. So yeah, I think if there is a time to do it, it's now. I feel like most Protoss should be revering Max Pax, to be yeah. perfectly fair. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> He's like this mytho mythical creature that one day maybe... He is mysterious yeah. in, every, in every way. I, uh, I thought someone said that defensive Protoss was the best, though. No, it's all about Max Pax. Anyway, never mind. <laughs> We've got, it's time to head on over to the stage here. We have got Skillus versus Bjorn here in this group. We thought it might just be a fight for a top two, but with Firefly doing well as well, it might be very difficult here. Let's find out over on the stage. Thanks so much, Kylaris. All our wonderful casters and analysts as they take us through this action. We've let Bion stay on the stage. We've invited Skillis to join him. And now these two titans are going head to head for your entertainment. Let's get this match started. Bjorn just got to warm up his TVP against Australia. Now he has to take on Skillis, another important match of this group. Let's welcome him onto the stage. What is Bjorn going to do? Slow nod. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, at this point, if I was one of the players on stage, I would also be afraid to reach out yeah, for the handshake. Because you know he's going to deny you. Yeah, obviously, the man had to work hard for it, right? Definitely looked a bit scary, even in that final game on El Sione. But in the end, the man from the Rebellion did win his first series. That was not the case for Skillers. He had a PvP against Firefly. Some people probably thought that Skillers was favored there. Some people thought it was even. Some people thought maybe he's the underdog, right? Because Firefly is the new goat coming out of China. I don't think it was a necessary loss for Skillers. I was keeping my eye on game three, and I kind of liked his start a little bit more. But Firefly actually got him good with a little depth drop. And he's like, hey, man, you lost a couple probes you should really rebuild the probes what you don't want to do right now is build a robo oh, quickly yeah. <laughs> and then obviously dt showed up so rough start to the group for skillers but you know he's been working hard on that pvt and i was actually on the same flight from amsterdam to katowice over here or to krakow actually and we spoke a little bit about the game about his practice and believe it or not Wadi, the internet won't believe it but i think you will skillers says that he rather plays pvt and PvZ. He says, I actually like playing against Terran more. I think it's easier to beat Terran than it is to beat Zerg. Well, not everyone agrees with that one, but... Uh. <laughs> <laughs> that is uh, that's one way of putting it. <laughs> Slightly controversial statement, but hey, you know, sometimes your play style just lines up like that, right? So we'll see what he has to kind of bring to the table, because maybe he's got some sneaky things planned in the early game as well, given that little bit of an edge, maybe put Bjorn off. We find out in a moment here as we dive on into our opening game of this best of three. Bjorn versus Skillers, and in the bottom left, repping that Shopify Rebellion in the red, it is indeed Bjorn. Young winning his first series, this man lost his first series, and it doesn't necessarily make it a must-win series immediately, but the map at the bare minimum is kind of what he's looking for. Representing Team Liquid, it's Skillis. I do love what Benny said on the desk. I do think this is going to be a completely different PvT. Skillis is actually a big Phoenix enjoyer as well, where I felt Australia's never been a massive Phoenix lover, at least not in PvT as Bion is building a barracks, kind of in the center of the map, a little bit closer to home than it is to Skillis' side of the map. But yeah, I wouldn't be surprised to me at all to see Skillis mix it up between Blink and Phoenix openers. Quick Storm, I don't think it's really on the menu for Skillis. Doesn't, doesn't strike me as the kind of Skillis style at all, right? I think he plays a bit of a slower game generally, if you can play Phoenix, Colossi and so on. Maybe that's one way, as we do see our Proby just coming across. I'm not going to spot the barracks initially, as he is round and round to kind of check, but just doesn't find it. 
He has definitely been a Phoenix Colossus enjoyer. He's also one of the very few high-level Protosses that likes Phoenix Twilight. Mm. And I'm a big believer in Phoenix Twilight, because yep. a lot of the builds of Terran that are incredibly good in punishing that Phoenix Colossus opening, like we saw Gumio have a cool opening earlier today against Trigger. Now, that scout for Gumio was obviously massive, because I think he wanted to go for a Wintermind drop. He didn't. I digress. But whatever is good against Phoenix Robo is very bad against Phoenix Twilight. But whatever Phoenix Twilight is very good against, you know, like, it goes a little bit in circles. Uh, it will be interesting to see if Skillers decides to go for some Stargate openings, if he can hide it properly, and where we're going to take it. But I don't expect him to go for a quick storm like we saw Astrea do. And like we even saw Stats do. Now, I do kind of feel that Stats' hand was forced a little bit by that very bad start he had in game two. But, hey, he turned that into one hell of a kid. <laughs> Yeah, definitely did as this Reaper is on the hunt for that probe and might just about run into it. He turns away from the probe, so the probe gets to sneak back over. And we'll just have a secondary scout towards the natural up the ramp. Just trying to have a look at what exactly is building over here on the side of Bjorn in these early stages. CC starts up on the high ground as well. Bjorn does this a lot at the moment. Super cautious, doesn't want to be dealing with any nonsense early in this game. As this uh, factory is going to get blocked from building an add-on. Yep, first unit is going to be Widowmine. I yeah, you're going to have to change that, okay, and he is going to change it. I was about to say, because if you want to go for a Widow Mine, you don't really want to reveal the fact that you go for a Widow Mine. But since we only went Reaper into nothing else out of the barracks, you need to bring your Reaper all the way home to finally kill that probe. In the end, Beyond did change his mind, and he says, no Widow Mine for me, I'm going to go Cyclone first. Don't think he scouted the Stargate. Single Cyclone is very nice against Oracles, but I don't know if Skittles is going to open up Oracle here. Uh, this is going to be beyond scout into the base right now, but he shouldn't be able to spot that Stargate unless he manages to bop himself over the wall. Here's the Cyclone, hits the Adept once before it shades away. Medivac on the way to continue harassing. The Reaper's going to go the long way around. We'll take two Adept hits on the way in, but we'll get through. And if what? he goes down, he would see the Stargate. Doesn't get there yet. The probes to oh. all. He does get the scout big. on the Phoenix as well. Yep, that's big. Obviously, for the people who don't know, you can kind of see as a Terran player what the Protoss is building. If you zoom in on the Stargate, you can sort of see the hologram of that being a Phoenix. And that obviously really changed things. So now Beyond will probably make another Cyclone. There is a chance he moves out with, he has actually done this a few times, where he shows a lot of Cyclones and Marines and a Medivac in the face of the Protoss. The Protoss is very focused, tunnel vision on having a good defense, and then he sneaks a Liberator into the main base. He did this against Trigger in the Masters Colosseum. That Liberator killed 15 probes, because Beyond was so good at being like, hey, you have to pay attention to my Cyclones, micro here, micro here, micro here, and if you're not paying attention, that Liberator can deal a devastating amount of damage. It's one of those things that Beyond is great at, right? Just micro at the front, maybe it's such a danger and then just sneaking something in the back just being able to multi-prong well we'll see what skills can do is we are going to see some offense here very shortly from beyond the cyclones begin to move out accompanied by the liberator on the other side as well so it's going to be aggression time very shortly really comes down to these phoenix you yeah. got to be careful if you get too much lifted up at once if skills can get a jump on a fight you very quickly lose everything on the map moments like this is why i'll never get tired of starcraft because both have potential here both have a lot of potential like this can go very well for beyond this can go very well for skillers that start was not great because one of the phoenix took a lot of damage but as long as skillers stays near his battery he's fine and scouting Ooh, this is great zoning by the way but beyond making it that's a lot of damage water on two out of the four phoenix that is a crazy amount of damage. And Skillis did see the Liberator, but he didn't kill it, obviously. And now he's still kind of in an awkward spot because he took a lot of damage on two of those Phoenixes. So easy to target them down during a fight. He is going to get the jump on this Liberator now, though, so finds it as Bjorn continues to pull it up the right side. Phoenix gets the grab. That's going to be a nice shutdown there. Bjorn is still on the map with those Cyclones, but has not decided to try and do anything else with them. So just kind of hold him back, hold him back to the center. And Skillis is oh. on that robot but dives in with the Phoenix. Well, doesn't really dive in, but accidentally wanders through, loses both of those hurt Phoenix, and that's why it's so punishing, right, from, you know, taking that damage earlier. Yep, that was incredibly well done by Beyond. Because as a Phoenix player, you never want to keep all your Phoenix at home and just like, hey, you're going to do something, right? Like, no, Phoenix are such quick units. They're great scouting units. They're also excellent in finding a little bit of damage, a free Marine here, an SCV there that's building a refinery or building a depot. Plenty of ways to slow the Terran down. But since Beyond didn't commit to the fight, you're like, okay, I kind of want to move out, but you have to be so cautious where you move them. Skillis was not cautious enough there. And even though he killed the Liberator and he didn't take any economic damage i'm still if i'm beyond I'm, I'm completely happy with this i know that i delayed this nexus a little bit we're six minutes into the game wadi that nexus isn't even done yet and sure he lost the lip but he killed two phoenix if i'm beyond i'll take it 
Yeah, Phoenix is something which you want to kind of build a certain amount of typically and then focus on other tech, at least for a little while. But now you're more forced into keeping on building those Phoenix. Gurn obviously just freely moving into his upgrades. 1-1, one, one, Stim Combat Shield, his own third CC is finishing into an orbital very soon. And another Phoenix goes down. Skills just cannot keep those air units alive in these early stages. You mentioned that critical Phoenix count or that a number of Phoenixes where you want to go, where you want to end up with as a Protoss. One of the mo reasons why losing a Phoenix or even two Phoenixes early is so bad because that move right there would have gone so much better if he has five Phoenix. Then you lift four Phoenix fire immediately, you kill that worker. If your Phoenix count gets dropped to three, you lift, there's only two Phoenixes attacking that unit instead of four unit of Phoenixes attacking that unit at once, and you're more likely to lose more Phoenix because you have less DPS. So, yeah, honestly, kind of painful for Skillers, but hey, a good Guardian Shield, a good fight with the Colossus, and he's completely back in it. Yeah, he is trying to go straight to that fourth base as well after being delayed, taking the third a little, so no delays on him in that regard. Gonna get Skillless's first person view here for a few moments as he continues to move those Phoenix around and seeing him just finding the Cyclones and quickly moving back. He also just popped the Templar Archives down yeah. there during this. So. Kind of early, no? 7 yeah. minutes, 28 Very quick seconds. Switch. Like as soon as the Twilight finish, basically. Yep. After a Stargate, after a Colossus opening, now also going for quick Templar Archives. And he didn't even have these gases yet. Really wonder where he's getting all that gas from. I do hope that he had extended thermal lens on the way and that it's done by now. Kind of concern because how on earth do you have that much gas? <laughs> all these sentries too. Yeah, I, I mean, I feel like this is a push from Bjorn that could just kill him, right? You know, but he's being a little bit too greedy. He doesn't quite have full preparation. So extended thermal lens did just finish. So he does in fact have that. Bjorn is going to split up. He's not going to go for one big attack. He's going to try and find a couple different directions in to deal some damage. Yep, I guess we didn't obviously invest in Blink. Didn't really make any stalkers. So all of the minerals will be spent on zealots, and yeah, the gas is just going to spend it on a lot of sentries, made a lot of phoenix, building some of these rover units and quick archons, hoping that maybe Bjorn is going to take a big fight before there are temp before there are ghosts out on the map, as the ghost academy did just finish up. One colossus is oh. very exposed there, as it's in the middle of all these bases, and it is going to get jumped on and it dies. And the second one, honestly, there is nothing protecting its skillers. Where are those force fields? You got so many sentries. It did live for a while, but losing two colossi like that is incredibly painful. This Protoss army body is not meant to chase a Terran army. It's meant to stand in a good spot, drop some force fields to take a good fight. Now you have to run into your own main in a very awkward manner. I mean, this was just great for Beyond. It could have been even better, but uh, he's not done yet. Yeah, and because there's no blink, and he just chased all the way into the main base. He's got no mobility anymore. Every Phoenix has gone down. Stargate's fallen, so you can't rebuild any further. And Bjorn gets himself a few more probes before he is done, and even then he's not actually done, because guess what? Back in the main, because there's no way to stop him. No, but it is so painful to chase armies like this with a couple of sentries, a couple of zealots, and if you don't have blink stalkers, that's where the phoenixes are supposed to still be out there and making this impossible for the Terran. You want to drop everything in my main fight, then you're committed, but he's not committed because there's no mobile anti-air. I mean, these stalkers without blink, they're kind of useless. It's even denied, by the way, so we're never going to get blink. I'm incredibly impressed that Skiller still has 60 six probes after losing 25 but make no mistake this game is a nightmare for skillers everything is going wrong and i feel that beyond has him right where he wants and i think beyond is very close to just ending this game yeah i mean this one colossus is maybe his lifeline at the moment a few zelts are kind of keeping it alive the marauders try and dive on it maybe with the help of a widow mine but super battery does pop there so beyond doesn't quite win out of the front but skillers just doesn't have enough to justify staying in and he still has that drop in his natural as well so Bjorn takes a very convincing first game where it was just the little things to start. Damage on Phoenix, kind of stops skills being as active, then you lose more Phoenix, and it just had that knock-on effect of eventually, Bjorn is able to take this big fight and catch Skillis off guard. Yeah, no, Skillis actually had a decent amount of ground units. He had a couple of Stalkers without Blink. He had all those sentries. We had an Archon or two, and he thought he was saving the natural with the Colossus there. And yeah, he'd be safe against eight Marines, even 60 Marines. One Colossus can hold the door against 60 Marines with Stim, but not against a monstrous Terran army with still those early game Cyclones as well. Marauders in the mix. Uh, this was just not it for Skillers. You look at the minimap, you see all these Protoss forces out of position, and two out of three Colossi dying before the rest of the army shows up. I mean, beautiful play by Beyond. Love how he was kind of bunny hopping between the main, the third, and back into the main. But yeah, finding a window like that, a tiny opening to get on top of these Colossus is all that Beyond needed. That fourth base is Skillers as well, right? Because it's right down the right side. He was positioned over there with so much, and that meant that Beyond towards the natural was already on the high ground. He didn't have a ramp to run up or anything. There wasn't any force fields to buy time. He just was able to run straight through, catch both those colossi as we saw. Mm -hmm. And that obviously was the, the tipping point towards everything else that happened from that point on. 
As, uh, yeah, Bjorn takes a much easier map than what he had to do against Australia, so hopefully Skillers can recover from that one, give us a fight back in this best of three. Yep, and we can't forget about that early game, the Reaper getting just deep enough to see that Stargate, to see that Phoenix, because otherwise there's a good chance that Bjorn, after that one Cyclone, makes other units, builds an add-on, whatever, because he doesn't know what he has to worry about. But getting that scout is just so big for a guy like Bjorn, Love how he moves out with Triple Cyclone, and even if he's Liberator, maybe Skillers did his homework and he knows that Bjorn likes to make a Marine Cyclone push with a Liberator in the main. He was clearly aware of that potential play. What he was not aware of is that you still need to be super careful with your Phoenix because Cyclones pack a punch. All right, well, in the game number two, we're in the bottom right-hand side of Oceanborn. Our Red Terran player representing the Shopify Rebellion is Bjorn. And in the top left side of Oceanborn, we're looking at the main base of the man who lost his first series of the tournament against Fireflies. Now down 0-1 in his second series. He needs to start turning things around. Team Liquids Skillis. A lot of those little things just to kind of sharpen up on, to make it a little bit smoother for yourself as we get into this now game number two. Rax and the gas coming down. No proxy out on the map or anything. It hides it off away from the ramp, so maybe Skillis will be panicked for a moment as he comes up here. But uh, a very minor factor. As we just get double gas on the way, so be unlikely to open factory before expanding once again. I think Skillis lost Blink on this map. I think this is a pretty good map to just go for some good old 4-gate Blink star progression as well. Doesn't mean you have to kill them, right? But just kind of try to get yourself ahead, force out a certain reaction out of the Terran, and then go up to three bases whenever you want to go up to three bases, and then maybe you can sneak in a quick storm. Now, after that first game, I wouldn't be very keen on playing Stargate again, because it just seems that Bion was very comfortable. And what I love the most is that Bion realized he didn't need to run into the natural. You don't have to deal damage. If you can just prevent the Phoenixes from flying to your side of the map, you're not losing any SCPs, you're delaying the third, so you're dealing this indirect damage. And one thing that I didn't even mention, but I do think it should be mentioned, is that with the opening that Bion went for, he forced Skillers to build double shield battery in the natural. That's also indirect damage. So double shield battery, Phoenix is taking damage, late third base, perfectly fine opening if you're beyond. Yep, and uh, this Reaper <laughs> misses the probe again, heads across the map to try and get that initial scouting, which maybe you get to see what the plan is as well. Barracks is trying to get over here to build the reactor before the probe gets in. Blocking this would be nice, actually. Yeah, you can just sit there and stop it. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Yana's smiling, but he probably doesn't think it's all that funny. No, not cool. <laughs> oh. Pretty major delay on your reactor at this point. And now you're going to... Reaper comes back. Oh. We'll build a pylon again. <laughs> Quick Cyclone is on the production tab for Beyond, but Skillers is gonna go Twilight Council this time around. And I like it. I think this is a very good map for Twilight Council. Oceanborn is massive, and we used to always say like, oh, large map is great for Phoenix, but there are some of these moments where the fact that the map is very large is actually not that great for Phoenix, because they cannot be harassing, defending, harassing, defending as quickly as they could on a smaller map. And it takes forever for even a fast unit like the Phoenix to be defending at home and then fly all the way to the other side of the map and then maybe there is another drop that snuck out so you have to bring them back again and you have to recall i kind of like twilight on this map i'm with you as we're about to lose a second probe of the game here so two probes to that reaper grenade goes down as we try and make our escape one adept died across the map as well and this reaper Ooh. roddy is out of there he's even going to try and go for one more probe he's hungry for some more damage and he's going to get it before the reaper goes down so third probe kill here out of beyond yeah that is very frustrating if you're skillers especially because skillers doesn't even really know yet what the follow-up is and we had one cyclone but we also have an incredibly quick tank uh, three probes is just way too many in general oh my goodness as the cyclone is now going to show up shield battery is not ready yet this is a disaster game for skillers as three probes was too many what about seven what about eight make it nine this is absolutely ridiculous and skillers already knows that this is normally game ending damage on this level oh 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 nikita what is happening, Wadi? Ten probes have died in a game that didn't even last for four minutes. Just all the things that kind of went wrong. We catch the Cyclone at the end, but Bjorn, obviously, he just... That Banshee tank, Marines, Roddy, right? He's just going to send it. And when he sends it, it's going to be tough for skills to have enough with that many probe losses. Yep, there was a very quick sentry there, so the hallucinated Phoenix could maybe scout if Bjorn decides to fire up Cloak, but it seems that Bjorn is not even going to go for Cloak Banshees. Oh, that's very painful for Skillers. That's not something you wish even upon your worst enemy, where you're getting ready to play a PVT, you've done months of prep studying, you know you have a couple of Terran players to worry about, 
And then you lose three probes against this Reaper alone, and that already makes you tilt a little bit. And while you're tilting over losing three probes to the Reaper, you're losing a bunch more. The Stalkers do take an adventurous fight in the center of the map. Picking up a tank this early is actually kind of big, and it's also slowing down the entire push. This is the kind of stuff that Skillist needs to slowly claw his way back into this game. You're right, it was an adventurous fight, but he's at the point where he has to take every risk, right? And in this case, probably pays off, because now Bjorn is staying at home a little bit more than he would have done otherwise. He's a bit afraid of the Stalker counterattack. He will just send the Banshee across the map. Does Skellis have a battery in the main base already? I don't think so. Yeah, that's that's going to be rough. Even if this Banshee just shows up and that's all it is, it's a few more probes and Skellis just cannot afford. Nope, and all the Stalkers are on the other side of the map, so at the moment we don't have anything at home. Good news for Skillers is that this Banshee will not have Cloak, and he is warping in a few Stalkers in the main, so that's going to make his life a little bit better. At this point, it's almost like, yeah, having a battery in the main is nice, but he can't afford it anymore. He's yeah. already taken too much economic damage. If I was Skillers here, I think I would just go up to three bases, and you spam mass gateway units, Stalkers and Zealots, even without any upgrade. Maybe single Forge, that's it. And then you hope that Beyond moves out a little bit too early with an army that's just a tiny bit too small to deal with like 10 Zealots with charge. Apparently that's not what Skillers is thinking. Skillers says, no, I'm just gonna go ahead and build a Robo Bay. But the problem with this is that you need a lot of gases. The more gases you take, the less mineral income you have, the later your third base is going to become. To me, this feels that, I mean, obviously there is not really a right choice. Maybe the Dark Shrine water goes right behind. Dark Shrine. <laughs> Always. Yeah, no, I'm with you. I think the main thing is even if you tech up and try and stay safe right now, you're doing that at the cost of not having a third, right? And then Bjorn's like, okay, well, if you don't have a third, I shouldn't need to attack into mm -hmm. you. So if Bjorn makes the right choices, it's very hard for skills to end up in a good place. And even then, he might just be in trouble. Dark Shrine's away off. This bio army gets across the map with Stim right now before there's anything out of the Robo Bay. Dark Shrine invested into, but no DTs yet. Could be very scary, and he is absolutely making efforts to go across to the other side. Things are starting to look mighty fine for the man from the Shopify Rebellion. Had a nail-biting victory over Australia, where things looked a little bit dicey in Game 3. But he's got a very strong showing here in his second series. Skillers is doing his best to buy some time with these Stalkers and Kite, but every single time he turns around to fight, if these Marauders and even the Unsieged tanks are going to fire, you're in trouble. I do like the Disruptor here because you need something magical, right? And a single Colossus is not going to give you that. A single Nova that's only softening up a tank is unfortunately not that magical either. Beyond is going to stem into the natural. Why the hell not? Marines and Marauders could go for that pilot. I wouldn't have hated if you yeah. left a couple of units on top of that pilot, because that unpowers the battery, that unpowers the robotics facility as well. And what on earth is Skillers supposed to do? These Stalkers cannot take on this army. They get shelled by the tanks. They get eaten up by the Marauders. He's got to fight it in some way, because his natural's under fire. Robo facility going down. He's got no road to further tech units. GG. And Bjorn takes a very convincing 2-0 after a much tougher fight against Australia earlier. Yep. Steaming over the Reaper, getting a few too many kills, and yeah. while you're angry over that, the Cyclone shows up and says, Hi, if you thought that was bad, we can make it a whole lot worse. Units out of position, Cyclone drives on in there, and Cyclones are so incredibly effective in taking out workers. <laughs> John with, honestly, I think the most straightforward victory we've seen so far on the mainstream. Almost every series has a little bit of back and forth, at least. And especially that second game, it was all beyond. And to be completely fair, even in that first game, it kind of felt it was almost all beyond because he did so much by doing so little. But if that's the case, you already know that you're on fire. Yeah, this really just started off horribly for Skillers. The little things really adding up to this moment here. And obviously that was kind of game one under wraps already. Like it went on from this, but you'd lost everything that was going to give you a chance. So Bjorn, I mean, he really just started strong and never looked back. Yep. Good scouting as well by Beyond. Excellent Reaper movement. He's always been a bit of a Reaper master in uh, this second game. I mean, the Cyclone is going to take all the glory, but honestly, the Reaper deserves the MVP because the Reaper is what kept Skillers distracted, is what disrupted the builder a little bit, got some lost mining time, got three workers. And while Skillers is being frustrated over that Reaper, that's where the Cyclone shows up. But honestly, Reaper MVP in my eyes. No, absolutely. That Reaper was, uh, it really just set the tone for everything else in the game. So. Fantastic stuff, as we're going to go to the stage and hear from Bjorn himself. Bjorn, I had to run for this one. You're just cleaning up these Protoss one after another. Tell me a little bit about that match from your perspective. 어 일단 변호 선수 승리 축하드리고요. 어 굉장히 빠르게 또 이렇게 승리 또 거두시면서 어 이렇게 호스트가 또 이렇게 정말 허겁지겁 뛰어나올 정도로 어 정말 빠르게 매치를 끝내셨는데 어떻게 좀 기분이 어떠신가요? Long time no. <웃음> 어 제가 그 운이 진짜 정말 좋았어. 아 여기 운이 정말 좋았어요. 제가 솔직히 
지는 빌드긴 한데 제가 그 사, 탐사정이 좀 이상한 엇갈린, 엇갈린 타이밍에 와가지고 제 빌드가 완전히 다 꼬였는데 그래서 빌드를 완전 손해했거든요 근데 그 빌드가 정말 잘한 100% 잘 먹혀가지고 되게 좋은 결과 나와서 정말 좋은데 진짜 운이 되게 좋았던 것 같아요 Uh, first of all, I feel really, really lucky because uh, Skillless actually really countered my build because uh, the probe actually uh, blocked the landing and blocked being a, building a reactor. So like I had to deviate from my original builds and make a new one. But still, I was very lucky that uh, my new build pan out so well. Absolutely. You picked that match up 2-0 after that great second game there where you did pull it back. But you still have one Protoss remaining in the group. Tell me, in your studying and your preparations, how do you feel about Firefly still waiting in the wings? 이제 프로토 상대로 2승을 거두시긴 했지만 그래도 아직까지 이제 프로토 선수 한 명을 더 상대하셔야 되잖아요. 그래서 마지막 이제 프로토 선수 파이어플라이 선수가 남아 있는데 파이어플라이 선수를 상대하기 앞서서 뭐 어떤 어, 준비를 하고 계신지 네, 좀 궁금합니다. 일단 파이어플라이 선수는 지금 최근에 떠오르는 프로토스이긴 한데. 오늘 앞서 했던 아스트리아 선수나 스킬러스 선수는 이게 정석적이라고 생각한다면 이제 파이어플라이 선수는 그 반대 이제 사파적인 전략적인 선수라서 오늘 같이 이렇게 플레이 한다면은 정말 힘든 힘든 승부가 될것 같아서 내일 그래서 준비를 잘해야 될것 같아요. I mean Firefly he's a uh, one of the rising stars and of course uh, unlike Astrea and Skillus uh, both are very standard players but uh, Firefly is actually one of the unorthodox player so uh, if I play uh, like today I might be in trouble so I need to prepare a lot for that. Well, we will let you get back get your preparations underway because we are looking forward to more games from you Vian but thank you so much for what you've shown here today on stage. Thank you all for watching. Let's go back to the desk, take a closer look at those games. Oh, I'd rather not, Rachel. That was the bopping. That was <laughs> that was a bit of a disaster series, unfortunately, for Skillers. But Bjorn looking strong and able to persevere through. Not a whole lot, actually. Uh, joining me, ZG, as well as Ouch. Ben, to talk about this one. I'm being a little bit harsh here, ZG, but it, it did look rough for Skillers. Yeah, not really any of the promise that we were hoping to see from him in general, because yeah. he's always had a promising series or moment or even a run and then was stopped by an eventual heavy hitter. Uh, none of that happened. And it, especially after, I guess, the first loss, he just wasn't feeling it or... And then he, I guess we're also disappointed because he also said that he really felt very good. And it just felt like maybe that was the curse. <laughs> He's like saying it, you know, <laughs> you're right. supposed to tell people and stuff. But it is a very unfortunate day so far for Skillis. The good news is, thankfully for IAM, you can have a bad day and still succeed. So very there's true. the future to look forward to for now. <laughs> All right, well, let's take a look at the standings then here from Group C as well and see who's who at the top of those leaderboards. We can only suspect that good old Serral has got himself 2-0. Bjorn as well, 2-0. Firefly 1-1 as a whole here, Ben. Uh, so the top two at the moment, kind of what people expected. Uh, absolutely. I mean, Serral, he's kind of like a foregone conclusion, isn't he? Like, yeah. And he's been playing really well again. I mean, Serral's obviously consistent, but when he gets a top eight, people are like, oh, he's washed up, isn't he? Even though it's just a top eight. <laughs> but like now he's kind of like, he's ready to like absolutely shine and fly. I think he's absolutely the guy to beat this tournament. Bjorn's actually playing pretty darn well. And some of those matches, like Astraea especially, was a guy that he has to beat to make it out of this group. But yeah, just not the best showing by Skillers so far. Like that, that series as a whole, the first one, he didn't get to shine truly. It was like lost one or too many Phoenixes like on the get-go. Oh. And then it was just like, I mean, that second game, that's just one that he wants to forget immediately. I mean, yeah, the Reaper gets them four probes and then all of a sudden you're like, oh, thank God the Reaper's gone. And then the Cyclone shows up. And like, it oh. didn't, yeah, it didn't start off that bad actually. Like when he gets that probe oh, block on yeah. that barracks, yeah. I'm like, oh we mate, if he does a pile on there as well, this could actually get a, a bit nasty, but then it all just fell apart like before yeah. his very eyes it was like okay the, the reaper gets four probes then it was like the cyclone kills the adept for free at the natural and it yeah then the cyclone just went across the map as well to finish the job I mean, even beyond in the interview was saying you know oh i had to readjust my build slightly because he blocked yep. it for so long you know etc etc so you're expecting okay maybe you know maybe this is a little bit of a leg up here for skillers but not to be uh we do actually have another series that is is it still ongoing, actually? Uh, it might be ending soon. It's Maru Cyan. Yes. And it's worthwhile. Oh, yeah. Cyan is at 88 supply to 61, is burning down the natural command center, and is arriving in Maru's main. I think he is literally about to 2-1 Maru. 
So he won a match, and I was surprised uh, because Maru versus Cyan. And well, <laughs> never mind. Yep, there oh, you but... go. There it is, Cyan. Two one, Maru. Okay, that's a big deal. That is a big deal considering no that group. No one saw that coming. No, I mean Absolutely that's not. that's literally like maybe the bottom seed of the tournament beating potentially like the second seed, right? I think stats is not to oh. well, not specifically, but yeah, he's like that's one true, of them true. for sure. Definitely one of the bottom few. And yes. Oh, what a way to start it off. I mean, looking at Haas and Lambo as well, they're shocked. Well, <laughs> oh, <I'm surprised. laughs> and it, it then also makes you wonder if he's going to be vulnerable to Showtime, right? Because we gave some, some credit to Showtime, I guess, in the previews of this group, because he's actually defeated Maru in like a best of one or, you know, before and has a couple of games against him. But now that Science also beat him, I don't know. I feel like everyone around is now like, oh my God, Cyan could do it. Like he's showing that Maru is vulnerable. Like I could actually do this, which uh, might be what pushes Showtime over to actually get a win against them. I don't know how to assimilate <laughs> that victory for Cyan. Actually, that's that's quite an interesting one. Because I mean, again, yeah, I was going to make the joke. Did last Katowice break Maru? Like, I mean, si since then though, it's been tumultuous journey for Maru as a whole. Yeah, it, really, it really has, but like kind of eats us, there's something special about it. Like people go into it looking absolutely impenetrable, mm. but like as soon as the tournament begins, there's like real kinks in the armor, right? Like, and, and we've seen it already, a few upsets where it's like, Kyo lost against Shin and was that meant to happen? No, yeah, I don't yeah. think so, but then it turns out he's not the best in TVZ right now, but that's humongous. Yeah. It really is. C considering that that top four was gonna be like, who loses to who of the top three, you know what I mean? Like we were yeah. just looking at that top four. Like, honestly, there was not a lot of expectation for someone of the top four to lose to the bottom two. And now it's seriously in trouble just based off of that, that Maru doesn't advance when a lot of people were once again very hype about him because he was seemed to be returning to form in the online tournaments. Let's not forget this, the road to the World Cup, right? If you don't get out of groups, you don't have the chance of being able to able play, play the qualifiers, which is the quarterfinals, and get yourself a spot directly from Katowice. So, if that's it, well, we'll see. We'll see. It's early days yet. Early days, James. Early days. Fixture, an interesting <laughs> fixture for sure. We're going to go to a break. Thank you very much, guys, as we come back here for more games in Katowice in just a few moments. Time, it's Dark versus Hero. You don't want to miss that one. See you soon. Banger. Intel Extreme Masters Katowice is brought to you by Monster Energy, the United States Air Force, and Intel.
run the show, whoa, whoa, enemies, never know, whoa, whoa, got it all locked down, we don't sleep till the morning, whole crowd loud on the feet and we going up, uh, uh, uh. 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 I.E.M. player card in my hand. Show me the greatest StarCraft player in all the... Oh, it's Cyril! I got him. I got him in 2D and I got him in 3D here on the social desk. Cyril, welcome. How are you enjoying I.E.M. Katowice so far? Thank you. It's been very nice so far. I've been enjoying every moment. And uh, my first two games went well, so that even improved my mood. Well, it doesn't get better than that unless you can pick up a couple more. How are you feeling about your prospects for the event overall? Uh... Chances are good, but uh, winning is always hard and everyone here is a great player. So it's always challenging, but at the same time, I think if I can do my best, it's it's always very doable. Well, I know you're a competitor that likes to win whenever he can, but this tournament, you kind of get to take it a little bit easy when we take the long view down to the eSports World Cup. You are one of two players who has already punched his ticket, and I, in fact, have that ticket right here. Yes, I do. That's for you right there. And I actually, we are going to need your legal signature on it as well to, to validate it. Should I sign it now? Please do. This is fascinating. I like watching you guys sign. That's a beautiful signature too. I bet you get a lot of practice giving out your signature. Well, I have gotten a decent amount of practice. My first version of the signature wasn't too pretty, but this one is okay. Oh, it's cool. Would you show it to the, the people at home? Verified. I don't think they can see much. Okay, now. Glorious. Not my best work, but uh, it's a decent one. <laughs> I hear you do your best work in the player booth, Cyril, and we're going to get to see more of that at the tournament here this weekend and at the Esports World Cup. But uh, I want to give you the opportunity while you're up here to, to say anything you'd like to the fans, to everyone watching at home. Well, just a usual shout out to Basilisk at first. There's the logo. Really supportive to all the players we have and uh, just a big, big help. And uh, just thanks for all the fans for their support and uh, keep watching the games. Well, thank you so much, Cyril. And a shout out to Basilisk and all the players here as well. And uh, all you at home watching, stay in your seats. We've got more StarCraft coming right up. And Cyril, a future world champion again? Maybe, maybe here Cyril goes into the Esports World Cup. Uh, is definitely one of the favorites has already booked his ticket there on the road to the World Cup. Now, let's talk about what's coming up here. We actually have already had some little kind of teasers of Group D already, but we can launch headfirst into it here on the mainstream as Group D is now on the way. And, you know, the cliche, it's the group of death, but it kind of really is, ZG. No, it actually is. I mean, yeah. there's a little bit of an argument about is it the biggest group of death, the deathiest death that's ever death, mm. but you know, <laughs> only if you're a hipster to even remember StarCraft 2 before 2015, so it's true. <laughs> it's fine. Uh, this is definitely the group of death, and we, as uh, we were saying, with, with Sign beating Maru, we were saying, well, these two last guys, you know, like if they do something, take a couple of maps, take a surprising series, great on them. But as far as taking surprising series, I don't think both of us were really thinking Maru. I certainly was thinking Hero, who is going uh -huh. to be playing in our next series. I think Hero is absolutely absolutely the most vulnerable to big, like, you know, falls. He also peaks, which is great, oh, yeah. but he also falls really, really hard. So I thought he was going to have trouble. And uh, now I guess it actually might be the case, if he loses a dark here, that it is between Hero and Maru of actually making it out if Dark and Rainer continue to perform to our expectations. But with these two guys facing each other, you really can't predict them. And any history that we look up, <laughs> 
doesn't actually matter because sometimes you watch these online series between the two and you're like, oh, well, clearly Dark was having fun. <laughs> well, clearly Hero was having fun. Oh, well, clearly yeah, Dark yeah. was having fun. So I don't know what to expect for this, but it's a very good taster for what we can expect from the rest of the group with these two. Yeah, uh, of course, Dark now representing Talon. And between these two, I think it's fair to say, we've got to hope for maximum insanity between these two, Loco. Because, I mean, realistically, two, but two of them can play a very flashy, hectic, aggressive style themselves. Yep. Uh, and sometimes, hey, we even see Dark play weird series on the biggest stages where it doesn't look good, but he still wins. So we can expect some crazy fireworks. Yeah, he does it all the time, right? So most of the pro gamers, whenever there's a big tournament coming up, they purposefully don't play in online cups. Mm -hmm. That's not Hero and Dark. <laughs> they play in everything, and because of that, they play each other about, I want to say three times a week on average, but maybe even more frequently. Like, they play in every online cup, other than maybe the European Weekly, but... Because of that, they're also so familiar with each other's playstyle that I want to say they bring out the best in one another, but honestly, they sometimes play some of the scrappiest games of StarCraft that I've ever seen. Like, there was a period of time, like maybe two months ago, where Dark was just going proxy hatch every game. Uh, yeah. To the point where it's just stupid, where you're like, okay, this is <laughs> not going to work, and he still uh. somehow makes it work. Don't think we're going to see that here today, but... They've been playing some fun games for sure. I was gonna say when you know when Lucas said they bring the best out of each other. <laughs> our hands you can up there say for it. a second. Yeah. You can say it. They bring out the best and the worst. It Absolutely. is that awful couple that you knew in high school. Yep. You know, like we're like sometimes they're really cute, but other <laughs> times I'm pretty sure it's not great. It's not. It's not a good. Situation. They try to outsmart each other, I guess, right? And sometimes they go one step too far, where <laughs> the builds just don't make sense anymore. The mind game, the mind game that the other person yeah. wasn't mind gaming anyway to begin with. Yes, that's exactly. It. That's All exactly right. it. Well, let's get to it then. Already the spanner has been thrown in the works here for Group D, which we thought was potentially a foregone conclusion for some of these players. Uh, but now we will find out between Dark and Hero who's going to be able to take a little bit of a lead. Two players who are former teammates. Now Hero still playing for DKZ Gaming is going up against Dark, who currently joined Talon Esports. The two of them know each other well, and this is bound to be an exciting match. So let's bring these players out. The perfect blend of intuition, creativity, and killer instinct is going to be on show here. And that is, of course, for both players. A Protoss vs. between two friends, two long-term rivals, and we know sparks are going to fly. It's going to be awesome. Dark, obviously, a man who made it into the playoffs many times here at the Intel Extreme Masters Katowice. Hero was the best performing Protoss in the year 2023. He made it all the way to the semi-final, where we all kind of thought he was going to make it to the final. But there was a normal man who had something to say about it. The history between these two, they already covered it a little bit at the desk. We really don't have to dive into it, because it's wild. It's all over the place. There are going to be days where Dark 4-0 is Hero, and then you think, like, wow, he's got his number, right? And Hero's like, no, I'm going to 4-0 you, and then I'm going to 4-2 <laughs> you, and then you can 2-1 me. They beat each other back and forth. I'm just very interested to see how clean is going to be the early game. We know that Hero is going to bring some aggression. He has very good adept uh, oracle movement. Once in a while, he switches it up and he goes all out of depth with Glaives. We know that he loves the, hey, it's a couple of adepts into a couple of oracles into eight gate zealot with plus one. And I couldn't believe that Dark was not ready for it a few times. <laughs> like he's got it figured out by now, pig. So it's going to be very cool to see where the games go between these two. And you know this as well as a former professional gamer. It just gets weird when you keep playing one guy over and over and over again. And maybe those series yeah. are not as important as this one, you can just ignore all that history that you have with one another. I mean, uh, we've interviewed them so many times at this point, and we always hear the same thing. We go, oh, you know, hey, uh, Hero, you've beaten Dark the last tw two, three times you've played. You feel good. And he goes, 
no, I hate playing dark. It's so stressful. He always is so unpredictable. I can't figure out what he's going to do. You know, it feels like he's in my head. I go ask dark the same question. He goes, Hero always has my number. He's in my head. They <laughs> both think the other guy's in their head all the time. <laughs> it's hilarious because it really is just like a game of mind games. And as you said, the early game is so important. Yet even when Hero has a stellar early game, gets way ahead, Dark can always surprise him. I mean, I've seen a lot of Hero lately, and sometimes that's the worst spot for Hero to be in. <laughs> you're not where, wrong. <laughs> where everything goes right in the early game, you're like, oh, Hero is in trouble. And if Hero loses two Oracles and you think there's very little he can do, he's like, you think I'm dead? Let me go ahead and show you some of the sickest playing micro of all time. And it's going to be an awesome series here in this incredibly stacked Group D. In the bottom right side, our Korean Zerg, one of the best to ever do it. Talon Esports, Dark. And in the top left side of the map, representing Protoss and Dragon Kaizy Gaming, Aggression is his middle name. It's Hero. <laughs> Often before battle, we say make sure you lock down the doors, leave the walls manned, but this man's walls will be wide open the entire game. He likes to welcome his opponent into the heart of his base and punish them if they overcommit to it. We've seen it do well for him. We've also seen him lose series to it. But Hero is a man who will grab his whole army and shove them to one spot on the map when he feels like it. And at other times, you'll split up into three or four places at once. Yep, and we can obviously talk about those famous, infamous, whatever, Hero wall-offs. It's, it's bait. There's no other way to put it. It's, it's bait. <laughs> we have learned a long time ago, every Protoss player of Diamond League and above will make a pilot a little bit back, and then you get a strong, big unit of buildings, right? Like gateways and cybernetic scores as part of your wall-off, because you can bailing bust it. You're not supposed to put a pilot in your wall-off. But Hero does it on purpose. He obviously knows that this is not good, but this is straight-up bait. He hopes that his opponents then decide to bailing bust him, and he will scout it in time, and once he scouts it, he's gonna have the right answer for it. He will create a secondary layer of wall-offs, he will have a shield battery, he's gonna drop an overcharge, and then as a Zerg, you're stuck on 20 drones, you have a lot of links and banes, you can't kill your opponent, you're like, well, he got me. Solar tried to bailing bust yeah. him on side Delta, it did not work pick. The wall of looks silly, but it legit straight up is bait. Yeah, it's it's something where he's actually gotten so good at holding all ins with it as well. You'll notice that it's very easy for him to wall off with a gateway behind, behind the pylon. It, yeah. So it's always like, oh, look, there's a weak spot, but he's so quick to seal that wall. And I love that the entrance is on the inside. It means if you want to do like a Ling or a Roach run by later on, You've got to go all the way up to the top of that wall and very deep into the territory. You know, he doesn't make the mistake of leaving the opening on the south. One thing that sucks a little bit, though, is that a Zealot will not always get Zerglings there out of it. Because once it's on that pointy area, sometimes the links can kind of push through. And if one link sneaks through, all of them can push through. You kind of need a flat surface normally to put yeah, a Yeah, you have to position. be pixel perfect here. Yeah. Like, if you're off by one pixel, they just squeeze right past. Yeah, and I think they can sometimes push the unit as well in a very weird way. So, yeah, everything is wrong about this wall off but that's just the hero that we know that's the hero that we love and let's be honest no one does it better in this matchup than he does so if he's happy with it and stalkers are a bit fatter he's probably going to put a stalker in whole position at least for a little while later anyway we'll just take it we're going to keep our eyes on these oracles and we're going to keep our eyes on the mini map because hero with adepts and oracles in the early game truly is a joy to watch ling's tracking the adept shade there it will be cancelled most likely and indeed it is as the Adept does back away, losing its shield, but not taking any direct damage. The first Oracle has caused a lot of problems in some of their recent series, especially Masters Coliseum. Dark was losing three plus drones to the first Oracle dive every game, and it was putting him in a disastrous position. Yeah, slight supply block here, well, slight, a pretty decent one for Dark. And that's one of the big problems, because he's gonna lose this Overlord as well. Dark and Supply Blocks are the biggest problem in his first five minutes of any matchup right now. It's, can he have a smooth opening? Because losing an Overlord there seems bad, but you've now got the Oracle, it's going to come in as well. The funny thing is though, Dark can be Supply Block, can lose a few drones, and then he grabs seven Queens, runs to the other side of the map, drops the Bailing Nest as well, and he goes for a Queen Link Bane attack, <laughs> and you're like, I don't think this is going to work, and then it absolutely works. He kills everything in the third, goes home, drones up again. This is obviously something that Hero is very familiar with as well, so he's going to keep that in the back of his mind. And i got to give it to Hero. I do think, in general, now this is a cast curse moment, he's very cautious with Oracles. He'll take a lot of damage, he'll dive in, but he doesn't really donate them over 
and over again. And I think especially against Dark, this is something that Hero really, really needs to stay on top of, because Dark will just straight up kill you if you lose two Oracles in the early game. Dark's going for lots of Queens, Drones, and a Lair now. Charge on the way for Hero, so, and that's a very... Quicker. It was, he's pull, he should be pulling off gas. This was a very fast set of gateways. He yeah. went two Oracles, no third Oracles, straight into Twilight Council. Yep, and he has obviously been doing this a little bit with a few basic adapts and then triple Oracle and then a Forge with plus one. This is going to hit even quicker than it normally does. Now, it is very important to keep in mind that Zealots with plus one are fantastic against Zerglings because they two hit Zerglings. If you don't have plus one, it takes them three hits. So Queens and Lynx should technically be be good enough to deal with a lot of zealots with charge if they don't have that plus one upgrade. But if you only have 12 zerglings and 12 zealots show up, yeah, you're still going to be in trouble. Oh. This is a really cool switch up, but I do like that bailing nest from Dark, and I believe that will come into play in time. Yeah, it should just barely be ready in time. Dark's actually looking to be aggressive, and this is very good. He's planning his own attack, so it's a big Ling Bane <laughs> attack. He's going to go for the Dropper Lords with the Queen. Zealots are getting surrounded right now. Seeing the Zealot Warpins is massive. Dark knows what's happening. The thing is, does he keep committing to the aggression? What do you do here? I feel like you have to pull back and defend his Dark, but his economy is so low. Yep, these are these scrappy, messy games that the, the guys at the desk were talking about as well. Dark wants to attack Hero. Hero is planning to attack Dark, and they're actually both moving out. They're going to meet each other. Oh, in the man. Map. Hero, if you just stay at home right now, mate, and you defend this, you're going to be absolutely fine. <laughs> hero wants to attack, and Dark wants to attack Hero. And now the Hero all of a sudden is like, wait a minute, that's so many freaking Zerglings. Why on earth do you have so many links? I still think with enough batteries, I think Hero should be fine. He's got all the gateways in the world. He just needs to buy a little oh. bit of time. But that is a lot of links and banes. He's got to get those zealots out of there. They have to pull back. The Oracles, one of them gets focused down. Great play there by Dark to start things off. He's going to wait for the Banelings now. There's no cannons. There's no real ranged damage. So it's hard here for Hero to force a good fight. Forge is ready, so you can actually warp in a couple of uh, cannons if you have the minerals for it. It's going to take a little while. Those Baneling connections are oh. pretty good. One of the batteries blows up. A lot of Zealots get blown up as well. Eight probes are falling in the process. It seems like most of the Zealots have died on the other side of the map, and there are still so many Banelings. And look at all these extra Lings that are about to show up. Yeah, there's not that much of a Ling reinforced, but he's already taken out the heart of Hero's army. 13 probes going down. Queen's are stuck. Is that a Baneling pick up there? Oh, he's going to go for a Baneling drop in the main. That's actually um, very cool. I love it. Really smart. Third base is already going to go down. Roach Warren and drones behind this. Dark doesn't need to find more damage. Well, oh, Hero is going to go for a big counterattack, though. He will get a lot of drones on that third base. Yep, a few probes won't hurt, and he's absolutely going to oh. get a few. As well as a lot of workers clumped up there. These Bailey connections oh. are picture perfect. The man doesn't need plus two melee. Now, all the Oracles with a lot of energy have flown to the other side of the map. They were thinking about fighting a Spore Crawler, did it for a while. In the end, Hero says, like, oh, I don't need that Spore. I need more drones. As long as the Queens are not at home, maybe I can find some more drones. But I think that Bailing drop was just the icing on the cake. Dark already did devastating damage, but that just made it a whole lot better. This is exactly what we expected from this series. Both players to come out brandishing knives and charging into action. And it seems like Dark's knife was a little bit sharper as Hero is going higher up the economy tree, saturating three mineral lines. Dark stopping at 42 drones initially, simply had more units. If Hero had turned around and turned back, he might have been okay. Yep. Remember, it was Dark that had probed first with the initial Zerglings. He knew what was going on. Hero lacked the information. Yep, Hero does not want to expand anymore. He can't really expand because he has no Robo. If you have no Robo, you got no Observer. And of course, he's got the Oracles, but do you really want to drop 17 Revelations to clean up all these crypt tumors? Hey, yes, he's the answer is yes, bored. Kevin. <laughs> yeah. I think he thought about attacking, but then he realized, hey, this attack has already been revealed. My opponent's more than ready for it. As Dark is here with Bailing drops around two. The Whoa. first one was incredibly successful. The second one is even better. And I think that is just going to do it. GG gets called. Dark wins game one in honestly exactly the kind of game that we expected between these two mind game upon mind game like hey you're used to a later cell of attack with a plus one forge i'm gonna do it a little bit quicker but dark's like no i'm actually attacking you and then they pass each other like ships in the night it's like all right all hell is gonna break loose let's see who gets the best of all maybe hero could have oh. spaced out his units a bit better at home because some of those bailings yeah. they connected with everything right they're not supposed to blow up zealots batteries and probes at the same time no it's it's always tough in this scenario because you are outnumbered but if he had the forge already up and had cannons started earlier it'd be great but losing the initial zealots getting surrounded in the middle of the map is very hard and it really did feel like you know hero is like look i'm the titanic i'm unbreakable let's smash it into this iceberg it turns out the iceberg wins
Even that moment there with the Oracles retreating and flying over all those queens that were just unloaded out of those drop lords, that's painful because the Oracle count was actually getting pretty high. And if you have one or two Oracles more, these are slow banelings. Like, Oracles yeah. are fantastic against banelings without speed. Makes it very hard for those banelings to connect with anything. Kudos to Dark for realizing that you don't just make a drop lord to elevate or bring some queens to the other side of the map. You can also, in the middle of your attack, pick up a few more banes and send those into the main base as well. And not once, but twice did he find crazy damage with that well done crazy messy game dark off to a good start yeah the adjustments that needed to be made there for hero i think uh, potentially stalker warpins to have some ranged units to kind of pick off units from afar but scouting it so late is usually the core problem and this is why scouting dark's third base is essential in this matchup with your oracles you need to see the work account and figure out if dark's building drones or not and if you don't have a heads up, a warning of that happening, you'll get caught off guard and it's nearly impossible. But I love your analysis there. Like, a Stalker may seem silly because Stalkers don't have upgrades either and there is no blink. But if you put a Stalker on hold position next to a mineral line, if Bailings want to power through that, you need to use a crazy amount of Bailings to blow up a Stalker. And you might just say, like, yeah, what if you just don't blow up the Stalker? Well, every second that goes by is in favor of Hero because Hero had a 15 worker lead and he had a crazy amount of gateways. Yeah. So as Dark, you don't really have time on your side. You need to go, go, go. And if you then have to blow up a Stalker or two, that's very frustrating, and it takes away a lot of power out of your attack. So yeah, I would have actually loved to see a Stalker or two on hold position just to buy time and then later on be five with the Zealots. But having three Zealots clumped up on hold position doesn't do anything. <laughs> Baneless is just going to blow them up. Yeah, I mean, you, you don't mind blowing up a pylon with five, uh, five Banelings. If you get some Zealots and then you get into the probe line, it is juicy. So nice aggression out of Dark. He's been making oddly timed Ling Bane aggression work versus <laughs> Protoss years after other players thought it kind of it hit, his, it hit the expiry date. And it really is because he's a master of disguising what he does. Uh, you can try to nerf Dark all you want. How do you nerf it? The man that supply blocks himself and surprises you with his timing nonetheless. Nearly impossible. Something Hero is no doubt hoping for in this series, though. It's going to be fun. Game two will be played on Heartlet. I don't think Dark wants to get nerfed. I mean, the man's been very <laughs> successful, especially historically throughout Katowice. So I feel like it's a tournament where he pretty much always does well, yeah. always has a bit of a run. Has never gone all the way, though. No, he's never made it to that uh, that championship. Dark's always just strong and solid, though. And I yep. remember he was looking like he was outmatched in quite a few matches last year, and he kept just winning anyway. It's like... The opponent may have better builds, they may have a better army, but the man has grit, determination, and the ability to base trade when he's behind. He always finds a way to make it tough for his opponents. Well, last year we thought he had very shaky ZVP, but it turns out that he was just shaking it until he found what he was looking for. <laughs> Incredibly different than we see some of the other high-level ZVP players play, but the man just makes it work because he does it better. His attack hits a little bit harder and in general a little bit quicker than when you expect it. In the bottom right side, taking the 1-0 lead, in his opening series of this group of death, it's dark. And in the top left of hard lead, the Protoss player going to be looking to scout very well this game, later on at least, if not at the start. In the top left, representing Dragon Kaiser Gaming, it's Hero. I like what Hero had in mind, where right? it's like, ah, I know that you know my timings, I know that you love, uh, I worry, I know that you know that I love the 8 gate zealot with plus one that hits a little bit later, so I'm gonna switch it up, we're gonna skip yeah. out on the forge, we're just gonna chrono boost the ever living crap out of charge, and we're gonna show up right when you're not ready yet, when you were kind of trying to build some roaches, but they're not there, then maybe my zealots can surround your queens and I'm off to a great start immediately, but Unfortunately for Hero, that was not quite what it was. Dark had a ridiculous <laughs> amount of Zerglings ready and was gearing up for his own aggression. So Dark is kind of getting the best of the rock, paper, scissors that these two love to play with each other. You really don't have to play it in PvZ. Yeah. Like you can actually just sit back from both sides. Protoss can sit back with just harassment. Zerg can just sit back and defend for a little while. But these two just love to attack and like to kind of increase the variance in the way that they play. A little bit more destruction derby rather than your kind of sitting back stroking the chin strategy game. Hero this time in game two has opened up with no scout. He's gone gas first, a very greedy build. It's going to give him a beautifully streamlined Stargate timing. At the same time, he can make adepts, chrono, you know, he can have warp gate on the way, 
Dark went for the 15 hatch, 15 pull. So he was trying to make sure that Hero couldn't block his expansion. And this is a slightly suboptimal opening for this matchup if they're not trying to block you because it does delay your early mineral income. And you can see that his gas is going to be much later. So Dark is kind of forced to stay on two base a little bit longer. And if, say, two Adepts get chronoed across the map, he might struggle to defend them with no link speed. We're going to actually open things up with a Stalker, and it's going to be a very quick Twilight Council. So maybe Stalker into mm. Resident Glaive Adept with a Dark Shrine, because Hero strikes me as a guy that loves to get a Dark Shrine quickly if he opens up Glaive Adept. Delayed his Warp Gate by a few seconds there as well, kind of faking Stargate almost was Hero. The Stalker, of course, will reveal that, uh, you know, I want to hide what I'm doing. I don't want you to know what's happening, but that could mean so many things because Hero is a player with so much variety. I would have loved to see him move the Stalker first to the right before shooting at the Overlord, because I don't think that Dark was paying attention, because as a Zerg, you don't necessarily expect Stalker first. Yeah. And if that Stalker would have just moved to the right side, fired a first shot at the Overlord, and you push the Overlord to the left, there's actually a chance that he kills it. You can shepherd it, just because the AI will run away from the source attacking mm -hmm. it, and that's always something which, you know, some players will do that every time, other players are like, ah, oh, he'll be watching anyway, I'll just start attacking it, but I agree, you can usually get two or three more shots in with that. And this Overlord will barely make it to that pillar in time, but already going to be very low with both of those. And no way of uh, getting the high ground vision is the problem as we go into Dark's first person view. Yep, old school Dark Templar drop, by the way. So a couple of quick DTs that could morph into Archons immediately. Could also wait with morphing them into Archons and see if your Dark Templars can find some successes. The Stalker got a few more shots of and that Overlord died, by the way. Well, an Earth killed that Overlord. Was it a Zelnaga Watchtower? That he just, I think he just misplaced it, honestly. I think <laughs> it was just slightly off the pillar. Maybe a probe ran over there or something, but unlikely as that's quite far out. Now, Link Speed is very late in this game. I believe it started, but he also hasn't built a safety spore crawler. And if he doesn't start that at, say, 415, it could get very dangerous. Yep, because this Dark Shrine is mega quick. The Road Shrine is going to go down. I have the feeling that Dark is thinking mostly about those Resident Glaive Adepts that I mentioned. But what he really has to worry about is that quick Dark Shrine. As Hero is also going to get an Observer. And this is actually something I really love about the way he plays this. And it's maybe kind of standard, but I still think it's a very cool touch. What Protoss players started to do It's like, okay, you try to find damage with the DTs. You always force out some units. Maybe you can morph them into Archons quickly. You can find some drones or battle the Queen shape of some links and if all that fails you have a quick observer on the other side of the map and there is nothing that the zerg player can do about the protos pushing back the creep with a quick observer and war prism and two archons that are picking up your creep tumors over and over again this is an awkward position to be in for dark he's got a few slow links and a few queens he does have a bit of detection there hero almost pushes in too deep but uh definitely i feel like dark's economy is kind of low and, and whilst he is starting to defend that drop, there's a third base at a decent timing for Hero. He's got Robo Bay and Forge on the way. Hero has a nice mid-game transition, whereas it feels like Dark's work account has just been stuck in the 30s for such a long time. Yep. You can now see uh, Hero, by the way, with that first observer that was ready to the other side of the map. I love this moment because playing PvZ is so much easier from the Protoss point of view. If there is a little less creep to worry about, yeah. there's just not that much that Dark can do here because there is nothing that's quick that can gun down that War Prism. So this is really cool by Hero. Economically, the game looks good for him. What do you make, by the way, of him taking the triangle, Hero, that is? Why is he not taking the base at 12 o'clock? Um, so the decision making when it comes to building placement with Hero is he just chooses where he randomly in the moment chose to do it. This man is intuitive as all heck, Roddy. I, I think they're both fine. Um, yeah, it's not the biggest of the I'm just yeah. wondering why. <laughs> it does give you a nice push path down the left side of the map if, if you're thinking Dark might take the front fourth base, but I'm not sure. Quick Spire by Dark, that's kind of cool. You mentioned scouting in the beginning of the game, Piggy. This is one of these things that Hero absolutely needs to scout. Even though he is already working on Blink, he's already working on plus one, so he won't find himself in a scenario where the only anti-air he has are two Archons in a War Prism and then a couple of Stalkers without Blink. I technically think this Spire shouldn't be that devastating, but it's still so much nicer as a Protoss to just scout it so you know what's up. I mean, a lot of things look good for a hero, but you never know how it goes when these two actually start throwing the kitchen sink at one another. And that's always the scary thing, is if, as you're about to go into the Mutalisks, that Protoss army starts pushing you on the front. Right now, Dark does not have a material advantage. And if you are ahead on the Roachling and then you squeeze the Mutas out, it's so smooth from here. 
But right now, it's equal workers, it's equal army. It's a very scary moment in the game. This observer has been so cool, by the way, because it's just been rotating in a perfect circle around these three bases, and every group doing that's trying to go forward. Hero is there immediately to deny it. He is, I think, about to go in a little bit deeper. We'll still not see the Spire. Does see that these gases have been taken as well. And at this point, you may have to ask yourself as a Protoss, right? Like, so what are you spending that gas on? Haven't seen a bailing nest yet. Haven't seen any bailings. Saw a couple of roaches, but you're always supposed to have a couple of roaches. I feel like Murderlisk are very realistic at this point, so you have to think about it. And Hero's already here. And we're just talking with Blink on the edge of creep. This is going to be an annoying fight for Dark, especially because Dark just spent his resources on those Mudas. But if there's one thing that Mudas don't want to do, is fight an army like this. No, with two Archons in the back and his speed prism. The Stalkers disrupt as an Archons gathering on the front. They're going to start pushing in. Mudas going after the prism. They do reveal themselves, though. He decides, nah, I've got to go across the map. The Ravages and the Roaches trying to hold. He's got to dodge those Disruptor shots so far. None of them landing. And actually, those Mutalisks are a little bit of a problem, but Stalker Warpins damaging the main base. Three Stalkers warping in. Good frantic response for Hero so far, but Hero is famous for struggling with Mutalisk Harass because he's just such a scrappy player with his organization. Can he get on top of it? So far, so good. Yeah, I'm completely okay with this. He killed one or two Mutas. He's still attacking in the bottom side of the map. This is going to be difficult for Dark, especially if this Protoss army makes it all the way up the ramp. Hero has been somewhat patient with his Novas, right? One of the Disruptors does get found in the center and the Nova Ooh. goes off to no man's land. Had some potential there to at least blow up a Ravager or two. But this Protoss army, I still love it big. And I'm still a bit worried for Dark. Dark needs to find more big pickups like those Disruptors. Ooh. Like the Fire Prism there with Ravagers. All right, are you kidding me, Dark? That was not supposed to happen. Oh my You're gosh. supposed to lose your Mutalist for that. He does it with Ravagers. And he surrounds the Stalkers as well. So many Stalkers have gone down. Hero's all in now. And if he blinks into this army, he's dead. But you know Hero realizes, oh, oh gosh, I lost units. I got to go. Attacking in is a disaster for Hero. He needs to calm down, back off, and slow this game down because Dark is on Mass Roach Link. Dark does not have that many drones, but Hero, when he loses his valuable units, when it gets to a hot, intense moment, he always goes to aggression. Dark has forced his hand, and Hero is stepping into Dark's trap. There was no need for Hero to stick around there. Obviously, losing the prism should be a wake-up call. It's like, all right, I'm not going to kill him here because if I cannot kill him with immediate reinforcements, how on earth are you going to kill him without those reinforcements after losing your disruption? This, but Hero continues to attack. He's still up in work as if he would have just gone home with all these stalkers. It really would not have been all that bad for Hero. Even if he's only on three bases and Dark is on four, it is four base Lair Tech Zerg with 61 drones. But by Hero continuing to attack, yeah, Dark's just finding better and better traits. The, the fear of, of the Mutalisk is real, I think, in this game, Rotterdam. I think because he doesn't have a Stargate, sometimes Protoss players get almost o overly afraid of the, well, if I pull back, he's going to go back into Mass Muta. I don't want to be fighting Mass Muta with Stalkers. I think Hero's playing a little bit, uh, feeling like he has to win right here in this moment. And that is unfortunately costing him because Dark has no, he's got such a simple solution to this game. Ooh. That Nova has potential and will connect with a lot of Ravages. That was good. By far and away, the best shot that Hero has landed throughout this game. Dark does have plus one right now on the Zerglings. That's important to keep in mind. But Hero has War Prism number two. And with that War Prism, he is going to get these immediate reinforcements. And it's actually still going to be incredibly scary for Dark, who's just been so low in the drone department. 61 drones is not a lot. He needs a Lynx around. But at the moment, he does not have the amount of larvae to randomly crank out 30 Zerglings. Nine more Mutas are going to go in. If there's a big disruptor shot, I feel like Hero can still do it, but that one whiffs and the Mutalists are in the main base once again. This is a disaster for Hero. He can't be affording that damage. And oh no, he recalls, but he leaves a bunch of Stalkers on the front. Dark will chase those units home. Oh, big Disruptor ambush, but he gets a few kills. It'll go down in return. The problem is that Dark's strategy is simplified at this point. He has Hero pinned, stuck on a three base all in, which means all Dark needs to do is survive, and he's winning this game. He's like, I just keep making Roach Ling. There's nothing complex Dark has to do because he knows Hero is immediately going to come back across that map and he just needs to defend army after army and he's way ahead. Dark's army is about to get a whole lot better though. Plus two melee is more than halfway down, but more importantly, Bailing speed is going to kick in. And Bailings may not be fantastic against Stalkers, but in high enough numbers, Bailings are good against everything. And Dark, with four bases, with a bit of money in the bank, can obviously rebuild if they both lose everything. Hero is hard stuck on three bases, not transitioning into anything better. That Disruptor is kind of exposed, but is at least going to be able to get saved by that War Prism. 
As the hero is going to make a cannon to make his life defensively a little bit easier. You don't need too many stalkers at home. A hero still is in this game. If he lands one or two fantastic novas, like he has already landed one, like we don't hate his chances here. But it is a bit sad that he's so stubborn. It does not want to go up to four bases. It's not that dark. Is going into hive and has like a terrifying timing window coming up. And hero needs to end it. Like hero can chill, oh. land novas like that, and hero is completely fine. And with 55 probes against 62 drones hero could still go up to four bases if he wants to dark's army is so scary though because there's so much baneling and ravager value in here hero needs to defend this scary moment if he does as you said he's in a great spot economically it's not that bad if he can start a fourth nexus he'll be okay in the long run hero is going to attack right now which seems map. like a really awkward choice i don't know about attacking into this ravager baneling army big run by hits his third yeah baneling run by is big muda's going to show up in the natural one more time as well that pylon going down that's actually going to save hero some resources because i think those stalkers would have just died immediately, but can Dark clean up this army? Dark is going to be on the creep. He's going to go for the War Prism immediately again, and he guns it down. That is massive. That Nova will connect, though, with Triple Ravager. It's the Lynx with plus two that should save Dark here. As long as he just cranks out a lot of Lynx. A couple of flanking Lynx coming in as well. It is going to be good enough for the man representing Talon Esports, as all of these Stalkers are so damn low on HP. And Hero is going to try to micro his way out of this, but it feels that it's just not a fair fight anymore. I think from here on out, it is a never-ending string of Zerglings that should secure the victory for Dark. Beautiful play by Dark. He's had Hero's number so far here in this series that it looks like he's about to seal the deal. They're known for back and forth close series. Hero often being the favorite. He has a 63% head-to-head -head record against Dark, and yet Dark is just all over it today. He's one step ahead in the mind games and he is uh, ready for every single one of Hero's moves. Yep, still has a lot of Roaches in the mix as well, and the Roaches may only have plus one missile attacks, but they will buy time, and then Roach is obviously great in buying time, and every second that goes by is a great one for Dark, who's still enjoying a four-base economy. He's about to go up to five. The drone gun has been hard stuck at 61. A lot of other Zergs would feel incredibly uncomfortable being on 61 drones. Not Dark, he just knows how to find those trades that make it okay for him to be on this work account, because he has found even more economic damage GG gets called Dark with a fist bump, well deserved because every single best of three in the group of death is incredibly important. This is the man that just a, a week ago was tweeting a series of question marks in response to him finding out about this crazy group that he got put in. But he's shown us immense ability to adapt and overcome one of his nemeses to start the group. A great start for Dark. Yep, pretty wild series, obviously. We had first game with both of them having a plan to attack one another. It went better for Dark. Hero, looking back at it, probably could have done one or two things differently in the defense. Game two was far from a standard game as well, Pick. He really liked a lot of things that Hero was doing. But after he lost that first War Prism, you said it, the man just wants to keep on attacking. And there are some moments where it's completely okay to go home. It's not that he has to worry about a five base Zerg on 85 drones yeah. that is working on Hive and Adreno glands. No, it's 61 drones lay attack, but Hero just keeps on attacking. And because of that, sometimes you're gonna get punished for it. He's got that mutilisk trauma that I, I think a lot of the Protoss players on the ladder can kind of, uh, I think, uh, feel their own kind of comfort with. They go, oh yeah, we, we know all about the fear of letting them get up to the mutilisk count. And, it was this point here where it said, okay, you know what? You're defending okay. Yeah. Just keep be careful with that army on the front. And that was not what happened. The prism got taken down by the pile. All the disruptors went down. And then the stalkers decided to keep on attacking and they got themselves surrounded for the second time in a row. The funny thing is after this, Hero still found himself in one more spot where it was like, hey, it's not that bad. Landed a great Nova as well on the right side. Landed one more good Nova in the center. But he's just so eager to end it. He never got any Archons anymore. Well, I kind of felt like an Archon or two would have been pretty nice against all these circlings that were messing with those Stalkers, trying to absorb some shots. But it was, in the end, not good enough. Let's go ahead and hear from the man as he's on stage with Rachel. Thank you so much, guys. Dark, after a dominating 2-0 victory here over Hero, I've got some questions. So in the last year, you've played 60-plus matches against Hero, and... Hero had the winning record against you for a lot of those, but as recently as three days ago, you turned it around in a tournament series and four owed him. You did just as nicely here today on stage. What has changed between you and Hero that has allowed you to be so dominant? 
어, 일단 박영호 선수 승리 축하드리고요. 어, 일단 작년에 저, 김주로 선수의 정정만 해도 60전이 넘었는데 그 중에서 대부분 사실 김주로 선수가 좀 많이 앞서 있었어요. 그래서 좀 위축됐을 법도 한데 그래도 이제 3일 전에 또 이렇게 결승전에서 4대 0으로도 얘기도 했고 또 오늘 시리즈에서도 되게 깔끔한 승리를 거뒀다 보니까 좀 뭐가 좀 변화됐는지 좀 궁금하네요. 음, 변한 건뭐 그렇게 크게 없는데요. 그냥 제 장비가 변해서 마우스와 마우스 패드가 변했기 때문에 어, 어. 그게 아마 플러스 요인이 된것 같습니다. Well, I guess nothing much, but I recently changed my gear, so I think that uh, kind of gave me a boost. I can think of one other thing you changed since I last saw you in December. You've got a brand new team, Talent Esports. Tell me a little bit about how they're supporting you. 장비 말고도 이제 12월에 봤을 때보다 이제 바뀐 게 하나 더 있는 것 같은데 역시나 이제 새로운 팀 이제 탈론 이스포츠가 역시나 눈이 띄는 것 같아요. 그래서 새로운 팀에 대해서도 한번 말씀해 주시죠. 어 제가 이게 많은 분들 앞에서 얘기하다 보니까 말 실수를 좀 했는데 <웃음> 어, 팀이 <웃음> 어, 탈론 이스포츠 입단한 덕분에 이렇게 얘기 된것 같고요. 그리고 정, 저에게 정말 좀 많은 관심을 주시다 보니까 어, 되게 좀 게임에 집중하는 데 있어서 즐겁고 좀잘 되는 것 같아요. I think I made a mistake on the previous statement. So, uh, of course, my team, Talent Esports, gave me a lot of support, and, and that made me a lot of uh, practice and, of course, uh, boost in the gaming as well. Well, I don't want to attribute it all to that. You have a lot of skill that you've been building over many years, especially against Hero. You fought alongside each other as teammates, you practiced together. Now on stage against him, it seems like you know your opponent so well, you were able to set traps that he fell right into. So tell me a little bit about the mind games that you set for Hero in particular. 어, 물론 여러 가지가 있었겠지만 그래도 이제 김주로 선수와 이제 팀 생활을 같이 하기도 했었고 그래서 서로 잘 알다 보니까 아무래도 김주로 선수를 상대로 이제 여러 가지 심리전을 많이 쓰셨을 것 같은데 어, 어떤 심리전을 좀 쓰셨는지 좀 궁금합니다. 음, 평소 같았으면 좀 게임 내적으로 긴장을 많이 해서 어, 좀 위축된 플레이를 했을 텐데 어, 이번엔 그냥 마음 편하게 하자라는 생각으로 임했고 어, 그리고 막상 마음 편하게 먹고 왔는데 어, 여기 정말 많은 분들이 와주셨잖아요 응원도 열정적으로 해주시고 그래서 그것 때문에 조금 긴장이 돼서 어, 생각보다 많이 실수를 한것 같아서 다시 돌아가서 보완하도록 하겠습니다. Well, uh, usually I feel very nervous against Hero, but uh, on this stage, before I get this stage, I just felt, uh, just let it all go. I'm just going to play myself. And I think that will uh, work well. But still, I, um, when I met all the crowd here, I still, the nerve, the nerve still kicked in so a little bit. So um, I think I made a mistake uh, at some point. Uh, so uh, I'll try to fix that. Well, there's a lot on the line for you here, Dark. You are in Group D, widely regarded as the group of death at this tournament, partially because you yourself are in it, and you're a pretty scary opponent. But tell me a little bit about the rest of your group, anyone you're worried about, how you think you're going to come out in the end. 아무래도 이제 죽음의 조라 불리우는 디조에 이제 배정됐다 보니까 물론 이제 박영호 선수가 있기 때문에 좀 이렇게 죽음의 조가 되는 것 같기도 한데 어 이제 나머지 선수들에 대해서도 좀 어떻게 좀 생각하는지 좀 궁금하네요. 어, 물론 이제 준호 형이 이겼다 해서 끝난 게 아니고 앞으로 더 넘어야 할 산들이 많은데 오늘 쇼타임 선수라는 큰 산을 이기고 나면 좀 마음이 되게 편해질 것 같아요. 어, 2승으로 가면 되게 편하게 임할 수 있을 것 같고 일단 당장 앞에 있는 경기부터 집중해서 어, 한번 잘 해보도록 하겠습니다. Of course, uh, beating Hero doesn't mean that I've been guaranteed. Uh, there's a lot of opponents, scary opponents to beat. So um, I'm just going to fo focus on the game at hand. So uh, if I beat Showtime, then uh, maybe I'll get a better chance of uh, going through uh, to the round of eight. Well, Dark, I'm going to let you focus because I know everyone here is excited to see more games from you, and we love to see you playing at your best. So thank you so much for coming and talking to us for the interview. Let's send it back to the desk and take another look at those games. <laughs> I do get the impression that Dark's come in very hungry for this victory in Katowice. As previously mentioned on these desks, it has been four years since the South Korean has been able to be victorious here in Katowice, the claim of championship. And Dark starts things off pretty strongly in his first match. Joining me, ZG, as well as Loco, to talk about this one. The first game was <laughs> like the Spider-Man meme. <laughs> it's like, 
wait a minute. Uh, so that was an interesting way to get things going and kind of a, basically replicated exactly what we were saying here on the desk, CG. Yeah, kind of, I, I think we were spot on. Um, <laughs> they they played pretty pretty similar to how they play against each other in every other tournament seems yeah. to be, which is that they bring out the best and the worst and the most interesting and the most fun and sometimes the most mind-boggling and good and positive. Um, bad and positive ways. So, so the most interesting part there for me <laughs> is that usually we see Zergs going for like a queen drop, right, with maybe a Roaches or Ling Bane, when they play a really clean early game. And that was by no means a clean early game. It was like a supply block at 44, and there were a bunch of mistakes. And then Dark just goes across the map, and he's like, yeah, you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to blow up a couple of your probes. And he... I think kills like a, a base and a half worth. I really enjoyed the Overlords doing a double take as they saw their already yeah. flying. It was like, oh, wait, wait, no, I'm still going. It's okay. <laughs> it's totally okay. Yeah. Game two, a little bit more normal, but sorry. You know, no, I just I was thinking because we're also watching Rainer vs. Showtime, which just finished game one. Yes. But it was actually kind of funny. As far as the two Korean players being aggressive, okay, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. But as far as the two Korean players playing the pristine, really like best version of StarCraft 2, maybe that wasn't it. But Rainer Showtime actually <laughs> was playing some really high skill, like early, mid, and super late game PVZ oh. that ended in a really interesting, like lurkers trapping an army in the angle. I don't know, I'm not saying Europeans are better, but. <laughs> it's a different <laughs> approach, right? Like, <laughs> Europeans are playing it like an Excel spreadsheet and the Koreans are like wrestling in the mud and they're just trying their very best to just end it as quickly as possible. Actually an eSport, by the way. Wrestling in the mud? Excel spreadsheet. Oh, <laughs> yes, I saw. <laughs> that makes a lot more sense. <laughs> that was a world championship. That was like a oh, weird eSport. Uh, <laughs> Why aren't we doing that instead? <laughs> no, I, I couldn't believe my it was, eyes. It was Rainer Showtime. Yeah. There was commentary. It was hype. I can, anyway, never mind. Never mind. Uh, yes. So we are actually w waiting for Rainer as well as Showtime to finish that series here, which will then have Rain on the main stage uh, here. So we've got to wait for that to conclude. That is actually currently on the B stream as well, currently 1-0. So you can go and hop on over there and see how that's going as time may tell. But again, when you look at this group, when you look at the makeup of it, I, I still have to bring up the fact that we're in a little bit of topsy-turvy land. Yeah. We can't overstate how impactful the potential Saiyan win is over Maru, yeah. really throwing that spanner in the works. Yeah, and I feel like the rest of, like, basically, I predicted that there was a chance that the top four would play as pristine in StarCraft II as you would expect being part of the group of death. Mm. But there was also a chance that every single one of them would show the flaws of the last year. Dark's the most consistent, but obviously has had flaws. Maru's had a really big lapse in his results. Hero only recently getting good results after a very disappointing year. And that seems to be the iteration of the group that's coming true. Dark vs. Hero wasn't the prettiest series ever, and there are definitely opportunities for the other guys to look at it and be like, oh, I could do better as the Protoss side, I could do better as the Zerg side. Showtime's actually really making Rainer sweat in these PVZs. Yeah, Mara yeah. loses to Cyan. Like, it's, it's actually as tumultuous as I thought it could be, and that's oh. exciting in a different way. I mean, considering Hero did so well in Colosseum as well here, Loco, I was expecting maybe to come in and look fantastic, but again, for Protoss, it really does right now feel so hard to be consistent, even if you are someone like Hero. Yeah, I feel like Hero versus Dark, or I guess Protoss versus Dark, it just works out a little yeah, bit yeah. differently. It's Very true. excited to see him up against, for example, Rainer here. I think that's going to be a bit of a different match, maybe just a little bit cleaner overall. But yeah, it feels weird to me that we're already going to have to say goodbye at least to, well, I guess three players, but especially four of the people in this group. Uh, so it would be Maru, Dark, Rainer, and Hero. I mean, yeah, they could all win this entire event, and uh, nobody would be really be surprised. Absolutely, I mean, I, I wouldn't be surprised if someone like Dark does do it. Considering, yeah. I think again, you know, now on Talon, now a kind of, I was about to say the death throes of his career, but we know kind of it's, like it's that <laughs> oh, towards that's the, very uh, dramatic. That is a bit grim, a bit of a sad aura. To be fair, that's but, what he said uh, last year. Like I had an interview with him actually on that exact couch right over there, and he said, "This may very well be my last tournament, Loco." I was like, "Oh, that's he very sad." And, he didn't say death throw though. No, no, <laughs> no, 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 he wasn't that extreme. That that is that is. Kolaris, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like that, that is a year ago, you know, is what I'm saying. So maybe, maybe we'll, <laughs> get, to, yeah, it's, it's we'll get to enjoy some more dark. It's <laughs> not. And I think he's obviously looking for the qualification spot to the Esports World Championship. Absolutely. Absolutely. But this is also a tournament in which he has been the most stable player in his entire career. Yeah. He's been in so many and he's reached one round of 12, uh, like half a dozen round of eights, and I think a round of four. And yet he hasn't actually won. 
So this is absolutely the trophy missing from his case that I think mm -hmm. would still burn in his mind if he missed the opportunity and then went to the military and couldn't come back. Yeah, I mean, and as all the players have rated it here as we look through all the cards, he's at 94 across the stats, which like there's three or four players at 94, and of course there's Serral at 97. But anyway, right, that's by the by. What we're going to do now is we're going to go to a short break. I have a lovely monster here, so thank you very much to them. It's the Lewis Hamilton one, actually, as we... Tastes like Ferrari. Uh, well, anyway, let's go to a break, and when we return, it's more from the Intel Extreme Masters Katowice. Intel Extreme Masters Katowice is brought to you by Monster Energy, the United States Air Force, and Intel.你好，你好，你好，你好，你好，你好，你好，你好，你好，你好，你好，你好，你好，你好，你好，你好，你好，你好，你好，你好，你好，你好，你好，你好，你好，你好，你好，你好，你好，你好，你好，你好，你好，你
oh man <laughs> minus one minus one what the hell oh not okay. again taste doses you sure i know this but tasteless and not those. What? Yeah, come on, man. What is that question? <laughs> <laughs> I was confused because it's so easy. <laughs> no way. Might as well get another X. Oh, that was oh. close. Uh, geography. Hit me with it. Probably Korea. <laughs> I didn't know that. Struck by bad luck. But that means I'll have good luck in the tournament. I'll take it. So I have bad luck in the tournament? Yep. Okay. That's what it is. It is what it is.
never know whoa, whoa. Cut it all locked down, we don't sleep till the morning Whole crowd loud on their feet and we going uh, uh, uh. Going uh, uh, uh. Going uh, uh, uh. Going uh, uh, uh.
Welcome back. It wouldn't be Intel Extreme Masters Katowice without doing this because we have currently found ourselves in the midst of a 1-1 situation now between Reyna and Showtime. And why on earth not just instead of being on break, actually just kind of jump into game number three here on the desk and actually like look at things that's going on. We've got ourselves Pig and Rotterdam, two brilliant minds to be able to bring you game number three. And we're not actually stealing it away from stream B. They're still going to be covering things as time goes on. But yeah, it's 1-1 these games are going the distance here, Pig. No, I'm putting them on, we're putting them on the bench, haven't you heard? We're just... Bear more force. <laughs> yep. Get out of the way, Bear all right? Bear more force break. We're going to take the hype game from you guys <laughs> and uh, do it over here on the analysis desk as well. Can't wait for the Reddit thread. <laughs> <laughs> once again, once again, these guys and their nepotism. <laughs> unreal, unreal. Uh, but Roddy, it really has gone quite far. I mean, Showtime's just been able to take the second game mm -hmm. after looking brilliant with this composition kind of unlucky because now twice we had the choice between a pvt and a pvz and earlier we chose skillers beyond and let's just say that won't be the highlight of the tournament oh. while well, there was also australia against kalazur and those guys had a sick game one on side delta that lasted longer than the entire best of three and then we also had the choice between hero versus dark and reina versus showtime and it was a tough choice for us but we're like we gotta go with hero and dark right in this group of death and I mean, it was kind of fun, but it was short. Meanwhile, Raynor and Showtime are having an absolute banger, or I don't know what kind of a term you would use. Bobby Dazzler. Bobby Dazzler, something go. along yes. those lines of a series. Game one was proper long, like 28 minutes. Both yeah. of them dropped to like 15 workers. In the end, Raynor barely won. Game two looked sick, where Raynor had insane mechanics, insane creep threat in the beginning, and he tried to kill Showtime, like many Zergs have tried to kill Showtime. But Showtime truly lived up to his name of D Mauer, hanging in there like a champ they both had a couple of great engagements and fights but in the end showtime did claw out like a 29 minute victory in heartlet but he did not forget about any center bases by the way just in case you guys were worried ah. about that and yeah now we're gonna hop into game three so an amazing pvc meanwhile we chose one that ended in 11 minutes it is what it is yeah it's a bit odd, it's a bit odd. even jack frost though can't really break the wall of demauer it's a little bit crazy of course we know rainer is somebody who has come into this tournament under Circumstances where he is very hungry for this. He's gone yeah. back into that hyperbolic time chamber. We've seen him going, or we've heard from him, going into those kind of Archon mode scenarios where he's practicing like that, which is just kind of mind blowing. But hey, guess what? Here's game number three. You know what? It's going to be awesome. Uh, down here in the bottom right side in the red, we've got Showtime representing Big Esports. <laughs> Sorry, I. <laughs> Why, do you, why are you looking at me? <laughs> Look at Showtime, he's cool. Add up to the top left hand corner in the blue, representing Basilisk, it's Reyna. Still got it, James. I'm not doing anymore. Still got it. <laughs> <laughs> ah, it's okay. This setup is not really made for casting, right? So we can just have a little conversation. But yeah, TLDR, an absolutely awesome series between these uh, two. And we haven't really spoken a lot about Showtime yet. But he did join the casters for dinner. I don't know how that pro gamer oh, snuck in there, right? The other day, opening day, we all arrived in Poland. We ran into Dean Mauer and he said, what are the plans? And we're like, well, we're actually about all to have dinner. And he said, can I join? And of course, Dean Mauer can join. So. A whole bunch of casters and showed them went to dinner. We asked him obviously about his shape, his prep coming into this tournament. Yeah. And he said, I'm actually feeling really good. And he's like, I know my group is super tough. And he's like, I'm not going to just think that I'm going to show up and smash. But one thing is for sure, I'm not going to make it easy on them. And Showtime has never been a guy who says those things if he doesn't truly believe it. Mm. And so far, I mean, yeah. we didn't catch everything. But what I've seen out of this best of three, yeah, Showtime looks damn good. I'm glad you re regaled me with that because he was on the opposite side of the table. And, you know, on the king of Krakow's dime, he got a free meal. All right, well, we'll <laughs> lucky for you, Showtime, OK? But yeah, I, I, I would hope to see him do well. Uh, honestly, as you say, when you're thrown into a group like this and you go, the whole it feels like the whole world is almost against you in those scenarios to hit so to hear that he has confidence. Yeah, he, that's exciting. No, he really does. He said, I I feel like I'm playing better than I've played in a very long time. I'm happier with my level than I've been in an incredibly long time and Honestly, in any other group, he said, I would put money on myself to make it out. <laughs> this one, it's going to be very difficult. But one thing is for sure, I will not make it easy on them. And I can tell you that Rainer did not have a walk in the park so far, because these two gamers have been gaming for over 55 minutes right now, and we're all tied up. That's a lot of gaming. And you know, it, it's kind of predictable that it would end up here, because if you look at Rainer and Showtime over the last year, it always goes to the final map. There's always a few hour-long games in there. 
and it almost always ends with Rain and Euro parasiting Showtime's entire army and turning <laughs> it against himself. Like, it's happened so many times, and I've talked to both of these guys about it, and Rainer just gets a cheeky grin whenever you bring up Neuro Parasites against Protoss players recently, because he's made some disgusting comebacks. And Showtime, on the other hand, just looks frustrated, shakes his head, and is like, yeah, Neural Zimba. <laughs> it's like, he's like, it's super, it's super hard to get at the Infestors in the back. And I was having this discussion with him where I was like, you know, Terran have tanks, they have Liberators. They're the main anti-infester late game tools that Terran have. For Protoss, it's like feedback or disruptors. But because Ultras just jump on top of the Protoss ground army, it's hard to get those things in range of the infestors before they neural all your carriers. Two adapts very early on the other side of the map. This is actually a pretty sweet start, man. Two of the drones try to morph into buildings. Three drones have still died. Seems that in the end, Rainer will get both of the adapts. But as a Protoss game, you always take this. Three drones dying this early. Two drones not mining because they morphed into buildings. And all the other drones running away, lost mining time. And I think that's an excellent start for Showtime, even if you lose both adapts. Follow up with the Oracle. Try and find a little bit of pickoffs here and there as well. I mean. Obviously, usually spore crawlers is, are up and running and good to go. We'll try and ward it off with. What am I doing? Shut up. Uh, go on, pig. <laughs> One thing I did want to say, by the way, while we were just going over that Hero Against Dark series, yeah, that yeah. previous game on Heartlet, we were, what was it, pick? Seven and a half minutes into the game, Rainer is on 95 drones. Oh, yeah. And he's got Hive Tech, and like 70% of the map is purple. Mm. And Showtime won that game, by the way, but it's just so funny, right? How Dark is obviously a world class Zerg, Rainer is a world class Zerg. Meanwhile, Dark is just battling there, grueling it out with 61 drones. Seven and a half minutes into the game, Rainer had 95 workers. And yeah, if he recognizes you're just going to sit there and turtle, like, he's, he's going to take advantage. But. I mean, Showtime is happy to go to the late game. He's done it many times before, and he's looking pretty fantastic in this game as well. Forge and Twilight 4 gas on the way. Looks like a pretty standard Ooh. just blink follow-up. This is annoying. It's actually annoying that Probe was not on hold position, so it died very quickly. Showtime is going to wipe in a couple of adapts. He's got an Oracle here, so in the end, he's going to take care of it without losing anything. But mm. doors are open. Rainer doesn't need 20 Zerglings to find damage. Six links here, four links there overall. And this is nice by Rainer, right? You're finding damage in a phase in a game where, as a Zerg, normally you say, I can't fight damage because there's nothing I can do. They're going to have adapts on hold position, they're going to have a shield battery, they have oracles. So still finding a bit of damage, forcing a recall, some lost mining time. These are the little things that do really add up for someone like Rainer. I like that Showtime's counterattacking. I feel like it's very easy to get in a defensive mindset when Rainer's flowing like that and he's harassing you with Zerglings. But now six adapts coming across, there's three oracles behind it, a fourth one on the way. Blinken plus one, actually only two oracles, sorry. Did he lose an oracle this game, or did he just delay that third? He just said he recalled one, but he definitely didn't lose one. So he's here, we're gonna cancel that shit. It kind of feels that Showtime is just looking to maybe cancel a fourth base, but there is no fourth at three yet for Rainer. I mean, at this point, they're dead even in workers, which is definitely not a bad spot for Showtime to be in. Like five minutes, 45 seconds, this is normally where someone like Rainer is already 10 workers ahead. He's gonna let the Adept Shade finish up. He tries to gun down the drone that morphs into Nevo Chamber. Doesn't quite get it, but he will still get on top of these drones. And it's again the entire economy. I would leave two Adepts behind here, by the way. The two center Adepts would be sick. You get a few more shots off. Does not want to do it. But look at Showtime. Showtime is on fire here, man. Drones not mining in the main. Drones not mining in the natural. Nine more workers falling and a relatively late fourth base for your Rainer. This was insane by Showtime. Yeah, you could see Rainer's lips kind of like tense up a little bit there. A bit of a frustrated expression. He knew that is not exactly what he wanted to have happen in the early stage. And he's going to go for an infestation pit. We're going to see that heading up to Ultras. I expect a second evolution chamber with Carapace at the same time as plus two melee. And a very quick hive is going to be Rainer's goal. I think he can get into Ultras that quickly with an early game like this. I don't think it's clean, but against Showtime, I think he'll risk it. I think there's there's always a, a willingness to be more greedy towards the late game against Showtime. Mm -hmm. Showtime hits a really stiff timing attack. He definitely could kill him. Yeah, I don't, no, we're going to drop a Hydra then as well. I think going straight into Ultras here would be way too ballsy. The map is kind of small. And you obviously want to get Adreno Glens if you have a Hive. You kind of want to get some Spellcasters. He has cancelled the Hydra then, now he's going to go into Roaches. I think he will probably stay on Roach, Ling, Ravager, maybe some Banelings down the line, and then you fire up a Hive just to get Adreno Glens and whatnot. I think if you sit back here and you try to rush at Ultras, I think Showtime aim moves you and you die. It's scary getting stuck on Baneling tech as well though, right? So I think it's a good choice here. The Roach Warren is so good for safety, but he's going to have to make sure he can hold on. Psy Storm's on the way, Showtime's fourth base and pro production looking good. And Showtime's got a surprising amount of map control, mm -hmm. not that much creep spread either. You can see the flow-on effect of the early skirmishes, getting all those drone kills, stacking them up with the adept pressure. 
And now Showtime just kind of uh, solidifying his side of the map with Cannon Battery. Yep, uh, one of the Oracles is going to be in a bit of a pickle. That Oracle will probably fall. Good job there by Reyna moving that Queen forward. But Showtime still finds a couple of additional workers in the main. These are the kind of games, though, where I do feel like a player like Hero will be in your face non-stop on the edge of creep. And I think it's completely okay to be there. If you have a War Prism, you have those Oracles to protect your Stalkers. You don't want to just let Raynor recover. You don't want to let Raynor find his rhythm. Seems that Showtime is kind of going to do that as he's going to drop a double robo. We're going to get Storm, double robo, plus two. He's going up to four bases, so... All right, James, I think we could be looking at potentially another 33-minute game between these two. <laughs> Don't you? <laughs> I'm not joking. You're right. You're right. <laughs> get in here, Kolaris. You're what trying you, to drag me in. <laughs> what do you think about Ultras now that they're 275 mineral rather than 300, James? I'm slightly that... smaller. I <laughs> that was ill. <laughs> smaller, aren't they? It's like not a cinematic. Old. No, exactly. More effective, though, that's yeah. for sure. They're not just getting stuck on each other like they used it's to. Shame you can't land your oracles into them, you know? Like just <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Just pulls out two laser guns from either side, gets one shot off, which, of course, you know, maybe shaves a bit of skin <laughs> off the knee of the Ultra before it just chucks it into the wall. But you said in the beginning of the game, though, Pig, we really have that on full display here. If Raynor knows that he's not playing against someone like Hero, who's going to be in his face all the time, he's like, ah, if you sit back, then I know I can take damage and I can still get away with murder. A Hive, Adreno Glance, a Spire, a Roach Warren, plus three melee, just everything at once. Well, normally you think he did not have the early game yeah. to justify all of this. But yeah, if Showtime is just going to dig in his heels, spam a bunch of robots, build cannons himself, what is stopping Rainer from doing the Zerg thing and getting a little bit of everything? That's a, it's a really good read and a special level of confidence to do that. I always call that the fruit dealer production tab because I remember like the first GSL season, everyone would be building like two things at a time and fruit dealer was like, no, nah, I need 14 upgrades going at the same time. And that's what we're looking at. That. That's a colorful production tab for Rainer right now. He's unlocking all the tech. I can't imagine he's going to go Great Aspire. I feel like the Spire is just there to react if he needs to use it. Mm -hmm. But Ultra Infesta, I mean, he's shown amazing engagements. We also that. have four Dropper Lords, by the way. So we have potentially uh, a good old 34 Lizergling drop into the main base. That'd be pretty sick. Eight times four. Eight times four. Quick maths. Let's go, Kevin. Oh, 16, 32. There we go. There we go. You said 34 the first uh, time. Calling you out. Uh, he's going to run two Zerglings into the main base. Ah, that's true. Okay. And the wall will be down. Wait, it's, it, this isn't Hero. This is, this is Showtime. The wall's always up when Showtime's playing. Uh, good denial on the base there. No fifth base for free. This is sometimes a thing very Turtle Protoss players run into, is the fifth just gets denied a few times in a row. They never get it up. And if you don't get the cannon battery up, it's so easy for Zerg to deny. Just 32. <laughs> I want those last two links to make it into the main base as well. I mean, a couple of Zellers wrapped in is obviously good, but Zellers are going to have a hard time with this many Zerglings once they get their hands on plus two melee. Adreno Glenn's bailing run by in the third as well. Rainer definitely starting to find some momentum, but he had a lot of momentum in the previous game, but he was not able to get Showtime out of there. He's going to go the Greatest Spire straight away as well, so he is considering the Broodlords. And against the guy building Immortals three at a time, that's pretty necessary. <laughs> oh, he gets two full energy only Templar. Oh, that's juicy. What do you think, James? That's a lot of links. <laughs> Come on, Kolaris. What sort of position is, is Showtime right now dropping into Pachinki? What's going on, man? No, it's looking rough. There's no parachutes here. Uh, but although that being said, that's a lot of Immortals to deal with those Ultralists, so we'll push it away for now. He's trying to defend on both sides, but, you know, it's, it's warding it off for now. Raynor has lost a lot of games, though, against Protoss over the last few months where he's trying to end it with Ling Bane Ultra. And it kind of looks like you've got the Protoss player on the ropes and you're like, I am almost there, right? Where it's finally just Immortals left and my Lings can get the wrap around. But that just doesn't really happen very often. Those storms are massive. And I think Raynor, it wouldn't hurt if he slows it down a tiny bit just to gather a bit of a gas bank. Because Raynor looks rich with 87 drones right now, 2200 minerals in the bank. But that means nothing if you have like 300 gas. That's one bad fight away from being in serious trouble. So I think slowing it down a tiny bit won't hurt. Shilta might actually help him with that. Six Broodlords already on the way and there's no Stargate units. I know Showtime will probably be wanting to go Tempests off those Stargates. They're perfect for dealing with the Broodlords, but it doesn't seem like it's super high on his priorities, and I think he might be surprised that there are Broods so early, because 
We know Rainer normally, like you said, he'll just be like Ultra Bane for like six, seven, eight minutes. Mass Lurker Ling for six, seven minutes. Yeah. In this case, he's realizing I've got to keep that tech moving. And if he can catch Showtime with no Tempest with his first round of Broodlords, he could do some big damage. The Broods are funny though, right? Because I feel like there was a day and age where six Broodlords would indeed completely mess up the Archon Immortal Stalker army, but that's not really the case anymore. Broodlords are still good. I recently did a tiny interview with Sarah as well, where he said he absolutely still believes in the Broodlord, but they are different. Like, yeah, they deal less damage, but they are a lot more mobile, so you can actually get away with certain cool plays. As these links go surround four stalkers and an Archon. It's so funny how quick Archons can even die. But the rest of the army is here. All five barriers there temporarily being activated. Something to keep in mind. You mentioned Neuroparasite Pink. It was researched a long time ago. I do believe Reyna has a decent amount of investors right now. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. You know, the, the Broodlord's not doing as much damage. It's the Broodlings attack a bit slower. They move slower. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, and yeah. Reyna was talking about this earlier, is Protoss players build second forge. And of course, Reyna being the very, very, you know, he doesn't take a lot of credit for things. He's a very humble gentleman. No one would ever call him arrogant. But he did say, you know, I did beat Sarah with double forge in that game as Protoss. <laughs> and now all the Protoss are rushing double forge. And when you're playing against, you know, plus three attack it used to be, no armor, no shields for your Archons and Stalkers. They die so quickly to the Broodlings. But now you're looking at shield upgrades, armor upgrades. The double forge makes these Broodlords way less effective. Super fun to watch a little bit of first person view of Raynor. Especially in normally the early mid game, he can move blazingly fast. Right now it's a little bit less about speed and it's a lot more about positioning and making sure that you have the right army comp and that you get the engagement that you are looking for. The Tempest being out is a problem. It's going to be something where Showtime with Tempest can just take his time, revelate, pick off units from afar. The Broodlord's not having that picking off power. Reyna would like to find an opening. Maybe, you know, catch the third base in the middle or find a way into the natural. But right now, it seems like a great army split for Showtime. Tempest on the north, half of his army in the north, half in the south. It's so fun when you compare uh, Protoss players like Showtime and Hero, where they are both incredibly good, but they are so different from each other. Yeah. Hero is always there, basically screaming while running at you and microing up <laughs> stalkers. And feels that sometimes we use one control group, sometimes zero. <laughs> Meanwhile, it feels that Showtime has a double keyboard here. You know, he's like, I've got 12 different control groups for every single unit. One of the very few pros who uses the core, actually. Yep. So he legitimately does use eight to ten. I think he uses all ten control yeah, groups. Yeah, I believe it. Almost all. Always. Like, it's insanely interesting, and it's kind of funny because I was talking to him about this um, just yesterday as well, actually, and he was saying, you know, there are situations where guys like Hero are so good with their manual unit control because they're just used to boxing and control clicking yeah. things and casting spells. And he's like, you know, there's also times, though, where they just screw up so badly because they lose track of their units and they all kind of get jumbled together. And he's like, he's like, no, I am jealous, though. Sometimes Hero is so clean with that army control in chaotic situations that I, I can't do it as well because I'm reaching to my control groups. And yeah. if things get chaotic, the control groups don't work that well. Rainer finding a little bit of damage, 10 probes falling there as obviously he's got double spy now as well. It's very important to use that double spy. He's got seven corruptors on the production tab. Tempest count is pretty decent. Kind of feels that maybe there was a moment for Reyna to try to land a Fungor too and get some value out of those Brute Lords. If those Brute Lords were just there to survive, well, they've done that, but I think eventually we look for something else, right? Because the longer yeah. this goes, the less likely it is that these Brute Lords are going to have a very big impact on the next fight. Oh, oh. Neural, Neural on the Immortals is big. He gets rid of one of them. Okay, two Immortals turned against their own side. The High Templar surviving for a moment longer until the Ultra Chow's down. Of course, those murals will get broken eventually, but this is already a fantastic fight for Reyna. Yep, pretty good start. Let's see how it goes right now. Oh, there's enough energy actually to land double neural. Look at those immortals killing an immortal. Protoss units are pretty good. That's what Reyna would say. In the end, all of these ultras have died, though, and I think it's time to run home. You don't want to lose all your Infestus with attacks like that. Infestus take up a lot of gas. Reyna has definitely fixed that gas issue. He had once upon a time. He's now sitting at 3.6k in the bank. This is honestly is the kind of game between these two that can go on for a very long time. I was joking about minute 33 earlier, but there is legitimately a chance that we get there. Reyna recently had an insanely cool long game against Hero in the Mass Colosseum here on Side Delta that had a lot of twists and turns and was a proper roller coaster. This one has potential to be just like that. That was another one of those games with like sick Neuroparasite comeback, right? Where Reyna was dead to rights. He does one of the most disgustingly efficient fights I have ever seen. Blinding Cloud plus Neuro, Hero's entire army turned on itself. But then he couldn't break Hero. He thought he had to go all in and, and he couldn't break Hero on the defense. And Hero made an amazing comeback in that series. Like what a fun game that was. 
This one, we've seen a similar scenario with Showtime back in, I think it was the Atlanta Regionals on this exact same map. I'll never forget Heroes, uh, oh sorry, uh, Showtime's entire army getting just caught by Blinding Cloud Fungal, and that's what he's afraid of. He's traumatized by it, so he needs to try and feed back those Infestors. He needs to keep Detection and Vision in front of his army. You mentioned feedback, but he actually just double feedback the Vipers of Rainer. I think those are the only Vipers that Rainer had. Always oh, a scary moment, right? Because yes, Neurals are important, Fungal is important, but Blinding Cloud could be the most important of it all. Ooh. Or maybe an Abduct on the Mothership. I don't like this fight for Rainer, actually, because no there is nothing to protect those Infestors. So those Infestors are going to die. And even if you now rebuild them, you need to wait a little while until they're out. Showtime is actually playing with a decent sense of urgency here, and he has just taken out two bases successfully, seven drones, and a bunch of spellcasters. The only flying units you need. Tempest to pick off Broodlords and one Mama. That's it. Mass Immortal Arc on Storm. It's a solid army. It's an old school army. And once again, you guys know what to say in Twitch chat out there. The Mothership performing its function as intended. Minus 300, minus 300. I was about to say, I don't know what to say anymore, man. Ever since they took my minus 400, minus 400 <laughs> It doesn't, doesn't have the same ring, does it? No. <laughs> the meme is dead. Minus 300, minus 300. Like, it's just, uh, it's a bit weird. But. Yeah, but motherships are actually kind of better now, right? And it's also no longer eight supply. It's only being six supply. Like, That's what I hated the most about it is that it a, was so expensive and be eight supply. It feels like so much, right? You can do so much other stuff. You can have four high Templars with a whole bunch of energy. There's a good push for Rainer right now. Oh, recall on top of that's dangerous, but... Oh, okay, so he's going to abduct the Tempest. He's going to take out one. Will he get the second one? Big Storms. Imagine if Shotan does win this. Oh, it's man. He's just completely on his head. This is such a chaotic fight. I mean, the Ultras are shredding through a bunch of the Stalkers, but the Immortals and the Archons are doing the thing. Stalkers now blinking forward, trying to get underneath these Broodlords. Both players have lost a lot. I think in the end, this will always be a better fight for Shotan. Oh, as the Ultras derp a little bit. I think Reyna tried to evacuate them towards the top right, but they actually turned around because those rocks are still up. And yeah, near all those cannons, batteries, immediate reinforcements, Showtime is never going to lose the fight that one-sidedly. The Drainer can stick around there forever. And now the entire bottom left of the map is Showtime's, or at least denied to Rainer at the very least. Mm -hmm. The top right of the map isn't really mining yet either. Rainer's bases are running low. His income advantage is disappearing. It's crazy here. Production tab, by the way. Nine Broodlords, a bunch of Infestors, a bunch of Ultras. And Lynx with three, three upgrades do manage to get into the natural. Battery overcharge could have been useful there for a split second. In the end, the battery does die, but the Immortal just refuses <laughs> to die, by the way. 3-3-2 three, three, upgrades yeah. on the Immortal, and that Lynx kill Immortals quickly. The plus three armor makes such a big difference. This is like <laughs> our perception of late game for the longest time in this matchup. Always revolved around Protoss ground, having terrible armor and shield upgrades. And it's just like, in this modern age, we look at them and go, oh wow, they really don't die, do they? And it's like, Turns out upgrades are good. <laughs> for the longest time, we didn't get them. Much better spot for Reyna to fight there with the Broodlords being above those trees. Impossible for Stalkers to get underneath them. Now, I do kind of feel that Showtime is trying to bait him out a little bit. Oh, Fife has got focused down without landing a spell. He abducted, but he's got no Corruptors. He's got like two Corruptors out right now. Reyna just doesn't have the right mix. It's also important to keep in mind that Reyna still only has plus one Carapace. And that maybe matters a lot more when Corruptors are battling a bunch of carriers, but I still think that's important. This looks like a fantastic catch, though, for Reyna. Juicy surround. Stalkers and mortals in the open. A few Stalkers get back, but that's a, a bunch of valuable units. Something back in the Reyna win column. I really feel like Reyna's bases have got to be oversaturated at this point, though. Like, yeah, he's yeah. That, that's, that's exactly what I was expecting. 30 workers on one base in the top right. Rainer's income is dropping. It was all blue arrows earlier in the game on the income uh, down at the bottom of your screen. You can see right now there's a little bit. <laughs> the, the, the red one's flashing for I the know, gas. Showtime's got the gas income. <laughs> that is actually weird that Showtime's mineral comes that low. He hasn't transferred back to the middle left base. He just lost the bottom left to all those links, right? Those bottom yeah. Left. But it's okay. I think Showtime can obviously overtake him. He's also working on a couple of these Thunder Robo Bay upgrades. I was wondering, by the way, why don't we have a Dark Shrine? Like, if you have this many bases, I think you should always have a Dark Shrine. There is going to be yeah. a moment where Reyna can lose his Overseer and maybe doesn't have Infestors to Fungo anymore. And just harassing bases, right? The same way Zerglings can run in when the base isn't established. You run in a few DTs, kill a hatchery, blink away. Like, it's actually very effective harassment. 
But Zergs uh, are so good with their mobility that a lot of the time Protoss players get used to not really having any map control. I just like it defensively. A lot more than I even like it offensively, where the DTs can potentially find some damage or give you a bit of map vision. I just think it's so nice if the Protoss attacks you with only one or two, Zerg attacks you with only one or two overseers. With all these Blink Stalkers, Storms, Archons, Tempest, it's very yeah. likely that you can kill their overseers. And if you then still manage to take a bad fight, you can always warp in a couple of defensive DTs to temporarily push the army back or to deal with run buys. How nice is it that you don't have to worry about run buys? You warp in a couple of DTs, the links will disappear. It's interesting we saw Showtime look a little bit uh, stressed in the camera for a moment before he straightened up his posture and went back to the, you know, shoulders back, confident chest out that we know Showtime for. Ooh, this is risky, by oh. the way. Big fungal, big fungal for Rainer, but his army's kind of small. He doesn't have a lot of support for these Broodlords. It's all just Broodlord and Festa. No Observer there. I don't see an Observer in that army of Showtime. It's incredibly risky for him to be here because we know that Rainer loves Infestors and there is no detection. I don't think he can stick around with his army. A couple of fungals land, Broodlords doing their thing. Tempest will get a couple of value shots up though on those Broods. That's nice. Insane game, man. It's such a draining series for both of these guys. Like, if you're Maru, you're obviously not happy that you lost your first series, but you gotta be peeking over your shoulder and looking at that German dude and be like, well, he's definitely making the Italian <laughs> boy a little tired here. And you know Maru's strategy versus Rainer, his best one is often turtle to late game and frustrate him, so Rainer's gonna be running into, I think, a field of opposition that are trying to play exactly what they know he doesn't like playing against. The Stalker blinks on the Broodlords, take them out. But the Ling Ultra is very good, but the Immortals in the back line, dude, they shred the Ultras. Look at the army supply of Showtime. Showtime doesn't have one big army. Showtime's got two absolutely monstrous armies, 145 supply. He has one Observer, one Oracle left, but there's only four Infestors left. I just don't see Raider having the kind of army to deal with this Protoss army. Whether it's the army on the left or on the right, Kalaris, strong Protoss armies everywhere. East and the West. East. Oh, but one, the, 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 the West is rotating north right now. Oh my gosh, is he going to rotate to the south? He might go from the north and the south here. Is he hitting from the north and the south? He's hitting from the north and the south. Oh my goodness, he's everywhere. Feels like there's, there's two different worlds here. And what's about to happen with them, James? It may be colliding. <laughs> <laughs> it's like one world is a lot bigger than the other world. I wouldn't hurt to recall this army out, by the way, because this army has done its thing. And I kind of think that Chilton could have recalled it out. I don't think recall is on cooldown. It's yeah. a bit of a shame to lose all of these units, but this still worked out, man. He wiped out the natural, he wiped out the lost stuff in the main. The army on the, on the right side has taken out the top right side base. drones on one base! Okay, good pull by Rainer. If he loses oh. all those drones, that would be a disaster. Storm would be sick. Recall did get used there, by the way. I just think it was a little bit too late, but I still think that Showtime should be very happy with how all of this has gone. As Rainer is wiping uh, or moving his hand through his hair, he knows that he's in a bit of trouble. Showtime has taken the bottom left. He's taking that base at 7 o'clock as well. This is just uh, very problematic for our Italian. I'm used to seeing the kind of angry, frustrated hair tussle from Serral, but you know, the, the Basilisk boys both have that maneuver down now. Uh, Rainer is used to being in these games and making scrappy comebacks, but when you're this far down on army supply, it's tough. It's a good catch. Gets a few Tempests, takes a bit of splash damage. Earlier you mentioned arrows pick. Six arrows in favor of Showtime. <laughs> I have never seen a man lose when six arrows are in your favor. The income advantage, 2,100 resources per minute more right now on the side of the Maur. Showtime said he's not going to make it easy on the boys here in the group of death. And Showtime is just playing a sick series. Even the yeah. first game that he lost on Ocean War, we didn't manage to catch all of it because we were casting the other game as one Fungo does land. But Showtime looked damn good, damn competitive in this as well. This is an amazing start for Dimauer. You know what we haven't seen is a massive fungal blinding cloud ambush. We haven't really seen the Vipers and the Infestors sync up. And Showtime uh, with a fist bump worthy victory over one of the favorites of the entire tournament. Unreal. What a shakeup here in a Group D, considering we previously just came off starting defeating Maru, and now we have Showtime defeating the two names that everyone was like, no, they're dead. <laughs> they come into this group, they're dead, but they are fighting back here, Roddy. That's the call an ambulance, but not for us meme, right? Where everyone's like, oh, we're so in trouble, but no, they're actually not. And how cool does that make our next best of three that we were waiting for? Yes. Which is why we had to temporarily cast this game from our desk over here. Maru versus Rainer up next. Both of them are 0 and 1 in this group. After that best of three, one of these two top favorites to win the entire thing, not to make playoffs, Correct. but to win the entire tournament is going to start off 0 and 2. That is catastrophic for either of these players. One of them will be at a 0 and 2 in this group. And considering the other opponents in this group here, Pig, you would have never predicted that Maru and Rainer 
could potentially be in the scenario. Yeah, that's wild. I mean, <laughs> what a date one. <laughs> it's it's the group of death for a reason. I, you got to realize all these guys are so clutch, and it's cool to see because Showtime has never been uh, a walkover by any means. But people were just kind of looking past him because of the depth of this group, and he's just surprising. He's showing he's got what it takes. He's coming in confident. He's coming in with the build orders, and we've said, hey, he keeps almost beating Rainer and losing at the last minute. These games, he finished them off. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, the man put in work and the man has declined a couple of online tournaments but well, he said nope i'm not in the mood right now to play online tournaments he really just wanted to practice in the dark wanted to get ready for this tournament in the best way shape or form and not give his opponents too much information not give them any clever ways to take advantage of tendencies that he has leading up to this event and it's safe to say that so far that's absolutely working out a very long way to go for the mauer before we can talk about him into the players but rainer is an amazing victory because we're not looking at a bad rainer right now rainer has worked incredibly hard to get ready for this tournament. He's been like working towards it for over a month straight, gearing up and for Showtime to show up and say like, you've got a lot of momentum, but I'm going to temporarily stop it. I'm going to start a one and know It's a very impressive win. Hey, and usually we're quite doom and gloom about Protoss to a degree, to a degree. But Cyan and Showtime taking these scalps <laughs> at the start of this tournament, you don't have to be too doom and gloom apparently. That's sick, but I, I've actually thought for a while that this is technically a good patch for Showtime. You think of all the things that kind of hurt him in the past. I saw that James, but... Uh, oh. Nothing too, dr nothing too dramatic. I feel like a couple of these things, like the bailing HP nerf, etc., this really works in Showtime's favor. Mm. And the longer that Showtime can just sit back and have a more powerful late game, the more of a terrifying player he becomes. Like, it makes sense to me that Showtime is incredibly good in PvZ in this patch. Sure, sure. Let's see if he can hang in with the Terran players in this group as well. All right, well, it's time for a break before I spill any more drinks here at the desk. Uh, and when we return, as mentioned here on the desk, we do have an important fixture. Maru versus Reyna, both of them at the moment here in group D, zero and one at the moment. Join us right after this. Intel Extreme Masters Katowice is brought to you by Monster Energy, the United States Air Force, and Intel. Hello everyone, my name is Iona Sotala and I'm also known as Cyril. Hey, my name is Ricardo Romiti, uh, also known as Rainer. And your unit is Queen. A queen? <laughs> how, how do you draw a queen? Oh, that's easy. And now you can just copy him and do it better. Yeah, I guess. How is it easy? I don't even remember how queen is. Yeah, me and Atra actually. All right. What if I draw like a deck queen? Yeah, I think that would be the best idea. But I'm gonna do it properly myself. <laughs> You're such a tryhard. What is that? <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> I'm really making the queen. I'm drawing a trampoline, I think. <laughs> You're copying me then, or what? <laughs> No, I, I don't remember. How? Yeah, I mean, eight, I know clue how it looks like. But eight legs, it has eight legs, as far as I know. What? It has eight legs? Yeah. What is that? <laughs> what? It looks like the Loch Ness monster or something. But isn't that what it is? Is that the head? <laughs> no, those are his hands. <laughs> the queen doesn't have paws. What is that? What? Why are you drawing hands on the queen? <laughs> it has hands. No. It has eight legs and two hands. It has like spikes, no? <laughs> yeah, but that's what I tried to do actually. I give it the crown. <laughs> <laughs> it's a turtle with a crown. What? 
<laughs> well, it's better than yours. No, it's not. Do we show it off? I think mine is a more fair. Well, uh, I think mine is an obviously. Hello, chat. If you think mine is better, type one. If you think the turtle is better, type two. Thank you very much. All right, welcome back. We've already had a very entertaining day number one here at the Intel Extreme Masters Katowice and some very unexpected results, especially from Group D. Joining me still, because we were scheduled to be on this <laughs> segment, but we ended up doing the whole cast for that game, it's Pig and Rotterdam here to now talk about an, what we would have originally have expected to be an extremely hype fixture, and it is still very hype. It's even more hype. But it's in a very weird scenario now. I think it's more hype. Like yes, obviously, yes. if they're both one and zero, oh, it's pretty hype because the winner has a good chance of winning the group. Right now, they're both zero oh and one. And yeah. I don't want to say that you're out if you go zero oh and two because we've seen people in the past advance even if they start off zero oh and two. But you're zero oh and two, and then you still have to play hero and dark as well. And apparently, mm. a scion that's on fire or a showtime that's on fire. I think the series is even more hype right now. Yeah, uh, dangerous as well for both of them as a whole here, at pig. And uh, traditionally, when we see them. Kind Kind of match up against one another. Maru does all right. I mean, but it is an extreme fixture here between the two. It's amazing. Every time these guys play, we get to see two things. Can Maru keep up with Rainer in the early and mid game? Yep. Because a lot of the times that's not the case. 
But also, even when he's way behind, when he gets to late game, can Reyna do anything to him? Because <laughs> Maru is just this unbreakable wall of late game. Reyna gets frustrated playing late game in Zerg vs. Terran uh, visibly, uh, especially after that last series, I think even more frustrated perhaps. So it's for him, it's, you know, can he run away with the early and mid game? Even in the championship he won, there was a famous Reyna vs. Maru match, and it was all about Reyna getting ahead and he loved playing Mutalisks to keep the movement, to keep the momentum going, to stop Maru turtling it out. So I do expect at least once, depending on the maps, Mutalisks to be an addition for Reyna. Yeah, I don't disagree. We've seen a decent amount of uh, Reyna playing Mutas in ZVT lately. We've seen it in some of those Archon practice games as well, but I'm not sure if he's totally in love with it. I think it's very situational. I think it comes down to the map as well, and obviously he's not going to tell everyone when he loves Muta, when he doesn't love Muta, when he thinks it's the right thing to go. There's a good chance we'll see it once in this series, but I do agree with Pick. Like, the early game is going to be very important. Maru knows that if he can ever get like up to five bases and get a lot of planetaries and a lot of goals, and basically all the only movement he will do is moving a couple of ghosts around to do a little pew pew action. Yeah, that can really get on the Reyna's skin. But obviously this is not Reyna's first rodeo either. And Reyna will know how incredibly important this is. So if he's forced to stay somewhat defensive himself, I'm sure that he will do this, especially after being only one in this group. Oh, definitely. And for Maru, of course, now representing vitality of all organizations, alongside Soli here uh, throughout the tournament as a whole, that's also kind of a big deal and kind of a big deal for those potential knock-on effects for the World Cup down the road here here pick so for Maru very important to be able to get a win under the belt likewise so for Reyna and this is traditionally where Maru has looks like the invincible Maru when he does get to that late game and continues to hold and continues to hold and make some of those comebacks happen and because we've painted that picture so much here I have a strong feeling Maru's going to be highly aggressive and just try to kill Reyna <laughs> because that, that seems to be how it works right whenever we're like that's what he's to do uh, and that is what's scary about maru he has hugely unpredictable early game openings you never know when he's going to do some sort of weird layered proxy or like you know you've got a widow mind drop then you've got a cyclone with a, a medevac chasing down overlords following it up with a liberator he's always got creative openings that he will mix in there and i do expect a mixture of different styles what I'm most curious, though, is will there be a mech game in here? He's played some fantastic mech into ghosts recently. Mm -hmm. Five mm -hmm. factories into ghosts gave Serral a lot of trouble in MC7 with that as well. So I would love to see it. I think Rainer, mm -hmm. he's good if he's ahead against mech, but if you can get to a pretty even late game, uh, Rainer will definitely find a, a big struggle to break through. Thoughts, Roddy? I was just taking a look at the map video, seeing what they were going to get rid of. It's going to be fun. There is a fun little side story that apparently is a thing here every year at Intel Extreme Masters Katowice. I don't know, but random Koreans will come up to Raider and be like, hey, Maru is really good right now. And he's like, okay. And then the next <laughs> one's like, Maru is really good. He's like, why are you guys doing this? Like, apparently it happens every single year. <laughs> they run into each other quite a few times. He's like, it's so weird, right? Why are they telling me this? I'm not going to change anything. But apparently the other Koreans want Reina to know that Maru is incredibly good right now. We didn't see it yet earlier, but perhaps no. we'll see it in this best of three. Yeah, maybe, maybe, as we kind of alluded to. It's, <laughs> it's usually a match where he has thrived in the past here. But again, you know, you kick the bee's nest for some of these guys, like Reina, for example. Definitely not going to be happy about going down to Showtime just before. No, no, no. Reina will be fired up. Reina historically does very good in group stages in IM Katowice. Usually, he yeah. was in the group of death two years ago where we had Clem and Maru. Reina back then defeated Maru in a pretty one-sided series, I would say. Everybody had high hopes for it. Obviously, last year, I think Reina barely dropped a map in the group stage, and he looked great even into the quarterfinals until he ran into the man who says he's just a normal man. He wasn't very normal at all. But Reina historically does not struggle in group stages, so it's a bit of a surprising start and I'm very curious to see what kind of arena we'll see now in the second best of three. Yeah, and as you say, I mean, in terms of all the potential of Amaru getting aggressive, there has been baffling moments in the past in Katowice where he's done some interesting builds on the international stage, which haven't really kind of materialized in much. And I'm thinking like really crazy Banshee things early on and trying to make Yeah, happens, but like the fastest Banshee you've ever seen and yeah, stuff like yeah. that. I know it happens. I mean, Rainer himself would say, okay, I'm playing Maru. That's a quote from like maybe a year and a half ago. He's going to do a, something crazy, random opening that's not op like really optimal, but it can surprise you. And if you get past that, he's going to turtle to late game. And that was his mindset about a year and a half ago whenever they played. He's definitely going to have his eyes open. He's not assuming Maru's going to sit back because Maru changes his opening every single game. He's a highly unpredictable Terran. That's why he's been so successful. He's not going to make it easy for Reyna to just guess what's coming next. No, definitely, definitely. I'm trying to think about uh, the rest of the makeup of this group now because everything's just been thrown out the window, to be perfectly honest, Rotterdam. Right? 
considering that our two Protoss that we didn't really expect to give as much of a fight as they have done, really have given a fight to the point where they could even advance. I mean, Showtime beating Reyna, I would say, is a bit of a surprise, but it's not the craziest thing ever, just because we know how hard Showtime still works. We yeah, know it yeah. takes these tournaments incredibly serious. And I think this is a good PvZ patch, especially for Showtime, but even for a lot of Protosses. Like, a lot of the Protoss players will tell you, like, yeah, if we lose PvZ right now, it's kind of on our own. Like, we are supposed to be doing better than what we have been doing. So Showtime beating Reyna, bit of a surprise, not that crazy. Yeah, Cyan beating Maru, I did not see that one coming. I'd be absolutely full of you know what. If I was like, yeah, kind of thought Cyan was going to show up and beat Maru in the death. And he's actually, by the way, like I'm kind of keeping my eye on the PvP that's currently happening. He's playing a good game one against Hero as well. I'm not saying that he's going to win, but yeah, Cyan is, is looking sick. And obviously Firefly also got to win. Like it's really cool to see these Chinese guys that show up. And they are not here to fill out this tournament. Oh, let's have 24 players. No, they are here to be gamers too. James, I know you're a gamer, but these guys are gaming. Doesn't Cyan have like three kids as well, or something like that? He has like multiple kids. <laughs> I have like no a idea. Kids. I don't think he get. The, I think he's complained in the past about not getting to practice as much as some of the other pros because he's you know so busy taking care of his family and everything. What if he but, practices uh, Arkham mode with them though? The three kids. <laughs> <are there>. Hey, <laughs> you know it's like the the doing push-ups with the kids on your back sort of thing, right? <laughs> he's got his whole training montage on it. Yeah, going toe to toe with Hero is crazy because. I always feel like in the last year, maybe two years, Hero and Max Packs are at the ultimate level of PvP. Mm -hmm. And then everyone else is just this kind of big step down from there. So anytime you can take on Hero in a PvP, that's fantastic. They're very close in game one right now over there on the B stream, if you guys want to oh, check yeah. that out. And of course, Maru and Rainer are getting ready for their match at the moment and uh, delays there. No I feel doubt. like Lars has bad news for us. No, well, oh. no, no, I don't, I don't. If I was at home, I'd have my eyes glued to every single one of these streams because considering how crazy Group D all of a sudden got, yeah. it is it is tantalizing stuff to be able to watch. And actually, speaking of which, uh, I do actually want to listen in on the opinions of our members from Group D before it all played out Ooh. to see what they think Ooh. about what was going to go down in Group D. Group D, D for death. We have Maru, who's a favorite. We have Hero, who's on fire right now. We have Dark, he's been looking incredibly strong for a very long time, and maybe this is his final tournament. We have Rainer, Rainer of course, incredibly strong right now. We have Showtime and Cyan. This group is ridiculous. It's really hard to pick a player that's actually gonna come out of here in first place because Dark, Maru, Rainer, these guys are all of such an intensely high caliber. It really comes down to who's going to perform on the day. Rainer has some absolutely ridiculous Zerg vs Terran, and we know he's been practicing in Archon mode, trying to become as unstoppable as possible. I think it's almost unfortunate for Rainer that he doesn't have more Terrans in this group to display that. He's going to need to show top tier Zerg vs Protoss and Zerg vs Zerg to get out of this group in a high seed. Now I think Showtime and Cyan are going to have a very difficult time in this group. But I can definitely imagine them taking a series, especially, for example, Showtime going up against Dark. I do think that's a match that Showtime can definitely win. It's Dark's last opportunity as a big tournament before he has to go off to his military service to show that he can become a champion. For him, if he can make it out of this group in first place, he's going to be setting himself up for a historic run and a beautiful way to cap off his career. This is Maru's big shot for a return to form. He barely fell short at the finish line last year. And that's uh, a loss which he said will haunt him for the rest of his career. This is his chance to make up for that. If he can get out of this group in a high spot, he absolutely wants to take that trophy home and he will not be leaving any opportunities on the table. This group, I mean, it's almost a little bit disappointing that we're gonna have to say goodbye to three of these players already, because at the very least in my mind, four of them, they could easily win the entire tournament. Well, I'm so confused and conflicted. I don't know who's who anymore, to be perfectly frank. <laughs> that was uh, not the players' uh, opinions of what was going on here in Group D, but it was your guys' opinion. That loco guy had some really smart opinions, man. That guy is honestly underrated as an analyst. If you could shut up loco for <laughs> that would be fantastic. Yeah. Uh, but <laughs>
<laughs> what do you think, Rotterdam? <laughs> oh, I couldn't really hear all of it. And my eyes have been glued <laughs> to the screen where Hero is, I, by the way, going to win the ah. first game against Cyan. But okay. Okay. Cyan really made him work for it. And as Pig said, Hero's PvP, excellent. Legitimately the only guy who is beating Max Packs pretty often. So for Cyan to make it this close and competitive in that first game, that makes me even more happy because apparently he's very good in PvP. Now he can hang in there in PvP with the very best. I mean, Group D, we had high hopes, but it was mostly about the big four because, yeah, okay, show them is very good and he's going to give us fun games, but it's about the other four, right? No, it legitimately is about all six and that's the way it should be in a group of death. Sick. No, definitely, definitely. A lot of fire has been brought to this group, which is very exciting to see. What For what a lot of people might have thought was a, almost a foregone conclusion for who was going to at least jostle for those top spots here uh, in Group D. Um, as he now, as Loco picks up the card of Maru, looks at Reyna, I mean, we have uses. Did we even show the cards yet? Himself. So 94 versus 94. It technically, according to the pros, yeah. is the, if you could display these for me, gentlemen, here's Loco displaying Reyna. And uh, over to our right, here's Ben Baker displaying Mario. <laughs> I have way too much hair to be Benjamin. <laughs> 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 uh, I suppose not. 94 versus 94, though, should be even. Yeah, I mean, obviously, historically, it is even. These yeah. are two of the very best Star of two players we've ever seen. I think that I'm a bit surprised by Maru's speed 91, because as amazing as Maru is, I don't think Maru's that quick. What Maru is, is incredibly efficient and Correct. super accurate. Yeah. Yeah. That boy, like even when he has like this weird little towel on his mouth, which he sometimes does, yep. he just never misclicks. So he's kind of moves, click, click, everything is picture perfect. If he plays Osu, he's probably going to get 100%, you know? <laughs> but I don't feel that Maru is that quick compared to some of these other guys out there. But he is just A, incredibly smart, B has great game sense and C is so damn accurate. Fun yeah. fact, he uses the slowest scroll speed of any pro gamer that I oh. know of, 40%. Most pros use 100%. Oh, for so the, uh, the, the edge okay. scrolling. Hey, I yeah. do that to 40%, Gold. <laughs> oh my God. to recognize God. I kid you not, always 40, 40, 20 is what I have, or 40, 20, nice. 20, whatever. Yeah, that's a lot slower. And you watch his stream as well. And like you said, it's so methodical and you almost think like, He's not playing that fast. You watch Rainer's stream, you get motion sickness. Yeah, you no, that's take yeah. medicine before you watch his stream. Yeah. It's like, oh my god. It is quite interesting though, because when we actually took the first person of Rainer just now, of course, 98 speed, which is absolutely apt for Rainer, mm -hmm. there are still times in the games where he does slow it down a little bit, right? He doesn't have to play at a blitzing speed to then still be efficient himself. No, but if you would have a Mudaling uh, oh, yeah, Bane game, you yeah. guys were talking about, maybe we'll get to see some Mudas. If we get to see a little bit of that first person view of Rainer, like minute eight and nine, when He's playing Mudo Link Bane, he's got two run bys and Mudas are flying around. Like that's actually crazy. Yeah, and that yeah. is what Pig said. You get a bit sick in your stomach <laughs> if you watch that for a while. Kind of watch like one game and then that point I'm like, yeah, can I please watch somebody that's slow? You know, that's when I open Piggy's stream. <laughs> I was like, oh, this is so pleasant. Look at Pig moving his little faster around. Hey, mate, there's nothing wrong with microing only using F2 and A move on the minimap, okay? I'm oh. like, I'm like, yeah, saturate my bases, I A move my zealots or whatever. You know, it's always zealots like Ling Bane or something I can A move. That's fine. Yeah. So now he is incredibly quick and obviously these scores are not meant, uh, made by us. Sometimes in the past ESL did yeah. it a bit different, right? Where they also asked us and they asked some of the other players. This is just players rating players. So there's a lot of the other guys giving a lot of respect to Reyna for being very quick. I mean, we've had different iterations of the cards as well. Of yeah. course, we had different iteration in Atlanta. And what was important for coming into this Katowice series, they even polled the audience. Which ones did you enjoy more? We actually went oh. towards these cards to see how things were going. And this, in terms of the players rating players for these categories, I think does give a pretty decent picture of where they all sit currently. And I also think they did it a bit more serious. I have the feeling that oh. last year they kind of saw it as a meme. And I heard that a couple of the pros voted the other guy. He's like, oh, he's super slow. Give him like nine out of a hundred, which is like, <laughs> okay, come on. So they had to remove well, a couple, first. but I actually think that all the players really enjoyed looking at their player cards and the presentation and the yeah, videos yeah. that they made with the player cards, but they're like, oh, okay, I guess we'll be a bit more serious. And yeah, I think they came out very well. I'm kind of at ease with a lot of these uh, ratings, but we already have a few nerds definitely overperforming according to their power level. Uh, apparently, apparently. All right, well, thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you for everybody else for their patience. We are ready to head on over to the stage here. It's an important fixture between these two, currently zero one both in the group thank you so much this match is a big one we're so glad you stuck around because it promises to deliver first up we've got maru a terrifying terran who conquered code s and came to katavice hungry for more he finished second last year at katavice 2023 will he maintain and will he continue on to today's and this weekend's championship he has to get through rainer one of the few players 
who has ever played in Riyadh, the champion of Gamers 8 this past summer, and the only one who has left footprints in that sand. This could be the end of his journey if he's unsuccessful, or it could continue. Let's find out what happens and get into the game. Two of the world's greatest pro gamers were facing off against each other in a very important series of StarCraft 2. It's Maru going up against Raynor. My name is Loco. I'm joined here by Zombie Grub. ZG, how are you feeling about this one? Very curious, honestly. The performances that all of the players in Group D have had over the last year have been up and down and all around. Rainer most recently not liking his performance at Atlanta. So he specifically went back into the training mode that he was before Gamers 8. And most famously does the versus six GM Archon Terrans, you know, type situation. So he definitely has trained for this matchup. I think he really enjoys being basically better than other players and to be better than Maru consistently. Must be nice. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? Is one of the crowning achievements for anyone in Star. Craft. So he always comes in hungry for this. You can see that he's like a little charismatic, a little excited here. And Maru, well, Maru's Maru, right? It's hard to tell exactly what he's feeling. But one thing we do know is that he didn't like his loss to Katowice last year, and he's really looking to turn up for this one. But Cyan already threw a wrench into that plan. Yeah, absolutely. Showtime doing the same thing as well to Raynor. And if you want to move on out of this group, right? I mean, no disrespect at all to those players at all, but it's so important that you win as many matches as possible. And I would say that an opponent like Maru, an opponent like Raynor, is the more difficult one. So in a strange way, this almost feels a bit like an elimination match. I, I know what you mean, though, right? Because we did, again, come in with the expectation that it would be maybe even a couple of blowouts for what we viewed as the bottom two, which is no longer the bottom two, and then a really tight race for the top four. And I thought the person who was going to have the most struggles as far as dipping was Hero. And he has had some struggles, but Maru and Raynor also taking some upsets, one certainly bigger than the other, but neither one putting them into a comfortable position where, yeah, they still have all of the other support supposedly more deadly players are there also looking at them. So this is a very important match indeed. It's also probably going to be one of the coolest ones as both players have really leveled up their TVZ. We're getting into map number one in just a second here. We're going to be on Alcyone. And in the top right now for Team Vitality, he is Maru. And his opponent down here in the bottom left hand corner, representing Basilisk, makes some noise for Raynor. So many people already turning up here. Just day number one of the tournament. If you have nothing to do over the next couple of days, you should just watch the streams every day from, well, basically dust to dawn. I've already seen people criticizing other people for not buying three monitors. <laughs> like, what are you doing? It's kind of pizza. Like, just you upgrade your that? internet, buy another monitor, yeah, get it wrong? done. Watch yeah. everything. Yeah, seriously. And it's awesome that everyone's already come down here on the Thursday, but then it's extra awesome that you guys right here in the crowd right now have actually stayed from sometimes, I, I'm sure for some of you, up to 11 hours at this point. Like, yeah, cheers for yourself. That's awesome. And this isn't even the last series of the day, but it's certainly uh, one of, well, <laughs> I mean, the other one's actually really great too, but this is certainly one of the ones that people are looking forward to the most as TVZ is still that really classic matchup, really the cover art of all the StarCraft in the world and all that. And we we do have Maru going for kind of an interesting iteration on an opener, but we also do have Rainer uh, needing a fix here. So good on him, because I was about to say exactly what Maru was going to do. <laughs> yeah, probably want to wait with that for just a moment. A lot of fans already showing up here. 
The entire Basilisk crew. I like how yeah, Rory is Roddy's just in so the corner there. <laughs> <laughs> he gets to be on the banner too. Yeah, it's nice though. It's like uh, it's like they kind of forgot, but like yeah. we'll fit them in. Yeah. You They're know. like, who are the players again? <laughs> oh, sorry. Wait. We almost <laughs> forgot about Roddy. Uh, of course, Roddy's even come in clutch for some of their team links. Absolutely. I absolutely can't forget. Yeah, I'm curious to see what sort of strategies we're going to see, though, because over the last couple of, well, really the last couple of years, Maru has been favoring that more passive style, right? But every once in a while, he seems to get into this mood where he just wants to kill you as quickly as possible. He yeah. goes for the most aggressive build he can come up with. Is that something you can really catch somebody like Raynor off guard with, right? Like, Raynor is incredibly good. Well, I was going to say early game, but he really doesn't have any particular weaknesses in this matchup. No. I'm fully expecting Maru to just play a, what we consider to be normal defensive opener with quick triple command center and everything else. But yeah, I guess we'll find out here in just a moment. <laughs> I'm not sure Baines needs Tim. <laughs> I don't know about that one. <laughs> <laughs> Baines needs Tim Peck. Yeah, I can get on board with that. Oh uh, yeah, sure you would, he's a big player. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, so we finally got back into the game, guys. And Maru, as I was saying, is doing an interesting iteration here. He went low ground to Plow Depot, low ground barracks. Yeah. Usually when we say that, you could even default assume it must be two barracks or waiting on possibly a third. But no, it's actually just a one racks. Actually, Gumiho does this quite a bit. If Bion was the guy who was always doing a two racks and Gumi always did like a one racks in an odd position, Maru would flip flop between the both, CC first, one racks expand, and a normal way, you name it. I mean, he definitely can do anything in the build order notebook. But yeah, what we're talking about is whether or not he's going to try and be super aggressive or the super turtley style that he definitely made famous and definitely perfected <laughs> a couple of years back. And that is a very, yeah. very fast third season. This is a super greedy opener right here by Maru. So he went depot wow. into a bunch of Marines. Another depot, right? But he's mostly just adding on three command centers before any gas whatsoever. Yeah. That this is means actually... that if Zerk decided to get aggressive in any way, shape, or form, it would have been GG. It's actually kind of insane, but we—I mean—we saw Kira do something similar, right? And he actually got away with, you know, thought murder, and then Dark was able to bring it back by getting like every possible good outcome from then on. So uh, I certainly believe in Rainer to do so, but I, I definitely think that Rainer's gonna scout this eventually, of course, and mm -hmm. then he's gonna get a little smile, he's gonna shake his head, and then he's gonna get even more of a murderous intent than yeah. he started off with. This is one of those build orders that would be horrible on the ladder, right? If you take this build order right here from Maru and you try to implement it in your own ladder games, you would probably lose about half the games by about minute three. There's a lot of very cheesy Zerks out there, but if you know who your opponent is, and in this case, of course, that's Raynor, Raynor will pre pretty much always open up with the same strategy. Now, this may actually be a bit of a misread. He's currently making eight additional Zerklings. He's not entirely sure what's happening inside of that base here off the Terran. Yeah. He really doesn't need additional links here, but he's expecting there's going to be some sort of aggressive follow-up. Now he's seen about three Marines. What's going on here? Well, that's the thing, though, is that, uh, you know, again, if we're talking about ladder, the amount of follow-up is probably very limited even amongst the, the higher leagues. When he's talking about professionals, what's going through Zerg's minds when they see that low ground Barris, especially with the Marine coming out, is that they don't know if it's a three racks follow-up. Only now now, does he actually see that a factory is on the way and kind of a late factory? Oh. So was that like a second factory? Well, actually, it's a third, but it's because, you know, we're just adding all the production right here, right now. We are going to get that mech game and it is not going to be completely scouted by Raynor. But I do think that first factory, obviously, it seems like the only factory to him might have been a bit of a tell on the CC timing. This is going to lead to a crazy mech army. So Maru has already gotten away with murder here. The scariest part of this game for Maru, at least in the first 10 minutes or so, is already done. He's managed to get away with a super greedy start. Now, I'm curious to see what the follow-up is really going to be. Will this just be... What? Is even faking Oh, yeah, back? okay. That, that has to be a fake. Yeah, it's fake. <laughs> There's no way. But this is obviously limited information for Raynor. He can't really get the scout into the main base. He's seen the green light inside of that tech lab. So he knows that something's researching, and at this stage in the game, that would always be Stimpak. Now, this is funky, though. You have... A mech build, oh. a triple CC. Nah, he's oh. not going to see it. And about eight Marines. And he's seen the green light. So you assume, yes. well, certainly, that it's not going to be Blue Flame Hellions with Mass Cyclone. Yeah, I know. He's, he's, <laughs> I mean, 100% he has to be assuming three CC into a bunch of barracks. Yes. Right? So, you know, he's not going to be attacked anytime soon or with a lot. And that is true for both mech and bio. 
but Ooh, obviously, yeah, finally sees something a little missed. But he, but he, because mm, I guess he hasn't seen the Hellions that much. Anyway, so I was saying, either way, you're not going to necessarily be like attacked with a lot. It's not like a two base all in that you didn't expect. But the way that you handle the first two medevac drop versus suddenly blue flame Hellion Cyclone is obviously very different. Now, Raynor is going for a quick Bailing Speed opener. Bailing Speed will certainly not be done in time, so his main defense is just going to be Zerklings and Queens, and then maybe a bunch of Slow Banes. He's aiming for a quick Roly Poly upgrade here. Now, he's gonna see that army here step onto the creep in just a moment. <laughs> he's restarted the upgrade again. <laughs> Raynor actually did see that it got cancelled for just a moment, which is a little bit strange, but did he really pick up on that? Because obviously That's... there's about a million different things to manage at once, and suddenly... Well, yeah. <laughs> this is the army that shows up on creep. That is not what you've been expecting at all. And yeah. there's a third command center on the back of this. Yeah, exactly. Again, if this was two medevac drop, you, Queen Ling would have done it, but... Now the Lings absolutely have to get us around and the Bailings have to connect, but the Lings are actually on the other side of the field, which might be a brilliant maneuver here. Let's see how much they can get done and whether or not Raynor can actually survive back at home. Yeah, this is not something you're gonna have a whole lot of practice against. Right now, though, his army here is at full power. That being said, the Zerg reinforcements are showing up, and it's clear that Maru has been distracted quite a bit yeah. with that Zergling run by. Five SCVs go down. But really was supposed to be almost like a game-winning attack right here from Maru, falls flat on its face. Yeah, really nicely done by Raynor. Obviously having all of his queens together, actually finalizing some of those banelings, having the creep that actually didn't dissipate until the tail end of that fight. All good things, but then he also made sure not to get distracted himself trying to control too many things. He was focused firing with those queens on the Cyclones every yeah. single time, just like the Hellenes weren't a threat to the queens, obviously, and they weren't looking to do a run by, which they, they might want to do because this forward aggression isn't quite working. And another okay. Ling run by is going to try and get in. This time blocked, but still going to find some reinforcements in the fourth command center. That's a good scout and a bit of a delay on it as well. Alrighty, so we have that mass cyclone Hellion style right here from Maru. We call this battle mech. It hasn't been super popular over the last couple of years, but obviously the cyclone did get a complete rework, and it's a very different unit than it once used to be. Radar is responding with Hydrolink Bane, trying to get the wraparound right here on these units. Baneling speed is done. These cyclones have nowhere to run. Yeah, very nicely done. Obviously, oh geez, like this, this is actually a bit of a disaster because reinforcements coming in. I, I'm not going to be surrounded, at least. There is still more power here off of Kree, but still, Maru definitely isn't getting the momentum. So disaster is too strong of a word because he is on you know three bases going yeah. on to four. But he really isn't finding any trickery. Rainer, I think maybe for a little while, had to suppress his drone. So maybe he's not like 90 drones, six bases, like a passive mech player, you know, you'd be able to get away with. But he's really doing an excellent job, and hopefully this propels him into that... Uh, I would say mid-game, but obviously we're like five base versus four base. Yeah. <laughs> Into the minute 10 in a better situation. This, this has been a very strange start to a game of SC2, not what we consider to be the established standard at all. Now, Hydras are just about to come online with some decent upgrades here, and that's going to make the defense a lot easier for Raynor. Generally, Zergs will transition towards some sort of spellcaster here, but obviously the question for Raynor is, can you really afford for example, an infestation pit, do you want to dare go up to Hive here? Like, what exactly is the follow-up plan? As Maru is just pumping out, well, can, now we have finally a transition towards Siege tanks, but up to this point, he's just been pumping out Cyclones. Yeah, I was wondering if Rainer could actually try and attack. I mean, especially after a, a surround again, then obviously trying to counterattack immediately, but that can be kind of difficult to do because it really wasn't a perfect game. Again, it wasn't 90 drones. You realize it was really passive mech and you can just do whatever you want. He does have to react to all these attacks and not let them snowball, but if he gets a surround, which he is once again trying to set up here, and then maybe he can actually go across the map while well, that tank count is still very low. The surround does not happen. Maru will keep plenty of the Cyclones and Hellion alive, and he's already well under underway into that tank transition. I believe like five just popped. Planetary's formed, fifth base is on the way. Maro certainly has successfully gotten to that more late game of the mech, and I could definitely see spooky mech in the future. Absolutely. Ghost will probably be on the horizon. What a cool way to open up here though for Maru, because normally, right, if you were to see this sort of opener from the Terran, and it doesn't get that tempo lead, it's very difficult for the Terran to actually stay in the game, because you're really trying to overwhelm the Zerg with attack after attack. But what Maru is doing is he's training as efficiently as possible with his mechanical army, while actually trying to build up an economical advantage. So, in a way, it's the Terran player who's trying to swarm the swarm, which is a, yeah. a very strange situation to be in, and it may be 
difficult here from, for Raynor to, to get this read. Does he even know about Baldo's bases up north? I don't think he does, actually. He, yeah, has he had doesn't even know about the fourth. Yeah, well, I mean, he knew it was being built, right? But yeah, he's going to try and take the offensive hatchery almost. Just deal with the minerals and find out that the base is already there. So Maro's playing at a super fast speed. And one thing he was able to display in some of the uh, Master Coliseum replays is that he actually can be extremely fast, not just that turtle style. He's just doing with battle mech at this point. Hyger's actually a little vulnerable right there. Not the correct numbers, nothing else to protect them from the Blue Flam Hellions. And Raider's supply is looking really poor. Maro's able to tank hop on the offensive as a mech player still maxing out and is already knocking on Raiders third base. Now it's a push with siege tanks right here for the Terran. That being said though, the tanks are pretty late on the siege up. Is there enough follow-up right here for the Zerg to clean all of these units up? The Queens have been pulled away from their hatcheries as well momentarily. Considering Raynor wasn't, or sorry, Maru wasn't sieged up there, I think this is the best fight that Raynor could have hoped for, but it's still not going great. It's not pretty. It's just not a pretty game. Maru got away with such greed that even though a lot of that early pressure from the surprise Hellion Cyclone didn't really do very much and end the game, obviously, it still gave him the control that he has used to play one heck of a macro game. Yeah. Raynor trying so desperately to hold on to this, realizing that the tanks are a little under defended, but not having enough lings to actually jump on top of them, losing out on the creep spread, losing out on his queens, and that Viper is only just being made here. Yeah, we have a, an attempt at a Lurker transition, but I don't know if Rainer can really afford it at this point. He's got 90 workers, which normally is fantastic against Terran, but Maru's got 93. This is, yeah, yeah. in a way, it's unexplored territory, right? Like, this isn't really something we've seen from Terrans before, and this is clearly something that Maru has been cooking up over the last couple of months. He's been preparing for this tournament, and this is a strategy that Raynor has not got a lot of practice against. Yeah, you could actually look at that Cure Dark series in Atlanta in the semifinals, as Raynor definitely looks like he's about to tap out. He knows that it's it's not been a very pretty game for him. But you can look at that same series, even though it was Bio, and kind of see the big differences, which was that Maru might have not conquered with that Hellion Cyclone, and his reinforcements were even cut off and whatnot, but he was ha so far ahead with the build and the macro, and Raynor still had to take so much into account that Raynor was still ultimately suppressed. He was actually almost always down in workers against the Terran, like, which is an insane concept. But what happened in that Cure Dark series is that Dark was able to get like a little bit and then counter, a little bit and then counter, a little bit and then counter, and really interrupted the Terran's flow. Raynor kind of had that happen with the Ling run buys. It just wasn't consistent enough. They stopped, and then when they stopped, they stopped for good. Yeah. So the, the real kicker here for Maru is that he's got close to triple digits worth of workers. Yeah. A lot of the times we see these sort of openers being played off of like 75, maybe 80 workers, but Maru's got so much income that he can easily match the Zerg. And because of that, I mean, he is the one who can trade cost inefficiently. The resources lost are looking really good right now for the Terran. And Maru is trying to create a chokehold on, on the natural expansion right now of Raynor. This yeah. is not normally a, a spot you're in, I don't think he's going to let go, right? He's got these no. siege tanks in such a good spot. 3-3 three, three is going to finish up in just a few seconds. He's aiming, yeah, he's aiming for the throat. I mean, there's there's a couple of factors why Raynor hasn't tapped out, right? And one of them is probably disappointment. You know, he's like frustrated that this happened this way. Yeah. The other one is that he has spellcasters, so he wants to be able to use them and try and do that. Then the third one, I think, is honestly, until these Hellenes reinforced, a tank-only reinforcement line from a mech player is actually extremely vulnerable. If you miscount how much Larva pops like 40 lings and your tanks get surrounded, you feel like an idiot. So I think Rainer really was hoping that would happen too. But Maru played every aspect of that with cohesion. I'm not going to say he played it perfectly because the Cyclone Hellion didn't actually, you know, it got surrounded, right? Yeah. But it just, it was cohesive. It worked with the rest of the plan of the build to do the greed, to do the macro, to be the Zerg in the ZVT here, just endless floods of units. Yeah, so normally if we see Battle Mech, right, say it's like, well, Cyclone Hellion or Cyclone Hellion with Benshee support, if this push right here fails, yeah. Aaron falls flat on his face for the rest of the game. Absolutely. But he had so much economy already at that point. I think it was a massive misread as well from Rainer. Like he found the fifth base when he was trying to take it and he didn't even know about the Terran's fourth at that point. Yeah. Right? He probably knew that it was up and running. Maybe he assumed it was at the three o'clock or something, but. That was a very tricky game right there from Maru, and I think it's something he specifically prepared for this event.
Yeah, probably. And I'm sure he's going to have very, you know, slight iterations on it for future Zergs that he can still bring out. Not always 3cc after the barracks, maybe after a legitimate factory. Again, he could do what Kier didn't go into bio after a very greedy opener. Um, he could probably swap over, like, faster or slower into the tanks as well and change things up that way. So it's it's very cool to see Maro in top form. But this is... This is where I'm like, oh no, okay, Reno needs a day to rest, right? Like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like you this take is a just, nap at the very least. This yeah. is snowballing, and if this was the day of the tournament, I'd be very worried. But he does get to rest, and I don't want to give up on him in his best of three, of course. But it does seem like it's just the off day for so many of these players, and the day performance really can't be understated. One of the criticisms that I uh, that I received from some of the pro gamers when I was like, well, what do you think we should talk about more? And they're like day-to-day -day changes like mm. the day of can be so different than the next are you day. saying pro gamers are humans That's i'm crazy. saying casters are sometimes wrong <laughs> that, <laughs> no 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 that first part i can agree with but i don't think casters no 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 <laughs> no you're absolutely right though sometimes when you're just having an off day right maybe you just are jet lagged maybe you slept like two hours less than you're used to right it's the little variance that can make a massive difference and Right now, it's starting to snowball. You can see on the camera that Rainer has not got his regular confidence. Yeah, that's that's kind of what I was looking at more so than even the results here. But we do have game two underway now in Solaris. In the top right, he is the Red Terran, Maru. And his opponent all the way in the opposite corner. Can he get it together? It's Raynor. <laughs> Spoiler, Raynor 2-1. Well, mm. oh, you got to believe in him, right? He is, like, one of the best comeback players in the scene. Um, I just, like, it is one of those things where it's either a nap, a day of rest, or it's an extended series. Mm -hmm. Like, it's a best of seven, right? And kind of like, need to get into that, like, that groove. Yeah, them, exactly. Right? You find your flow. Yeah, so the other thing that could happen, obviously, is that Raynor opens up with something different himself, which is exactly what he's doing, and then he forces the momentum to be on his side. I'm not necessarily thinking, you know, oh, I don't think Raynor is thinking Mario's going to do the same thing, because that would be insane. Yeah. Right? But this Rainer is a bit different, but yeah. He might be looking for something just to start things off, to give him control, and maybe most importantly, a very thorough scout. Absolutely. So it's a pool first right here from Rainer to get her with a quick gas geyser. Oh no, I don't like the barracks positioning at all. That one should certainly be on top of the ramp. I brought it up in the previous game. Rainer, nine times out of ten, will open up hedge gas pool. But after that game number one, apparently Rainer has decided, you know what? Terran here is playing a little too cheeky. I'm going to go ahead and go for a spotting pool first and a quick gas geyser too. Now, curious to see if it's just going to be 100 gas. Yeah, it will just be 100. He's going to get, I think, metabolic boost. No, he pulled one off. This could certainly be a bailing bust. That would actually be very interesting. <laughs> we did see Shin with some... Uh, that, that actually worked pretty freaking well. There's no you walls. You don't even need a bailing bust here. No, you just, <laughs> you just need a circling flood. You actually are like waiting for the bailing finish and like, oh, the door's open. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <all> right, then. <laughs> but no, I mean, a little bit of uh, earlier speed action could... I mean, surprise Johnson Maru. Gas is a bit funky here, no? Well, Maru is not doing any scouting himself. So I know we're talking a lot about what Rainer could doubt or could do last game compared to this one. But oh, it's a roach one. Oh, wow. I feel like, well, obviously they exist. Obviously they do well. But I feel like it's been a long time since I've seen the two-base roach actually work. Because so many like people were opening up Reapers and they're actually kind of good against it. Yeah. You can slow down the roach attack so much, right? With yeah. just three Reapers, you just keep throwing the grenades. Maru is playing exceptionally greedy, though, because normally, right, to put it in perspective, we will see an SCV go across the map and then it gets followed by a Reaper. In this particular game, Amaru is not scouting at all. In this particular series, he's not scouting at all. Yeah. So exactly. if Rainer manages to get across the map with like seven roaches, more of a couple of them into Ravagers, and then, well, I mean, flood with Lynx, how in the world is, is Maru going to hold? Yeah, I really like this choice from Rainer. If Maru continues to be greedy, even though it's a little less greedy than last game, boom, gotcha. If this actually is like a complete gamble of like, well, I got to give him momentum back, let's just freaking go. Fantastic, I think that's actually a great call. But then to give Maro some credit here, he should be wary of something like this. Rainer is not someone who's known for being literally only a Mac Reserve. 
So I, I would imagine he's at least depending on like, yeah, two Hellings into two Cyclones to give him some start of the defense. <laughs> but he really is playing greedy. I mean, these engineer no wall at, the No wall at the top of the ramp actually is insane. Focus my mind. Yeah, he just sent the SCV. The reason why he did it is because he sent the SCV ever so slightly late and he's like, oh, I guess I'll just plant it right over here. He's going to abandon the low ground that goes straight up towards the high ground and, well, give up those SCVs on the... It's still not a wall, though. <laughs> we need high ground vision of some sort. That Overlord is actually not close by. Well, I guess you can just walk your entire army up there. That works. That was a really late supply to you. I mean, maybe they didn't have minerals, but uh, now I'm going to try and body block with the SCVs. Kind of working to uh -huh. a degree. Maru's going to be able to lose a lot of SCVs before he is officially out of this game. Really more so, it's about killing all the units, which right now, Raynor can't quite get to. Surrounds the Marines, but the SCV pool will protect the mech units. And the last rounds are going down. I think means there's uh, there's now a controllable situation, right? You can use the chokes, you can wait for a couple more units, and the SCV hold position is going to be really good too. And that, there it is, there, the hold position comes into effect, and it might just be barely enough. You can see it, Raynor knows he did not do enough damage to another greedy build of Maru. Wow, beautiful hold right there from Maru, though. That was one of those situations where it can go terribly wrong if you don't control it perfectly. Maru backing up right there in between those structures of his and creating that choke point. Yeah. Hold position, having those Hellions fire from the back. I was with you. I thought Cyclones were going to be the go-to option there for sure, but those Hellions in the back were incredibly valuable. Yeah. It, it is kind of tricky when you have so limited factory units, but obviously it's kind of both to help out against both, right? Yeah. At the end of the day, Lings are what's going to get into every nook and cranny. They're going to get the surrounds, and they're going to be the fastest reinforcements. Curious. Those Hellions just roasted so many Zerklings. Oh, the Love Hellions, see yeah. the, the kill count on them. Yeah. And Maru played that so patiently, too. Again, like the lack of wall completely, because he wanted to use the choke. The hold position on the first three SCVs, he wanted to use the choke. The pulling back to the self-made choke. The hold position after attacking when he found that it was the best solution. I mean, that is... That's proving the confidence right there and doing the build in the first place. Yeah. No, you're absolutely right. It's a follow-up push right here from Rainer. So Rainer putting all of his eggs in one basket. He has decided that this all-in, well, the first wave of it didn't work out. I'm going to try and go for a second wave as well. Question is, does the young Italian have enough stuff right here to overwhelm the Terran player? Again, good choke point right here for the Terran for now. He can afford losing a lot of SCVs. This is essentially a push that Rainer has to win the game with. He doesn't have a lot of follow-up, only 26 drones. Yeah, yeah, he actually got within like two or three workers of his uh, of Maru in the last push. But then with Maru 3cc, it just skyrocketed again. So <laughs> Maru has, I mean, 10 plus workers to give, actually like more like 20 plus, 16, 17 already going down. The numbers are starting to rise. The Roach is actually coming in after the Cyclones had given up some of their lives in the hold of the choke. Might actually yeah. be the ticket here. Rainer, through force of will and the unexpected second all in, might have caught Maru too much by surprise. Yeah, he was a little bit late right there on the SCV pool. He doesn't really need a lot of workers here, so Mule's alone should be A-OK. -okay. I think ultimately Maru is going to be able to reinforce this decently well. Stim pack at this point is also done, but I guess they're going to <laughs> Marines to Stim. And 1-1. One, one. <laughs> oh my god. Yeah, these are the most well upgraded two Marines in the world. <laughs> oh, Jesus. This is actually an insane situation because you know what? The situation as far as the Zerg economy versus the Terran it's economy, dirty. Yeah. it has happened hundreds of times before, but I don't think I've ever seen it with Stim and 1-1 one, one done for the Terran. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the follow-up pushes here from Maru are going to be dangerous, though, because Raynor just does not have any upgrades of his own. He is actually going to try and make a macro game out of this. He's decided that apparently winning with more units is not going to happen, but he needs to somehow, some way, match the Terran's economy with those three additional mules. And those mules, they will account for a ton of mining. Yes. So, uh... yeah, how many? We're already up to 38. Larva's uh, yeah, pretty good. Larva's pretty good. <laughs> it, it is. You know, when you just you know, can go ahead and choose to do the other thing. You can have a roller coaster of an income. But, <laughs> <laughs> but then, of course, you got to give Terran some credit here. It's pretty freaking nice to produce both. All Absolutely. right, like <laughs> army and SCVs at almost the same time. Maru obviously isn't that rich. He does have to skip like a third SCV every now and again. But he also has such a forward stance on the upgrades that he could forego upgrading for a little while and still be good, but he's not even going to do that. He is grabbing the armory. He is uh, going to keep with the upgrade lead. I just want to say I love the seven and a half minute Reaper. Like that I is love it. <laughs> yeah. I actually love it. You never really see Reapers past the very first one, but this is actually a very good moment to get a bit of vision because a scan is about, well, 
a lot of resources, right? You have to choose if you want to go for a mule or you want to go for a scan, and that Reaper is a lot cheaper. So Maru getting that scout off the third hatchery, he now knows, hey, he's actually just trying to yeah, play a macro game against me here. And yeah. Well, I mean, a scan would have been much quicker though, right? He's already up to well, 53. There's also that chance the Reaper scouts more than one base. So, I, I <laughs> legitimately, because so often you'll feel like the only thing you can do as a Terran who's been defending is to go for a Banshee. And yeah. That's a big commitment. It takes so, so long. Yeah. yeah, just going for the Reaper makes so much more sense if it successfully gets across the map. Speaking of getting across the map, two medivacs immediately picked up again. Stim, combat shield, 1-1. One, one. Actually <laughs> insane. Plus one carapace about 25 seconds away from finishing two. That would have been so freaking helpful. But do these Marines finally get their time to shine on the offensive, and do they win the game? <laughs> yeah, the strangest timing attack right here, but you can see the strength of those upgrades. Having the 1-1 one, one and the combat shield, I mean, we see, a, we see a 60 Marine drop all the time, right? Like, that is not a strange strat. He's actually just going to sack all of the units. I don't know if I quite agree with that, because yeah. Who 2 is on the horizon as well. It's going to make those units even more powerful, but... I think it already did a lot of damage, right? All the response, all the, uh, like, running in single file is really bad for the Zerg. So, and, and kudos to Raynor for focus firing as diligently as he did. Oh, on the medevacs. Oh, misplaced too. Man, this is, this is going from bad to worse. It was a great sign for Shin, though. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> he just went for a bailing bust on the back of his. Yeah, and at, legitimately, actually, that's a kind of a good point. Rainer's been experimenting with a lot of like 60-ish drone uh, Ling Baneling attacks. Mm -hmm. Like that's what he was doing almost all the time versus uh, Clem in the last two series that they've played. I might like it in this situation, not necessarily because I'm a real believer that it works strategically, but rather, in a game that's already got such weird pacing, can make it even weirder. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Maru here decides to fire up the fourth command center as well. So that one is, all things considered, obviously a little late. But this is a very difficult game to read, right? Like, you can play a thousand games of SC2, and you will not come across this particular situation very, very often at all. Yeah. These guys have played tens of thousands of games. Yeah. So it becomes a bit of a guessing game. You have to make the right decision at this moment, and if you invest too much into economy, you may just end up falling behind. Second factory coming up. Okay, Maru is just preparing to play a long game. I do think, even though moving on to the Zerg side of the map, and especially if they have really good creep spread, is scary, I do think this is the, one of those positions for a Terran where they say, oh yeah, I'm comfortable. Yep. I've got way superior upgrades. A single double drop made you panic like <laughs> hell. Yeah. Like, you haven't done your signature stuff, which is run by me all the time. So this is my game to play around with. And obviously Maru, especially, the later the game goes, he just becomes more intimidating. So Raynor definitely still on the comeback. His workers have never really truly been as impressively higher than Maru's as they should. Again, only by two at this point, which I mean, they're both getting saturated, but regardless, Raynor again, not getting to the destination as fast as he would want in both games, which is maxed out six bases, 80 drones, hive technology. Yeah, you're absolutely right. He is uh, several minutes behind at this point. And if you look at just the supply count, this doesn't really look that bad for the Zerk, but in the, well, other pillars of SC2, like for example, upgrades and tech, he is not in a good position here whatsoever. Still an uphill battle, but this is at the very least a lot more manageable than it seemed, well, just about five minutes or so ago, right? He's got a good enough economy to keep going in this game. But if there's anybody comfortable playing a slow TBZ, at least from the Terran's point of view, I would say that's Maru, right? A lot of players yeah. are not really enjoying slowing down the game all too much. But we talked a little bit about it before these matches started, as we do have some nice target firing here by our Terran. Maru loved playing that passive style for a very long time, and he still mixes it in. So mm -hmm. this is the perfect setup for exactly that. Yeah, I mean, he could show off the speed that he was displaying versus Serral a couple of weeks ago, because he was playing as fast as, you know, we see Clem as the fastest player, but this isn't necessarily the one to do it, because even though I said he's probably feeling comfortable, again, it's really difficult to tell exactly the situation. You can't get into every hatchery and see the exact saturation of the minerals or the gas. You can't necessarily get the exact technology if you scan incorrectly. So Maru playing a very weird game in a more, you know, defensive style. We got the drops of the majority of the army staying at home. Makes a lot of sense. That also means that Raynor can also try and get to an equal point as far as the army supply and, and general supply. It's the bank that will be missing for him in a late game like this. Yeah. 
That upgrade advantage is going to disappear though, right? Over the next couple of minutes. I mean, sure, right now Maru is significantly ahead in that department with 3-3 finishing up. But there are no plus four, plus four upgrades in StarCraft 2, so he can't go any further than the upgrades that are finishing on the right side of your screens right now. Mm -hmm. Rainer, in the meantime, going into his own 3-3. Those are going to upgrade, well, those upgrades are going to finish in maybe a yeah. minute and a half, two minutes or so from now. Ultralis Cavern coming up. I mean, tech-wise, he will be able to catch up, but yeah, the bank is going to be a big question. I do think Maro is going to start to pile on the pressure. I mean, he's, he's maxing out on, you know, not ghosts so far, but I'm sure we'll get there eventually. Yeah, there's the first ghost. Yeah, it's mostly just been Link Bane, I guess, up to this point, right? So. Yeah, for sure. Like, you actually don't want to go overboard on ghosts uh, if they're not going for like, a tier 3 <laughs> unit. But those are the upgrades once again displaying their effectiveness. 3 3 versus 2 2 underneath a uh, handful of medivacs is very nice. But yeah, you're right. The upgrades will equalize the bases and the economy situation overall, I guess, will kind of equalize. But the bank is what's going to be missing. And Rainer has struggled to kill Maru every Zerg has struggled to kill Maru with like an 8,000, 8,000 bank. Right. So to do so when you're on 2,000, 2,000, or not even 2,100 in this game right now, obviously you have to be very careful feeling that you can just throw wave after wave of Zerg, even though that's the play style that you've been designated as the Zerg player. Yeah, this is not the type of game where Rainer can just roll down a planetary fortress, right? Like right. he's not in a situation, well, maybe in a few minutes from now, but he's not in a situation where he can just freely throw away like 20 plus Bane Links. He needs to be very cautious. Marudo playing this almost uncomfortably safe, right? Like I'm almost wondering if he's giving the Zerk a bit too much wiggle room here. It's, it, again, I think it's a very difficult game for both of them, even though Maro can look at some of the stats and feel comfortable. Actually pushing out against a guy who has recovered from the weird opener into yeah. being now able to do his Ling run buys, you know that is going to be a sore point. And they certainly are. Those are cracklings with plus three melee even just finishing now as some get into the main base because there was never a wall. <laughs> uh, so that's actually about that part. <laughs> quite a few SCVs killed, and they even stopped a lot of the extra production. Maru also getting deflected at the front. Not a lot of creep on the right side of the map, but, well, if you look at the minimap right now, we're crossing about the halfway point on the other side. So you can certainly start creeping up this bottom section of the map, too. Now, we have Ultras coming up into somebody who's already into Liberator tech as well as Ghosts. How do you feel yeah. about that? Well, one thing that uh, Terran players love to do is be really obnoxious, so... Every Starcraft player loves being obnoxious. No, Zerg players are, you know, truly guiltless souls who have never done anything wrong in their life. That's true. <laughs> but the Ghost for one thing, now it seems to be Mass Liberator. Yep. That seems to really be giving some Zergs some real difficulties. They might win, but they're going to be gritting their teeth the entire time. Uh, there are a few Widowmines set up, but not in this particular spot. Maru may want to move some of those over. This is a scary army over here at the front, but those Zergling runbys are really starting to hurt. There's a lot of production over there. A couple of the Banelings do end up connecting here as well with the main army of our Terran. One of the hatcheries, though, finally falls. Oh, here. oh, 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 oh. That was, oh gosh, that was like so many Marauders and Ghosts getting taken down as Maru was focusing elsewhere while he was actually being pulled in three different directions. Mm -hmm. Two attacks of his own and then trying to deal with the defense as well. Maru. I think he might have been right. Maybe missing his time to shine. Really, there was a time where there was less creep spread. Yeah. There was, you know, Rainer still kind of uncomfortably choosing between army and drones. But to choose that right moment on the side of the Terran, it is extremely difficult. I didn't mean to downplay it. I meant to just highlight, like, Maro yeah. might feel okay, but he can't just win the game, and now he's losing it. Yeah, he lost a lot of his production structures. So generally, Zerkin's killing a bunch of barracks. Not that big of a deal, but Maro actually needs to remax here. Oh, we actually have Chitinus plating. Oh, no, coming oh, up that is after so there's late. already like six Ultras out on the battlefield. Ultras without that upgrade just, well, take a lot of damage even from just the Marines. And Maro has got plenty of those, but this is starting to look a little worse for the Terran than it did at the start of this match. Oh, I mean, absolutely. This is... Oh, this is Rainer ripping him apart. The only thing that is concerning is that Rainer's gas bank is so low. So if he does overcommit with plateless ultras yeah and that could be huge that would be so bad you know a planetary fortress that has its upgrades and mass scv repair into the ghost coming in that could have been a disaster but maro just simply does not have enough units and the ghosts have already used so much energy apparently the ultras are going to be forced to flee again they're really not even equipped to be doing what they are doing rainer is just feeling the momentum and doesn't want to let it go yeah i think it's important though for him to slow down a little bit maybe if chitinous plating was done he could have continued going here but you gotta play into those 
Well, small mistakes that you make as well. The chitinous plating upgrade just makes the Ultras significantly more tanky. But ultimately, that's also going to give Maru a lot of room to breathe here. So he's going back into that uh, ghost style. He's going back into as many Marines as possible. But he hasn't quite established a foothold once again, Widowmines. Okay, not getting the greatest of detonations. <laughs> almost got one on the Terran. No, that been yeah. fun. The ghosts are almost all going to be able to escape. Almost, though, but no repair or lift. I think he could have canceled that planetary. So missed opportunity. Yeah, 18 oh, thrones did go down. Oh, mind drop in the oh, top yeah. left -hand corner. This is a game of speed now, Zongrub. Yeah, it actually is, absolutely. And seriously, so Maru has actually said in interviews that he'll feel days where he just doesn't feel as fast. Like his his hands do not listen to his brain. But then there's also maybe some rumors of him maybe getting like surgery to fix something. You know, it's the Terran, the Korean Terran problem. My point is he seems to be really displaying a lot of really fast TVZ. The style that he reserved in his back pocket for the days he felt good more often in the last few months. And when he is feeling it, he is amongst the best as far as being the multitasking, aggressive, speedy, skill check Terran. So we might be able to see that as things have once again settled on the supplies. And it is Rainer's bank that ends up being the concern as it is dreadfully low and he's not maxed out as of yet. Infestors right now are sharking around the map. There is obviously no Raven, not a lot of missile turrets, not even really that many command centers in the grand scheme of things. One fungal growth and Rainer may just be able to get those ultras to close the distance. Still though, for now, Maru pre-splitting a lot of his units. I love that. Zorkins once again rushing through the center of the map. In the bottom right, they do get scouted. But Maru, yeah, crossing his T's, dotting his eyes here. This defense is looking a whole lot better now. It does seem like he just simply persevered as he is continuing to be maxed out despite the attempted run by still being annoying. And I think really though, the run by's have to open up more opportunities <laughs> like this. The investor just popped up in the middle of the group. <laughs> like, what's up, guys? <laughs> I was here all along. That nice was... fungal, and I think, yeah, he does kill a bunch of stuff, but Maru's supply count looking very healthy here compared to Raynar, who's, well, still at a worker lead at the very least. He's going to try and take one of the bases here in the top section, but Maru is taking firm control, at least, of the middle of the map. Yeah, the more that this game goes on, and Maru is the one that stays maxed out, ever-increasing quality of army as well with the Ghosts and Liberators, the more you think back to that missing Kitness Plating, he definitely had momentum, yeah. and that yeah. absolutely adds a lot to an attack. Maybe he still gets stopped short by that planetary, but that would have been critical to continuing <laughs> on there, and at least having a bank for this next stage, the 22-minute stage. As of right now, Rainer knows that Liberator is becoming an ever bigger problem, so he's going to grab a handful of Corruptors, but they're still tricky to use, as the Ghosts should be covering these Liberators. In this case, they aren't. <laughs> completely yeah. left alone. This is also a difficult game for Maru to read, though, right? Because this has been extremely chaotic, and you don't really know exactly what's been going on ever since about minute three. So guessing exactly how much money the Zerk has at this point is not easy. Does Rainer... Yeah, have a maxed out army here with like 3k in the bank, or are you actually slightly ahead economically? Well, it turns out it's that second option, but Raynor's sure making it look like he's rich. It, yeah, he's kind of puffing up his uh, chest here, right? Some great fungals on top of a lot of the army, and another fungal on the backside too. The problem is that the fungal might have decorated it all in green. None of the units actually died, and Rainer realizes that was not the fight despite the spells. The DPS wasn't there, there was no surround, there wasn't enough splash to follow up on, and he doesn't have the bank to make that mistake. What an incredible game of StarCraft 2. This is really good. Marudo ultimately seems to be coming out ahead here. He's tightening the noose for Rainer, trying to, yes, yeah, stay alive, but this has been a very difficult game for him, and he's been trying to make the best out of it, right? For a little bit there, it looked like he was coming back, but I think that this army here from Maru is going to be nearly impossible for him to stop. Yeah, indeed. It's 40 army oh, oh, up. Oh. That is a very, very good fungal, and the ultras are getting nice, close, and comfy with a lot of those units, but the cloak up as there is no Overseer is going to be a problem. And once again, not enough DPS post Fungal to get the kills. Rainer obviously displaying some world-class play here. I'm saying he's having an off day as if we're all like super disappointed in the kid. We're absolutely <laughs> not. Showtime had his pop off. Showtime just played spectacular. Maru's back to that form that we expected from him. But today is not Rainer's day to be number one in the group. No, and he is not going to be happy about it, and that's exactly why he wants to stay in this game for as long as possible.
It's clear that Maru is also starting to feel, well, maybe some of that tiredness, right? This has been a very long day for both players, and I don't think Maru from, say, 11 a.m. would have taken seven fungals in a row like that. <laughs> but ultimately here, our Zerg just didn't have enough follow-up, so he's making more and more infestors. He's hoping, praying almost, that Terran is going to make another slip-up like that and that he can finally cross that distance. He's taking one of the bases up north once again, but it's a little reminder field over here at the bottom of the map. Uh, you gotta respect Rainer for giving it a go. He does still have a lot of bases and, you know, a kind of consistent income. Uh, Rain Maru is only so far ahead, I guess, uh, when you consider what the map used to look like. It's still a bummer for Rainer, but now he's losing one of those critical bases that was good consistent mining. But not being able to <laughs> get over a 150 supply hump, as you know, yeah. Terran is maxed out. I mean, that just feels terrible. Absolutely. Yeah, a couple of the banelings right there got very ambitious. They decided to morph in within the Terran's vision. The only thing really lacking here for Maru is just knowledge of where those infestors are. The only way for Raynor to really get back into this is to fungle the entire Terran army and to get some sort of follow-up. But these scans, I love them. I think it's very clever from our Terran here. Make sure that you're not going to be falling into that trap once again. And now the snipes are going down. We don't have... There you go. Beautiful EMPs. We don't have anything else anymore. And there it is. It's a 2-0 win for Maru, but he had to fight for it. It certainly did. Rainer doesn't look completely outclassed in any regard. No. It just... it. This was... Yes, to be one of those groups that comes down to the play of the day. Any one of these guys could beat anyone, and we used to talk about that as the top four, but now we talk about it for all six players. And today was an it for Rainer. It's kind of half it for Maru, who really did look very strong in the TVZ, but his TVP had some weakness. Maybe it could be exploded by Showtime later, but he has proven dominance in this TVZ. Excellent build in game one, and then excellent defense in game number two. Yeah, Maru actually played incredibly well in this series. I love the build that he did right here in this match. I mean, <laughs> if you didn't see it, then this is the first time you watch the match and you've seen a lot of StarCraft games, this would be the moment where you think, oh no, Terran is out, down and out. But Maru at this point, and yeah, and that match was actually slightly ahead, building up a massive economy with a very cool start to his strat. Just, yeah, out, out Zerging the Zerg. Yeah, he really did. And his swift follow-up to the tank transition and then even offensive tanks was was really terrifying for a Zerg player. They, they kind of hope for that big gap in which they can breathe and get to technology. This micro was beautiful. It absolutely wow. was. Yeah. Like, and I'm <laughs> I'm guessing maybe that's why he had such belief in the placement of his barracks initially. He knew it would create some type of artificial choke. Yeah. But uh, maybe it could have even been better. I don't know. But... I think Rainer is not too happy, though, with how this all went down. Oh, no. I think if he were to do this a bunch more times, he would probably win at least 50% of the times in that spot. This is the moment where those Marines went across the map with 1-1 one, one Stimpak and Combat Shields. Oh, some big mailing connections as well, but yeah. ultimately, yeah. Maru, he persevered. Yeah, that one clip just before this one was when Rainer had taken a 40 supply lead and had the map and had the creep spread and seemed to be getting into Maru's main base and natural more often than not. And then it just it, it just petered out, you know, like it, the, the ultras without chitinous definitely helped with that. And that's unfortunate, but maybe Maro had this one anyway. Let's go ahead and send it to the stage for an interview. Thank you so much to our wonderful casting team. I'm down here with Maru, our victor of the match. Now, Maru, while they were talking about the match, we got to stand here and look back at the screen behind us. You were watching some highlights from match two. I want to know what you were thinking as you watched yourself play out. Uh, right after the match. 어 일단 조성수 선수 승리 축하드리고요. 어 일단 관중분들도 이렇게 지금 전광판으로 이제 경기를 보셨듯이 지금 조성수 선수도 경기 끝나고 나서 일단 어 본인 경기를 지금 뒤에서 하이라이트 좀 보시면서 아까 어좀 되새기시는 것 같은데 어 경기 좀 어떠셨나요? 어 1세트는 제가 생각한 대로 풀려 가지고 좀 괜찮았는데 2세트가 어, 상황이 좀 어지러웠어 가지고 아직도 so first of all, uh, at the first game, uh, I was really satisfied because I think I pulled off uh, my builds perfectly. But uh, in the second game, it was really, really hectic. So I, I, I don't, I still don't know what happened in the game. So I think uh, that's why I uh, look at the stream of the highlights. 
That game absolutely was hectic. That game was so fast. And part of the reason it went so fast was your inputs. You're so clean. You seem to be very decisive right now. Tell me a little bit about your condition going into this tournament mentally and physically. 어, 아무래도 이렇게 또 어려운 경기를 치르고 나서 조금 힘드실 수도 있을 텐데 지금 이렇게 경기 일단 어, 심적으로나 이렇게 좀 육체적으로나 조금은 좀 컨디션 괜찮으신지 예, 좀 여쭤보고 싶네요. 어, 일단 시안 선수한테 지고 나서 굉장히 힘들었었는데 그래도 레이너 선수 잘 잘한 선수 이겨 가지고 어느 정도 자신감도 회복한 것 같고 아쉽긴 하지만 괜찮은 것 같습니다. So uh, after my match with Cyan, I lost that match. I was a little uh, devastated, of course, and I didn't know what to do. But um, actually, this win gave me a confidence boost. I think I restored my confidence uh, in the match uh, further. So um, yeah, it's not a, it's not a good uh, it's not satisfying overall uh, today. But still, it is one one. I still have a chance. So yeah, I'm I still feel relieved. You deserve to be relieved. You picked up an incredible victory there, and we have more to see from you as the tournament continues. But for now, let's send it back to our analysts and take another look at the match. Thank you, Rachel. Yes, this might be the only time in tournaments where Maru has only got himself a, like a 97 in terms of defensive stat on the cards. However, he still holds strong here uh, against Reyna in this second game and is able to move through to get himself that 2-0. Joining me, Pig, as well as Rotterdam, to talk about the series. It was looking, well, especially game two, Pig, overall. It was looking spicy. I thought maybe Reyna was going to be able to push it to a 1-1, but not to be here. Yeah, it's that's one of those weird games where it, it looks like it's over three and a half minutes into the game when the roaches can't really get up the ramp and you kill four SCVs and you needed to kill 40 <laughs> SCVs. Yeah, yeah. And then, the again. I mean, we, we saw Rainer's shot on camera as well. He thought he was completely out of it yes, at that point. Yes. That was the most desperate round two wave and yet it actually found massive damage. Definitely did. Right he kind of ball? channeled his inner dark there where the first all-in did not work and he knew he was Omega dead and I really felt like it was at the point of leaving and he's like, ah, let's just make more links. Maybe I get a lucky surround and the Hellions were out of position and Maru just didn't have many units yet. So the second wave did so much better than the first while the first one is supposed to feel the damage and that kind of allowed Rainer to make a game out of it. But Maru never truly let it slip away. It looked a little bit scary at one point with some link run by some chaos, but if Maru is heading into to all the planetaries, the ghosts and the liberators, we know that he knows how to close yep. out a game. Yep. And like, it looked like a standard game if you open the stream 15 minutes in, but it was always a bit different, right? Because the banks were different, the upgrades were different, the creep threat is different. There was a hatchery of location right in the top left. Uh, overall, it's just a very rough day for Raynor. Maru with a very cool build in that first game, and kudos to how long he kept Raynor in the dark, right? That Overlord got so close, yeah, yeah. denied. An early Ling, like, doesn't really see a whole lot. So Maru just came in with a plan. Raynor clearly had a plan for game two, and that plan got disrupted. No, it definitely did. Uh, and uh, now, I mean, we have to truly kind of talk about the elephant in the room a little bit. 0-2 Reyna in this group so far, Pig. That puts him in a bit of jeopardy here. He's got some fixtures that you would consider a little bit easier for him on the, to some of these parts, but not much. It's still an extremely tough group considering what we've seen so far in it. Yeah, I mean, uh, obviously going down 0-2 to Maru is especially rough because we often see people get through with a 2-3, to three, you know, score in Katowice. But it's like one of the groups that happens yeah. and they need to have a good map score where they're winning, you know, they're winning two zeros, they're losing one two. And other games to go well for them for other players. Yeah, it, ne it needs to kind of line up. Yes. And in a group like this, that's very difficult. But we've already had Maru lose to Cyan. You know, we've had a few different kind of upsets and things. So the score lines are already, it doesn't feel like there's uh, anyone that will be absolutely destroying the group. Actually, Dark probably will, let's be real. I feel like Dark's going to be way <laughs> ahead of everyone. So th there's chances for obviously him to come back. He technically only needs to win potentially two of the series in the rest of the thing, hopefully three. If he wins the rest of them, he's still got a very good shot of going out. But against the competition, Hero still lying in wait, Dark lying in wait, they're hard matches. It is tough. Yeah, you can talk about the possibility of advancing with two wins and three losses, and that has happened plenty of times in the past in Katowice. But what has also happened is winning three times and only losing two series and still being out. Like, that is actually a chance as yes. well. Yes. And I think that's the way scarier part. Obviously, Rainer at this point can pretty much forget about finishing first, and we didn't even talk about that today, but finishing first is a very big deal because you go straight into those quarterfinals. Well, if you finish second, 
second or third place, you still make playoffs, but you play round of 12, and you can obviously go up against somebody that's incredibly scary. So winning the group is going to be hard, but yeah, basically every single series is a must win. I do still think that Rainer is going to be the favorite, though, in every series that he plays. Like, I think he has learned yeah. a lot from that hero series in Masters Coliseum. Yeah. He's done very well against Dark lately, and even though Sion has played good, I think Rainer is the favorite there. They'll don't think that's a hot take. So I think Rainer will probably still make it, but this was a rough day. He was so incredibly excited. He was really looking forward to Katowice. He said it everywhere, you know, yep. every close. He was looking forward to this moment. He wanted to shine, and today was not his day, but you guys said it, man. Katowice just hits different. And even the most experienced players, you can kind of see them lose it, make a couple of uncharacteristic choices, miss clicks. Like the pressure does get even to the very best, to the big champs out there. Yeah, no, you make great points, especially considering, as you say, first place in each group effectively qualifies them for a qualifying match for the World Cup, which is yeah. massive in itself. Never mind w eventually potentially winning this prestigious tournament that is Katowice as a whole. Well, thank you very much, gentlemen. It is time for a short break here. When we return, we have our final series here on the mainstream. We have been holding on to Dark versus Showtime here yeah. as both of them are trying to challenge for the top spots in this group. Intel Extreme Masters Katowice is brought to you by Monster Energy, the United States Air Force, and Intel.
one more series and this man here is looking to do it pretty much justice as he's looking really poised to be able to make a splash here in group d welcome back to the desk we've got loco as well as rotterdam to talk about dark going up against showtime and somebody who i didn't really expect to make the splash that he has so far showtime here we now have a match which is the polar opposite of what we saw in the previous one as of course we had a situation where now ren is zero two one of these guys will go two zero in this group loco yeah no i don't think uh anybody really expected this right i think a lot of us yeah, I thought that Showtime had a good chance of maybe taking a series here and there and doing a, yeah, a good showing overall, or having a good showing overall, but to be potentially first in the group on day one of the event, that's crazy. This group is so I, good. I was going to say, was this picture behind you taken after he won his first series? <laughs> <laughs> he does look very happy. <laughs> he yeah. looks very happy. I think that was right after you bought him dinner, Kalara. Oh, <laughs> yes, of course. Thank you, thank you. First W of the weekend. <laughs> <laughs> but Roddy, your thoughts coming in? I think it's very fun, because not to throw out the Kolaris cliche here, but this really is two worlds colliding. Dark is weird and likes to just attack. And of course he's got great macro and he can play late game, but almost every high level PvZ you watch of Dark, you think earlier as well, Hero plans on attacking Dark, Dark's like, no, I'm actually attacking you and that's better for me right now, because I've got more units. Online as well, you watch Dark against the likes of Hero or Max Packs. He makes these attacks over and over again where you're like, this can't work, this seems silly. He makes it work, he's so incredibly good at it. Showtime is the polar opposite. We call him D Mauer, the wall for a reason. Dark is gonna most likely attack. Dark uh, Showtime is gonna defend, so it's the ultimate two worlds colliding of a very aggressive player, a very defensive player. Um, I, I don't know, maybe it's weird, or maybe I'm a hipster, but I'm kind of feeling Showtime, man. Yeah. I think he's got a very good read on PvZ, and I feel stylistically, unless Dark just pulls out that weird black magic again that he's so capable of in this matchup, I don't see any reason why Showtime can't just properly defend and get himself ahead. Yeah, I mean, I guess it depends on how early it hits, how much Showtime is really set up. What hits, ahead. how it hits. Yes, exactly. Yeah. No. No, I'm with you, though. Like, Showtime is one of those players who grinds a lot of games, right? And he'll try and just defend perfectly against whatever the opponent can throw at him. And even though what Dark throws at him can be very wild and very crazy, generally speaking, I think Showtime can defend it all. Mm -hmm. But what's such a beautiful mystery about StarCraft 2 is that you can have five of the finest and brightest Zerg minds in the world. And mm -hmm. they can look at the Dark build and they're like, no, this doesn't work, no, this, this doesn't work, doesn't yeah. work. <laughs> and then Dark will be that sixth bright mind and he's like, I'm going to do it and I'm going to win with it. And they all yeah, look at yeah. each other and it's like, how does he keep on getting away with it? And it's legitimately hard to explain, but clearly Dark is so good in these fine small moments yeah. of how to move Zerglings in and all in, where to position the queens what to absorb damage with and sometimes it looks crappy and messy but clearly he sees tiny potential yeah. killing windows that almost no other zerg sees because we're not saying here yeah. it shouldn't work it's the best players out there that say this cannot work and dark keeps on making it work yeah, what an enigma i mean honestly and what a pickup for talon <laughs> considering that he was effectively a free agent for them to then go and pick up considering uh, the performance that he can potentially have with what exactly what you're saying the guy makes things happen that shouldn't happen and on big stages well yeah, yeah. gentlemen thank you very much it is time now to head on over to the stage let's get our final series for the day underway thank you so much for our final match of the day we've got two players that are sure to entertain can you guess who they are? Uh, I'm not gonna keep you in the dark. Not so close to showtime. Please welcome to the stage, representing Talon Esports, Dark, and his opponent, representing Big, Showtime. <laughs> One final series today in the opening day of Intel Extreme Masters Kata Vita 2024. It's Dark versus Showtime. And we are very ready to get this one on the way. A ZVP that could promise to be a lot of foot damage. It could also prove to be a long one. I mean, uh, Showtime already showed that he can go the distance with some of the absolute best Zergs on the planet. And I mean, taking out Raynor in his opening match. We've got some mega upsets in this group already. I mean, Cyan taking out Marrow, Showtime beating Raynor. 
not to say it's a mega upset that one because as you just said to me uh before this even started showtime's been so close so many times to doing it and when it comes to the best of threes anything can happen yeah no absolutely and that's the brutality of katowice in a group like this everyone's playing their best it can happen and that was a close series against showtime your next matchup is against maru that's brutal showtime had some time to think about that last one chill out now he has to play against dark he took down hero earlier the problem is for showtime it's like he wants to play that big macro game right but dark will just not let him get there a lot of the time he's going to make it weird he's going to make it difficult he's going to do things off beat that you're not used to playing against and that's going to make it a real challenge for showtime this for me like when i've played before i've always felt like this is obviously Showtime being the wall, but Dark's just a raging bull, man. Like, if he doesn't like the way the game's going, he knows when to flip the kill switch, you know? He's just like, I'm going to throw everything at you. You just don't expect it. And, like, even that Reyna series against Maru just now, I felt that Reyna channeled his inner Dark, where, where yeah. the first wave failed miserably, and it's like, wave I'm going to keep two. on yeah, keep <laughs> on going. Like, Dark's the kind of guy that can do that. And sometimes you look at his StarCraft, you're like, mate, this is silly StarCraft. But then he just makes magic happen, truly is a magician. Yeah, he really, really is, as we get ourselves ready to go on hard lead for our opening map of this series. Again, the last of today, plenty more games to come, as we are going to be starting off in the upper left-hand corner from Talent Esports, we have Dark. And Spawner in the bottom right, as our Blue Protoss, representing Berlin International Gaming, it is Showtime. <laughs> Getting late over here, we've been going all day, but we still have the crowd out cheering away. And uh, some guys ready to give us some good games of StarCraft 2, man. It's exciting. I mean, Dark, he's, he's he's a guy that I absolutely love, you know? There's that whole meme of me being like, oh, I like this new <laughs> kind of thing. But no, Dark's really just been a true thorn in the side for a lot of top players, just because he can make anybody look silly. Not in the way that Rogue used to do it, where it's just like, you know, clean, sharp, like I kill you in four minutes StarCraft, like it was, Quite boring, to be fair, a lot of the times when he won. But Dark, he can actually make the impossible happen very often. And I really love that about him. And just that series against Hero earlier, where he's like, you know what? Let's just get some queens and overlords. Like, it's not going to be pretty, but it is going to be in your face. And that's just the way that Dark likes to fly. Yeah, we, we were talking about it as well, right? You played against Hero. It's like, you see Dark play online a lot, and a lot of people, they play online a bit differently. And Dark, especially, you look at his playing like, well, this is online play. It's a bit chaotic. It's not as well thought out. It's a bit of this and that and a mishmatch. And he comes to Katowice and he plays the exact same sort of thing, right? Because that's his specialty. And while it may not all be optimal, it's very good at putting your opponent in a weird place. And then your attacks can hit a bit harder. They can hit a bit better. And your opponent doesn't always have that practice and experience of, oh, yeah, well, if you hit me at this time, I can do this and get away with it because no one else really plays like this guy. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And I feel the fact that he goes in with what he's going to do, automatically he's playing his game. Doesn't let his opponent really do what they're comfortable with. What is Showtime comfortable with? He's comfortable with sitting back and defending and doing all that and really surviving. Dark, he's the kind of guy that he knows how these players play. And you said it, he plays like he does online, where it's like such a freestyle, all over the place kind of way. It's almost like he's turning into a bit of a hero when it comes to Zerg, but it doesn't stop there. He can play a whole variety of styles, which that's what makes Dark truly terrifying. And Showtime, he opened up a lot of Stalker type builds against Rainer, I believe. I just spoke to Rainer briefly talking about uh, how Showtime hasn't played Stalkers in years. I really thought it was going to be Stargate. And then he did it. So nice to see. Oh, I'm, I'm looking forward to see what Showtime brings in this series because Dark's just, he's a different Zerg altogether than Rainer. Both are brilliant, but in very different ways. Kind of feels like you need the Stargate against Dark, right? Because you just need to be safe. The Oracle provides so much safety and scouting. Try and figure out what's going on. And of course, you know, there's, there's different ways to then follow up from that. So we'll see exactly what the plan becomes here for Showtime. The Stargate and Triple Oracle is very standard from him. That's something he likes to do a lot as the first couple of links get adventurous, but the Adept is here to turn them back away and say not today. Absolutely. So far, everything the bread and butter of this matchup is just going to be a little bit of Dark trying to find out what exactly he's up against. I know, like, Stargate play tends to be the most uh, most used strategy, most used build. But so far, Showtime's done a good job of denying that. But remember, Protosses do still have some other tricks up their sleeves that Zergs need to make sure they're not quite up against. Yep. No, absolutely. As uh, Link Speed finishes up and 
I'm just, uh, you kind of, you know, said it, right? I'm excited to see what Dark's approach is going to be. You can sort of see where Showtime's taking it, fairly standard for the moment, but what's Dark's approach going to be to try and knock Showtime off of his kind of comfort zone? Oracles obviously will be very defensive initially. You can obviously then use these Oracles with the Adepts maybe for a little bit of a poke. Initially might use that to just expand with as well. Looks like we'll get that third in the next few moments. But yeah, one of the great things that Showtime often does with Oracle Adept is to kind of push out really clear creep with the Adepts as well, using the Revelation as detection. He was one of the first to do it. I remember when it became like uh, something we tested in like a balance tournament. And Showtime was instantly like Oracle Adept, like clearing up creep. And he's continued to use that ever since. As you do see the couple of uh, drones going down. Oracle getting pushed away to the corner. Now, of course, he's just keeping on building those oracles for now, but a couple early drones always adds up. It certainly does. I mean, those oracles, especially getting it behind the bases, always a damn nuisance. Dark hasn't taken tremendous damage yet, but he's also been kind of skimping on those spore crawlers a little bit. You see the second oracle here realizes, hey, there's a couple of queens here, but I can continually get damage done. Now, there is a spore at this sack natural, so can't dive in there. Both these guys just very badly wounded here. Oh, my goodness. Oh. He calls the one, gets the other to the corner, low HP. I mean, it worked out for the moment. One more Oracle showing up towards this base. Triple Queen here, that's a no-go. And this one at least will save most, most of its HP, only really lose now on the shields. Showtime sets his follow-up into action. Twilight Council and the Forge. Doc's been pretty greedy, man. Overlord speed, lair, all these things. Only just now building Lings as the Adepts come over. I feel like if they were there 20 seconds sooner, that could have been scary. Now, now well, it's just going to be that creep clearing force. I tell you what, Showtime's position that he's getting himself into here, very nice. And the fact that he's forcing out so many units, I mean, does Zerg really need this amount of links? I mean... Well, he's going to kill him. Yeah, I think... I'll try oi, to. Oi, oi, oi. I mean, that's a... I didn't expect the Shaden to exactly go off there, but the Queens were a little bit late to the party, but they are going to clean up this Adept squad. And you might be thinking, hey, was that really good for Dark? And I mean... It's definitely nice for him. I saw Overlord drop being done here. He's already got the speed, yeah. and this Tough is one of those moments, Wardy, where it's like, <laughs> Dark, he's kind of had enough of what Showtime's been doing in this game. Titus to follow it up as well. Showtime, he already knows what's going on. Cannons, a battery, extra gates. He's obviously a long way off, plus one and Blink, but if he can just somewhat stabilize, and of course, in this situation with just Blink Queen, it's so much about that Sim City. So I'd say there's a real hope, especially with enough cannons and a couple batteries. I'd say there's really a chance right now. Uh, there's a massive chance, an absolute massive one, depending on where he really wants to go. I mean, seven queens, they can pack a true punch here. I, I like, He's for the Nidus. I like what Showtime's been doing, but this is exactly what he pulled out against Hero when he, you know, he was poking him too much. Showtime supply is very good, but he's supply block for the moment, and he's been non-stop pro with 63. That might have been a bit too greedy from the German over here. You're so reliant on that stack defense, but Dark is going to work around it by Nidison into the main base to get the links here, and the Queens obviously just drop in, so what a fascinating position. The only thing I'd say is this position is very choked up, so it's going to be hard for those links to find a lot. Let's see what we can do. Queen's venturing a bit off creep. Needs to be careful, make sure those transfusions are still available as Stalkers fight from the low ground. So the battery in the main base is available, and we can overcharge as well, should there be energy, which I'd be surprised if there wasn't. So far, I think this is still looking pretty good for Showtime, though, as Tark is going to bring the spine crawlers through. I mean, that's really cool, but Showtime's handling this absolutely beautifully. The amount of static that he got up into this main base, <laughs> even the stasis here on the natural dog. All the links. That's yeah. every link. I think He's going to be sent home packing and he's, not blink. he's still probing up while this is going on as well. He's holding phenomenally 66 probes to 38 drones. This is not what Dark was expecting to happen here. And with Blink done this game, I wouldn't say it's near unlosable for Showtime. He's in such a good spot now. His stalkers will never die. The spine crawlers cancel as Dark realizes, uh oh, I'm in some trouble. He starts up drones back at home, but that ain't really going to fly as Dark tries the big old retreat. Showtime will go and get everything he can. Nidus goes down. He's obviously got some creep to clean out, but one revelation will get all of that. And Showtime leaves up 40 supply, and nothing really stopping him from going on the map with those stalkers. 70 probes, Wardy. He is yeah. rich. Like, absolutely rich. And look at this. Look at Dark's position here. You look at this and you're like, hey, this <laughs> the Protoss probably did some aggression, right? He got really far ahead. No, 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 no. He did a little bit of poking here and there, but Dark, he is in a world of trouble here. Losing the Oracle, it's like the first bad thing that's happened for Showtime this game. A 40 supply lead. Like Showtime, this is not a moment for him to sit back and just kind of bunker on up. He needs to go, 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 I feel. And really, like, he needs to know that his opponent's so damn hurt after that. At least take an instant fourth base, right? Like, if you're not going to go, at least you're going to go in economy. 
which he is going to do. Temple Archive's coming up. I think the one thing that holds him back from sending it is there's no prism, there's no reinforcements, and you know Dark's going to instantly be back across the map as well, so maybe that's a frustration you're already preemptively thinking of. So reasons for him to maybe not send it, but with the fourth base coming up, at least he's guaranteeing some advantage off of all of this. I, I even like this defense. Oh, and another stasis that's here. Crazy. I mean... Now he can go. Now he can go. Now he absolutely can. He's got plus two, closing in on finishing up, getting the robo up and running as well. Storm on the way as well. And, oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah, so much. It's actually crazy. You know, usually when a Pros holds off these attacks, they're like wounded, they're bleeding, they're like just about trudging along. And, and this time, Showtime, he's like walking on water, man. Like he's just not being stopped. And we have a quick look at the worker kill count, because I'm not sure if he even lost a probe. He didn't, oh, he lost one probe. That might have been even like a scouting one as well. That just shows how good he is feeling. And Hydra's are the unit of choice. They can obviously deal good damage and stuff, but that is just so much Protoss, man. I mean, this, Doc's doing a good job of staying in this to some degree, but I don't know how he holds. Great concave by him though. And honestly, Showtime, it's getting a little bit tricky for him to break through, but Dark, he's so wounded, man. He's on three bases, going up to Hive to try and get a Lurker then out. Yeah, Lurkers are going to be here, but there's just going to be such a lack of them. We're already seeing the Storm, we're seeing the Robo coming online. The other tech is coming through from Showtime. He's not full sending it while, you know, not succeeding and not having tech. He's just sort of poking. It looks very aggressive because he's just that far ahead, but he has all the right follow-ups. Immortals already coming in. There's nothing he needs Immortals for right now apart from the Lurker transition. So he is really cementing his lead. And yes, it might not be a quick finish, but he's just, I think this is the safest way to guarantee because what if Dark hadn't tried to tech up, spammed a bunch of units and then jumped on Showtime being overly aggressive? Showtime's been incredibly safe, but not in a way that's like put him behind and allowed us. He's been in his face. He denied the fourth base, right? And the fact that he's been so good about these upgrades as well, plus three being pumped out here, getting more cannons as well, just really, really hunkering on down, solidifying his position and Soon, Dark's gonna have to do something to try and get himself out of this absolute hellhole. Showtime's so ready for like the lurker based all in timing, right? Cannons coming up once again. Of course, Dark, it's not worth droning yet because you've got no fourth base to send those drones to. And by the time you have a fourth, you've probably got drones left over from your main and natural that are mining out. Uh, Showtime, of course, has Storm as well, amazing against all these Hydras. The lurkers are the only slightly scary thing on the map, but when there's only six of them and your army looks like this at Showtime, I find it difficult to believe he's going to be that afraid, and he is continuing to push in despite seeing the first Lurker shots, drops the first Revelation down. Dark has split off down the ramp as well, so he's all over the place here. Showtime will back it up just a second, and there is an attempt of Anitis in the back of the natural, but that's denied. Ah, uh, yeah, nice Stalker in position, of, and as well with the cannons that he made from earlier. I'm really impressed by Dark still holding on here. Like, if this was any other Zerg, I'd be like, yeah, they're, they're, they're kind of dead, right? But Dark's the kind of guy, he's been in these kind of situations so many times that there's a little bit of me that keeps having faith. And he's doing a really good job of spreading out his army just to stop the AOE damage. But it's real tough to break this Protoss army, man. Yeah, Shotan just kites away from the Lurkers as well, lets the Storm go down on the Ling Hydra that tries to chase. And again, just maintain an advantage on this map. You can see the rotation to this front base and to the side base and just trying to force Dark out of position. You can do so much with this setup, and he's just going to drop the Fleet Beacon down another Stargate because he's maintaining the lead and continuing to increase that lead as he goes. Absolutely. Even getting some cheeky storms off here on the Lurkers, just softening up a little bit. And Showtime, he's playing very restricting here. Big storms do land. His army's very difficult to really take out. He's on plus three weapons, remember. All these units dealing as much damage as possible. Decent storms. I mean, even the drones getting pulled. That's a desperate Zerg if I've ever seen one. So he knows, he knows that he's wounded and hurt. Showtime did try and target fire down the hatchery there, which was just saved. That's one of those moments where it's like, oh, that's dangerous. But if he knocks it down, it's brilliant. In the end, he kind of nearly knocked it down, but still traded okay against the army. So not too bad. And again, with extra stargates, you start producing carriers here. Dark is so far away from any sort of response. Maybe even just Tempest. They build a bit faster and against the lurkers, they will force damage immediately. You really have a choice of what you want to do. Dark is a mile away from Aspire, so yeah, we'll see what Showtime builds into. For now, a couple more mortals, and uh, a few more High Templars still focusing on the ground, but has the option of the later game air tech if wanted. What is the resources lost have at right now? Because I, I really feel that Dark has been trading very decently to say how bad yeah. a situation he's been in, and everywhere that Showtime's running into, there's lurkers. I'm I gotta commend Dark again just for how well he's making a game out of this because he was 70 supply against 110 at one point in this game and oh nine immortals though that is so much ground firepower that he has to worry about
it is scary because if Showtime does mess up one fight super badly, Dark's at the position where he might be able to get back into it, right? Like, you can even lose a fight here at Showtime and still be okay. But there's also that fight where you lose everything and Dark gets across the map with Lurkers before you have a rebuild and you just can never clean up the Lurk account. So you need to be making sure that never happens. Obviously, again, transitioning into air units, all the stack defense will help him with that. Showtime clearly is just happy to say, yeah, if I need to play this out late, I will play this out late. I'm not afraid of you making that comeback because I'm confident I will make the right choices. Yeah, and Dark's being very careful about like his pullbacks. Like you saw Showtime, he was ready to pounce on that army. Dark being very good about knowing that was just like, all right, get back, get back. Let's, uh, let's hunker down on these four bases, get ourselves set up, but I don't think he has any clue about this. Unless this cheeky overlord did get a decent scout on those Stargates. No, nothing yet so far. Yeah, uh, and even if he scouts it, does he have the money, like, free to really drop a Spire down? He's had to spend everything he had to, like, max out right now. And he's even then, he's only just, like, introducing a Viper or so. Like, his tech is really limited. It's been Lurkers or Bust for him up until this point. So those carriers coming through are going to be tough. Hatchery dies. Dark A in the position to be giving up 300 minerals. How many cannons are on the map right now? I've just been looking at that production tab. It's just been cannon after cannon after cannon. And you see Dark. This is not normal map vision for a Zerg right now. Yeah. He looks like he's playing like a Terran, you know, without sensor Super towers. Super Turley, yeah. Yeah, I mean, like, Creep has not been able to go out in any direction whatsoever. And he's still playing calm. I'm looking at his face right now on the camera. Like, he doesn't look like he's truly phased at all. And he is a warrior, a true warrior. And he will do everything he can because he's in a decent position in the group already, getting to beat out Hero, a really good Protoss. But right now, Showtime's bringing the heat. No, he absolutely is, and uh, you can see Dog just working with anything he can. If he can find an avenue to start getting some creep out on, then brilliant. But you're right, he is so blind. He doesn't see anything, and if Showtime is about to show up with six, lurker, uh, six carriers, and it's mostly lurkers, and how many hydras are even on the map, right? Like, can't be that many because he's made so many lurkers at this stage. This is going to be rough. Eight extra gates to the rebuild instantly coming in from Showtime, potentially two. And they have 27 cannons. You can answer to your question familiar then. <laughs> I mean, that is so many cannons. I mean, even if Dark wanted to do a counterattack, he's got a lot of infrastructure to go against. And Hydras, one he, queen. <laughs> yeah, he's soon got no units that shoot up left on the map. Five Hydras against this amount of carriers. This is the saddest Lurker army, but there's Lurkers for absolute days. I mean, a big Spore Crawler field is coming on over. I mean, Dark, the fact that he's playing this out, ah, he's a, he's a true fighter, man. He's more of an optimist than I am. You can see how desperate he was. He's like, I had to build 23 lurkers to survive. And obviously that's really bad against the carriers now, but like that's just how much he felt as though he needed those units because of how much pressure Showtime was able to apply up until this point. That Oracle, I think, gets donated to the Spore Crawlers, drops a revelation, doesn't do much else. And Oracles are important at this stage because they're your guaranteed vision. And Oracle, once it's revelated, you've got guaranteed vision of those lurkers throughout that revelation. It's not like an observer, which if it gets sniped down, you're in the midst of all these lurkers, suddenly you're in trouble. So it is nice to have those Oracles available, especially for moments like that. It's still a lot of lurkers. Still a lot of lurkers. Remember, like, Dark, he's been on a pretty low drone count the whole time, so his army is big. And this carry count, it isn't at that, like, 8, 9 number where it's really scary with super duper sick upgrades. Soon it will be, but this, if there's a chance for Dark, this is kind of it, but I don't think this is it, Wardy. Look, even the ground army of Showtime just able to punch on forward. He's got so many gateways as well, and nice little fist bump from the wall over there. Nice play out of Showtime. Showtime's just very aware, like I say, all the way throughout this, exactly knew what he needed to do. He was very aware. There wasn't a moment where I was like concerned that he was doing the wrong thing, even though he didn't end the game off that lead, right? Just very calm and collected. The transition was spot on. I think the only thing I would criticize is maybe he could have started air upgrades a little sooner because he wanted to go into it. Hidden plus two is typically such a big timing for air units and he didn't even have it at the end here. So he just could have started that a bit sooner. All began with this hold, of course, which was just monstrous. Losing like one worker, I mean, just what a setup. This hole was so sick. Like the amount of infrastructure he has in the back of his main base over here, it was like three, four shield batteries, a cannon over there. Look, you see all the beams from the shield batteries absolutely everywhere. I mean, this was a scary push, but he made it look pretty damn easy. And to make things look easy that are as difficult as that, that's a talent in itself. And Dark really did a great job of selecting the right unit composition to make sure that he would give himself a chance because not, nothing else really gets you to this point other than getting those lurkers out, and he just about got there. And yeah, he was kind of screwed when Showtime got to this point. 
But the whole idea from Doc was, hey, I'm going to make you make every right decision, because if you step off the beat once for one moment, I will jump on you. I will punish you. It didn't arise because Showtime played out properly, but it's credited to Doc, because he was playing to his pretty much only out right until the bitter end. Yeah, I, I, it's one of those games where I'm like, Dark, you're dead, right? You're going to die on this push or this push or this push. And he was holding. He was doing good splits against, against all of it as well. Just played nice. But this man on camera right now, people really bring it when they turn up to Katowice, right? Like, the, 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 the little kinks in your armor, they really start to show. But so far, sh what Showtime has showcased, it's, it's nothing short of amazing. Like, these are some of the absolute best Zergs on the planet. And he's absolutely duking out with them. And so far, three and one, when it goes up against like Rainer and Dart, that's amazing. Very, very true. And even if he ended up losing this series, having the map win is such a big deal. You know, we talk about this all the time in Katowice because these groups are close, they're tense. It's been a map difference before. It was a map difference last year when Oliveira made it out of his group over Clem, right? That was all it came down to, one map. You know, that's, that's how crazy these groups get. So even getting this first map is a big win. Is obviously looking to fight back. In the top left hand side of Oceanborn will be our Red Zerg player, Dark. And standing over in the bottom right, as that blue Protoss really living up to his name, it is Showtime. Ah, uh, really cool what we're seeing out of Showtime. I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed his play for a long time, you know? He's, he's the Protoss that, even if you're a player from a different race, it's hard to hate him, you know? He's never been one for these tricks, these gimmicks so much. He's always been about... He, or he's always felt to me like the European stats in a way. Yeah. Like it's always that kind of play that you get out of him, and that's why he holds a lot of respect. But it really feels like he's starting to level up again, which is kind of incredible to say. His, his PVZ lately has really been good. Like, throughout the last few months, it's been impressive. He had some crazy series against some of the top guys in Europe repeatedly. And he's shown it here today against Reynor already. He's now a map up against Dark. Love that probe. Over to the corner, scouts the base. It's just so nice just to guarantee it's going down there and at all, because Dark is someone that will proxy hatch you. So to get that confirmation immediately, really nice for Showtime. Yeah, absolutely. Dark is the kind of guy that can really throw the kitchen sink at you. Like, and we saw that in the previous game. Worked against Hero to absolute perfection. This game, though, Showtime just showcased how to deal with that. So far, though, everything pretty normal between these two here on Oceanborn. And I don't know who picked which map, but... Yeah, I'm not sure. I, I think Dark maybe picked map one. Uh, I mean, already, already, Dark is 1-0 in the group. I mean, both these players 1-0 in the group, actually, so both feeling pretty good, and they're both taking out very strong players in their opening matches as well. I mean, this group, honestly, it's been turned on its head a little bit. Like, Reyna going 0-2, that isn't something I really expected. I mean, he had Showtime and Maru, which is really hard, but Maru being 1-1, and then his loss was to Cyan? Yeah, right. Usually you feel like one runs like, well, you know what? A couple of the like less likely to advance players to come. No, not for Maru. Maru's still got to go through Dark and Hero and Showtime. He's obviously playing well. That is not an easy lineup at all. So that is the, uh, the, the kind of crazy part about it, especially that's what the upsets cause, right? So this group is going to be mayhem. This is a group which I feel like when it comes to uh, Saturday, when you're playing the final day uh, game of the groups, I'm like, I feel like everyone's almost still going to be in the running and like every map on every series is likely going to be important. Yeah, like in my head, I was I was all about like, all right, I think Reyna's playing good recently and he's talked he's talk the big talk, you know, and I think Maru's always a solid contender, dark, very consistently good. And then I was like, hero, depending on which hero shows up, it could be a, you know, a, a flash in the pan or like an absolute star. But yeah, Showtime, he, he showed Case that there's, there's another big boy in the group to talk about. No, absolutely. What a way to show up. I mean, remember when this group got released and Doc just tweeted out like question, question marks. marks <laughs> and then Showtime just replied to him being like, question mark, and like more of them. I was like, yeah, that's kind of how I thought you guys would feel about it, but both living up to it so far. Few links about to have their link speed and they'll get some map control for Doc. I love the question mark tweets out of the Koreans, by the way. Like <laughs> yeah. the last time I really remember seeing that and laughing so hard was like MMA went to MOG Arena or like winter or something, lost to Goody 2-0 out of the <laughs> tournament. It's just like question marks. <laughs> and I was like, yeah. I remember freaking, that so much. Freaking Goody does that to the best of us, mate. But uh, yeah, so far, similar build here by Showtime. We'll go for Oracles and hey, why not? I mean, they worked out to pretty good 
like degree in game one. Like they did a little bit of drone damage, but some of those stasises really bought Showtime a lot of time. Like not just in that natural where it got it on the ramp, but even when he's taken the fourth base and it's like, yeah, now, now I'm pretty safe, right, for a long time. This is a lot of links to turn up at this moment, but oh, again, a little bit stuck here. Already a decent hold by Showtime. Even has the target fighter guarantee as many links as possible. Other oracles across the map, nothing on the natural location. Will be turned away. There's one drone coming down here. Do we want to grab it? It's going to be a sport roll anyway. Mm. Like this game, though, Dark, like his uh, work account, definitely looking healthier than it did in the previous one. Uh, when I was looking at it, I know Protoss tends to get a little bit of a lead, especially when this attack comes out, just because you have to make units to deal with it, right? But that previous game, he was he was wounded right from the get-go. Showtime's being more aggressive with the Adept suit of this game, though, mm. right? So he, he took a little while to come across the map with the Adept last time. This time he's going to be here much sooner. We'll see what he wants to do. Two queens. I don't know if I love that. And near the sport crawl, so the oracles can't really help the adepts. Obviously, they're going to help themselves by just being choked up. It's a few drones. Five. I mean, it's five minutes in the game, so it's still early enough that I think I love that for Showtime. Uh, and keeping all the oracles alive. Yeah. I mean, Dark's doing the right thing here because he knows there's not another wave, a ground wave to deal with. Yeah. So it was like 11 drones, catch back up, getting the lair on the go, getting the plus one melee on the go. I mean, they're both playing very well. They're both absolute top tier players at their respective races. Yeah, bringing it uh, all here in the very important Gadavito event. Couple more drones, Oracles will go sit in the corner. As yeah, that melee upgrade are really uh, gonna show us what Dark plans for the next little while in this game. Showtime just continues into his Bliss One, into his Blink. So again, really sticking with those Stalker styles, following these Oracles. And then says, no, I'm actually going to go charge, baby. Let's do it. Really good, though, of course, against the melee upgrades. Charge is generally much better there. Ah, absolutely. I'm going to see a little bit of first-hand action here from Showtime, getting the macro going, seeing what he can do with these oracles. And Protoss is so good at this, man, this gliding and shooting. And yeah. this drone count killing from So him. difficult to do. Yeah, it's actually a lot harder than it looks, like the, the gliding effect. Um, but I, I, the drone count killing that he's getting away with here, this sh doesn't often happen. Like when you see the Serals defend and the Reynos in this matchup, like this is already a good amount of damage and Showtime's just feeling it today. Yeah, he is, checks in, finds the Queen there, just wants to drop the Revelation down, try and find some information. Just very interested as to where he's going to go with this charge, like how aggressive is he going to be? We see a lot of gateways being added on. That's quite natural now because you're hitting three base saturation. How much of a push does he want to make? Obviously, he's not warping in any extra Stalkers. Put a lot of money into gates. He could start warping a lot of zealots all of a sudden and then really hit dark before he's prepped with any sort of banes or anything. Like, Ling Hydra is not going to do well against a lot of charge lots. So, yeah, it's a lot of Hydras, though. It's a lot of Hydras. And the drone count isn't insane at this point. Like, dark is definitely one of these guys that pumps out the units before the other Zergs. Yeah. And then drones up afterwards, if he wants to, unless he's really smelling blood. And Showtime's doing a good job of just trying to find out what exactly is going on. Got to see when the fourth base was going up, and he can kind of expect this opening, I suppose, to some degree, right? Or rather this follow-up from Dark, but uh -huh. still, it's Dark. Okay, might have got a little glimpse here on the Hydras popping out and when they did. Yeah, I think the main thing for Showtime, right, is just he doesn't have to do loads with this. He's taking that fourth base and everything. He just wanted to skip through the Stalker stage, right? He says, there's no reason for me to get the Blink Stalkers up, so let's go to charge a Mordal Archon. Skip out on the Stalkers, which are very gas-expensive units, and that need to be super active on the map. Right now, if you imagine Stalkers trying to be here, fighting these Links with plus one melee, a lot of creep, feels very unlikely they'd get much done, so... I don't hate what he's doing, that stays forward. Just gonna catch a couple links. Good pullback from Dark to only get one activated here. Prism gonna have to do some evacuating, I think, as you see the Oracle's in some trouble in Showtime. Maybe get a little too adventurous, has the high ground to escape with. Gets one final Overseer, but that was a lot of losses from Showtime on that fight. I don't think he expected quite that number of yeah. Zerg right there. Like, you felt that maybe if the first stasis is amazing, but Dark was very good, as you said. Kind of baited it a little bit with just a few links, and he survives. He weathers the storm for now, and. Drone count still not up to like a really healthy number like 80. He's actually thrown down a Roach Warren now, which is very interesting to go into Roaches after seeing what he's seeing. But I ah, will see what Dark's able to do with this because his army's starting to get a little bit scarier now, here, Wardy. Showtime really needs to buy 45 seconds of Storm, right? Mm. You get Storm, it's so good against the Link Hydra. But you need to get there. Oh. And right now, these High Templars on the run, they are going to be saved, I think. One goes down, but only one. Well, just got to be careful because every Storm will help. Absolutely, this is quite a squishy army. I mean, it's not got Banelings in the mix or anything like that. It's just raw, <laughs> non-suicidal units. And the Roaches are definitely going to add some health to it and longevity. But still, that work count, not too high. Like, Dark, 
I don't think he's looking to make this a super long game. And if he is to make it a long game, he's looking to mortally wound his opponent getting there. Yeah, Showtime really needs to lean up on his uh, static defense. Remember, he also lost some of the Oracles. He has less Stasis Wards to help cover all these entrances. Has to drop two Storms already. Remember, he doesn't have a lot of High Temple with energy. Some of them were more recently warped in, so that might take a little while. And these kind of fights are weird because he's not really near any static defense either, right? So. Kind of a weird position and Darth make on sort of control the natural. I love that the High Temple find the storm towards the Hydras at least, because that's where you really want it to be. But Showtime's gonna need a little bit more down. Half the army supply. Let's see what he can get. That storm's really not doing it for me, Ben. As it looks as though this army of talk is gonna be terrifying to deal with. It really is. I, I love the fact that you kind of brought some roaches to the front, used them like marauders. That's a lot of depowering done on that pylon as well over there. The Robo can't even make immortals anymore, and I think that's his only Robo. Showtime feeling now is the time to really try and shut this down, and honestly, he's got some big power units here, but that is so much Zerg in his natural right now. Just, just no stack defense on this natural location. He had a Stasis Ward like up in the center of the map. I feel like he needed the Stasis Ward here. He needed to stop this ramp being broken, and he just did not manage to do that at all. So now Dark is going to swarm him through the reinforcing roaches and just hitting this timing off the 70 work because it's going to work beautifully. And Showtime just wasn't able to get well enough set up for it. We are going to a game three here between Showtime and Dark. This was such a dark game, by the way. Yeah. Like, a hook. if you told me, like, or it was a barcode name, I'm like, which Zerg is this? I'm dark. Any any day of the week, just low drone count, kind of does some weird kind of tech switch there into the Roaches, but it was the perfect tech switch. Very good handling of the Storms as well. Like, really good splits. I love the little Roaches going forward as well, and he caught Showtime totally out of his position for that. Yeah, when Showtime first pushed, you're right. He definitely, this moment here, he did not expect this much to be here. And, and he's up against the wall, and I almost feel like he probably could have started evacuating maybe a little sooner, but it's like, when do you cut your losses? And here, you lose power to the Robo. There's no stack defense to help you here at all. I feel like he's got so much stack defense on the fourth. He's got a bunch on the third. He just had nothing to stop Dark End in this position. That's the one place he didn't expect Dark to take the fight, to dive into the heart of his, well, entire setup. And that's exactly where Dark found it. He got, he got the weakness. Absolutely. And I mean, it was like a giga roll in from Dark, right? Like, no tier two upgrades on the way. It was all about pumping out as many units as possible, but that's exactly what he was looking for, and it's exactly what he achieved. And that's what makes Dark scary. Like, we, you can't help but mention it. Like, this guy just knows how to kill people with absolutely anything. Like, oh, he, he's a menace, an absolute menace. And now we're getting on to map three here between these two lads. Yeah, I think Dark's going to take a quick moment or two for a break, so it'll be a moment before we do jump in, but... We have ourselves a very exciting game three coming up because you've seen the potential of both. If Showtime can get up into his game and control, he makes a lot of good decisions. But Dark can stop him getting there. He can make it crazy. And he tried to in the first game. That time Showtime found the defense. I think that's going to be what game three comes down to as well. There's no way Dark doesn't at some point say, survive this and then we can play on, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it's just the, <laughs> the amount of like things in his arsenal that you have to worry about if you're sat in Showtime shoes and it's just like, mate, that, that, I don't normally die to that kind of stuff, but I don't normally get to play against that kind of stuff either. It's just a bit a bit unusual, but that's just, that absolutely is Dark's bread and butter. And I I always love watching Dark play, man. He's, he's an absolute, an absolute baboon when it really comes down to it, but beautiful. And we will get to a short break just while we give Dark the time that he needs. The players are very used to facing off against each other in 1v1 in StarCraft, but let's test their general knowledge against one another. But don't land on the X, because that's minus one point. Uh, 안녕하세요, Talon Esports 소속 강영우입니다. 네, 안녕하세요, DKG 소속 Protoss 유저 김준호입니다. ID 는 히어로고요. 돌림판을 한번 돌려보겠습니다. 예방가? <웃음> 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 꽝 돌려보도록 하겠습니다. X 나와라. 나이스. 이러면 안 돼. 어, 영어 하면 돼. 세 번이니까. 세 번씩이에요? 응. 그러면 저 이제 두번 남았으니까. 꼼수는 안 돼. 꼼수 안 돼요. 힘 힘주고 돌려. 와 질이 나왔어. 이거 뭐였더라? 진짜. 이거 게임 그건가? 소식이. 찍어야지 뭐. 잠깐만. 약간 생각을 해봐. 소식이. 풀 뜯어 먹을 것 같은데. 있지 않을까요? 공룡도 있는데 육식 초식 네. 있을 것 같아요. 에? 들어가? 아니, 뭐... 아 원래 커 초식 동물들이. 코끼리도 맞아. 초식 동물이잖아. 
똑같은 거네. 아 너무 쉽다. 와 캐리건입니다. 너무 쉬운데? 너무 왜, 너무 어. 차별 아니에요? 이거 <웃음> 아이. <웃음> 나이스! 맞아? <웃음> 이, 이렇게 됐으면 나와가지고 내가 이겨야겠다. <웃음> 이기자! 오, 이길만해. 아, 아, 이거는 좀 약간 심오한 거네. <웃음> 심오하다고요? <웃음> 왜요? 왜 심오하지? 철학적인 거 아니야? 에? 있을 수도 있고 없을 수도 있잖아, 이거. 그게 아, 아니잖아요. 설정상으로. 아, 설정상으로. 아, 설정상으로? 있나? 설정상으로는 있는 거. 그럼 철학적으로 얘기해 주세요, 그러면. 어? 철학적으로 얘기해 주세요. 아, 안 돼. 그, 그럼 그 정도 말빨 안 돼. <웃음> 어, 어, 질문이 그, 프로토스는 이미 있냐고요? 네, 있습니다. 있다고요? 어? 이게 그 대가리, 아니, 대가리가 아니라 <웃음> 머리에 달려있는 그게 있잖아요. 어? 아. 캠페인 안 해보셨어요? 나안 no, 했어. 이겨도 이긴 것 같지 않은 승리긴 했지만 어쨌든 이겨서 기쁘고 명우랑 이렇게 재밌는 게임도 하고 해가지고 재밌었던 시간인 것 같습니다. 여러분들 이제 곧 인게임이 이어질 텐데 많은 응원 부탁드리겠습니다. 감사합니다. To see so many minus ones across the board on the on, on the trivia quizzes, it's genuinely impressive how low those scores have been throughout today. I love I love the fact that like you ask a pro ross like, hey man, do pro ross have mouths? And he's like, oh, this is deep. deep. <laughs> <laughs> Dog just laughs at him. This isn't deep, bro. Do they have a mouth or not? And he's like, Yeah, they have mouths. He's like, No, no, they don't. Like, Dark teaching and Protoss, Protoss things. That's just fantastic. I'm so glad the Koreans got asked this, though, because be, this has been like a hotly debated topic, like, not debated necessarily, but it's been talked about a meme so much recently, right? Between like our streams and stuff. <laughs> so, good to know Heroes just out of touch completely as we get ready for game number three here. Dark and Showtime looking to have the perfect start to day one of their Katowice runs. In the top left, the dangerous Zerg. Not so good at trivia, but in StarCraft, he's deadly. It's dark. And spawning over in the bottom right hand side as our Blue Protoss for Team Big, it is showtime. Actually, of the two there, I mean, Dark, Dark actually answered all of them right. Yeah, Dark yeah. was way better than Hero. He was like, yeah, I think at least one was a herbivore. And it's like, the old, even said the Ultralist before the answer popped up. And yeah. I was like, hey, that's pretty impressive. I didn't know that. And then, <laughs> and then he's getting, Herbivore's Hero's, a pig. And he's like, oh, you got that easy one. That was a freaking easy one, but. Oh, uh, do they have mouths? That's deep, man. It's philosophical. <laughs> <laughs> it's a philosophical question. <laughs> yeah. He thought way too deep into that. And it's like, okay, explain it, man. He's like, no, no, no. My brain's too small for this. Oh, that was fantastic. Great content. All right, all right. Third game between these two lads, though. Final game of the evening. The day is getting late over here. And these players, I think they've been here for a long time now. Both 1-0 in the group thus far. Taking maps, though, in every series. That's awesome and dark. He's up to some cheeky stuff over here, Wardy. Yep, no, he absolutely is. Drone comes across, wants to block this hatch, but Showtime gets the probe down there. So it's just going to say, nah, -uh. and as we get the Nexus in. I mean, in the end, Dark already had one hatch star, start up his gas and pool. So yeah, I mean, I mean, this is nice for Showtime because the drone across the map early is money spent. I think that's already a terrible start oh. for Dark. Like, I, I mean, like the fact that he did not get the hatch down, but also the probe came and hit the drone first. Yeah. Meant that the drone couldn't win the fight. If the drone hits equal time with the probe, the drone wins in that moment. And then it, like it's a little dance and stuff. But so far, this is not the start that Dark was hoping for. Yeah, first two minutes, disastrous, but not quite on those levels. No, no, no. But yeah, now this drone, it's just like, well, do I go back home with my tail between my legs? And he's like, no, no, I'll stick around. We get to see which tech you're going for at least, which, you know, he's, he's respecting this drone. He's He's got the probe following it for a little bit. I don't think it's entirely necessary, but yeah, Showtime's definitely not going to be too phased about this thus far. No, not at all. Got his second gas up, drops the Stargate in the main. The drone will spot that. I don't think that's... Uh... You don't want to delay the Stargate so much that you just can kill off the drone. Just let him see it, right? Just, it's fine. 
The only thing he could do is like some crazy like cancel into Twilight, right into Glaives, but the Adept's moving out on the map. It didn't even come to kill this drone. No, I mean like that guy just hanging around for as long as it did. It's going back home at this point. It's like, do I even make it? It's like, bruh, probably not. I'm, I mean, I'm a little bit surprised, but uh, yeah, Showtime just prioritizing the fact that you can get Adept's on, out on the map. Remember, speed's going to be a lot later with a build like this where you really do commit to trying to get a hatchery down. And Dar just trying to be annoying with it, but yeah. Um, and about scouting the Stargate, long gone are the days of, oh my goodness, I got scouted, I now lose kind of thing. It's like, no, no, no. Builds do tend to be kind of in line with things now, and it's just about dealing with it properly. Especially a Stargate, right? It's it's so like, okay, Dar can be like, okay, nice, it's not a Twilight Council, but it could still be a Twilight after Stargate, you know? There's still opportunities there as these Adepts are going to commit in. They're going to get a drone and now going to find another. Run away from those Lings, actually created an exit for themselves for the moment. They are desperate for one more drone. He's going to get it, and that's, see, that's pretty good. That's a lot of lost mining time. Multiple drones going down and super early in the game. Yeah, and like that isn't something that Showtime's been doing. He's been waiting for like a good five or so Adepts to then go in, combo it with the Oracles, but given the opening, just feeling like, hey, I can get out across the map and killing those drones as early as he did, that's absolutely great for him. We'll keep this probe alive as well over here. That's also nice. So far, this is a fantastic start for Showtime. And the drone count, the worker count, really, really represents that very well right now. Very aggressive with the oracles on those lanes, activating them immediately. I thought the first time necessary to make sure the probe doesn't go down. But even right, on the map here, activating to get rid of a single ling. Just wants to push these units back, stop them from being on the map, stop Dark from having units is never a bad strategy. No, definitely not. And Showtime just getting everything sorted out behind this. This is the kind of game where I can absolutely see Dark just wing it with something, you know, when it's all been a bit like, nothing's disastrous, but nothing's that good. Um, and, oh, I like this second wave of Adepts coming out, because that's not necessarily something that you're really thinking about if you're Dark right now. And he, does he have any links on the field even? No, I, I feel like he doesn't have much at all. No, but he's ten, got ten. ten. Links. Well, that's okay. Obviously, this depends where the fight is. The Oracles are very separated from the Adepts, and that part I don't like for Showtime, because so much of this is like, hey, the Oracles can jump in and help if they want to. He's mm. going to send it, man. He wants some drones. He splits. He gets a couple different drones. That was actually really well done. And he actually keeps two of the Adepts alive. So, again, don't really hate that. Gets a Creep Tumor on the exit as well. And even these ones going to threaten into the main base. So, again, cool play from Showtime being very aggressive this game. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, yeah, you were absolutely right. Like, that... <laughs> sending the two different sets of shades onto two different drones, just guaranteeing the kills, no overfire or anything. These oracles, though, this is a little bit scary there. And you saw the little twinge on Showtime's face, realizing that, ah, it could bit off a little bit more than he should chew, or can chew even. Does he only have one oracle left? Did he uh, only build two this Two, one? two oracles okay, left. So he did build three. Yeah, no, I mean, losing one just, it's always sad because, like, it's almost always unnecessary, right? Like, it's, uh, like, ah, uh, did I get that much out of this? These last two Adepts are still going to come back one more time. Two more drones, a couple more shots, make it three. I, I really love what he's done with the Adepts this game. It's just such a different vibe. And if I'm dark right now, I'm quaking a little bit. It's like, bro, like, who am I playing against? This is meant to be showtime. Yeah, absolutely. This is a different tempo altogether. And... I feel this was Showtime reacting a lot to what Dark did early on and just realizing like, hey, 